Once More with Feeling by Red Pretzel, read by Alanix Mabella. Chapter 1 Pansy Parkinson was in her office. Not just in her office, but sat looking rather at home in Hermione's armchair, tapping her stilettos against the side of the desk as she casually flipped through the manila folder Hermione had received earlier that day. The confidential folder, Hermione remembered, was a jolt, hurrying forward to her desk and snatched it away from Pansy's manicured talons. Miss Parkinson, Hermione greeted with a smile she was more welcoming than her action. My apologies, I must have forgotten we had a meeting. They did not have a meeting. Hermione was resolutely certain Pansy Parkinson had absolutely zero interest in the regulation and control of magical creatures. Judging by the perfectly sleek, raised eyebrows Pansy gave her in return, her unwanted visitor shared the same sentiments. Spare the formalities, Granger. As titillating as it was to read your proposal on liberating the oh-so-oppressed cockatrice, Pansy drawled, eyes flashing in amusement at the irritated look Hermione must have failed to conceal. I'm here for pleasure, not business. Pansy Parkinson was in her office for personal matters. Hermione resisted the urge to look outside her window for flying pigs. Oh, right, yes, of course, Hermione said, extremely self-aware she was still awkwardly standing up in her own office. She looked pointedly at her armchair with a jokey nod, silently asking for her chair back. With a mild sigh, like she was doing Hermione a favour, Pansy rose, walking around and placed her right hip against the edge of the desk, one leg elegantly crossing over the other as she leaned back, fingers tapping rhythmically on the leather embossed panel. Hermione wondered if it was an inherited trait or through years of etiquette training that gave these aristocratic purebloods the ability to look graceful yet casual in any given place. Probably the latter, and Hermione subtly glanced at the mirror near her desk, making sure she was not slouching in her chair. So, um, how's things? Hermione lamely asked, when the silence had extended just past socially acceptable. Bloody hell, even Pansy's snort sounded graceful. I do hope you're more charming at your ministry functions, Granger. Merlin help your networking skills. Pansy reached into her robe's pocket, pulling out a silver embossed envelope and holding it out to Hermione expectantly. What's this? That's kind of the idea of envelopes, Granger. Open it up, you'll find out. Hermione took it with a restrained huff, not too dissimilar to the way she'd taken the folder from Pansy's hands a few minutes prior, ignoring Pansy's quiet chuckle as she peeled the flap open, eyebrows lifting towards the ceiling as she read the elegantly navy blue stitching. Dearest Draco Malfoy and Hermione Granger, you are cordially invited to the celebration of Miss Pansy Parkinson and Mr. Theodore Abraham Knott's engagement on the 25th June 2006. RSVP no later than 12th April 2006. Location to be confirmed privately upon RSVP. Hermione blinked once, twice, and then a third time as she stared at the invitation in front of her. She was, of course, aware Pansy and not were dating, but hadn't realized it had reached such milestones. Er, uh, congratulations, Hermione said, carefully placing the card back into the envelope. Weddings were hardly her fault, and she wasn't quite sure what to talk about with the bride-to-be. Er, uh, do you, so, is, um, do you have a dress? Hermione internally winced. Merlin helped her, indeed. My wedding dress has been designed since the day I could say husband, Granger, Pansy said dismissively, Ernest playing with the freight stitching of the leather desktop. Hermione had to sing the Hogwarts school's theme in her head to resist the urge to smack her hands away. Pansy looked up at her, with a viper glint to her eyes and a smirk to match. Don't worry, only a couple hundred house elves will have been harmed in the making of it. Hogwarts, Hogwarts, Hoggy Waddy, Hogwarts, teach us something, please. Hermione smiled tightly at her, regretting her decision to rearrange her afternoon meeting that day. Would she give to currently be set opposite Horace Jorkins, the sleazy, aging cockatrice breeder who spent every previous meeting staring at her breasts, making not so subtle innuendos on how welcome she was to come and pet his cockatrice? Anytime, anywhere.
I'm sure their blood, sweat, and tears will glitter like diamonds on your train, Hermione replied wryly. Nonsense, Pansy waved airily. They'd never show up under the actual diamonds. She finished with a wink. Whether we be old and bold or young with scabby knees. The dressy on the invitation sprang to Hermione's mind. Why did you deliver this to me, by the way? Why not just owl it to Draco? True, Hermione had the misfortune of spending more than a few dinners with Pansy and Theo over the last few months. Certainly against her will at first. But once Draco had pointed out that acquainting oneself with the Sacred 28 was a great way to gain financial support for her latest proposal schemes, Hermione supposed there was no harm in interacting with the snakes every once in a while. And when Draco insisted on joining her for the dinners, they are my friends. Why wouldn't I join for dinner? And Granger, you'll have much better luck letting me be the one to manipulate my friend's bank account. Hermione had struggled to come up with an excuse not to go. The things she did for her career. But few business dinners didn't explain why Pandy was currently in her office, personally handing her an invitation with her name embroidered in blue silk on it. Draco Malfoy plus one. Hermione could understand, but to be personally, in this case quite literally, invited? Sure. If I wanted the hours we pay by next winter, I'd have happily owed it to him. But I'm sure you understand why it's far more time efficient to come to you. Hermione blinked at her, but Pansy carried on, seemingly oblivious. It's not like he responds to our owls half the time anyway these days. Evidently helping you save the animal kingdom one deadly beast at a time is far more stimulating for him. Pansy paused, scanning Hermione quickly and took a moment to pointedly stare at Hermione's breast. Hmm, maybe Hermione should introduce Pansy to Mr. Jorkins? Well, I guess there is one thing, oops, uh, I meant two, she grinned salaciously, making it worth his while. To Hermione's credit, she didn't think she blushed too deeply. At the very least, she successfully felt the urge to cross her arms above her chest. I'll be sure to pass on the message, Hermione said, with a tone hopefully indicative of finality. Oh, do please ensure it. I was hoping to count on a golden girl, Pansy stood, wonderfully charming away the small creases in her robes. She turned to leave, but not before she tapped delicately on the envelope still in Hermione's hand. Twelfth of April, Granger! Pansy's eyes scanned the forever untamed mess of curls haloing Hermione's head, her lips thinning for a fleet moment in obvious disdain. I'm sure I don't need to remind you it's a formal occasion. Hermione was at least 70% certain Pansy was talking directly to her hair and couldn't stop the self-conscious brush through with her hand. Our heads could do with filling with some interesting stuff For now they're bare and full of air With the twinkling wriggle of her fingers, Pansy turned on her heels and headed towards the door. It's good matters to respond post-haste, Granger. She stopped one foot planted in the hallway, and Hermione imagined wondrously slamming the door in her face, only for a second. Or three. As if reading Hermione's thoughts, Pansy cast her eyes down the manila folder and smoked. I presume I'll be informing Gringotts of a sizable donation to your apartment soon enough, no? With a finer quirk of her brow, Pansy disappeared around the corner, and left Hermione to wonder if getting the final word in was also part of a purebloods etiquette training. The aroma of spices and trace amounts of flu ash flooded Hermione's senses as she stepped foot into the living room of her flat that evening. Crookshanks meowed and weaved around her legs in greeting, and she bent down to stroke her old familiar. Hello, Crooks, she crooned softly. Not been giving too much trouble, have you? He only purred, rubbing his head into a palm as a poignant scoff sounded out from the kitchen. I think you might want to old Potter and let him know he might have missed a whole crux. Hermione snorted as a blonde hat poked around the corner, cheeks flushed red, forehead lined with perspiration caused by exacerbation, no doubt due to the fury companion still nuzzling against her. An accusatory finger jumped in the cat's direction. Hermione watched in amusement as Draco glared menacingly at him, looking at it all dissimilar to the bratty, poncy 11-year-old Hermione met on the Hogwarts train all these years ago.
that thing made me burn myself twice and he knocked over the pen so i had to start all over again hermione looked down and quirked a brow questioningly at her familiar crookshank simply blinked lazily at her though his eyes held a hint of triumph and satisfaction before sauntering off towards the corridor had tilted high in what Hermione could only assume was a mockery of Draco's own rather standoffish posture. Draco scowled after him, turning on his heels and stalked back into the kitchen, muttering under his breath, Not even Nagini, basilisk on your knee, long can one blood cat live anyway. Was all Hermione was able to grasp as she removed her robes hanging them up on the hook. She let her nose lead her feet, following after Draco into the kitchen, where he was rather aggressively stirring. Paella again? Don't worry, I remember to thaw out the prawns this time. Draco cast a wry grin over his shoulder. As charming and graceful as you are with the spite of food poisoning, I don't feel like receiving any howlers for the rest of the week. Awfully inconvenient on the co-workers and all that. Hermione scowled, her gin tilted upwards. You throw up for three days, let's see how jovial you are. Draco shrugged dismissively, his focus firmly on picking up the cayenne pepper shaker, not the cinnamon. Merlin knew they didn't need a repeat of the enchiladas incident. You needed the break. I don't have time for a break from work, Draco. I'm meeting with the Wizengamot in two weeks. Draco looked back at her, his eyes wide in surprise. I thought the cockatrice hearing wasn't for another nine weeks? Hermione glared at the kitchen tiles. If she squinted, she could see tiny grains of rice Draco must have missed in cleanup following Crookshank's earlier alleged sabotage. Evidentially, the Wizengamots find my proposal exceedingly important. I must not need the extra time to put my case together. I surely have all the evidence I need. She paraphrased the regretted teeth, the memo she received the day before. A memo she had great satisfaction in incendiaring from the safety of her rubbish bin. Draco raised his brow in question, tapping his wand to turn the pot to a simmer, and walked over to her, his hand stretched out to twirl a rebellious curl between his fingers. You think they're sabotaging you, like the manticore case? He murmured lightly, tugging the cool, and watched as it sprung back. Hermione huffed. That buggering manticore case. Four months of research. Over a dozen all-nighters in her office. Two emergency trips to St. Mungo's following minor disagreements with a particularly stubborn manticorn. Admittedly, Draco had not been the most supportive in this particular case, and the gloating I told you so's he tossed away when re-wrapping her wounds or administering her potions was more insufferable than her being bedbound for a week, only to arrive on the day of the hearing to be turned away at the door. Oh, hadn't the stranger gotten the memo? The hearing had been pushed forward twenty-four hours. Oh, what a shame. It must have gotten lost in transit. We wondered why you didn't show up yesterday. Not to worry, Miss Granger. You can refile an 18 months per Wizengamot policy. She'd stormed through the ministry halls in a wild rage, only vaguely noticing her hair giving off sparks that had landed and shocked quite a few employees. Hermione hadn't even noticed where her feet had taken her until she was pushing a rather shocked but all too willing Draco into his desk chair. Just barely of sun enough mind to cast a silent charm around his office as she unleashed her anger and frustration riding his lap. Afterwards, both spent, sweaty, and gasping for breath, Draco, like approaching an injured wild animal, had quietly asked how the hearing went. Hermione would later blame her intense orgasm and residual anger for the way she suddenly burst into tears, her vulnerable mind making her weep and cuddle into Draco's side for the rest of the afternoon. She could only thank Draco's gentleman's stature for the way he patiently let her cry out for hours, his hand stroking her back in a soothing manner, with no complaints despite the pile of paperwork sitting on his desk. Ever the aristocrat, he'd even escorted her back to a flat and tucked her in bed, and when she'd woken up the following morning with a blinding stress-induced migraine, a glass of water was sitting on a bedside table next to a pain relief potion. We'll get them next time, was a simple note scribbled underneath the potion bottle. Hermione made sure to send him an owl apologizing for her behavior the previous day, thanked him for the medicine that she'd endeavored to work on her professionalism, and could he meet her in the office that afternoon to discuss the appeal? Together, they spent an entire afternoon writing up an appeal and archiving Hermione's research, so that she wouldn't have to go fraternizing with those bloody manticles again, as Draco had grumbled once they'd finished, before he rounded the desk, got on his knees, and spread her legs. 
Minutes later, he was pocketing her knickers, wiping his mouth, and asked if she wanted Thai or Italian that evening. Hermione eyed the pen bubbling behind Draco. The rice is sticking to the bottom, she pointed out. With a string of French castles, Draco rushed over, quickly stirring the contents. Anything else happen at work today? Oh, you bastard, you better not be overcooked. He glared at the prawns, which looked suspiciously shriveled. Silken navy blue ran through her mind. Pansy Parkinson was in my office when I came back from my lunch today. Hermione started, her brow furrowing when Draco's back curiously stiffened. Draco looked back at her, face open but grey eyes hesitant. Oh? She reached into her bag and pulled out the embossed envelope. Did you know Pansy and Theo were engaged? He's my best mate, Granger, so obviously not. Hermione snorted, tossing the gaudy slip onto the kitchen counter as she went to stand next to Draco. Mmm, those prawns did look overcooked. The invitation is for both of us, Hermione frowned, her teeth creeping forwards to gnaw on her bottom lip. Why do you think they put my name on it? Draco's lips quirked into a private grin as he stood the rice. Why indeed, Granger? Hermione frowned, feeling like she was missing out on some private joke. Must be a Slytherin thing. Do you know something I... <laughs> Her words were cut off by the spoonful of rice shoved not too gracefully into her mouth. Draco looked at her expectantly. She let the rice sit in her mouth for a moment, the savouriness overpowering her taste buds. You forgot the white wine, she critiqued after a moment. He scowled, turning his head glaring into the empty corridor. I didn't the first time, he huffed, reaching for the bottle. Dinner will be another ten minutes. Draco cocked his head towards the cupboard where crockery was kept. Be a dear and set the table. He cooed at her with a smirk. Hermione rolled her eyes at the mocking endearment. With any luck, you'll be the one vomiting this time, she muttered, but reached up to grab the plates. As she headed to the table, Hermione could have sworn she heard him mutter, As if I'd ever harm you, Granger. The echo of her second orgasm still hummed over her veins as she sat on the toilet, cleaning herself up. She stood, her thighs only slightly trembling as she flushed a chain. Washing her hands, she heard Draco moving through the living room, casting the nightly wards as she shut off her fireplace. Back in her bedroom, she wrinkled her nose at the stench of sweat in the air and crossed the room to lightly crack open the window. Somewhere in the corridor, she heard Crookshanks meow and whine. For the dozenth time, you furball demon, you're not sleeping in our bed, Draco grumbled and her lips twitched at Crookshanks' hiss in response. Merlin's bull, this is exactly why you're not coming in. Be grateful, I don't need any potions requiring cat eyes, because I know where that stop first. Draco appeared through the door frame, closing and warding the door. As Hermione climbed into the bed, he strode over, placing a glass of water on her bedside table. Ooh, wonderful. She had been waking up extremely thirsty lately. Draco plopped down next to her with about as much grace as a blast and its crude. Granger, I hate your cat, he muffled into the pillow. I'm sure the feeling is mutual, Hermione said dryly, her eyes appreciatively trailing down the taut muscles of his back, all the way down to his wonderfully plump, please, Granger, my eyes are up here. Hermione looked up to see Draco tightly grinning at her. Honestly, he pouted, her, chuffling to rest on his side. I feel so objectified. She eyeballed in response and turned her back to him to lay down, snuggling her head into her pillow. Barely a beat later, and she felt him shuffle towards the middle of the bed, his arm reached around her waist to tuck her closer. Hermione lay there for a few minutes, lost in her thoughts. She had no idea how she was going to complete the paperwork for her hearing in two weeks. She had no idea if it was possible to get food poisoning from overcooked prawns. She had no idea why Pansy thought the quickest way to tell Draco of her engagement party was through her. But as Draco's breath slowed, and she felt a sleepy, lazy kiss at the nape of her neck, and him murmur a barely audible good night. She at least was sure of one thing. She was not dating Draco Malfoy. Chapter 2 Hermione bumped into Theodore Knott on a Tuesday as she headed into the lift to meet with Harry and Ginny for lunch. And she couldn't help but think that karma had finally caught up to her for that boys course in fifth year. That was the only reason Hermione could think of as to why her life regularly involved interacting with former Slytherins. Said man looked up as she stepped into the lift, and his expression brightened, although the dark sharpness of his eyes betrayed his true motives. Ah, oh, Granger, 
just a girl I was here to see. Dear greeted with a Cheshire cat grin, and he leaned down in a slight bow to kiss the back of her hand. Tall, dark, poised, handsome, and all the manners of a well-bred pureblood. No doubt he was the physical embodiment of the type of man her great-grandmother Ida had instilled into her to avoid. Unless the man was also old money, as she had called them. Apparently grandmother Ida's mornings only went so far as a man's bank account. Hermione only hoped that Theo's status as a newly promised man was enough to forgive her in her ancestors' eyes. Hermione resisted the urge to roll her eyes as she tucked her hand out of Theo's grip. She reached across him to press the button, the lift closing with a shuddered groan, and a pair jolted slightly as the lift started once, twice, and then thrust downwards. Somehow, I highly doubt that not. Aren't these days when you meet with your parole, Aurora? How's Aura Fontaine, by the way? Hermione asked, her lips twitching when his suave mask slipped into irritation for a fleeting second. Old, he replied shortly. But evidently, he's not completely lost his marbles because he's approved my probation to be lifted. Hermione must not have hidden the shock on her face quick enough as Theo tittered at her. Honestly, Granger, it was one minor time turner incident. It's not like I was blitting my soul. He leaned in, his grin shark-like. Besides, rumor has it you've also dabbled a bit in time meddling yourself. I'm sure Draco would be fascinated to learn what truly happened with that overstuffed chicken inside you. Hermione scolded at him and hoped that the mean expression on her face distracted a treacherous blush that had creeped across her neck. Leave it to Slytherin to hold on to a silly school rumor. Leave it to a Gryffindor to think the laws of time magic should apply to everyone but themselves. See a bit back, not missing a beat. Hermione exhaled in not quite a half and simultaneously raised her left eyebrow and chin and looked at him expectantly. Ron called it her molly face. What can I do for you not? Ah. Oh. Theo snapped his fingers, his slick persona back in place, and he reached into his suit jacket to pull out a silver hip flask. Most likely an heirloom, judging from the outdated engraved pattern, and held it out for her to take. Draco left this behind from our gentleman's night the other week. Do be a lamp and return it to him, won't you? The ding, quickly followed by the less than graceful landing to the ground floor, interrupted Hermione's barbed retort to his patronizing tone as she stumbled. Of course, Theo had to reach out to steady her. His own gait showed nary tremble. He probably had to take posture lessons from the moment that he could support his overgrown big hat, Hermione internally grumbled. Thank you. Hermione muttered, taking the flask with a frown, and Theo shook it at her playfully. Why did everyone keep giving her Draco stuff? Why does everyone keep giving me Draco stuff? She repeated out loud, as the pack quickly stepped out of the lift, before the swarm of early lunchers rushed forward. Theo just snorted, not wholly unlike Pansy did in her office the other day. Huh? Hermione guessed it was true what they said. People did start to resemble their partners. Quickest way to get things to him is through you these days. Besides, Draco is awfully possessive of what's his grandeur. Theo planted his feet and stared hard into her face for a moment. Can't keep what's his away from him too long. He gets awfully grouchy. Over a hip flask? Hermione asked in bewilderment. Theo blinked at her, that Cheshire cat grin slowly returning to his features as she hummed. Sure. His eyes searched hers, and Hermione wasn't entirely sure he found what he was looking for before he shrugged. Topic seemingly dropped as he tilted his chin towards the flask in her hand. Just be sure to give that to him when you see him tonight. What makes you think I'm seeing him tonight? Honestly, who did they think she was, his keeper? Theo snorted again, and Hermione decided the second time around was far less graceful than his fiancés had been. <laughs> Good one, Granger. He snickered and bowed a final time as he turned towards the direction of the ministry exit. Pansy is still waiting for that RSVP, by the way. I'm sure your precious books could handle you having one night away from them, if that's what's causing your late hour. You will send your response soon, like a good little lamb, won't you? Theo smirked over his shoulder and tossed her a quick wink as he sauntered off to the ministry building before she could reply. Slimy git. Hermione wondered what the odds were of being able to slip arsenic into his wine at the next business dinner unnoticed. Promised them to none what with the hard gaze of his fiancée and the talents to match. As she headed towards the ministry cafeteria, 
Hermione's thoughts were troubled with the fact that Theo and Pansy had the bizarre notion that Draco and Hermione had regular matching schedules. They surely didn't see each other that often outside of work means. They certainly weren't close enough for the promised couple to ensure that they'd RSVP together. Draco occasionally came around to her flat after work, yes, but that was only so they could bring the work home with them and not lose their stride gained in her office. How many all-nighters had they pulled to finish research? Or to write up field notes? Or to score through centuries outdated legislations? A light bulb went off in Hermione's head. Ah, that must be it. Of course, Hermione internally chuckled. Draco had been helping her plan and research the cockatrice proposal for the last couple of weeks. Hmm. Hermione supposed it could be why the invitation had been sent together. Theo, at the very least, knew how long-winded it could take for the legislation to be officially recorded as law. And thanks to Pansy's nosing through her files the other day, no doubt little gossip had whispered Hermione's next case into his ear. They were primary benefactors after all. It was only logical for them to assume Draco would be forced to spend more time with Hermione during an active notion, hence the joint invitation. Hermione let out a delightful long sigh and enjoyed the tingle that spread through her brain at finally solving the little puzzle. She had spent far too much time thinking this over the last few days. And time was absolutely something Hermione did not have to spare on such frivolous matters. Harry, so help me, Goodrick, you're not giving our child that horrendous name. His actions helped turn the visiting ball in our favour. Name one time he said anything even remotely nice to you that didn't involve your mother. He loved her all that time, Ginny. Ginny huffed. Her face had slowly turned as red as her hair throughout the course of this argument, and she threw him a scornful glare. Oh, yes, he had a child infatuation with your mother. She rejected him, in turn he joined Death Eaters despite her, so romantic, not to mention the years he spent harassing Neville. Or do you not remember Snape being his greatest fear? <sighs> he was a war hero, Harry pointed out weakly after a brief pause. So was Grob, Hermione spoke, tired and drained after hearing the pair argue for the last ten minutes over her second's future godson's name. The look Harry gave her could only be summed up in one word, betrayal. Ginny sat back in her chair and looked very much like the cat who got the canary as she grinned at Hermione, a protective hand gently rubbing over her rather pregnant belly. Albus Grob Potter, Ginny hummed, certainly takes the lead in my books. Harry gaped at his wife, and Hermione wondered if that was the first time she had ever seen her best friend lost for words since the day she befriended him back in the girls' lavatory. When Hermione decided to take a rare proper lunch break away from her desk, she hadn't envisioned it would be spent watching the parents-to-be arguing over what middle name to give their child. Her friends often complained about her lack of social interaction. Hermione, we work in the same building. How hard is it to meet up for lunch? Yet, on the rare occasion she did leave her sanctuary of an office, it likely meant she would be subjected to an hour of thrilling conversational topics such as Quidditch, Quidditch players, Quidditch leagues, vague references to confidential active aura cases Hermione wasn't privy to, and oh, did they see Brock Wade attempt the wonky feint last weekend? At least in her office she had her books. She had ancient wizarding law texts that needed translating, and most importantly, she had her ginger biscuits tucked away in her top desk drawer. Ah, her desk. Hermione felt her eyes glisten wistfully at the amount of research papers on her desk. As she listened closely, she was sure she could hear the papers calling her name. Hermione. Hermione. Hermione? Hermione? Harry waved his hand in front of her face, and she came to with a mild embarrassed flush to her cheeks. Merlin, she hoped she hadn't drooled. Again? Oh, yeah, um, Hermione glanced between the pair, hoping for a cue. She could always count on Harry Potter. You got any names we can toss into the hat? Hermione paused for a moment before her face brightened, research papers forgotten. Well, if you did want to go down the route of teachers who made an impact on your life, what about Professor Lupin? The Patronus charm saved your life more than a dozen times, and who knows? You might never have been able to master it in time if they weren't for his teachings. Albus Remus? Harry panned a blank look in Hermione's direction. 
Hermione flushed, sitting back into her seat. You asked for my suggestion, she defended. Better than Albus Novellus, Jenny muttered into her juice glass. Besides, Merfus probably already called dips on his good father's name, right, Hermione? How would I know? Her brow furrowed. She glanced between the pair. Her eyes narrowed as Harry pointedly avoided her gaze. Well, if group's out of the question, and Hermione should have known better than to take a sip of a drink when she saw the twinkle in Ginny's eyes. What about Hagrid? As Harry's eyes near bucked out of his glasses, Hermione snorted, tragically at the same time as she'd swallowed, spraying her teeth back against the rim of her cup. She grimaced as she felt the hot liquid splash against her silk blouse. Bugger, that shirt had been a Christmas gift from Draco as well. Hermione's breath hitched as Draco trailed hot, open-mouthed kisses down from her breast towards her stomach. Her tummy jerked as his tongue flicked into her belly button, and she choked back a moan at the deep chuckle he breathed against her damp, sensitive skin. His kisses pressed deeper into her skin as he moved further south, and Hermione was unable to stop the soft whine that leapt from her throat as he tongued across her navel. She rose up to rest on her elbows, watched as his head dipped. Wait! Her hand reached out, gripping the silky locks between her thighs. Draco's eyes shot up to her in alarm, and he pulled away from her. Did you pick up my blazer from Twitter's dry cleaners? She watched as Draco blinked lazily at her, held his gaze as his head returned to its place moments prior. She groaned as he kissed across her right hip bone. Draco, I need it for my meeting tomorrow. Did, 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 uh, did you, did you pick it up? She gritted out and resorted to counting the cracks in her painted ceiling as she tried to focus on anything but a teasing tongue between her legs. Draco was quiet for a few moments and Hermione twisted her fingers in his hair firmly. In the wardrobe, next to that offensive potato sack you call a dress, he murmured against her thigh and nipped at the skin gently in retaliation. Whatever words Hermione had planned to defend her wardrobe choices were cut off by a gasp moan, her spine arching as Draco's ministration returned in full force. Pansy still needs our RCP, she blurted out, not a second later. Draco looked up at her incredulously and quirked a brow, no doubt in disbelief she brought up his engaged ex whilst they were... Ooh, but if Draco didn't look sexy at that moment... His gaze was hot and seared through her as he pressed soft kisses not millimeters from where her mind needed them to be. Just a little to the left. I'll send them tomorrow, dear. Draco smirked and Hermione barely had a second to process his words before her spine grew taut like a bow and all other thoughts melted away as he dipped back down in between her thighs, his lips right where Hermione needed them to be. Hermione grabbed the newly cleaned blazer from her wardrobe and threw it on, exacerbatedly pulling out her hair from where it got caught under the collar. Her whelmed, where was her? Her hands flew to her pockets out of habit and she huffed, pulling out only the dry cleaner's receipt. Tossed to the ground without a second thought, joined what was likely half of her wardrobe and drawers content, half-hazardly discarded as she'd searched in near vain for a favorite cream button-up. Naturally, it had to have been stored in the last place she'd thought to look. What was the shirt doing next to a bunch of socks anyway? Hermione must have left her wound in the living room, she concluded and in her hurried manner tripped over Draco's old credit jersey and stumbled against the edge of the doorframe. Cursing and hobbling on one foot down the corridor, the smell of eggs and toast wafted towards her. Draco was attempting to read the morning paper, and what looked to be wrestling one arm against Crookshanks, who was trying his damnedest to paw the toast from Draco's hand. Every morning you pull this shit. Can I please just eat my toast in peace, you little... No, that's my toast. Piss off. Hermione glanced at the time on the clock and blanched. Oh, bugger, bugger, bugger. Draco, have you seen my... On the side table. Ah, ha! Hermione pocketed her wand with a sigh of relief. She never could get used to the naked feeling she had without it. And my... Hung up on the wreck. No, ah, uh, would you just die? Surely this is your ninth life, you mangy senile rodent. Crookshanks hissed viciously in response. She tossed on her outer robes. Rats, where's my... Right, just fuck, there, you happy? Evidently, Crookshanks must have won the toast war as he jumped down from the counter and came into Hermione's line of vision, holding what looked like a half chewed slice of butter toast in his mouth and a satisfied gleam in his eyes. Draco, I don't suppose you know... Here, 
Draco replied, and Hermione fought the urge to snicker at the sucky tone of his voice as he held up her bag by the knuckles of his fingers. Hermione rushed forward, her fingers just clasped around the straps, and found herself barely a half distance away from Draco as he'd pulled the bag towards him, his lips encasing hers. She felt a firm hand pressed against the nape of her neck as she leaned closer to him, felt his deep groan as she let him deepen the kiss. She supposed, after he lost his breakfast to her pet, it was only polite. A moment too soon, she felt herself pulled away, a disgruntled moan escaping her mouth without permission, and her head, feeling very much like a bag of cotton wool, leaned forward to follow to have a slice of toast pressed against her mouth. Hermione's eyes popped open. Draco's amused grin looked back at her. Good morning, he murmured, his eyes focused on her lips as she chewed on the toast absentmindedly, her mind still reeling from the sensation of his lips on hers. She swallowed several times. Drake hadn't quite buttered the toast enough, admittedly, a little dry, before she replied a breathless, Morning! His eyes positively glinted as he cocked his head and a suspiciously innocent expression adorned his features. Ranger? he questioned softly. Hermione could only hum in response, her eyes very much focused on the crumb still on the corner of his mouth. She wondered how unprofessional it would be if she leaned in and licked it off. Aren't you late for something? Hermione jolted back so quickly she swore her spine cracked. Her eyes shot back to the grandfather clock in her living room and gasped in horror. She snatched her back from the snickering gits fingers as she rushed to the flu. Hermione knew two things for certain. First of all, she was, in fact, very late for her meeting. And secondly... Barely catching Draco call after her that he'd sent their RSVP back to Pansy as the flames surrounded her, she was definitely not dating Draco Malfoy. Twitter's dry cleaning. Tokens reserved by Al only. Receipt number 53948DHR. Description Black Muggle Blazer Cream Linen. Total 5 gallons 7 sickles. Collected by H. Granger's partner. Chapter 3 Twenty-two months ago, Draco Malfoy strolled into her office without so much as a knock. She'd heard through the grapevine that Malfoy was the new liaison for the Department of Regulation and Control of Magical Creatures, but given the recent rising tensions between the Ministry and a small clan of health vampires up in Durham, she hadn't expected to see him so soon. The irony of a former Death Eater being the peacemaker for half-breeds was not lost on her. Miss Granger he greeted cordially, as if he hadn't just barged into her office uninvited. Got a moment? Even if I didn't, I'm sure that wouldn't stop you. Hermione gestured to the chair on the other side of her desk. A ghost of a smirk twitched at his mouth as he sat down, reclining into the chair, one leg crossed over the other, as a rather expensive-looking Italian bro came up to rest against the edge of her desk. Hermione had to recite the five principal exemptions to Gemp's law to calm her irritation at his casual, gentleman's club posture. Co-workers or not, if her shoes scuffed her desk, she'd ensure Martha would be eating nothing but bad baby for a week. What brings me the honour of your company, Mr. Malfoy? If you're here to discuss Durham, you'll need to speak with Kinkleberry down the hall. Oh, not to worry. Spoken with and been propositioned multiple times by Mr. Kinkleberry for the last three weeks, Malfoy quirked a brow at her. Who knew dealing with a bunch of coffin boppers could make a bloke so horny? Whatever gets your rock offs, Malfoy, her mind dryly replied, her interest in the conversation quickly dwindling and her fingers started to edge back towards the paperwork in front of her. Malfoy clicked his tongue. I assure you, Miss Granger, whenever I step foot into this building, it is solely for business, although... Martha leaned forward to drop a thick, heavy manila folder on top of the papers she was reading, and he snickered at the glare she shot him when it just missed the tips of her fingers. I'm sure what's in here will send your golden galnicus all a quiver. Think of manicus often, do you, Malfoy? Hermione said coolly, barely registered in Malfoy's choked of cough as she flicked open the folder and read the headline of the proposal her eyebrows raised in disbelief. Her head snapped up to his, vaguely aware of a gaping mouth. Malfoy simply looked back at her with a blank, almost disinterested expression, but she noticed the way his eyes glinted challengingly. You, this, how, did... Hermione's brain reeled as her mouth tried to catch up with her thoughts. This is my wolfsbane, Bill. Malfoy hummed, looking almost bored as his hand flicked the label of his tie. 
I'm aware, Blay said a right laugh when he read about the second rejection in the prophet. The vacant expression on his face slowly morphed into the smug, cocky grin Hermione had seen all too often in the early years at Hogwarts. Hermione gritted her teeth at the image in her head of the two of them laughing at her failure over a cigar and century-old fire whiskey. Is that so? And what? You decided you wanted a front row seat the next time the node or muggleborn tried again? Mervis eyes flashed, his jaw tense. If Hermione hadn't been staring daggers at him, she might have missed the way his eyes guiltily flickered to the sleeve of her left arm before his eyes met hers in an equally silly place, a silent refusal to rise to a bait. Don't look a gift unicorn in the mouth, Granger, his tone low and heavy. Hermione swallowed and had to resist repeating the motion when his eyes tricked the movement. I'm here to help, and if you don't believe me, you have my permission to send in the potty brigade to interrogate me. Hermione's brows furrowed. You want to help me. Technically speaking, that is my job. She flushed and quickly covered it with a scowl. What makes you think that submitting this a third time will be any different? The Wizengamot has made it very clear they have no intention of ever passing this bill. Malfoy clicked his tongue in disapproval. My, 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 I didn't take you for quitter, Granger. Whatever happened to that bushy hat 14-year-old that spent a whole year chasing after house elves with that ghastly knitwear? Fifteen. She couldn't help but correct. Fifteen. She couldn't help but correct. And she got sidelined by archaic and barbaric legislation and precedent. Hermione half choosing to ignore his bob over her knitting skills. Hermione's father always taught her to take the high road after all. Besides, she had much better chances of hexing Martha from above without him expecting it. And that's exactly where I come in. Martha rose from the chair and bent down over her desk, his hands coming down beside hers, head cocked to the side as he leaned in. Ever heard of the phrase, friends in high places? You're saying you expect me to bribe people to pass this bill? Hermione scoffed. Her shoulder blades tensed as she resisted the urge to pull back against her chair. The notion that she would ever stoop so low Mavis' rehabilitation be damned, once a Slytherin, always a... I'm saying let me be your friend. Mavis replied silkily. His eyes flickered down to stare at her lips, and Hermione felt the lick of humiliation creep up in her spine as she realized she likely had some crumbs from her biscuit break still on the edges of her mouth. Mavis met her gaze, and her stomach flipped at the intensity and determination there. Perhaps he did want to help her? No doubt getting a bill as monumentous as this passed, with him attached to the project, would send a tattered reputation of the mouth named Sky High. I'll let you think it over for a few days. When you do make your decision, Almi, he said finally and stood up straight. Of course, I have all the time in the world to wait. He paused to shoot a pompous smirk. Not sure the same could be said for your precious werewolves, though. And with a cheeky wink, he turned and sauntered out of her office. Of course, the haughty bastard had to leave the door wide open. As Hermione headed back to her desk, her door pettily slammed shut. After an intense 15-minute internal argument with herself on how she would not give him the satisfaction of doing so, her letter to Malfoy containing details of her schedule and three hours for the next few weeks sat already written on her desk. Fifteen months ago, Draco strolled into her office and Hermione had just a fleeting sensation of déjà vu before she noticed the exhilarating and shiny gleam to his eyes and the quickness to his step. Hermione's stomach quivered in anticipation as she looked up at him. Malfoy? she asked hesitantly. No, any werewolves in need of a free prescription for wolvesbane? His tone was casual, but Hermione could detect the shaky adrenaline coursing through his body, and she couldn't help but admire the way his Adam apple bobbed. His words registered a beat later, and her heart stopped, her eyes snapping up from where they were tracing the trembling vein in his neck. What? Mervo hummed contemplatively, one of his hands coming up from behind his back, and Hermione swallowed at a distinct purple waxy seal from the Wizengamot office. I don't know about you, Granger, but I've definitely earned my Christmas bonus this year. It passed? She asked breathlessly, her eyes darted between his curl and his triumphant grin. Hermione didn't dare blink. For fear she'd snap out of this daydream and be set hunched over this translated script of the Dutch house I've seen in 1893. 
Hermione didn't dare blink for fear she'd snap out of this daydream and be set hunched over the translated script of the Dutch House Elves Union's 1893. She eagerly snatched the scroll out of his hand as he held it up to her, barely remembering to send him an apologetic smile as she ripped open the seal and she scanned the document so quickly and intensely her eyes watered. It passed, she repeated, numbed. She couldn't believe it. Manny always followed the logic of never believing anything until she saw it with her own two eyes, and yet there she stood, reading the notice of approval for a wolfsbane bill. A former written notice that it would be written into legislation by the beginning of next month, and her brain screamed at her that she was imagining it. Congratulations, Granger, Martha murmured from somewhere next to her. You did it. She had done it. She'd done it for Remus, for Lavender, for that sweet little nine-year-old boy whom Greyback had savaged when he was just a toy. He couldn't understand why he wasn't allowed to attend his best friend's birthday party when the moon was full and bright. He's my best friend. Best friends can hurt each other. I promise I'll be careful. Mommy, please, I promise. And shook, the parchment creased by the intense grip of her fingers, and she could taste the salty tears stream down her cheeks. She gasped out a choked laugh as she spun around to face her colleague. I did it! We did it! Hermione beamed at him, and she bounced on her heels, high off of her giddiness. Murphy let out his own laugh of disbelief and shook his head at her. If there's anyone more stubborn than a group of old, labitated, pompous wicks, it's you, Granger. His fun dive soothed over the backhanded compliment, and in a euphoric delight, Hermione leapt into his arms with an exhilarated laugh. Her legs wrapped around his waist as she pulled him into a choking hug. She felt Malfa's quiet gasp against the navel, his arms strong yet hesitant as they tightened around her back. The blood in her veins roared as she leaned back. The congratulations froze on her lips as she took in his heavy-lidded gaze. Hermione licked her lips nervously and shivered as he intensely watched the movement, his expression hungry and yearning. Malfoy, she whispered, her breath coming out staggered and heavy as his hat snapped up to meet her eyes. The coil in her snapped at the heat in his eyes as she leaned in to claim his lips in a bruising kiss. Malfoy seemed to respond instantly, his lips artfully swallowing her gasps, and his hand reached up to jerk at the hair tie holding up her bun. His groan as his fingers glided through her curls made her thighs clench around his waist, and she bit back a whimper as his mouth broke out from hers minutes later to travel hotly and eagerly across her jawline. Hermione gripped her hands across his shoulders as Malfoy staggered back, and collapsed into her chair, barely having a second to catch her breath as he pulled her toad across his lap. Grey eyes shone up at her in a mix of awe and arousal, as her hands pulled at the buttons of his Oxford white shirt desperately, and Hermione took immense satisfaction at the choked off curse that fell from Malfoy's lips as she leaned in to kiss across his pecs. It was certainly the most enjoyable way Hermione had spent breaking in her new office chair all afternoon. Hermione stared down mournfully at the formal invitation to dinner, the vein in her forehead pulsing as the aggravating headache crept in. Why did she have to shake Malfoy silly all those weeks ago? She'd hoped by keeping her distance, memories over in person meetings, darting into empty conference rooms as she'd spotted a silky shockingly blunt box around the corner of the corridor she was walking down, and charming her office door to stay open when he would manage to catch her alone, that they would all be glaring neon signs that she wished to maintain a status of professionalism between the pair, regardless of the multiple glorious talk calling orgasm he'd given her. Evidently, Martha must have had selective blindness since there had been an envelope in her desk waiting for her when she arrived that morning, with him asking her for the honour of joining him for dinner that evening. Or maybe Hermione had tucked them as her little too hard during their third go of it, and she'd inadvertently killed off some of his brain cells. It wasn't that Martha was a terrible person to be around, well, anymore. If anything, the six or seven months spent working together in a wolfsbane bill had been surprisingly enjoyable. True, the size of his ego and self incompetence had a mind reaching for a headache relief patient more than a dozen times, but Martha was also incredibly witty, hard-working, with determination that highlighted the Slytherin ambition that Hermione had always secretly admired. More often than not, she'd come into her office in the morning to find him already there, surrounded by legislations, international cases, journals and testimonials from potioners, as well as the day's agenda written out on her board, with a bullet-pointed list of targets to be completed by the end of the day, with extra bonus tasks scribbled at the bottom if the list was complete before the end of the workday. Hermione's mouth had watered the first time she saw it, and internally mourned at the years wasted on Martha's prejudice during their schooling. 
She'd caught herself fantasizing more than once about the study sessions they could have had together during their hours or noons. Imagining his task list and her color-coded notes had her eyes glazed over in academic euphoria. She would then spend the next 15 minutes mentally cursing Lucius Malfoy for the rhetoric he drilled into his son during his childhood. And only when Malfoy would ask her what her desk had done to her for her to be glowing so poisonously at it, she would snap out of it and carry on with the task at hand. And on occasions where she'd slip into old bad habits, working well into overtime that the moon would be at its highest point in the sky, standing up to fetch something and going dizzy, the realization that it was well past the lunch hour and she hadn't eaten anything since breakfast, writing so intensely that when she'd go back and write over it, she'd groan because her nose had smudged half of the ink from where she'd pressed against the parchment, drinking more pain relief potion and water because her muscles would be stiff from hours at her desk. Mafo was there to pull her right back. A steady hand at her back as her vision would black out if she walked across her office too quickly, shortly followed by a grinder. I'm heading to the cafeteria. Do you want a sandwich or soup? A playful tuck of a plate as she walked behind her when she slouched too far down. Steady on, Granger. I know mothers think which is a humpbacked hag. You don't want to prove them right. Wordlessly holding on a tissue when her frustration reached boiling point and she'd cry silently behind her hand. Yes, it's not like dating Mafra would be terrible. His gracious, gentlemanly actions aside, he was also annoyingly good-looking, and it certainly wasn't like she hadn't contemplated it once or twice, but as she stared at the stacks of paperwork on and surrounding her desk, complaints from centaurs about wizards encroaching on their sacred land to poach plant life for their potions, lawsuits between goblins and gringots over whom the goblin made trinkets truly belong to, testimonials from close-to-death abused house elves, it seemed Hermione would barely make a dent in the paperwork before another stack wished in, redirected from the customer service department. How could she, in, how could she in good conscience, turn her back on these creatures and spend an evening wine tasting with Malfoy at Blaise Sabini's vineyard? All the while there were thousands of magical creatures having the utmost basic rights of life beaten and pillaged from them. She couldn't, she sighed internally, and looked back down at the letter in her hands. Mafra's word from their first meeting month ago echoed in her head. Of course, I have all the time in the world to wait. Not sure the same could be said for your precious werewolves, though. That was just it, wasn't it? Mafra did have all the time in the world, but the magical animal kingdom did not. And if they didn't, then neither did Hermione. Remind me again, Granger, how teaching me to cook will help your puke? Hermione's hair bristled against the nape of her neck. It's spew. Society for the Promotion of Elfish Welfare, she snapped back hotly. She snapped back hotly, a frazzled hand coming up to wipe away the sweat that bloomed from the heat of her kitchen. Ah, yes, spew. To his credit, Malfoy had taken her rejection in his stride and graciously never brought it up again. He did, however, take Hermione up on her offer to discuss a trial run on her new house elf regime and subsequently found himself taking cooking lessons every Friday night at her flat. The first time, she'd gotten the permission to use the ministry kitchen after hours, but after he had set one of the stoves on fire, that offer had promptly been redacted. How on earth did you manage to set the stove ablaze? You were boiling potatoes! You're the professor here, Granger. Honestly, it's uncouth to settle all the blame on your pupil. The cottage pie the previous week had been a moderate success. The mashed potatoes somehow simultaneously raw yet burned. Peas still a little frozen, carrots overcooked. Knowing how to cook is a basic survival skill, Malfoy. I don't care if you have all the galleons in the world. She held up her hand to stop Malfoy from bragging that yes, he likely did have all the galleons in the world. Even you, Sacred 28 Lord, should at least know how to cook an egg. That's easy, Granger. Decide how you want your ex and promptly threaten your house elves with a pair of socks until it's been cooked to your taste. Malfoy said simply as he squinted at the next step in her recipe and muttered under his breath about her mannish handwriting. Hermione grabbed the ladle on the counter and lightly clipped it around his head. Oh, fuck, Merlin, woman, you'd think sharing a house with those Weasley twins would give you a modicum sense of humor. Malfoy scowled at her and turned his attention back to chopping up the spring onions. Admitting you found the Weasleys funny? Ha, huh, you know, I think if we listen carefully, we might hear your father have a heart attack. Hermione teased, her lips quirked into a grin when he playfully shot a glare at her. 
Hermione watched him for the next few minutes in silence, staring at the concentrated pulsing of his jaw and the way his brows knit together into a frown as he tried to size the bull peppers into even stripes. She recognized the determined glint in his eyes as he studied the recipe from potion classes over the years. That satisfied gleam to his expression when he successfully completed a step. Him treating her cooking lessons as seriously as he did his education, or her wolfsbane bill, sent a wave of appreciation through her, and her skin practically hummed with gratitude. Thank you for doing this, Malfoy, she said shyly. I, I know it's not the most exciting way to spend your Friday evening, so thank you. It means a lot to me that you're helping me with this. Malfoy took a long pause, the knife hovered over the last inch or so of the bell pepper as he swallowed. No well, said Rotherby, Malfoy said, a smile on a smile thrown over his shoulder, and Hermione swore that the quiver in her chest had more to do with the fact that the knife was dangerously close to Malfoy's fingertips. Even if you are a lousy teacher. Hermione promptly whacked the ladle against his head again, and the sulky git was still pouting as he leaned in to give her a polite kiss on the cheek goodbye when he departed through the flu a few hours later. Hey, Hermione, I don't suppose you have a date to this weekend's Beltane Festival, do you? Thomas Diggle asked her on Monday morning as he came by her office to collect some documents that needed to be returned to the ministry archives. Hermione's neck jerked upwards from the chapter she was reading, and from peripheral vision she saw Malfoy do the same. Uh, sorry? Hermione stared up at the young wizard, dumbly. How many conversations had they had in the year he'd worked in her department? Two? Maybe four at a push? Diggle rubbed the back of his neck sheepishly, but had the stance of a confident man. His shoulders pulled back, chest puffed out, a wry grin on his lips. Well, since I never got my chance with you at the duel ball. Yes, well, given the fact that he would have been a first year at that time, that would put a damper on his plans. Malfoy seemingly had the same train of thought, as she heard him clear his throat in a vain attempt at hiding his snort. Diggle's eyes snapped to Malfoy's, his boyish grin transfigured into a sneer for a brief moment before he turned back to her, his gaze expectant. The heat of both his and Malfoy's stare made her palms sweat, and Hermione suddenly wiped her palms dry on the armrest of the chair as she shifted closer to the desk. Ah, uh, right. Well, you see, um, I'm very flattered. Diggle's eyes brightened, and Hermione rushed to continue. But the fact is, I'm very busy, and I do not think that I will have any time to attend the festival, alone or otherwise. She smiled apologetically at him before pointedly dipping her chin at the documents in his hand. They need to be re archived by the end of the hour. Diggle's shoulders dropped minutely as his eyes flickered between her and Malfoy, for Malfoy had glared at him for the past few minutes. Diggle's shoulders dropped minutely as his eyes flickered between her and Malfoy, for Malfoy had glared at him for the past few minutes. No doubt, Malfoy was still in a sour mood after Hermione had refused to retract her Manticore proposal from the Wizengamot submission department, and they'd spent the whole morning arguing over it, and evidently Malfoy was content to impose his foul attitude on everyone else that passed by their office. Before he nodded, a small courteous smile on his features. I understand if you didn't make room in your schedule. His eyes started nervously to Malfoy before they settled back on her, wary but eager. Just let me know. Hermione nodded. Most of them an agreement. Her attention returned to a book, but it must have been interpreted as confirmation for Diggle as he turned to leave her office with a small, satisfied spring in his seat. Neffel's eyes followed Diggle's back, and he rose up from the chair and nonchalantly asked Hermione if she wanted anything from the cafeteria as he crossed her office. Nose halfway through the first chapter of The Manticore, murderous, meticulous, or mundane, Hermione inaudibly dismissed him with barely a wave of her hand. Oi, Diggle, don't suppose you could do me a favour? She heard Malfoy's voice trickle off as he headed further down the corridor. As Hermione settled into a story of one manticore massacring an entire Romanian village, she barely paid any attention to the fleeting thought in her mind that the cafeteria was in the opposite direction from where Malfoy was headed. By Thursday, as Hermione headed into the office, she overheard two of her co-workers lament over the news that Diggle was in St. Mungo's for exhaustion due to sudden strenuous workload. She offhandedly relayed the news to Malfoy as she settled into her desk, setting up a quill and ink pot to arrive. Oh, that's a shame, he'd replied, but the amused smirk on his face told Hermione he thought it was anything but. Granger. You heard anything special about the Spellman and Blishen exhibition down at the Wave this weekend? 
Hermione spun in her chair so quickly she knocked over her coffee mug. The hot beverage slowly spreading over witness testimony she'd spent all weekend transcribing. Before Hermione had even finished letting out a string of curses, Malfoy cleared up the mess with a lazy flick of his wand and looked up at her expectantly. It's only the most highly anticipated ancient rune exhibition in the last century, she gasped. There was not enough oxygen in the room to push out her words fast enough. There's supposed to be ancient texts from over a thousand years ago, including annotation of Merlin himself. What? Why do you? What? Hermione choked on a wheeze as her lungs suddenly contracted when, with a rather dramatic flourish, Martha pulled up two tickets from his desktop. His eyes scanned over them half-heartedly, and Hermione was sure she was turning purple at his aloof attitude at the relics in his hand. Maybe she told him those tickets were the equivalent to him holding the golden snitch in a match against the Gryffindors. He wouldn't be so... Was he bending them? She shot up from her desk in horror and stormed over, reaching out to snatch them from his ungrateful fingers. Quick as a whip, Malfoy leaned out of her reach and rested against his chair, his hands coming up to fold behind his head. His expression was positively lecherous. So, a big deal then, huh? Why do you have those tickets? How do you have those tickets? Malfoy's lip twitched, quite visibly holding back his laughter. Sent to me in the mail this week. Courage of the Maeve, it's an old family friend. Family friend or bribery list, Pontiac, Hermione scorned inwardly. The fact that she had spent weeks searching for spare tickets had near fallen to four different nocturne scams. In her desperation for one meager ticket, Mava was just swanning about, getting not one but two tickets sent to him free of charge by the museum. Hermione said wobbled at the injustice of it all. You want to come with me? There was definitely not enough oxygen in her office. What? She rasped. Malfa brought his elbow back to his desk, this time looking at the ticket more contemplatively. I do have a spare ticket after all. Now, I do love a good exhibition as much as the next wizard, but even I couldn't hold my attention to a gallery of a bunch of old stick drawings for an entire evening all by myself. Did I mention it was a private tour? Malfa cooked a brow and Hermione's ears buzzed. A private tour, a private tour, a private tour. The yes was halfway out of her mouth when she stopped, suddenly very aware of the towers of case files surrounding her desk in a moat of white paper and red tape. She gloomingly looked between the transcriptions on her desk that needed memorizing by next week in Malfoy's hands. She noticed absentmindedly he really did have lovely hands. I, I can't. The words left her mouth like acid. I don't have time. Hermione's eyes burned with frustrated tears. She'd spend a month as a deformed cat, six months petrified by an overgrown snake and tortured by the most insane witch in modern wizarding history. But this, this was truly painful. Mavis' next words promptly made Hermione's knees collapse under her. Did I forget to mention the tour guide studied manticores in Belarus? They barely entered the cloakroom when Hermione pounced on him. Most amazing, a kiss to his neck, experience of a life you don't even know. A kiss to his jawline, Merlin himself, she nipped at his bottom lip, can't believe we got to touch it. She pressed her lips against his desperately, her fingers reeling from her mouth endlessly each time they separated to catch their breath. The hog Philip convinced the magical not to. She pumped at his trousers, her skin hot as she licked up Malfoy's neck. It was vibrating against her tongue. I need to write this all to... The room spun as Malfoy twisted the two of them against the wall, Hermione gasping as her exposed shoulders pressed against the cold stone. Later, he growled, his lips bruising hers as he flattened himself against her, hips meeting hers in slow but firm motions. Oh, think I could get him to visit the office next week? Hermione breathed against his mouth. Granger. Malfoy's expression pinched and his voice strained. His hold on her slackening. Hermione took the opportunity to slide onto her knees in front of him, hands reaching up to fumble with his slacks. Malfoy, cursed from somewhere above her, sends jolting out to the side, barely managing to pull the cloakroom curtain across as she took him in her mouth. It was only after Malfoy put up with a kiss to her neck, and the pair headed to the exit where their tour guide Philip was waiting for them so he could lock up. His face positively beat rude as he avoided all eye contact, but the thought occurred to Hermione that they really should have cast a silencing charm. Evidently, Mafa was more committed to the house elf regime than Hermione realized. 
Whatever you learned on the Friday at her flat, come Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, there'd be a Tupperware box on her desk waiting for her when she arrived to her office in the morning. And when she peeked inside, she would seem there for a solo attempt at a recipe. The rate in which she improved each time was annoyingly spectacular. He always was a competitive bastard. You just don't like it when I'm better than you at something. Martha said one lunch when she'd said as much, eating away through a positively divine tikka masala. He had braised the chicken before making the curry. Hermione snorted, only minutely blushing when a few grains of rice flew out of her mouth and landed on one of her memos. At least Malfoy had the manners to disguise his love as a coughing fit. You've never been better than me at anything. Hermione threw back a petty attempt at regaining her footing in the conversation. Pretty sure I could beat you at swallowing my food. Malfoy quipped, his smirk widened at her glare. I beat you in potions too. Weren't you the one who told me that cooking was like potions? Hermione miffed and stepped aggressively at a chunk of chicken. You might want to try beating me at humility too. Just eat the damn food, Granger, Malfoy said. It's the private smile he gave her when she did as she was told. It's the private smiles he gave her when she did as she was told. Her stomach, a kaleidoscope of butterflies, when he later looks down at her empty container in a smug contentment. A satisfied smile on her face at eating anything other than the dreadful ministry cafeteria grub. When Hermione thinks in moments such as this that Malfoy would make a pretty decent boyfriend for someone who had the time, of which Hermione certifiably did not. They were walking down Diagon Alley on their way to visit an apothecary that traded in the use of Manticore Venom when it happened. The theater is gone! The glob of spit clung to Malfoy's cheek and he blinked in shock. Hermione wheeled around, her wand cracking like a whip in the air as she jabbed it under the stranger's chin. Her voice calm and quiet. What do you think you're doing? Whose lot ain't welcome round here? The wizard sneered and Hermione's nose wrinkled at the stench of butterbeer that seemingly seeped from his every pore. Just doing me part for society and keeping these streets clean. By his lot you mean ministry official? Hermione replied coolly, her wand twisting in the straggling strands of his beard. Are you aware that spitting at a government employee counts as grievous assault and as punishable by up to a year in Azkaban? The wizard's eye widened in fear minutely before they hardened again, looking over her shoulder at her still-frozen colleague. You ain't never gone call me off to that place. Me baggering wizard and a judge gone punish me for doing what they wish they could do. You mean the wizard and mother tried him and cleared him of all charges? For crimes committed under duress and for being under age? Hermione's voice began to shake in anger, and she felt Malfoy step closer behind her, his hand pressing against her spine in an attempt to calm her down. Come on, Granger, just drop it, he murmured in her ear, his palms burned against her lower back. Do you even remember that he's the reason Harry Potter was able to defeat Voldemort? The wizard flinched and he scoffed. See? He survived living with that man for years, and you can't even handle hearing his name. The tip of Draco Malfoy's fingernail is more worthy of the name of wizard than you have in your entire being. Try to remember that next time you decide to bathe in a butterbeer barrel. With that, she used her wand to push his chin back with a jerk, and he stumbled back, playing between the two of them. The men hawked up another spit at their feet and stalked off not daring to look back as Hermione's once they trained on him until he disappeared out of sight. Hermione exhaled shakily, Draco's breath a matching tempo against her neck, and she turned to face him. The spit had vanished without a trace, but the resigned look on his face told Hermione that maybe it wasn't the first time that had happened. She chewed on her lip nervously. Are you okay, Draco? Draco stared at her, his magnificent grey eyes bright and shiny as he exhaled with a jokey nod. Peachy? He replied, looking down at her in wonder. Hermione couldn't help but compare the look on his face to when she'd first stepped foot in the Hogwarts library in first year. Sheer awe and bliss. Her heart clenched at the thought that maybe this was the first time someone other than his friends and family had defended him. Her tongue darted out to wet her lip nervously, her stomach quivering when he followed the movement, his lips heavy and dark. He reached down and grabbed his hand. Come on, we're late. Draco asked her out again during another late night at the office, at the end of August, once she'd fully recuperated from her slight altercation with the Manticore in the Scottish Highlands and had finally been given permission by the healer to end her bed rest. 
Virgo had been with her at the time, and she hadn't seemed all too pleased at the idea. His lips tired and thin as he glared reproachfully as Hermione eagerly sprang from her bed. No doubt he was just annoyed he could no longer boss her around for a week. Surely your near death experience. He barely graced me. Would be enough to convince you that life is too short. You need to live a little. He crooned circularly, bending over his desk, his nose nudged against hers. What say you, Granger? Should I tell Vivaldi's to reserve a private booth for two this weekend? I promise to be a gentleman and wait until the third course before I completely ravage you under the table. Hermione snorted, ignoring the heavy flush spreading across her chest as she looked down at the paperwork on her desk. You and I have different definitions on what it means to be a gentleman, Draco. Besides, I only have two weeks to get this manticore bill in front of the Wizengamot, and no doubt they're going to use the Scotland incident against me. As they should, Draco muttered. Hermione ignored him. So I need this case to be as airtight as possible. I can't have any distractions, and I certainly can't waste an evening fretting over which fork I use for my capri salad. You work your way from the outside in. Draco smirked at the exacerbated look Hermione threw him, but held his hands up in surrender as he walked back to his desk, the subject dropped. Just as they departed to their respective flues, close to midnight, when Draco had finally had enough and practically had to carry Hermione over his shoulders to leave the office, your manticores will still need saving tomorrow, Granger. You might as well try and save them after a good night's sleep. He asked her if they were still on for their usual dinners at her flat that Friday. Hermione frowned and asked him why wouldn't they be. Draco stared at her, his eyes searching hers for a moment before his expression settled into a usual smirk. No reason, he said, causing the distance between them and giving her a quick kiss on the lips before he stepped into the flue and called out for his manor. Hermione watched the flames disappear, trying in vain to distract herself from the way her lips tingled. Draco surprised her at lunch with two tickets to an exclusive book reading that evening for Hogwarts, a history, first edition. Lucky coincidence aside, it was one of the best birthdays Hermione had had in years. Hermione woke up with a jolt, her wand already in her hand as she whipped around from the origin of the strangled scream that has roused her from her sleep. Her eyes landed on Crookshanks, just in time to see him leap off Draco's face and sit on his heels in between the two of them. Her furry friend's tail swayed in contentment as he, if cats could, smirked over at her bad companion. She looked over at Draco, who was clutching his chest, his eyes red and watery as he pointed an accusing finger towards a pet. That animal sacrifice in waiting just tried to kill me in my sleep, he rasped out. This is the third time that's happened this month, Granger. Maybe he just finds your head extra comfy. I can imagine there's a lot of thoughts going on up in there, so it must be really lovely and squishy. Hermione teased, cooing at her pet as he purred under a stroking motion. Draco shot them both a glare full of utter loathing. Granger, I've been telling you, you need to ward this bloody bedroom at night. That Belzebub is out to get me. Draco hissed as he leapt from her bed, muttering angry promises about reuniting Crookshanks with his ancestors in Egypt, and Hermione's thighs clenched together as she watched his glorious naked bum storm into her ensuite. She noticed Crookshanks was also watching him leave, and she couldn't help but think that maybe Draco was onto something. Her cat did look at Draco the same way he had last winter when that mouse had invaded her flat. Go easy on him. Hermione won Crookshanks and lifted a brow when he looked up at her blankly. He's the first decent co-worker I've had in years. She ruffled the top of his hat, smiling when Crookshanks whined in protest, his paws shooting up to bat her away and turned to follow Draco into the bathroom. Draco was still glaring at Crookshanks at breakfast 45 minutes later, but his anger had somewhat appeased by the I'm sorry my cat tried to kill you blowjob Hermione had given him in the shower. Hermione felt the urge to remind Draco for the dozens time that he had offered to help her set up her Christmas decorations in her flat. Do we really need to do this by hand, Granger? Draco complained somewhere behind the curtains of tinsel, cursing as he tripped over a stray bauble. Hermione would never tell him she saw Crookshanks nudge it towards his feet when Draco's back was turned. It takes away the authenticity by using magic, Draco. Hermione calmly replied, her brain focused on whether she wanted to use the North Star or the Angel Tree Chopper this year. Which one had she used last year? Draco grumbled behind the tree as he weaved the silver tinsel. His compromise on doing everything by hand was if she transfigured the decorations to the official Slytherin colors. 
what's the point? Brightest witch of the age, certainly taking up a lot of time for someone claiming to. Draco rounded the front, his arm stretched up to tuck the end of the tinsel thread under the top branches of the tree. His cheeks red and splotchy from the exertional effort of reaching up a couple of inches. A couple of hours later, Draco lifted Hermione up by her hips so she couldn't nestle the angel in its place. She'd finally remembered she'd used the North Star last Christmas, kissing the back of her head as he gently placed her back on her feet. Next year, we're using magic, Granger. Draco bowed as he pulled away from her. The mess of spare baubles, strands of chinsels, and spare string vanishing with a flick of his wand. Hermione agreed, but only on the promise that Draco wore a red and golden jumper. Draco kissed down her neck in apology as he pulled out of her. Urgent family business the next day meant that he couldn't spend the night. An international port key activating before sunrise at his manor the next morning that he couldn't afford to miss. He murmured his goodbyes against her lips once he was fully dressed, his nose nudging against hers once, and Hermione swore she was imagining this wistful gleam in his eyes as he left for the flu in her living room, telling her not to see him out, that her flat was rather nippy in the winter and she was better off staying put in her warm bed. She didn't think much of it as she heard the roar of the fireplace and turned on her side to fall asleep. Hours of tossing and turning later, her frustrations rising at her inability to drop off, Hermione shuffled closer to the other side of the bed. She finally felt a blanket of sleep closing over her, face smushed into the spare pillow with the scent of apples and cedar wood surrounding her. What were you thinking, flying in this weather? Hermione scolded for the fourth time that hour as they sat in the bustling waiting room of St. Mango's. I was thinking, if I turned down Petter and Weaselby's invitation to play Quidditch due to a little rain, I'd never hear the end of it, Draco calmly replied as if there wasn't a gaping wound at his temples. A little ra- There was official weather warning issued. The thousand-year-old oak tree at the back of the burrow's garden was blown down. Are you telling me you thought you could outright gale force winds? Hermione scorned and made a mental note to send Harry a howler when she got home. Her childhood friend beat one evil wizard and suddenly he thinks he's invincible to the elements. Honestly, what was so special about Quidditch that has forced all logic and reason out of the boy's heads? She inwardly snickered at the possibility that there was a Freudian explanation for their obsession with flying balls. Draco winced at her tone and gestured to his forehead. Watch the volume, dear. He shot her a lascivious smirk. Whilst I do enjoy hearing you scream, let's keep it in the bedroom, shall we? Hermione only had enough time to shoot him a filthy glare as a healer called his name, gesturing for them to follow her over to a spare cot. Draco stumbled as he rose up from the rickety chair, his face whitening out, and Hermione's arms shot out to wrap around his waist to steady him. Her anger briefly forgotten, her anger briefly forgotten, her eyes flashed up to his in concern. Are you okay? Her hand pressed against his cheek, and Draco's eyes fluttered close as he nuzzled into her palm. Mr. Malfoy, do you need assistance? The healer approached them, Hila Shelley, her name tag claimed, and Hermione's stomach swooped as she looked at her. She was pretty, very pretty. Draco must have thought so too, because when he eventually peeled his cheek away from Hermione's touch and turned to acknowledge her, his smile was positively euphoric. I might be in need of some medical attention. Do you know where I might get that? Hila Shelley's laugh was annoying, Hermione decided. Draco wasn't that funny, and yet it seemed in between every stitch Hila Shelley twinkled out a giggle at whatever quip Draco said in his mild injury-induced delirium. She'd known he was delirious when he spent six minutes waxing poetry about the poodle coat Granger calls her hair, and how he could see his family constellations in her freckles, all to the delight of the peanut allergy attending to his wound. Miss Granger, I understand your concern for Mr. Alpha here, but you're blocking the light again. Hila Shelley politely but firmly chided as she gestured for Hermione to step away from the cot. It had also seemed with every stitch Hermione found herself leaning closer and closer to Draco's side. Hermione grit her teeth in irritation. It's not like she had any malintentions. Someone in the corner of this hospital room had to be the professional one, and she needed to make sure that Draco's wound was healed and taken care of properly. She certainly wasn't going to be up half the night listening to his sulky whines as she replaced his bandages. Draco practically peacocked under the attention of the healer, any time Hila Shelley responded back to one of his comments with her own thinly veiled innuendo or oh so witty remark, Hermione believed Ron would call the exchange a bit of banter. Hermione had to bite her tongue to hold back an eye roll. 
and she knew Draco could tell because the gleam in his eyes grew heavier and his smirk widened. The kid had crashed into a tree, received a minor concussion, and he chose that moment to school his next date? The end of his start tethered when he lost Shelley rested her hand on his thigh as she leaned up to cast a silent charm on his stitches, and Draco stage whispered, My, my, shouldn't you buy me dinner first? Hermione couldn't swallow her scoff in time and turned her back on them before Draco's head could turn towards her, and she'd be forced to suffer through another one of his sanctimonious smirks. She didn't quite storm off, but Hermione was very aware of the resounding slaps her shoes made against the linoleum floor. Hila Shelley's light giggle faded behind her as she aimed back to the chair in the seating area. Miss Granger, someone called out to her left. Hermione smiled politely at the receptionist as she approached the desk. Is there anything wrong with Draco's paperwork? No, not at all. But given his concussion diagnosis, he's not of legal mind to send himself out. As his emergency contact, we need you to do it. As Hermione reached out for the clipboard, her signature scribbled so harshly it lightly tore at the document. She briefly basked in the fantasy of leaving him in the Janus Thicky ward overnight. It would serve him right for flying in a storm. Hila Shelley's laugh sounded out across the room, and the receptionist jumped in shock as the quill snapped in Hermione's fingers. Chapter 4 Laura Medley was a competent enough assistant. She sorted through Hermione's mails, tossing out howlers and cursed envelopes before they could reach Hermione's desk knew what cases had to be on Hermione's desk in order of importance, records from the archives were extracted and returned in schedule. Medley even took the liberty of bringing Hermione a morning coffee when she arrived to start her shift in the morning, her assistant sipping on her own concoction of sugar, cream and syrup that had Hermione wincing on behalf of her dentist's parents. Medley knew not to take it personally when Hermione got snappy if pages were missing from an old archived case study and would even work well past end of office hours to track down the information Hermione needed for a proposal with nary a complaint. So yes, all things considered, Medley was a very competent assistant, except for one flaw. Medley loved gossip. Hermione sat at her desk. Eyes boring into the investigation report from Jorkin's cockatrice farm in an attempt to draw out her assistant's high-pitched nettering over two male employees who had been caught in the same loo cubicle as she sat on the floor sifting through previous transcription of Visingamot hearings. Madley's gifted ability to do multiple tasks at once without any mistakes was the only reason Hermione hadn't sent her off to the archives. Definitely not a muggle artifact, you know Daphne, right? She didn't. Well, she's absolutely devastated. Apparently, her and William had a moment at the Valentine's Gala, and she was all gearing up to ask him to Belte next month. Ooh, didn't Thomas ask you out last year? I wonder if he tried again. Oh, but then again, Mr. Muff, wait, what was I saying? Oh, yes, anyway, Daphne, poor girl. She spent over 50 gallons of weight loss patients. Something about William liking... The Hogwarts school song went through Hermione's head as her hand twitched and arched to cast a quick silencio in Madeline's direction. The last three days had Hermione feeling like she was back in the Gryffindor dormitories, listening to Lavender and Pavati babble on well into the night over which of their classmates had gotten fat over the holidays and, ooh, did Pavati think Seamus was keen on Lavender? So now Daphne has like this big complex and she's crying in the loose at lunch, thinking she might have turned him and like, what if she turned all of her exes? And I'm not being funny or nothing, don't get me wrong, but have you seen the way William dresses? If that wasn't a big enough hint. Draco couldn't come home soon enough. He'd left a few days prior. A billywick smuggled in from Brisbane has escaped his owner and was causing all sorts of mischief down in the small town of Somerset. Draco had been summoned to help the Auras handle the muggles, of whom were baffled and panicked at why a third of its residents were all levitating in the shops, streets and homes. Hermione read in the prophet that the muggles had suspected chemical warfare from Russia and she couldn't help but snort at the image of Russian muggle government viewing the residents of Bathpool as a threat. But Draco leaving for the other side of the country evidently didn't put a stop to his meddling. The same day Draco had left, whilst Hermione was poring over her notes on the inhumane methods poachers used to obtain cockatrice eyeballs, a popping sound went through her office. She looked up, startled to the side of a familiar lunchbox. Foggy and steamy, evidently recently heated up, perched on the end of her desk. There had been a letter to the lid that made Hermione both flush and scowl at its content. Dearest Granger, try not to die of malnourishment in my absence and eat some actual food. 
I've counted them, and those bloody biscuits of yours best still have eight left when I get back. And no, before any house come my way, my house elves did not cook this. It's been preserved with a stasis charm. My elves will have, if they follow my instructions properly, for I have many a spare sock lying around, reheated the food since I don't own a mic or wave. If you can find in your bleeding Gryffindor heart to forgive my trespasses, I would greatly appreciate it. I do look forward to recounting those biscuits of yours upon my return, Granger. DM. P.S. Stop slouching. Hermione had debated not eating the food out of spite when she found herself straightening her posture after reading the footnote of his letter. But then her stomach had rumbled quite painfully, and so Hermione reached out for the Tupperware with only a slight pout on her lips. She supposed she could always finish off her biscuits over the next few days, buy another packet and simply take out two of them. The punsy pret would be never the wiser. I've been delivered yet, Miss Granger? Hermione's head snapped forwards, meeting the questioning eyes of her assistant. A faint blush bloomed across her neck as she smiled apologetically at her. I'm sorry, Laura, I was a million miles away. What did she say? Should I check with Matilda on the front desk to see if the basilisk legislation has been delivered yet? Madly repeated. Oh yes, please, Hermione said and nodded towards her office door, her eyes catching the time on the clock. You might as well take a lunch back now as well, before all that's left to the cafeteria is the egg sandwich. Hermione sighed in exacerbation when, half an hour later, a Tupperware container appeared on her desk. Honestly, she grumbled as she forked out a few overcooked chunks of pork. His mothering could give Molly Weasley a run for her money. The image of Draco sitting with Molly and knitting Christmas jumpers made her choke on a potato, and she just imagined to control her coughing when Medley returned through the door, the basilisk files in her hand. Hermione had out her hand for the file and almost missed the way Medley's eyes flickered between her and the container, a small knowing smile on her assistant's lips as she handed the documents over. Do you know when Mr. Malfoy will be returning? Medley's voice was innocent enough, but Hermione recognised the vulturous glint in her eyes that had often resided in Rita Skeeter, and Hermione couldn't help but think that Medley's talents were wasted in the ministry. She'd thrive on a daily profit, getting paid to gossip for a living. He'll return when his job is completed, Hermione said coolly and raised a brow at her assistant. Have you finished with the court transcripts? I just have one more to go through, Medley said as she returned to sit in a lotus position on the office floor. Hermione managed to get through three pages of the basilisk legislation in blissful silence before Medley decided Hermione must simply have the updates on the Daphne William debacle. Hermione glanced mournfully at the empty desk next to hers, her chest clenching wistfully as she pictured a tall blonde poncy wizard sitting there. No doubt he'd give her assistance the same look of disdain Hermione internally wore and Hermione had to chew on the inside of her cheek to hold back the heavy sigh that burned in her throat. The look on her face when he walked in with Frank, it was priceless. Like, I'm not being stereotypical or anything. My cousin Tan is gay, so I'm not being funny for saying this, but the man wore more pink than umbrage. Like, how did she not put the pieces? Merlin. How she missed the peaceful silence the pair would bask in as they worked their way through Draco's to-do task list. How long did it take to catch one Billy Wick anyway? Her biscuit drawer remained unopened for the rest of the week. Only because Hermione was too preoccupied with her work to justify a biscuit break, of course. The moon gleamed through the gap in her curtains. Its silver rays painted across her walls and ceiling as Hermione shifted in her bed for what felt like the hundredth time that night. Her eyes fell on the clock on her nightstand, the red LED numbers telling her it had just gone past four in the morning, and she let out a resigned huff as she sat up in bed. It seemed she would not be getting any sleep that night either. Perhaps she needed a new mattress. Jack had certainly complained for the dexterity of his spine more than a dozen times. I might as well be sleeping on a bed of rocks, he grumbled into the back of her neck. I'm sure the two dozen goose pillows down in your manor are getting lonely, Hermione said sleepily, interlocking their fingers as his hand came around her waist to envelop hers. Feel free to pay them a visit. Draco just hummed, his knee pushing between her thighs as he settled behind her. I'll be sure to do that tomorrow. The next night, as Hermione was still catching her breath against his chest from her orgasm, he told Hermione to watch out for the bill from his chiropractor. Hermione sighed again as she slipped out of bed, cursing as she tripped over Draco's Quidditch jersey. Honestly, how hard was it for him to keep it hung up in the wardrobe? The stress of the quickly approaching hearing must have been why Hermione couldn't sleep, she thought as she made her way down the corridor to make herself a much-needed cup of tea. Crookshanks was sleeping peacefully on the green ottoman in her living room, his face nuzzled into what Hermione was sure was Draco's favourite pair of socks as she passed her old familiar by. A soft sleepy purse hung in the air behind Hermione as she entered the kitchen. 
At least one of us is getting a good night's sleep, Hermione inwardly grumped. Her freshly brewed tea sat next to her as she summoned an old cockatrice assault court case file from her bag. Hermione figured she might as well be productive, rather than mope about all night in her too cold, too empty bag. The calendar on her desk indicated it was two days until the Wisingamot hearing, which meant that it had been four days since Hermione had managed anything more than an hour or so of sleep. She was admittedly getting a little snappy. Medley hadn't been in her office since the first hour of her shift that morning, and no doubt the little gossip had spread word of Hermione's mood, since she hadn't heard height nor hair from any of her colleagues all morning, not even a passing conversation in the corridor. All but one person, a fresh-faced, mousy hat which Hermione couldn't recall seeing around the office before, would innocently enough knock on her door about an hour prior and ask if Hermione had wanted a cup of tea. In hindsight, Hermione had overreacted a tad, her sparking as she'd snapped that if she wanted a beverage, she would have asked for one, and if that concept was too difficult for the witch to understand, then perhaps she might want to enroll into the ministry nursery. At least that way, she'd be with peers of similar comprehensive level. Maybe she'd overreacted more than a tad. With a sigh, Hermione reached out and jotted down a quick memo to send the witch. She'd really need to find out her name, an apology fruit basket once her hearing was over. Just another item on her endless list of tasks to complete, Hermione inwardly grimed. Slamming the memo against the desktop with a little more force than necessary, her heart sparking in multiple directions, Hermione turned her attention back to her speech she'd spent all morning preparing for when she faced the Wizengamot in a few days. She scowled as she noticed a glaring error in one of her preceding case references. 1946, not 64. Hermione, you blithering idiot! She huffed, her arms pressing together as she slammed her head against them in misery. You know, talking to yourself is the first sign of madness. Hermione stiffened at a familiar draw. Great, on top of borderline chronic stress and sleep deprivation, now she was hallucinating. My, my, my. I'd heard on my way over here that you'd been a little testy today. Don't I even get a hello? How long did hallucinations last? Hermione frowned and slowly lifted her head up to peer over her arms. Her heart positively jumped to her throat. Draco leaned against the threshold of her office, and Ivar quirked up in amusement as his fingers wriggled in a wave. I hear absence make the heart grow thunder. He pointed to her hair and smirked, of which was roughly three times its usual size. Your mane must have missed me a lot. Hermione rolled her eyes at his wry grin and concluded that he was truly standing in her office. Not even her hallucinations could be that insufferable. Her irritation rebounded, drowning out the way her heart pounded against her chest. Found your billy wit, you did. Took you long enough. Draco smiled at her, and perhaps Hermione was hallucinating because his smile could have only been described as soft, intimate, like she wasn't supposed to see it. Hermione dropped her eyes away from him and belatedly regretted turning down the intern's office to make her a cup of tea. She was suddenly parched. A little owl told me you made Matilda cry yesterday. Hermione grabbed her quill, her teeth gritted as she fixed the mistake here in her speech. Good, she was being stupid, Hermione said, huffing as she spotted another factual error. She felt like she was back in the common room, marking one of Harry and Ron's old history of magic essays. They could click his tongue as he peeled himself off of the doorframe and crossed her office. I must say, it's been a while since I've seen this little vindictive side of you, Granger. His palms came down to rest against the edge of her desk as he leaned down conspiratorially towards her. Hermione's eyelids unwittingly flickered close for a brief moment. Apples and cedar wood overwhelming her senses. Should I warn Matilda to stock up on Madame Pimpernel's pimple potions? Only a fool would do the same trick twice. Hermione said lightly and lifted her speech up at eye level, effectively shielding her away from Draco's mischievous gaze. I don't know about that, Granger, Draco hummed, and Hermione swore he almost sounded like he was laughing. I've often found that consistency is the most effective method in getting what you want. Hermione hummed back. How is Somerset? Long. Draco said simply, and he stood up to move around the desk. Hermione's back was positively white-hot with heat as he approached from behind her, one hand coming forward to press against the edge of the desk and the other against the armchair. Her head heavy and drowsy as he leaned in to read her speech over her shoulder, his lips accidentally brushing against her ear as he did so. Merlin, did she need to sleep? Draco tittered as he read over the page, no doubt laughing at effectual errors and Hermione's heart shredded against her ribcage as her hand gently tilted her head to the left and soft warm lips pressed delicate kisses, once, twice, a third time, against her neck. The parchment creased under Hermione's fingers as she fought the urge to sink back into the chair and pull Draco closer. 
I can feel how stressed you are, Granger, Draco murmured against her skin. Yes, she was. She was so stressed. Maybe if his lips went a little lower. Given how many grammatical errors you've made in this statement. What, did you have Diggle write this for you? Hermione bristled and her mouth shut open to defend herself when Draco's lips encased her earlobe and sucked on it lightly. One of her hands leapt up to push down on Draco's jaw and she breathed out a shaky moan as he released her ear and kissed back down her neck, stopping to suck on her pulse. Stressing about the outcome in a couple of days, Draco's nose nudged her skin and Hermione felt his lips curve into a smirk. Shall I contact one of Father's old ministry lackeys to send a cursed heirloom to one of the Wisingamot chambers? Hermione knew he was joking, but a quiet voice in his sleep-deprived mind had her seriously considering it for a moment. Worried about my mental state, Draco? Be careful, I might actually think you care about me, she said instead. Draco's lips paused against her, and a panicked wave of regret flooded Hermione's system. She opened her mouth to claim it as a joke when Draco's teeth nipped at her collarbone. I just hate to see the Ministry lose one of its few competent employees, Draco said eventually, his voice somewhat hoarse. His throat cleared. <clears throat> Merlin! Forbid you end up in a loony bin, Granger. I'd hate to have to be settled with Diggle on all of these liaison cases. Hermione snorted. The poor man doesn't come within a hundred foot of this office, if you're in it. Draco, honestly. She turned to look at him suspiciously. What did you say to him to make him so afraid of you? Draco's eyes practically twinkled. What did you say to Matilda to make her cry? He countered, effectively avoiding the question. Hermione scowled at him, a shameful blush creeping up her neck as she turned away to sulkily thump at the leather top of her desk. Draco chuckled at the blush spread to her cheeks as he kissed the back of her head. Evidently, I strike the fear of Merlin into Diggle, and you make your subordinates cry. Draco's hands tucked on her shirt to slightly expose her shoulders, and he bent down to kiss around it, his lips curving into a smile. What a pair we make. Hermione let out a laugh before she could think better of it. Draco pressed a final kiss against the nape of her neck before pulling away. Did you eat? he asked, a hand reaching down to grasp at the top drawer of her desk. His note from a few days ago ran through her mind and Hermione huffed. Damn his velvety lips for making her forget what pret he could be. Are you sure you caught the billywig? Hermione attempted to bet his hands away from the drawer knob. Draco simply grinned at her, his grip tightening. You know, maybe you should go back and check if you've managed to obliviate all of the muggles. She gave up trying to peel him away from her biscuit drawer and turned to lean over her speech again. I can only imagine nightmares they must be dealing with. Your pale pointy face is quite horror-inducing. Draco just snorted, his hand coming away from the drawer to tuck playfully at her hair. Like Pavlov's dog, Hermione straightened her back instantly. I missed you too, Granger. He simply sat and bent down to grab the speech from Hermione's hands, her grip loose as her brain faltered at his words. The blood roared in her ears as she swallowed dryly in an attempt to drown the shaky gasp that hammered from her chest. Hermione was vaguely aware she was gaping up at him dumbly as he read her speech again. His brows furrowed and his lips pursed, his eyes scanning across the parchment. I spotted Potter and Weasley heading towards the cafeteria, he nodded towards her office door. They should still be there, you should go join them. I, you, what? Hermione blinked at him. I missed you too, Granger. Her mind still reeling, her money gave no resistance as Draco pulled up from a desk chair, a strong hand to her back as she was pushed gently towards the door. Go and have lunch with your friends, Granger. Even swats like you need to socialize on occasion. Draco, I can't afford to go have a lunch break. I don't have time. Yes, I know. Draco rolled his eyes, the impact softened by the teasing grin on his lips. Like it was some kind of inside joke. Her money frowned, not understanding what she was missing out on. I also know the ins and outs of this proposal, Granger. I can take over for an hour. You need a fresh pair of eyes on the speech. He waved her off, turning on his heel to head to his desk. A small sigh of relief ran through Hermione as she watched him sit back at his desk. She hadn't realized just how much she'd missed seeing him sat there. She quickly tossed that thought to the back of her mind, scowling inwardly at her ridiculousness. What kind of person missed seeing their colleague sit at a desk, load up on brain fuel, pretend to give a damn when the wanted twins talk about Quidditch, and then come back and we can work on this together? Draco looked up, his eyes narrowing as Hermione dragged her heels against the carpet. Of course, he carried on, slowly. If you're not up for Quidditch talk, I can always out Pensy instead. I heard she's looking to discuss flower arrangements. Hermione darted out of the office before he could finish his sentence. November 2005 You just seem happier, like, I don't know, like the weight of the world has been lifted off of your shoulders, Harry said as the pair of them watched George and Ron argue over which fireworks to set up next. I thought that was my line, Hermione teased. 
Harry elbowed her gently as he rubbed absentmindedly at his scar, an old habit from his teen years he'd not yet shaken off. James' delighted scream rang out from the safety of the patio, his chubby hands clapping together in glee as George set off a firework that exploded into a glittering red and gold lion. James echoed the lion's roar whilst trying to squirm out of Ginny's protective hold, most likely to run after his temporary pyrotechnic friend. Hermione couldn't help but notice how Ginny had avoided the butterbeer run had brought over all evening, and she glanced slyly at her best friend. She'd give it until the end of the week before Harry probably spilled the beans. I'm serious, Hermione. Harry looked at her, his vibrant green eyes still visible through the lenses, cloud and foggy from the ash of the bonfire and firework. I can't remember the last time I saw you this happy. I know your job means a lot to you. He held up his hand to stop her from interrupting. As it should. But you were no good to your department if you burn out. It's nice to see you like this again. The two of them snickered as George and Ron tussled to the ground, fighting over who got to set off the last firework. So how come you didn't bring Malfoy? Hermione's eyes snapped to him, her eyebrows knitted together in confusion. Why would I bring Malfoy? I thought Ginny's invitation said for loved ones only. Of all people to ask her why she didn't invite their childhood nemesis, it was Harry. Sure, Draco had attended a few dinners at the Potters when she'd been forcibly invited by Ginny. But that was only so they could continue on their work and not lose their stride in whatever idea they'd been brainstorming all afternoon in her office. And sure, Draco and Harry had been perfectly cordial with one another. Heck, on one occasion they'd spent the whole evening cracking jokes between themselves about the ink stains on Hermione's face. But Hermione didn't think that that necessarily constituted Malfoy as a loved one. Harry opened his mouth to reply and then paused. His eyes searched her face. Hermione shifted uncomfortably. She had the feeling she was being hit with his awe interrogation face. Whatever he was thinking, Hermione couldn't tell before his face slipped into a neutral expression. Right, he said slowly. My mistake. Harry continued to send her curious looks when he thought she was distracted by the sparklers Ron brought over, and Hermione felt a lick of self-consciousness creep up her spine every time she caught him staring. She probably just had bonfire ash on her face, Hermione determined, and wiping away at her cheek. Can't believe I'm feeling grateful towards Malfoy, Ron groaned for the third time since the three of them sat down for lunch. He stepped a sausage with his fork and pointed it at Hermione accusingly. If he comes to me expecting to return the favour, you can deal with it. Hermione rolled her eyes. I don't spend lunch at my desk that often. Harry and Ron dead spent simultaneously. You two need new work partners, Hermione's finger wriggled between the pair. I've heard the rumours. She snickered as the pair blushed, surreptitiously moving away from each other. We're not the only one with rumours about our co-workers. Harry said slightly miffed as he poked at his peas on his plate. Honestly, if he didn't like them, why order them in the first place? His words processed through her mind a beat later and she looked at him questioningly. What do you mean? Harry yelped, a small leap from his seat as he reached down to rub his leg, shooting a filthy glare at one. She could only assume Ron was the culprit. Don't listen to him, eh? Ron said, twirling his fork around his temple. Anyone debating naming their child Severus is not of sound mind. Hermione chortled as the tips of Harry's ear flushed pink. He tried to set for another 15 minutes conversation topics fleeting until Hermione's one bust on her table. As much as she did love her job and was relieved that Draco was finally back to help her prep, sometimes she did sorely miss just hanging out with her old friends. Hermione's lip trembled and she blinked back tears furiously. Oh, I'm being so silly. She cried, hands furiously wiping at her tears, and she shrugged off the concerned looks from the other side of the table. I'm just tired. I haven't really slept this week. It must all be hitting me at once, she smiled in a watery reassurance. Really, really, I'm fine. If you say so, Miney, Ron said, a cautious smile on his face, one hand still hovering in the air towards her. Didn't you say Malfoy was going over the case, Harry added. Why don't you stay another half hour? Ron tsked, shaking his hat and mocked offence. Still can't believe Hermione's willingly let another person touch her work. Remember when she'd all but rip our arms off if we so much as looked at her transfiguration essays? That's because you were trying to cheat, not help me, Hermione muffled from behind her hands and peeked through her fingers to clear at them accusingly. You say cheat, I say inspire. Run and boyishly at her when she couldn't hold back a snort. No, no, I really need to be heading back. Drake is waiting for me. Run and Harry exchanged a look Hermione couldn't quite understand. I bet he is, Ron muttered into his coffee, making Harry cough awkwardly and brushing through his dark, messy hair. She raised an eyebrow at the two of them. 
Of course, if you really do want to help me, she said slowly. Draco did insist on a fresh pair of eyes. Oh, I, I think I heard. I said, yeah, yeah, I think Jenny's going into labor. Gotta go. Harry shot up from his chair, smiling at her apologetically as he grabbed his robes. Hermione snickered at his retreat before turning to look at Ron expectantly. Ron just quipped a brow at her. I wish I could, but I do not want to. It was approximately 19 hours until it was in the mud hearing when Hermione finished her third practice run through of her speech, and she wiped at a sweaty brow, mentally drained from all of the objections and more questions Draco had thrown at her for the last hour. Was that last question really necessary, she panted and fixed him with a silly glare. I highly doubt the court is going to ask me what type of feathers my bedding is made from. Draco simply shrugged. They moved your case up by two months, Granger, he reminded her. Trust me when I tell you they are going to pull every trick in the book to find a way to snag this from under your robes. He stood up from his desk and approached her. Hermione couldn't hold back the heavy sigh as he pulled her into his arms, a hand coming up to a massage between her tense shoulder blades. Hermione nuzzled into his shoulder, despite her mind screaming at her to keep a professional distance between them. They were in her office, after all, and anyone could just walk in and make all kinds of assumptions. But Merlin, Hermione was exhausted. She could feel Draco massaging through all the fatigued knots in her back, and she hummed in sleepy pleasure against his chest. Hermione was internally debating the ramifications on how inappropriate it would be to ask Draco for a proper massage at a flat later that evening, when he spoke up. Let me take you to dinner when all this is over. Hermione's previously loosened muscles stiffened again, and she slowly peeled herself off of his chest, just catching the way his eyes flickered cautiously, almost hesitantly, before they hardened into a determined glint. What? A pale hand came up to thread an escaped curl from her plate. His expression light with something akin to wonder as he played with her hair. Have dinner with me, Granger, he repeated. You've been working your ass off for weeks now. Give yourself this break. A lump the size of a golden snitch lodged in her throat as Hermione attempted to swallow. Her tongue flickered out to wet her lips nervously. Draco, I've told you, she said, stepping back, and her body berated her for leaving his comforting embrace. I don't have to... Time, Draco finished and huffed out a laugh. Once again, his expression twinkled with knowing amusement, although Hermione didn't miss the way his eyes tightened. Hermione Granger's never-ending quest to save the magical animal kingdom. If Hermione wasn't too busy ignoring the way her heart skipped a beat at the way her given name fell from his lips, she might have almost missed the way his tone was almost fond, wistful even. He strode towards her office door, one hand lightly tugging on her plate playfully as he passed her by. Wait, she called after him. Draco blinked at her expectantly. She looked down towards her shuffling feet, her hands clasped together as she asked shyly, Will you be there tomorrow? At the hearing? He paused for a moment, looking her up and down before he replied, a cautious, Do you want me there? Hermione nodded and his eyes glinted, a smirk licking at his lips. Consider it a date, Granger, he said with a wink, a smirk spread into a full blown grin, and he rounded the corner as Hermione blushed. The back of Hermione's neck was caught with sweat, as fifty purple-robed senior wizards stared down at her. Some glaring down at her in austere disdain, others looked like they were wondering what to have for dinner that evening. A show of hands for those opposing the bill, the chief wallet droned, the miserable old git's hand joining a fair few others. Hermione couldn't finish counting the hands in time before the chief called for those in favour. A burden sigh left the chief's mouth as he nodded in Hermione's direction. Her nails dug into the palms of her hands as her ankle twitched in the urge to jump out of her seat. So, the chambers have spoken. We will submit your proposal for legislation, Miss Granger. Congratulations. The chief sounded anything but congratulatory as he tapped the gravel against his block, his fellow gallery a wave of plump, billowing curtains as they all made for the chambers. Hermione waited until the last wizard disappeared behind the old oak doors before she bounced up from her seat positively giddy as she turned on her heel to face the spectator benches, where a certain blonde colleague of hers had sat diligently behind her for the past two hours. Draco met her ecstatic grin with his own triumphant smirk. Her breath caught in her throat at the heat that shone in his eyes. Hermione laughed breathlessly, her feet a mind of their own as they made their way towards him, Draco's hungry stare like a siren call. She startled as Horace Dawkins' leering face appeared not inches away from her. She hadn't even noticed him approach her. I do believe congratulations are in order, Miss Granger. Ah, yes, her nose of him to congratulate her breasts. Hermione smiled tightly at him as she lifted her arms to cross protectively against her chest. Thank you, Mr. Jawkins. I look forward to receiving an update sense of all the livestock on your farm. 
I imagine there'll be quite the sudden increase of the official numbers. She stared at him challengingly and inwardly smirked at a flicker of scratching irritation he couldn't hide in time. He blinked and then his expression oozed into something lecherous and he cooed at her. My office still stands, Miss Granger. You're welcome to come and pat my cock, Beatrice. He paused mid-syllable to pointedly toss her a leer. I'll even make sure they're pretty right up for you. A hand clapped down on his shoulder, knuckles white as long elegant fingers stuck into Jorkin's shoulder in a way that must have been quite painful judging by the way the breeder grimaced. I'm aware there's not much honour and decorum amongst beast breeders, but I would hope that even a man of your status would know it's unseemly to speak to a witch with such candour, Draco drawled, and artfully pushed the man away from Hermione. Jorkin's blanched recognition bleeding into his eyes as he looked up at her colleague. He flitted his eyes between the two of them and clenched his jaw as he bowed to Hermione. I'll send my reports by next month, Jorkins forced out, turning on his heel with a sneer as he stalked out of the courtroom, in a way quite reminiscent of Hermione's old patient's professor. Draco's steely eyes followed him out before he looked back at her. His eyes traced over her as if he was looking for any damage from the skeevy breeder. Hermione smiled up at him in reassurance and reached to interlock their hands together. A sign of thank you. Draco's thumb swiped over hers. Want to learn how to make apple pie tonight? She offered. Draco grinned challengingly down at her, a hand reaching up to twist one of her curls around his index finger. You are so incredible. Draco murmured against her mouth, swallowing her gasping moans as he moved inside her. One of his hands gripped tight against her thigh as he pulled her closer to him. His tongue licked into her mouth, a slow, sensual, matching tempo to his hips, and a mighty whimpered. Draco, she bleated. So amazing. His voice was hoarse as he nipped at her lips. No one else can do what you do. So lucky to have... Draco broke off with a grunt, his fingers digging into the flesh of her thigh. Hermione's eyes fluttered as he twitched inside her. She barely pulled away from him to catch her breath, before he was tugging her right back against his sweat-slicked chest, his kiss desperate as his lips tried to touch everywhere they could reach. Hermione felt both suffocated, yet somehow too far away from him, and her arms lifted up to pull down his neck, bringing his lips back to hers in an eager, equally desperate kiss. Her skin positively hummed as he moaned into her mouth, it tastes like apples and sugar. His lips shifted, and then he was suddenly deeper, right there where she needed him to be. Hermione's head fell back in a guttural cry of, oh, oh my god. One of his hands cupped her chin, and he whispered, breathless, look at me. Hermione felt his lips quickened as she held his eye contact, grey eyes blown wide and hazy. She clenched around him as his pelvic bone brushed against her, and his eyes fluttered in clouded pleasure. Hermione, he gasped out, F fuck, Hermione, I... His head quickly bowed to the nook between her neck and shoulder, and she felt his tongue lick at the sweat as he masked something unintelligible against her skin. So amazing, so brilliant, so beautiful, he panted against her neck. Hermione's eyes burned as she swallowed back a sob. Her skin was positively alive with her magic. Her heart an untamable beast against her ribcage, and she dug her fingernails into his shoulders. Draco, she pleaded again, her was fluttering around him as she got closer to the edge. Draco's thrust grew choppy, and Hermione's navel trembled as his fingers came between them to rub tight circles against her. A final choke groaned, and her vision was Nirvana. Hermione lay plastered against her bedsheets as Draco went to set the nightly wards. She knew she had to go to the bathroom to clean herself up, but she couldn't summon the energy to get her legs to obey her brain. Weakly, she reached for a wound and cast a quick cleansing charm, grimaced at her less than hygienic method. She made a mental note to check a local muggle supermarket for pomegranate juice the next time she went, just in case. And don't think I didn't notice your mangy fur all over my socks, you little shit, Draco muttered, appearing through a doorway. Draco quickly closed the door just as a ginger paw came into view and he walked across her room, placing a glass of water on a bedside table, his other hand playfully flicking at her nose. All right, he asked, his voice quiet in her dark bedroom. She nodded, huffing out a laugh as he climbed over her to get to the other side of the bed. Draco evidently decided that taking the extra ten steps must have been too strenuous a task for him. As they lay together, Draco's arm having snaked around her waist a few minutes ago, Hermione's mind worried with her thoughts as she thought back on the past couple of days. She glanced at the glass of water on her table before gazing back at him, and Hermione couldn't help but feel a wave of gratitude towards the man sleeping next to her. How he'd likely spend a whole day preparing meals for her, not knowing how long he'd be gone for, and knowing how terrible her eating habits got when she was stressed. How, after several long days of casting complex memory charms on an entire muggled town, 
When he should really have taken a few days off from work to recuperate, he proceeded to pull an all-nighter to help Hermione with his speed, with nary a complaint. And the congratulatory bouquet of flowers he had delivered to her desk the morning of her hearing before she'd even met with the Wizengamot because he was seemingly convinced she'd win. If this was what Draco was like just with his co-workers, she mused as her eyes traced over his peaceful face, what must he be like with his girlfriends? Hermione's eyes widened at the last sneaky thought that slipped the forefront of her mind, and she swallowed dryly, and coming up to rub her chest as it throbbed with a sudden acidic ache. Too much sugar from that apple pie, she tried to convince herself. That did warn it could cause heartburn. In case you didn't understand the concept of sleeping, Granger, it tends to help if you have your eyes closed. Draco drawled sleepily, before asking a bit later, What's wrong? Hermione shook her head. I had coming up to brush away a few strands of blonde locks that had fallen across his face. It's just nice to have you back, she murmured. Draco's eyes shot open. His head lifted off of his pillow as he searched her expression, her face heating up at the intensity of his gaze, and she stuttered the implications of her words hitting her. At, 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 at work, it's, it's nice to have you... It's nice to have you back at work, she finished lamely with a shaky laugh. She could have sworn she saw something akin to pain flick in his eyes, and Hermione barely had the time to press a step forward before Draco leaned in, his hand pressing against the back of her head as he pulled her into a slow, deep kiss. Hermione's heart shuddered against the ribcage, and she breathed shakily against his lips. Draco pulled away just enough to nudge his nose against hers before he laid back down. Go to sleep, Granger, he yawned. Merlin knows you need it. He was seemingly out in minutes, his arm a dead weight across her waist. Hermione's mind trickled back to her thoughts. More specifically, that last devilish thought that had crept up before Draco had interrupted her musings, as she found herself snuggling closer in his arms. Draco's arm tightened around her subconsciously as she turned on her side to lay face to face with him. As the welcoming wave of sleep began to wash over her, Hermione's last thought before she dropped off was just how surprised she was at the sharp pain in her chest at the thought of Draco dating. Chapter 5 Hermione paced the floor of the veterinarian's waiting room, shooting the Medi-Witches a vicious glare any time one of them tried to get her to move to the seating area. How could she possibly be expected to just sit down and wait while Crookshanks was possibly... Her throat closed over on a sob as she tried to blink back her tears. No, she couldn't let herself think like that. But as she tried to focus on brewing a dreamless sleep potion in her mind, every so often her attention would slip and Hermione turned to stare imploringly through the doors towards the surgery ward, where, despite her best efforts, she'd even in a feat of desperation name-dropped herself. She would never let herself live that down. The Medi witches had refused her entry at every attempt. Her head snapped up at the sound of her name, and her knees positively buckled as Draco rushed through the doors, shoving his way past Medi witches His eyes were shiny and white with panic as he got closer to her. I got your Patronus! His breathing was heavy and ragged. What happened? With a choked of sob, she lurched forward into his spreading arms, hands desperately clinging to the back of his neck as he pulled her into his embrace. And her stomach twisted in guilt as she remembered he had lunch plans with his mother that afternoon. Hot, salty tears streamed down her cheeks as she tried to explain through her sobs, Crook, Crook Shanks, he was just lying there. He just sounded so... He sounded so in pain. Never heard him like that be before. Hermione hiccuped and pressed her forehead deeper into his chest. I don't know what's happened. No one said anything. No one will tell me anything. Her voice trickled off weakly as she broke into another sob. Draco's arms squeezed around her waist and she felt his lips press against her temples. Shh, 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 he murmured soothingly as he rocked her gently. The healers are with him right now. The fact that you've not heard anything is a good sign. It means they're making progress. Hermione shook her head and whimpered wetly. I can't lose drugs, Draco. I can't, she said. What if something's happened? What? He's so old. What if there's complications? What do I do? How can I just stand here? Draco, I can't lose him. Her chest felt tight with panic, and she was very aware of how shallow her breaths were. Hermione was certain. If Draco were to let go of her, she'd collapse onto the sticky linoleum floor. Draco's hand cupped her cheeks, and he stared down at her fiercely. You are not going to lose him, he vowed, a thump wiping away at the tears on her cheek. You know, as well as I, that that walking furball is invincible. 
The monster wobbled, and Draco bent down. His kiss, soft and quick, but a wave of comfort, washed over her all the same. I mean it, Hermione, he said as he tucked her head back into the crook of his shoulder. That ruddy cat of yours isn't going to go out without a fight. And the next time there's a psychotic dark lord roaming around the wizarding world, don't send Potter. Send Crookshanks on him instead. Hermione's chest erupted into a watery laugh, and she thumped her fist at his arm lightly. Don't make me laugh, she thought. My cat is ill. A group of interns swarmed past them. One of them accidentally botched into Hermione's shoulder, causing her to stumble. A group of interns swarmed past them. One of them accidentally botched into Hermione's shoulder, causing her to stumble. And Draco tucked on Hermione's hand as he pulled them over to the old rickety chairs in the seating area. He sat down, ignored Hermione's weak protest as he pulled her into his lap, his firm hands twisting her legs so she was set across him. Hermione leaned her shoulder into his and nuzzled her head into his neck. They sat together in silence for the next hour, the only noise being the occasional whimper and sniffle from Hermione as she shuddered through a new round of tears. In a vain attempt to distract herself, Hermione fiddled with the rings on Draco's fingers, as his other hand soothingly traced patterns down her arm, as it was pressing against her forehead every few minutes. An old woman sat across from them, an old ivory birdcage resting by her feet, and Hermione felt her cheeks burn every time she caught the private, knowing smile the elderly witch sent in their direction. Miss Granger? Hermione startled. Head clipped against Draco's chin as she jolted up. She vaguely registered Draco's curse behind her, the vision slightly invaded by black dots. As she greeted the Magi zoologist, Crookshanks, she gasped out as her hand clawed at her chest. She felt Draco come up behind her, one of his hands warm and grounding against her lower back. The vet, his white coat, said Hila Pippin, smiled at her. Not to worry, he's doing just fine. Hermione's knees sagged and she felt Draco quickly move closer, both of his hands clasped around her hips. Her mind bust with endorphins of relief, and she had to blink several times to focus on Hila Pippin's report. Retrieve this item from his stomach during the surgery. Hila Pippin waved his wand, and a small black object appeared in a floating protective orb. It had caused a minor gastrointestinal perforation, and there will be some additional scarring in his esophagus, but we've sealed up the tear and he'll be on prescription of antibiotics potion for the next couple of days. Hermione glanced at a peculiar item, cocking her head as she tried to make out what it was that almost killed her cat. Her jaw dropped as she recognized the half-chewed, half-digested silver stitching of the Malfoy emblem. Granger, Draco's voice fluttered in disbelief, is that my sock? Hermione shuddered out to laugh as she looked back and forth between what was indeed part of Draco's favorite sock and the healer, the kind man's eyes glittered in equal disbelief and amusement. It's certainly a first for our healers too, Elipipin chuckled and waved his wand again, the sock disappearing with a pop. We'd like to keep Crook, he paused to glance back down at his chart. Crookshanks, in our recovery ward for a few days, given his age and type of damage he received, we want to keep a closer eye on him. Hermione let out a squeak at the word damage and her chin wobbled. He's going to be okay though, right? She whispered. Well, we don't like to make any promises, Ilepepin held out his head defensively as Draco huffed scornfully behind her. But Knizos, even half-breeds like your familiar, are notoriously resilient, so I have good faith that he'll make a full recovery in no time. Hermione nodded as her eyes glanced towards the wood entrance. Can I see him? Ilepepin smiled at her apologetically. Not today. The surgery will have been a lot for him. And he needs to rest. You'll be able to see him tomorrow once he'd had some sleep. The vet pointed them in the direction of the receptionist and told Hermione to leave her details for the staff to be able to notify her of Crookshank's discharge before he left with another kind smile. Hermione exhaled shakily as Draco came around, one hand against her cheek as he brushed away stray hairs from her face. You okay? he asked. When Hermione nodded, he returned to gesture before a small smirk etched his lips. So, I guess I need to add my socks to the list of things to ward against the cat of yours. His eyes were playful, but Hermione still saw the remnant of concern and panic linger in them. She let out a soft laugh, lifted up on her toes to give him a small, thankful kiss. Thank you for coming, she said, looking up at him apologetically. Draco's expression a little dazed as he looked at her with heavy eyelids. I'm sorry for interrupting lunch with your mother. 
Hermione wasn't entirely sure if he'd heard her, his eyes fixated on her lips. She blanched as she remembered that in her panic that morning, she hadn't had time to brush her teeth before rushing to the vets. She blushed furiously and broke his gaze to focus on the buttons of his shirt. Hmm. She wondered if they were made out of ivory, as her eyes traced over the walls. Her fingers fitted it with the button closest to his belt, and Draco's throat cleared, his voice still slightly thick. Let's get you something to eat and head home, Granger. After checking in with the receptionist, they walked hand in hand to the apparition point. As her navel swooped at a familiar pulling sensation, she tried to remember in vain who had grabbed the other's hand first. Draco's back was just crossing over the threshold of her bedroom into the corridor when she called after him, softly. Can you stay with me? Hermione whispered into the comforting darkness of her room. Draco's breath hitched, his back stiffening and he looked over his shoulder, his expression cautious. And something else her money couldn't quite place, but it made her heart gallop like a hippogriff against her ribcage. Her tongue wet against her lip nervously as she held out her arm. She had to congratulate herself internally when her hand didn't betray the nerves that had every inch of her skin burning. Please, she said. I need you, I need you to stay. Becker shuffled in the doorway, and Hermione couldn't bat down the feeling of utter fondness at how shy and torn he looked. I, you, it's been an emotional day. I don't want to take advantage of you, Granger, he said, finally, his eyes actively focused on her bedside table. She shook her head. You're not, just, can you just hold me until I fall asleep? Draco's eyes squeezed shut and he swallowed thickly. Doubt crept up her spine as she watched him linger in the doorway. Perhaps, perhaps she was crossing a line, some unstated yet neon red boundary that Draco didn't want to cross with a colleague. She opened her mouth to take it back when, with a shaky, heavily exhale, Draco slowly made his way to sit on the edge of her bed. His hand tucked lightly at her hair, that familiar yet unreadable private smile on his face as he gazed down at her. Scooch over, he murmured. Hermione did so and sent him a small, grateful smile as he shuffled under the covers with her. I'm sorry about your socks, she said meekly after a few minutes of being lulled into relaxation from Draco's steady breathing against her back. I'll buy you a new pair. Draco chuckled and Hermione's stomach somersaulted as he leaned over to kiss her. She exhaled weakly against his lips as he murmured, As if I give a damn about my socks, Hermione. Don't tell me, little boy Diggle tried to invite you to Beltane again, Draco asked her when she came back from her lunch break on Monday morning, the bouquet in her hands. His tone was inquisitive, humorous, but Hermione didn't miss the way his expression soured, his eyes almost venomous when he looked at them. She swallowed nervously. Did he not like hydrangeas? Hermione summoned all the Gryffindor courage that she had as she placed the bouquet on his desk. She debated actually handing them over to him, but Draco looked like he was seconds away from tossing an incendio in their direction, and she didn't feel like being in the firing line. I, um, uh, well... I got them for you. <laughs> Hermione cleared her throat, almost missing the way his eyebrows shot to the ceiling, his disdain melting away in wonder, as she fixed her gaze on the blush pink flowers. She wondered absentmindedly if her face was a matching shade. For me? Draco repeated, staring down at the bouquet with much less venom, his expression bewildered, and was he blushing? Hermione watched his fingers pinch at the skin of his wrist. She hummed. You bought me flowers. I believe we've established that. Y you bought me pink? Pink flowers? Not to worry. The flowers assured me your masculinity will remain intact. Hermione couldn't hold back her eye roll. Honestly, man. You bought me flowers, Draco repeated as he said dumbly. Hermione huffed. Well, if you don't want them. Draco's hand shot out, the flowers disappearing from under her hand as quick as a snitch. He held them almost protectively against his chest, his cheeks a wonderful complimentary rose hue to the hydrangeas as he blinked inquisitively at her. Why did you get me flowers? His eyes fucked over and Hermione didn't need to be a legolimens to know that he was searching through his mind for some forgotten occasion. Hermione's lips twitched. He looked like a man who was trying to remember his wedding anniversary. Read the card, she prompted and nodded towards the envelope. She was pretty sure his eyebrows were going to be permanent residence for her ceiling by the end of the day, as his eyes bulged in disbelief, looking inside the envelope. 
These are tickets for the Quidditch semi-finals. He looked up at her suspiciously. You got me Quidditch tickets. Technically, Ginny got you the tickets. Hermione grinned at the way he lightly grimaced. More than forbid he felt like he owed the Weasleys anything. Okay, he said slowly as he looked at her more cautious now. Hermione could have sworn his eyes looked almost hopeful. The visitors gazed between the tickets and herself. So, why am I holding Quidditch tickets and some pink flowers? They're not just pink flowers, Hermione huffed, and brushing away at some flyaway curves in irritation. Don't you remember plant theory for herbology? I remember Longbottom fainting in herbology. He smirked as she glared at him, but his leering look didn't reach his still hesitant eyes. They're hydrangeas, Hermione pointed limply. Hydrangeas are known to be a flower of gratitude. Roses too, of course, but they're far too commercialized these days. And I know if you were spotted walking around the ministry with a bunch of roses, there'd be all kinds of assumptions and stories in the newspapers. And Granger, you're babbling. Oh, ah, yes, right. Hermione tucked her hair behind her ear. Basically, what I'm trying to say is, I'm very grateful for what you did the other day at, at the vets and afterwards. She turned her gaze to the floor, her cheeks heated in embarrassment. Draco was silent for a moment. When he finally spoke, his voice was hoarse and tired. Granger, I, you didn't have to do this. I wasn't expecting anything from you. I know, Hermione nodded looking up at him. His expression was open but pinched at the same time, and she smiled at him reassuringly. I know you wouldn't have, I just, but I still, I still wanted to let you know how grateful I was, am how grateful I am. Her eyes narrowed and a coffee stain on his desk. Maybe she should have gotten him a coaster instead, as she continued. You left lunch plans with your mother to sit with me in a grimy vet's office whilst I cried over my old cat who ate your favourite socks. I know you. I know you didn't plan on spending your Saturday night comforting your crying colleague, your crying friend, all evening, Hermione corrected. After almost two years of working together, she supposed they could consider each other friends, but I appreciate it all the same. Draco stared at her. His brows knitted together as he searched her face. After a few uncomfortable moments, his expression relaxed and he shrugged. He leaned back in his chair and thumped the tickets in his hand. I can't help but notice there's two tickets, Ranger. Whatever thoughts had been troubling him had seemingly vanished as he quirked a brow at her, his eyes bright. Yes, I thought you might want to invite Theo or Blaze or, or if there's someone at work or anywhere really, I suppose that you might want to to ask out the word surprisingly felt like acid against her tongue and she couldn't hold back her grimace various images fleeting in her mind of draco snuggled up to several faceless tall thin blonde models in the quidditch stadium stands hermione gritted her teeth draco's eyes flickered across her face as he smirked briefly before it shifted into one of concern how's the lovely supplements you're doing hermione blinked at him her eyes burnt with threatening tears as she nodded He's doing well, but the healers want to keep him over there for a few more days, until Thursday, they said. Thursday? Draco glanced at her tickets. The game is on Wednesday. Why don't you come with me? Me? This is what I ask. But I don't like Quidditch. I know you don't. Draco rose from his chair and rounded his desk, moving to sit against the edge. His knees pressed against her thighs as he leaned forward. But I do know you're only going to spend Wednesday night fretting over that overgrown furball, so you might as well take your mind off of things. She hated that he had a point. But I hate Quidditch, her mind sobbed, her bottom lip dropping into a pout. She certainly hadn't foreseen this outcome when she asked Ginny for the tickets. Draco reached up to lightly press her bottom lip between his forefingers. Good. You can think about how much you hate it whilst you're there. Given away, Draco and thousands of fans around them hollered and cheered. Hermione assumed that his team had won. She had barely paid any attention to the match. Her eyes had been very much focused instead on the way Draco's glazed legs had put torch across his thighs. And when he leaned forward, his razor eyes following the seekers every time they dove. Hermione's eyes would flutter shut as the scent of his cologne wreathed through her senses. She felt Draco pull her up from her seat and the stadium spun in a wide variety of colours as Draco twirled them around in celebration of victory. Hermione joined in on a delighted laughter, only for a moment when, likely in a rush of endorphins and the heat of the moment, 
Draco bent down to claim her mouth in a breathtaking kiss. Hermione had no excuses, however, when, as he barely pulled away from her, her hand sneaked around his neck to pull him down into another much deeper, much longer kiss. By the time she finally pulled away from him, Draco looking as a punch drunk as she felt herself, his eyes hazy and blown wide, their section has long since been vacated. Hermione couldn't shake the feeling that she had forgotten something important. She mentally did a checklist as she searched through her desk. Her wand was on the right of her desk as always. Medley had brought her a morning mug of coffee, of which was next to a memo for her meeting that morning. In a brief stint of panic, Hermione glanced over to the clock. No, she still had two hours until her meeting. Crookshank's medication to be taken at home had been picked up at the apothecary that morning on her way into work and was safe, tucked away in her bag. She even peeked into a biscuit drawer. Huh? Draco must have bought more. She was sure she only had three left, she mused, as she looked at her unopened packet. She slammed the drawer closed with a huff as that niggling sensation crept up in her mind. Hermione hadn't felt this itch since the day Parkinson hijacked her office with that blasted engagement party invitation. For a moment, cold sweat gleamed on her neck as she wondered if that was what she had forgotten. The calendar on her desk clearly indicated it was well past the 12th of April, and she really didn't want to incur the wrath of Penry. Until the memory of Draco calling after her, the day she almost missed her meeting, that he'd returned their RCP swirled in her mind's eye. Hermione let out a relieved sigh, but the little, constant nudge in her mind persisted. Maybe she should ask Medley to check for any of the members for sale next time she visited Diagon Alley. At least that way, Hermione would have some form of confirmation that she was indeed forgetting whatever it was she was forgetting. Or maybe her week of sleep deprivation before her cockatrice hearing had caused some form of permanent damage in her brain, and she was doomed to be with this maddening niggling in her head forever. She glanced at Draco's desk. She glanced over at Draco's desk. The wizard had returned to his own efforts for a meeting, and couldn't hold back a smile at seeing the hydrant geas in a vase on the corner. Preserved with a stasis charm, their petals as vibrant as the day she'd visited the florist. Why, forever, of course, Draco had drawled when she asked him how long he would keep the bouquet for, and he turned to give an exaggerated, flirty wink. That way, whenever I look at them, I'll be reminded of you, he had cooed. Hermione simply rolled her eyes and quickly spun her chair around to face the other wall so he couldn't see the blush that bloomed brighter than his flowers across her cheek. Hermione nudged at her again, and Hermione slumped her head against the desk with an exhausted groan. Hermione first began feeling like something was off a few days earlier after a meeting with other department heads and deputies. Mercifully, making it with one minute to spare, damn Draco, sinful, insistent tongue and fingers. Hermione was walking back to her office alongside Dorothy Whittleworth, head of the spirit division, when Dorothy asked her if she would be attending the fundraiser at the end of next month. Hermione snorted in disdain. No, I don't think I will be. Oh no? How come? Oh, surely you must. You always look so lovely, especially when you put some effort into your hair. Dorothy hadn't meant it as an insult, but Hermione sucked her teeth in irritation all the same. Be that as it may, Hermione said sardonically, and her eyes twitched as she held back an eye roll. I think I'm going to pass all the same. I don't fancy dealing with reporters all evening making dicks about me being single and trying to use that as a valid reason to undermine my case. The pair of them nodded at Matilda on reception. The latter noticeably avoided Hermione's eye contact, and she swallowed guiltily. Perhaps she should send Matilda an apology fruit basket. It certainly went down well with Bugger. What was that intern's name again? Dorothy threw her a confused look. Why would they make comments about you being single? She asked as they rounded the corner to Hermione's office. I mean, wouldn't you be going with... Draco? Draco paused, mixed up into her office, and looked over his shoulder with a smirk. There you are, Draco hummed. Been looking all over for you, Granger. Hermione's cheeks tinged with colour as she tried her hardest to ignore the way her tummy fluttered when she met his soft, relaxed grin. She swallowed thickly and cocked a brow at him. You can just leave a note? Where is the fun in that? Draco dismissed and, with a rather dramatic flick of his wrist, pulled up the bag in his hand. What's this? I'm afraid I can't join you for lunch today. I don't have the time. His lips were positively sinful as he smacked at her. 
But Merlin knows if I leave you to handle your own food, that biscuit drawer of yours will be empty quicker than Potter can say expelliarmus. Hermione scowled, the blush on her cheek spreading to her neck as Draco bent down and stage whispered. Most likely for the amusement of her swooning collie, she noted bitterly. Who knows? You continue to consume that much ginger and you might actually turn into the eighth Weasley sprout. He shuddered dramatically. Dorothy's laugh was airy with delight, and Hermione's mind unwillingly cast back to that giggly healer back at St. Mungo's a few months prior, whom Draco had tried his damnness to pull. Trust a Malfoy to never let a concussion stop him from getting what he wanted. Her nails dug into the palm of her hand, and her chest throbbed with acidity. Draco reached out, grabbing her hand, and placed a bag in her open palm. His fingers slowly called hers as he looked at her, grey eyes piercing through hers. Bon appétit, he said, circularly, and Hermione was minutely grateful for the way Dorothy sighed audibly. With any luck, it drowned out her own shaky exhale. With a final wink to her or Dorothy, Hermione couldn't tell, nor could she tell whether it irritated her so. Draco strolled off down the corridor to head to the ministry lifts. Dorothy let out another wistful sigh, her eyes still fixed on the spot where his glorious, firm ass had rounded the corner moments before. I wish my boyfriend was that attentive, Dorothy said mournfully, tossing a somewhat reproachful look at Hermione. Hermione looked bewildered at the random comment. Right, she said lamely, before she gave her goodbyes and headed into her office. Dorothy's words lingered in her mind, much to Hermione's chagrin. She found herself reading the same complaint four times, unable to hold any sort of attention, and her hackers were rising steadily. And she couldn't help but wonder what Prince Draco had at that time of day. A slick, unnervingly uncomfortable thought came to her mind that perhaps Draco had lunch plans with someone else, like on a date. No sooner had the thought entered her mind that a snapping sound jolted her mind out of her musing, and she looked down in shock. Her quill lay scattered in several broken pieces in her palm and across her desk. Hermione scored over her employer contract renewal form, and her forehead throbbed as that niggling parasite tingled in her head. She groaned, her fingers lightly massaging over her eyebrow as she tried to pinpoint what was bothering her. Her hair sparked when, after reading it for the dozenth time, nothing jumped out at her, seemingly out of place. Ministry of Magic Contract of Employment Renewal. Name, Hermione Granger. Date of birth, 19th September, 1979. Department, Regulation and Control of Magical Creatures. Want, ten three quarter inches, Vinewood, Dragon Heart String Core. Emergency Contact, Draco Malfoy. Secondary Emergency Contact, Harry Potter. It is hereby agreed as follows. In this contract, except to the extent that the context otherwise requires the following terms shall be. Perhaps her annual wage had been decreased? Her mind is most pressed against the paper as she squinted at the fine print. She'd heard their department would be receiving budget cuts. Her mind couldn't help but suspect that the chief warlock had some influence on the matter. But she would have to check her old contract and compare it word for word when she got back to her flat later that evening to be sure. She tossed the contract to the side, temporarily giving up. She supposed she could always ask Draco to help her overlook the contract later at night. Her mind tingled. Any plans Hermione had to spend an evening analysing her contracts were dashed as Draco flewed into her living room, his expression casual, but his eyes glimmer teasingly. She was very grateful for the fact that she was already sitting on her couch when Draco pulled her favourite arithmancy book from behind his back. A first edition of her favourite arithmancy book. Hermione gaped up at him in disbelief as she slowly rose from the couch. Is that... it is? How did you... A friend owed me a favour. Hermione paused mid-step and looked up at him suspiciously as she raised an eyebrow. Do I want to know why they owed you a favour? Draco groaned before he mockingly pondered. Probably not. Her eyes narrowed slightly, her eyes flickered back and forth between his wicked grin and the book. Draco laughed lightly, his lips pursed as he slowly turned on his heel. Of course, if you don't want it, I guess I can always give it back. Hermione shot out and snatched the book from his grip before he could finish. It clung to her chest protectively as she tried and failed to not blush at his knowing smirk. 
Her heart pounded against her chest, and she was mostly convinced it was due to the object in her hand. No, I, I, I love it. Thank you. Hermione smiled up at him shyly, internally mortified at her ungrateful behaviour. If her great-grandmother Ida was still walking around, no doubt Hermione's buttock would have been bruised pink at that moment. She leaned up to give him a quick peck, noticing the raised goose bump on his neck as she pulled away. Hermione supposed she should put the heating on. It was a surprisingly nippy evening, despite being mid-spring, and it wouldn't do to let her guests freeze, especially after he'd just given her the most delightful gift. The hours of the evening flew by, Hermione's head barely coming up for air as she pressed her nose deep into each chapter of the book. Her feet sought out the warmth of Draco's lap some forty minutes earlier, and one of his hands lightly rubbed at the soles of her feet as he lazily looked over some paperwork. Crookshanks was tucked under Draco's right arm. I'm only learning this because you were at death's door last week, Draco grumbled when her cat had gingerly hopped up onto the couch. His deep, relaxed, purring snores being the only sound in the living room, aside from the occasional quill scratch to Draco's paperwork and the crisp, turning pages of her book. Have you found an outfit for Pansy's party? Draco asked as he thumped the delicate skin around her ankle. Hermione blanched as she looked up at him in horror. Between her hearing, Crookshank's surgery, and monthly reports, she'd forgotten all about it. Pansy's warning drawl about it being a formal event rang through her mind, and Hermione thought about her wardrobe. The only item in there being even remotely non-business attire, Draco had fondly labelled an offensive potato sack. Her internal panic must have crept onto her face because Draco just smiled knowingly at her and reached over to kiss her knee, his hand squeezed at her ankle. I get mother to sort it for us both, he suggested, and Hermione smiled in relief, giving him a grateful nod as she turned back to her book. Her stomach churned as her mind suddenly nudged at her again, but then the next chapter of her book was all about the formulas Bridget Wenlock had used to discover the magical properties of the number seven, and all thoughts and anxieties in her mind were quickly muted. Hermione made sure to thank Draco properly for his gift when the pair decided to retire to bed many hours later. She was raised to always honour her dad after all, and promptly took him between her lips, not pulling away until he'd spilled into her mouth for the second time, tears streaming down his cheek, her given name falling from his lips in a desperate, pleaded whimper, and his hands threaded through her hair. He tucked softly, and then a little harsher, before she finally released him. His eyes were positively feral as he pulled her up to sit in his lap, and she moaned as his tongue ravaged hers. Hermione pulled away, drinking in the air greedily. Draco, a panting, teary mess underneath her. She leaned in and traced his tears with a soft kiss to his cheek, his jaw, his nose, and finally, his lips. She stuttered on her breath, Draco's hot, blazing eyes boring into hers as he whispered, My turn. Hermione yelped out a laugh as he flipped them over, her heart erratic and giddy as his lips reclaimed hers, only for a moment, before Draco travelled hot, wet, open-mouthed kisses down towards her inner thighs. Hermione, did you say you wanted milk in your tea? Jenny called to her from the kitchen. Just a splash, Hermione called back as she tickled James. No, Hermione, no, James pleaded between bags of delighted youth for giggles. Be careful with James, Hermione, Jenny's voice sounded out again. Ever since George babysat him the other week, the little monster won't stop swearing. Hermione let him go when his brows started pinching together and his cheeks blotched red. The patience of a two-year-old being as delicate as it was, not to mention. Hermione suspected he'd inherited his father's rather biting temper. She didn't want to make him fussy and upset. James trotted over to roll around on the rug. Whoosh! Falling from his lips every so often, as he, Hermione could only guess, pretended he was a broomstick. Bloody pregnancy brain! Jenny grumbled, two steaming cups of tea in her hands. Hermione gingerly took the cup held out to her her knees groaning in protest as she pulled up from the floor to sit on the couch. I had to make the drink twice because I forgot to boil the water for the first time. What a waste of tea bags! She huffed as she awkwardly limbered her way onto the couch. Tea bag! James parroted from the floor. His limbs pretzeled it as he rocketed side to side on his back. Oh, to be that flexible again, Hermione said wistfully, and absentmindedly rubbing at her knee that clicked. Tell me about it, Jenny huffed, with a fond yet exacerbated glance at her belly, before she said sulkily, I'm as big as a hypocrite. Hermione rolled her eyes. You're pregnant, she said. 
And hippogriffs are extremely graceful, magnificent creatures. Did you know that? Spare me a whizzing in my voice, Hermione, and let me complain. Ginny held out her hand as she cut Hermione off. Her pregnant friend shot her a cheeky side glance. Besides, whenever I do, Harry feels so guilty that he does anything he can to make it up to me. Hermione grimaced. Ew, please don't make me think of my best friend being in any form of sexual situation. You said anything about sex. Sex. They both whipped their heads in horror towards James. The toddler busy having the time of his life making rug angels. Ginny scowled and cocked her head towards the dinner table across the room. Hermione held out her hand to assist Ginny up from the couch and they made their way over. I'm going to hex George the next time I see him. Ginny seized once they sat down, checking over her shoulder at her son. He was none the wiser to what he had said, now happily running around the rat with his plush toy fireball. In his toddler wisdom, fireballs evidently sounded like dragons. Hermione smiled at the utterly doting look on Ginny's face as she watched her son play. Ginny turned around and pointed a warning finger in Hermione's face. Let this be a lesson. If there's anything I learned from Quidditch matches, it's that Malfoy has a putty mouth that will make Voldemort blush, Ginny said and grimaced after taking a sip of a drink. Damn, I forgot the sugar. Hermione's mind niggled at her again and she swallowed uncomfortably. Why would that... What's Draco got to do with this? She frowned. Oh, have you two not had that conversation yet? Hold on, I think I took your drink. Give me that, would you? Ginny swapped their cups, taking a quick sip. A brief look of contemplative on her face before she huffed at a laugh. Oops, yeah, that one's yours. Hope you don't mind sharing my spit. It's fine, Hermione waved it off, more focused on analysing Ginny's first comment, confusion and dread sitting like a brick in her stomach. What conversation have we not had? You know, Ginny twirled her wrist in a dismissive motion. Getting married, having cruelly white, hairy pointed faced children. Oh, we can't forget the 2.5 peacocks in your back garden. But I'm telling you, keep an eye on your future ankle biters. I have a feeling that the mouth of flair for dramatics is genetic. Perhaps Ginny had brewed the wrong kind of plant leaves for her tea, Hermione thought, as she glanced down questioningly at her cup. She licked her lips, her voice slightly hoarse. Why, why, why would we talk about that? Hermione tried to laugh it off, but the way her face pinched made the task exceedingly difficult. Well, unless the pair of you broke up, that's usually what grown-ups talk about when they're in a committed relationship with one another, Hermione. Jenny rolled her eyes into her cup, and Hermione's heart stopped. She must have been silent for too long because Jenny looked up at her, a brief taking a back look on her friend's face as she took in Hermione's picky, bewildered expression before she squinted at Hermione suspiciously. Hermione, Ginny said slowly, you, you do know that you and Malfoy are dating, right? Hermione wasn't sure how Ginny was able to breathe. Considering it felt like all the oxygen had been sucked out of the room, she opened her mouth to respond, to deny it, to say anything really, but only a ragged wheeze managed to squeeze out of her lungs. Harry, are you, are you kidding? What? Don't tell me you didn't know. Ginny spluttered out, her eyes a mirror of Hermione's in bugged out disbelief. I mean, well, yeah, sure, I know Harry and Bron said to never say anything to you, but that was months ago. I thought, surely you would have spoken about it since then? I just thought you were trying to keep things on the low with Rita. Ginny passed a suck in a deep breath, hand flying up to rub against her belly. Hermione's hand reached out to her, and are you okay on her lips, when Ginny looked back up at her, accusingly. You two have, you know, all that time, she whispered a cautious glance to her son. Well, yes, but no, not all the time. Just when things get a little stressful at work, Hermione defended, that doesn't mean we're dating. I thought he comes around your flat every Friday for dinner. He cooks lunches for you, for Merlin's sake, all the time. But that's not. He's just helping me with spew. Hey, that's what we're calling him these days? Ginny said with a drawl. That's not funny. Hermione, he's always at your flat. Didn't you say Crookshanks ate his sock? He's always sleeping over. 
We work in the same department, Hermione huffed, the hackers on her neck stiff with irritation. Sometimes we'll finish work back at my flat and, look, it's just more convenient for him to flew in from mine some mornings. Oh yeah, I bet the flu journey from his manner is real strenuous. Jenny? Hermione's voice trembled in a warning. Hermione? Jenny parroted back. She leaned back in her seat and gestured to the empty seats next to them. He's at dinner here, in Harry's and I's house, multiple times. Honestly, Jenny, you can't expect him to hold on to your silly house rivalries forever, Hermione said, her breasts pinched together in disapproval. How could Jenny be so misunderstood about her and Draco's relationship? Hermione fitted her eyes down to Jenny's stomach, and her mouth thinned. Pregnancy brain, indeed. He sits with his arm around you the entire time. Hermione shivered as a mild spring breeze drifted in through the open window. It gets cold in here sometimes, she dismissed as she pulled her cardigan closer to her body. Hermione was sure if Ginny's jaw dropped any lower it would spill into her teacup. Ginny stared at her, her eyes widely scattering across Hermione's face, no doubt looking for another situation to twist in her imagination. Ginny's eyes widened before a smug leer painted across her face. When did ye two have... She cut herself off to check on her son again before she leaned towards Hermione with a whisper. Sex? When did you two have sex for the first time again? The answer came to Hermione's mind before she even tried to think back. February last year, after my wolfsbane bill was passed, a blush crept across her cheek as the day trickled into her memory. Her hip bones were bruised with Draco's fingertips for a week and she couldn't look at the chair without her face flaming. Ginny hummed that lecherous glint still in her eyes. And didn't Malfoy take you to Greece like two months ago? That was for a conven- We? That was for a convention. I'd been reading a book about crack and ancient runes that were thought to have influenced the direction of Blushen's research. And I heard about the convention there that were exhibiting the original runes, the money shrugged. So I couldn't manage to get us tickets. Ginny carried on undeterred. Oh, of course, Draco had tickets. You could ask for Val of Phoenix Tears and that man would have it delivered to you by all the same evening. When was that convention again? Mid-February, I believe it was, yes? Right around the, for the lack of a better word, anniversary of your office escapades? Jenny positively gloated with her deduction and her mind gaped at her. Jenny, I don't know what kind of ideas you think you know about Draco and I, but... A small thump sounded out from across the room, followed by Jem's anguished cry, and Jenny darted out of her seat with remarkable speed given the stage of her pregnancy, and she hurried over to comfort her son. Oh, did she bump into the couch? Jenny cooed, as a gentle hand brushed through his shock of messy dark hair. Does he need anything? Hermione asked as she reached for a wand in her pocket. No, no, he's fine. Kids are like sponges, aren't you? With Ginny distracted as she fussed over James, Hermione took a large swig of her drink. Her thoughts whirred and screamed at her like a baby mandrake. The convention in Greece had only been a two-day event, but after Draco had pointed out how exhausting and hardly the most frugal means of travel international port keys were, they had decided it was more financially and physically beneficial to extend the trip into a four-day weekend instead. And when Draco had insisted that she could stay with him in his family's villa free of charge, it's only going to be collecting dust otherwise, Granger. We might as well take advantage. Hermione could think of no other excuse not to go. The convention had been glorious. Hermione had bounced around, store to store, like a kid let loose in a sweet shop, giddily dragging Draco to every lecture, workshop and demonstration, and even though he'd huffed once or twice about her determination to somehow be at every schedule in the itinerary, I've heard rumours about the time turner, Granger. Should I expect an inquest from the Department of Ministries when we get back? Hermione knew Draco had also found it all to be incredibly fascinating. When she'd unfortunately lost sight of one of the guest lecturers she had been determined to speak to, sulkily dragging her feet back to Draco, she found him standing in the corner, talking rather animatedly with one of the archaeologists. She'd caught the trail end of their conversation as she approached and was surprised to hear that Draco had offered to fund their next day. She hadn't been able to join in on the conversation, though, as, when he'd seen her approach, Draco nodded his goodbyes to the wizard and smirked knowingly at her despondent expression. He tucked on her hair lightly and asked if she fancied seed food for lunch. Draco had been rather touchy-feely with her that weekend, his arms rarely leaving the comfort of her waist as they explored the island, 
But it was mid-February after all, and even Southern Europe experienced bitter winter days on occasion. Draco was just making sure that Hermione didn't catch a cold. It would reflect badly on his upbringing if he had let her freeze to death during a trip that he invited her on. Sure, Draco made flirty comments. He'd ask her out to dinner a few times, and sometimes Hermione would catch him staring at her when he thought she was focused on the work in front of her. But she pictured the St. Mungo's healer, Dorothy's giggles, a face as blonde sat opposite him at lunch. Hermione knew that, even if he was attracted to her enough to sleep with her on occasion, Draco had no intention of ever pursuing Hermione for a proper relationship. He, above anyone else, knew how busy she was, how stressful her cases were, how every spare minute she had she threw into work, and oftentimes he was right there at her side, working all of those cases on top of his own liaison responsibilities. Draco understood how important her work was to her. And as she pictured his to-do task lists and the piles of paperwork on his own desk, she knew his job was important to him as well, no matter how many little quips he would make about the creatures. They'd worked together long enough that Hermione knew Draco would never manipulate her trust, that he valued her as a colleague just as much as she valued him. The ridiculous notion that Draco was somehow pinning for her, either Shelley's twinkling laugh echoed in her mind again, and an even more outrageous idea that she, Hermione, would not notice if she was accidentally dating someone made her laugh out loud in bitter scorn. A gentle tap on her hand jolted Hermione out of her musings. Ginny had at some point sat back down opposite her and was looking at her with fond pity. Hermione shook her head vehemently. We're not dating. The missives passed. Hermione, you'd have to be blind not to see how crazy he is over we're not, he's not, Draco wouldn't lie to me like that, Hermione spat and ripped her hand from under Ginny's. We're not dating, she said with finality, fixing Ginny with a challenging glare. She promptly drowned the rest of her now cold tea as she tried to ignore the small voice in her head that asked if she was trying to convince Ginny or herself. Chapter 6 February 1979 This was absolutely useless. Hermione's fourth time scoring the only book the library had on Wizarding Monarchs throughout history, and there wasn't so much as a footnote regarding a half-blood prince, legitimate or otherwise. Hermione slammed the heavy book shut and immediately winced at the loud thwack it made throughout the stacks. A group of seventh-year Ravenclaws looked over at her from their table. Combined look of disdain, derision, and from one particularly stressed-looking witch, seemingly moments away from hexing her as her little outburst had disturbed them from revising for their quickly approaching nudes. Hermione blushed sheepishly and nodded her head in apology as she quickly turned on her heels and darted around the stacks. She cornered another row, and then another, and then one more, until she was certain she had put considerable distance between her and the temperamental study group. She was at the back of the library now, the imposing doors of the restricted section looming just ahead of her. A wistful, bitter sigh escaped her as she pondered the possibilities that the information that she needed was only a couple yards behind those ancient oak doors. Hermione had tried pleading with Madame Pince a few weeks earlier to let her browse the section, but the librarian had simply sneered at her. Like Hermione was something foul stuck to the bottom of the miserable witch's pointed heel and told her to not make silly requests like that until she had a written approval from her data professor, per Hogwarts policy. At the image of Hermione approaching Professor Snape after class, the one teacher in school who did not consider Hermione's dedication to her studies to be considered anything remotely worthy of respect, 
and asking him to give her permission to explore the restricted stacks to try and find any sort of proof that the shady wizard Harry was using to cheat in class with even existed had made Hermione snort in derision. No, it seemed Hermione would have to fall back onto the one thing she could always count on in times of uncertainty, her brain. Hermione glanced at her surroundings, walking around the aisles until she found an empty table so that she could focus. To her displeasure, it seemed like the majority of the seventh-year student had decided to take that Saturday as an extra day to cram in as much revision as possible. She huffed quietly. Perhaps she should return in the evening when everyone else was at dinner? Her mind trailed off as she spotted an empty table barely visible, crammed around the damp corner at the farthest part of the library. She smiled in relief. Her footsteps quiet but quickly striding towards the corner, her hands reached to relieve her achy shoulder of a heavy bag. Hermione froze, her back slamming back down quite painfully on her hip, as she discovered the table was not as empty as it appeared to be. Never was such the table. His head laid across his arms, no doubt in the middle of a frustrated tiff Hermione herself was quite familiar with. Hang on, was he sleeping? The steady rise and fall of his shoulders, the even deep exhale of his breath, in contrast to the deep purple bruising under his eyes, a peaceful, relaxed openness to his face Hermione had never seen before, all indicated he was, indeed, asleep. Hermione's head tilted in curiosity as she couldn't help but observe him. He looked much younger when he was sleeping. Her cheeks bloomed in colour as a devilish thought in the back of her mind commented that he was rather good-looking when his face wasn't pinched up into a scowl. The small fabric crease indentations on his cheeks indicated he had been sleeping there for a while now, and her mind shifted on her feet as she debated as to whether she should wake him up. Maybe he'd be so disgusted at breathing the same air as a mudblood he would storm off and Hermione would have a lovely empty table all to herself. Her lips twitched in amusement until Harry's remark about Malfoy disappearing from the map at night rarely ever being in the comfort of his dormitory flashed in her mind. Her brows furrowed together as she looked at him more closely. He really did look exhausted. Hermione couldn't help the disproving purse of her lips as she wondered if that was the first time that Malfoy had slept all week. She glanced over her shoulder. All of the other tables were still full of anxious, irritable students. She turned back and chewed on her lip anxiously. He was asleep after all. It wasn't like he could cause any harm to her. Not that she was worried about such a thing, as the delightful memory of her hand slapping his cheek sprung to her mind. And if Hermione was quiet, she could make her notes and simply slip away. Merfa never had to know she was there. Her mind made up, she quietly slipped into the seat across from him and gently placed her back on the table her hand reaching in to pull out a roll of parchment and her quill and ink. Hermione had barely written a couple of bullet points before Harry's suspicion ran through her mind again. The idea of Malfoy being a Death Eater was laughable, yet, as a sickly, burning sensation bloomed in her stomach, Hermione couldn't help but think of poor Katie Bell's accident. Malfoy abandoning his prefect responsibilities when he'd taken great joy abusing them their previous school year, him barely showing up to any classes, even in patience, the one subject Hermione was sore to admit that he bested her in, a rarity she knew he took great pride in, it all appeared like Malfoy just couldn't bring himself to care anymore. Of course it didn't mean he was a Death Eater, for crying out loud. Perhaps he was depressed? Hermione looked over at his dark circles again. She knew that insomnia could trigger depression. It was much more plausible that Malfoy was just going through some stuff. His father was, rightfully so, carted off to Azkaban last summer, rather than him being the new recruited member of Voldemort. Even with her logic lecturing her in her mind, Hermione found herself glancing at the sleeve of his Oxford shirt. She squinted, trying to distinguish any sort of black ink underneath the fabric. Her hand crept towards his arm slowly. Hermione jolted, her brain catching up to her movements, and she scowled at her ridiculousness as she picked up her quill again. Her cheeks flamed at the realization she'd practically almost violated Malfoy in her sleep. The shame of her actions reignited her determination, and she promptly turned back to her notes. It was finally a few hours later, as the sun began to set, Hermione estimated it was somewhere around four in the evening that Malfoy awoke. Hermione jumped, her quill scratching through the parchment in her surprise as Malfoy sprang upwards. She was surprised at the flicker of pity she felt when she saw the terrified, panicked glaze of his eyes as he wildly glanced at his surroundings. Malfoy did double take when he saw just who was set opposite of him, and his left hand pulled at the sleeve of his shirt reflexively. Hermione's heart shuddered. What are you doing here, mudblood? he spat, and Hermione snickered inwardly at the way his voice cracked. 
Something akin to slick satisfaction spread across her back at the knowledge that she'd caught him off guard. Hermione simply stared at him coolly. I know you no longer seem to have an interest in education, Malfoy, but surely you can still recognize a library when you're in one. Malfoy sneered at her. I meant, what are you doing at this table? Was there not enough room anywhere else for you to squeeze that big, ugly, bushy hair of yours? Any lingering compassion she felt for his exhausted state quickly trickled away. No, there wasn't, Hermione said, and tapped her wand to fix a tear in her parchment. And I'm not finished yet, so either you leave, or you can go back to your precious beauty sleep and let me concentrate. She was surprised to see his cheeks prick with colour, as a pale hand lifted up to wipe away invisible drool from the side of his mouth. Watching me sleep, Granger? You know, I'd heard rumours about muggles being into kinky disturbed shit. I should have known your bedroom taste were as filthy as your blood. Merford tried to leer at her, but his jaw trembled as he tried to suppress a yawn, effectively ruining any venom his words had had. Oh, I can think of about a million things I do to you, Malfoy, and I can assure you not one of them falls into the realm of kinky, Hermione said as she smiled in a stickly sweet manner, trying to swallow the nausea at the idea of Malfoy being involved in anything intimate. She looked down at her parchment to hide her own blush that began to bloom across her face at that thought. When Malfoy didn't reply nor make any motion to leave for several minutes, she looked back up cautiously. She jumped slightly when her eyes met his. She hadn't even realized he was watching her. His eyes were tight and unreadable, his lips white as they pinched together, looking rather painful. Hermione rolled her eyes. Her quill slapped down onto the table as her patience snapped. For bloody sake, I didn't do anything to you, Malfoy. Hermione hoped that the blotchiness of her cheeks could have passed for anger, not embarrassment, as she remembered the way she had almost peeked under the sleeve of his shirt. Malfoy didn't look convinced. I'm supposed to just take your word for it. Merlin, Hermione half a pitiful laugh. It must be so miserable being a Slytherin, constantly paranoid that someone's out to get you. Malfoy's eyes flickered. With what, Hermione couldn't tell. Before they glazed over briefly, another yawn shuddering out of him before he could suppress it. That treacherous flicker of pity spiked on Hermione's chest again. I know you live in a dungeon all year round, but I imagine that there are beds in your dormitory, Malfoy, Hermione chided lightly. You might find it more beneficial to try to sleep there than in a public vicinity. You're no good to anyone if you drop down dead from sleep deprivation. Malfoy blinked and Hermione tried not to squirm under his pointed gaze as he gave her a thoroughly searching look. I'm sure you'd be all cut up about it, mudblood, Malfoy said, finally, his voice lacking any real venom and his shoulders still lightly slumped from fatigue. Malfoy's eyes looked her up and down in a final suspicious glance before he reached for his book bag from the seat next to him, slowly rising from his seat. Hermione's hand darted out before she could think twice. The both of them stared down at her hand on his in shock. She didn't know what shocked her more, the fact that she was touching Malfoy or that he hadn't cursed her hand off yet. Hermione supposed, in a sleep-deprived state, his reflexes weren't at their usual standards. Her tongue flicked out to wet at her lips nervously as she retracted her hand and dug around on her back for a few moments. I mean it, Malfoy. She looked up at him as she placed two ginger biscuits she'd smuggled in from the kitchens into his palm. You need to take care of yourself. Malfoy stared down at the biscuits in his hand, and then back at Hermione, his eyes wide and startled, like he was seeing her for the first time. Hermione's stomach flipped as she tried to smile. It came out as a grimace. They're not poisoned, but you're welcome to offer Parkinson a bite if you'd like to confirm that for yourself. Malfoy's lips twitched, and Hermione swallowed. Her tongue wet her lips again, before she repeated quietly, I mean it, Malfoy. You need to find the time to look after yourself. A bitter laugh escaped him, his hands pocketing the biscuits roughly. Malfoy grabbed his book bag as he threw Hermione one last, derisive sneer. I don't have time, Granger. Mrs. Malfoy was sitting in her office. Hermione was not dating the Malfoy heir, and Mrs. Malfoy was sitting in her office. Her lungs burned as she tried to remember how to breathe. Was it one inhale in, two exhales out, or maybe it was the other way around? Oh, Merlin, she was going to die of an asthma attack right in front of the Malfoy matriarch. Miss Granger? Narcissa greeted cordially, as if Hermione's face wasn't moments away from meeting the floor of her office face. You're looking well. As well as anyone could, when bombarded with a surprise visit from the mother of the man she was not dating. Mrs. Malfoy? Hermione nodded in accordance. Should she have curtsied? 
Was it improper for her to maintain eye contact? Her fingers stuck painfully into the skin of her palms to fight the urge to blush. As she realized this as I was sitting on the chair that Hermione had ridden her son silly on, not weeks prior. Hermione wasn't sure what was going to give out first, her heart or her lungs. Please have a seat. No need to be stood on my behalf. She was being invited to sit in her own office. Merlin, she needed to get a grip. Hermione cast a glance at the empty desk next to hers. Draco had oddly spent very little time in her office for the last couple of days. Hermione would go so far as to even say he was somewhat avoiding her. And she couldn't ignore the voice in her head that had pointed out it came as an awfully conveniently close timing to that afternoon at Ginny's. Perhaps Ginny had gotten in touch with Draco and he was equally baffled at Ginny's conspiracies. Hermione swallowed the bitter hurt at the idea that Draco was so offended that people thought that they were dating that he would even go so far to ignore Hermione at work. Of course, Hermione had dismissed Ginny's nonsense, but she had no intention of actually letting it affect her relationship, under the category of friends, of course, with Draco. Hermione felt Narcissa's patient eyes on her, and she startled, this time unsuccessful in holding back her heated cheeks. My apologies, Mrs. Malfoy. I was a million miles away. Your apologies are not necessary, Miss Granger. My husband was once a ministry man himself, as I'm sure you are aware, so I am quite used to the distracted conversational partner. Her words had no malice as she cast her eyes over the mounds of paperwork around Hermione's desk. Are you working on anything in particular at this time? Many congratulations on your cockatrice bill, Miss Granger. Hermione blinked. Oh, um, well, oh, yes, thank you. Please do call me Hermione. She searched her desk, hoping that any document would grab at her attention. She smiled limply, her paperwork failing at her. At the moment, I'm investigating March's complaints, specifically from the goblins at Gringotts. I found myself falling quite behind as of late. This is a hummed in polite interest. Although Hermione suspected the matriarch couldn't give a lick about the temperamental bankers. And of your mantical case, have you made progress with your appeal? Hermione blinked again, slightly taken aback. Oh, uh... She thumped through the folders on her desk. I know it's here somewhere where... Um, sorry, Miss Malfoy. Hermione looked back up at her, her brows knitted together in confusion. With all due respect, but how do you know about that? It had taken every connection Hermione had to keep the reports of a sabotage bill out of the newspaper. And the woman sat opposite from her was surely intelligent enough not to have to sneak Rita Skeeter as a close companion. Oh, Draco told me everything, Narcissa interrupted Hermione's thoughts. He said that you were dreadfully upset about it and wanted to know what his father does to cheer me up when I'm of similarly fragile state. Hermione frowned slightly. True, she had been angry and a little bit teary about the wizard not going behind her back, but she wouldn't have said that she was dreadfully upset, certainly not fragile. Draco wanted advice as to... To cheer me up? Hermione asked incredulously as her brain belatedly processed Narcissa's words. Yes, he was rather put out about the whole situation. Would you consider yourself an autumn or a winter, Miss Granger? Hermione tried not to squirm under Narcissa's inspective gaze, her eyes tracing over Hermione's body. I... what? My apologies for the prompt intrusion, but I'm sure you are aware that I did not come here to discuss deadly beasts. Hermione frowned at Narcissa's choice of words and opened her mouth to defend the creatures. They were far too intelligent to be labelled as bees, when, with a wordless flicker of her wand, Narcissa summoned a magical measuring tape, similar to the one the tailor from Hogsmeade had used when designing her jewel ball dress over a decade earlier. Hermione stared perplexed, before she remembered her conversation with Draco the other evening. Ah, right, the engagement party outfit. When Draco said he'd get his mother to sort it out, she'd assumed Narcissa would simply send her an outfit from Diagon Alley. She certainly didn't expect for his mother to show up to take her mighty sizing personally. A hand surreptitiously pressed against the softness of her stomach as she inwardly cursed a biscuit habit. Would you be so kind as to stand up for me and come this way, Miss Granger? She did so, in a best glance to her open office door as she checked to see if her assistant had returned from her lunch break. She hadn't. Hermione wasn't sure if she was relieved that the office gossip wasn't there to witness Draco's mother paying Hermione a personal visit, or annoyed that she couldn't get madly to make up an emergency meeting for her to escape to. Narcissa stepped towards her, the tape flittering beside her head. 
and Hermione internally grimaced as it reminded her of Rita Skeeta and her blasted quick notes quill, a contemplative look on her graceful features. Hmm. I would say you are more of an autumn. It's a pity. Draco is a true winter. Do you have a colour preference? Um, periwinkle, I guess? Hermione felt like she was back in divination class with the woolly theory of it all. Like there was such a thing as a correct colour for her skin. If she liked something, she wore it. Hermione's eyes twitched as she tried not to look imploringly towards the paperwork on her desk. Narcissa's mouth twitched in amusement, not unlike that of which Hermione had seen on Draco's face many a time. And Hermione's spine was tight with horror at the idea that Narcissa might be a legalemans. Hermione looked down towards her feet, her cheeks flushed. Yes, well, I think we should go with a colour that will not wash out that lovely complexion of yours. But I will keep that in mind, Narcissa added courteously the pair of them knowing well enough that she would not. I will ask our family seamstress to keep a record of your measurements, Narcissa said some uncomfortably twenty minutes later, after she had finished moving Hermione's limbs around like a raggedy doll. Oh no, that won't be necessary, thank you, but I can't really see an occasion where I'd need something tailor-made for me again. Especially not by the Malfoy seamstress, she added on mentally. Narcissa smirked. Well, at least Hermione knew where Draco had inherited that look from. A Malfoy is always prepared for anything, Miss Granger, Narcissa said simply, the tape disappearing with another fluid wave of her wand. It appeared that Narcissa had mastered the artful aristocratic air of polite indifference, but after two years of working in close contact with her son, Hermione easily recognized the minute glint to Narcissa's eyes, a small glimmer of satisfaction that hinted that Narcissa had gotten whatever it was she had been looking for, and Hermione had her sneaking suspicion that it wasn't her measurements. Hermione was ready to throw the heart back in her hands at Draco. Would you just let me buy it for you, you, you chauvinist? I'm a chauvinist because I'd rather spend my own money. You are if you think you're too proud to let me spend mine. Granger, I, it's just a bloody book. Ow! Hermione had thwacked the book against his arm. Exactly, you buy me books all the time. What's the problem with me doing the same for you? Draco rolled his eyes. If I let you buy all the books you ever wanted to read, you'd have no money to pay for your rent. And then just where would you and that monster you call a pet live then? Hmm? I suppose you could always use your books to build a fort. If ye let me? Hermione hissed, her eyes narrowed into slits. Draco snatched the book out of her hands and held it high above his head. He smirked when she jumped, her chest brushing against his as she inwardly cursed her short limbs. His other hand snaked around her waist, pulling her hips towards his. Her jumps faltered, her breath quickened slightly, when his hand squeezed her hip before coming up to tuck playfully at her plate. Now, now, watch the temper, Granger. We are in public. He hummed a pantomime glance around the bookshop before he returned to grin at her salaciously. Of course, you're more than welcome to take out your frustration in a different way. Should I check if the leaky cauldron has a spare room? Hermione swallowed as her never quivered, her tongue wetting her lips nervously. She felt a lick of white-hot heat ooze up her spine when Draco watched her movement. The pupils of his eyes expanded slightly, and his lips lightly parted, and her heart stammered against her ribcage. Ginny's words raced through her mind. You'd have to be blind not to see how crazy he is over you. Her eyes widened at her traitorous thoughts, and she jolted back hoping that her skull covered up the quiet gasp that escaped her. Fine, she said, resisting the urge to stick out her tongue in a childish sneer. Go buy your stupid book, then. Hermione turned on her heel, ignoring Draco's snort of amusement, and walked over to a display where the sole shop assistant was placing the last book. An amused smirk was on the young employee's face. He looked barely out of Hogwarts as he looked between the pair of them, no doubt having overheard their little spat. Shall I help you with that, sir? The shop assistant asked Draco, giving Hermione a wink as he walked past her to head to the checkout till. Hermione stared at the blurb of the new paperback, only half registering what the book was about as she focused on her breathing, her irritation settling down and relief really rushed over her. At least Draco had stopped ignoring her now. When she'd arrived at her desk this morning, inwardly scowling when she wasn't greeted by a pale, pointy-faced aristocrat, his desk empty for the fourth day in a row, she had made the plan to storm his office at lunchtime. If he wasn't going to come to her, it was such a silly nonsensical, not to mention incorrect theory, by a heavily pregnant friend, 
then she would go to him. She had been fantasizing for the third time about dragging him out of his office by his silly locks when there had been a knock at the door around eleven that morning. She jumped and huffed in irritation when she realized she had wasted a whole morning daydreaming about Draco. Said man was at her door and had had the gall to casually ask her if she wanted to join him on a little venture to Diagon Alley during their lunch break, so that he could pick up a book. As if he hadn't been ignoring her existence for the past three days. I know that books fill you up more than actual food, Granger. Come and join the world of the socialized for an hour. Draco had spent the entire journey on the way to the bookshop, complaining about the resurgence of the half-empire clan up in Durham, that he really didn't want to have to go back and deal with being propositioned by Kinkleberry for another month straight. It had been an empty, endless stream of conversation. Hermione hummed and ahed at the right moments, pointedly ignoring the subtle, scrutinizing side glances Draco had sent her way as they walked side by side. His knuckles had brushed against hers too many times for Hermione to consider it accidental, and she offhandedly wondered if this was considered a date. Hermione shook her head and tossed the book back onto the display table. Ginny's ridiculous idea had invaded her mind like weeds, and she'd barely been able to focus on anything else all week. Again, the absurd notion that Hermione had somehow been dating Draco, that Draco was crazy about her, and she hadn't even noticed. Hermione's laugh was like poison in her mouth. She turned on her heel away from the display and her preposterous thoughts and headed towards the till. Hermione's steps halted, a brick falling in her stomach as Draco's conversation with the store assistant reached her ears. Your bird is quite a little spitfire. I bet she has a handful in the bedroom, am I right? The employee's knowing grin stuttered as Draco, from the angle that Hermione could see, turned a cold glare at him. She shivered. He looked so much like the harsh boy of her teen years. She had forgotten how chilling he could be. If you'd like to keep your job, you won't say another word, and you'll beg that for me. Draco pointed at the book on the desk before his back stiffened almost imperceptibly. His head whipped to the side, and she noticed a slight gleam of panic flicker in his eyes before his face melted into an open, casual expression. What? No books caught your eyes? My, my, this must be a first. Should I notify the prophet? The smack didn't reach his eyes, and she almost missed the way his eyes flitted back to the shop assistants, cautious, defensive. Hermione's smile felt awkward and unfamiliar, like she was wearing somebody else's face, as she walked towards the desk, taking the back from the shaky hands of the employee. Our lunch hours are messed up. She prompted and cocked her head to the store entrance. Draco just nodded, not even sparing the teen behind the desk another glance as he stalked out of the bookshop. They walked to the apparition point in silence, and as Hermione focused on picturing the marble flooring of the ministry, her mind was racing with the conversation she'd overheard, and more specifically, Draco's reaction to the employee's rather inappropriate comment. Whilst he had rather admirably defended her honour by threatening the crew teenager with his livelihood, there was one thing Hermione hadn't failed to notice, when she'd be charmingly referred to as his bird, the brick in her stomach was positively leaked. Draco hadn't denied it. Hermione smacked the folder onto her desk with a huff and shoved her face into her hands. She only had until the end of the day to complete the final checks on her cockatrice bill before it was sent off to be officially written into the Wisingamot law, and she still had 23 pages of reading to analyse and compare against her initial proposal. She had less than seven hours to complete three days' worth of work and all she could think about was Draco. His knuckles brushing against hers, his sexy, wry smirk when he had asked her to dinner last August, his possessive arm around her waist when they slept, the nervous, panicked look in his eye when that teenager had called her his girlfriend, Ginny implying that their stupid, wonderful trip to Greece was an anniversary holiday. Hermione's head throbbed, and burning tears of frustration leaked between her fingers. She did not have time to be stressing over such silly nonsense, and she cursed her brain's need to overanalyze every single piece of information ever given to her. Why was Hermione thinking about this so much? At the beginning of the week, she had fully intended to let Saturday's conversation trickle away from her memory. And yet somehow, her mind had clawed its grip into the idea, and it boomed like devil's snare throughout every crevice in her body slowly smothered any rebuttal, any logical explanation she could grasp at. There's no way, Hermione muttered to herself. Draco wouldn't do that to me. And did something happen with Mr. Malfoy? Hermione startled and wheezed out a curse as her spine snapped upwards. Madly, her assistant stood in front of her desk, 
She hadn't even heard her enter the room. Laura, she gasped, a hand clutching at her chest. Please remember to knock before you enter my office. Medley pursed her lips slightly, her brows furrowed together in concern. I did knock, Miss Granger, twice. I managed to track down Mr. Wick's previous complaint submissions to our department and wanted to give you this. She handed over a thin manila folder. You were right, it had been dismissed without a singular inquiry into his claims. Hermione thanked her quietly and placed a folder next to her legislation pile. Another case she had fallen behind on this week. Medley glanced at the empty desk next to hers. Are you and Mr. Malfoy can, Miss Granger? She asked and cocked her chin towards the empty desk. He hasn't been in this office a week. Did you two have an argument or something? It's, it's just, I think, this is the first time in almost a year that he hasn't brought you lunch. Her vision dotted as all of the blood drained from her face. I, I'm sorry? Hermione blinked slowly, hoping she was just reading into Medley's words a little too much. No such luck. It would be just a real shame if something had happened. I, I know it's not my place to say this. I know the two of you were trying to keep things quiet. I mean, if there's a lesson to be learned about poor Daphne. Oh, she's got a new boyfriend, finally. It's that office relations can be quite tricky. Medley shrugged. But the two of you, you're good together. My apologies if I'm overstepping, miss. Hermione held up her hand, and her heart pounded against her chest. Stop. Just, just stop talking, Laura. Her throat was dry, like sawdust, and she swallowed. She nodded at a thin folder her assistant had handed her and smiled tightly. I don't have time to sit here and discuss my my relationship with Mr. Malfoy. I'm too far behind on my reading as it is. She tilted her chin towards the door, silently dismissing her assistant. Please, can you contact Mrs. Rutheridge and cancel my meeting this afternoon? Tell her I apologize profusely, but I can't afford to miss the deadline. Hermione waited until Madly had closed the door behind her before she let out a rapt exhale. She must have been experiencing some sort of frequency illusion. How many people had suddenly thought she and Draco were dating? The muggle expression Dad always quoted to her when she was a child went through her mind. A mindset that had helped her discover the truth about dear Professor Lupin's condition back in her third year. Remember, Hermione? Once an accident, twice a coincidence, three times a pattern. Ginny, the teenager from the bookstore, and now her assistant. Hermione shook her head, denial angry and blazing in her chest. She couldn't have been that oblivious. Could she? February 2006, Royce. I didn't think it was possible to get sunburned in the winter, Drake. Hermione teased, her shoulders still shaking from laughter as she pointed out that the lobster that he was eating was a lovely matching shade to his nose. Draco scolded her and flicked a droplet of garlic butter in her direction. You're in no position to make comments, Granger. I can barely see the ocean behind that lion's mane of yours. You know, the humidity charm is only second year level. He paused to leer at her salaciously. It would be my pleasure to tutor you when we get back to the villa tonight, if you'd like. Hermione ran a hand through her curl self-consciously, and turned her attention back to the swordfish on her plate, her cheeks flushing. Petty git, she mumbled to herself as she stabbed at a baby potato with her fork. Can't even handle a little ribbing. Should let him spend an evening with George, see how he handles. She shoved the potato into her mouth. Her cheeks stuffed and her bottom lip pouted slightly. She was very aware of Draco silently watching her eat for the next few minutes. She blent the chilly February air for the way that she shivered when her eyes met his. Contemplative, yet warm. Did you enjoy the convention? Draco asked after she forcibly swallowed her last bite of asparagus. A little too al dente for her taste. Her eyes crinkled as she beamed at him, her hair sparking against her shoulder blades when she nodded enthusiastically. It was wonderful, she said, her teeth gnawing on her lips. I thank you for getting us the tickets, Draco. I don't know how to repay you. She poked at a flake of swordfish, shining. The delightful melody from the string band twirled and danced in the air surrounding them. As Draco tilted his head, his lips slightly pursed in contemplation. You could dance with me, Draco offered. I can what? Hermione blinked at him dumbly. Dance with me? He cocked his head towards the private balcony beside their table. A breathtakingly stunning view overlooking the again sea. Hermione looked around the restaurant, shockingly empty despite it being a Saturday night, with a shy, cautious glance. This is hardly the place. Consider it a late birthday present as well, if you'd like. Hermione quirked a brow. Your birthday was seven months ago. An early one, then. 
Draco grinned, picking up his napkin from his lap to rest next to his dinner plate. He stood up, his thighs gloriously defined through well tailored grey trousers, as he circled the table slowly. He held out a hand to her. I promise not to step on your toes like that oaf crumb, he smirked when Hermione shot him a warning glare as she clasped her hands together. Victor was a perfectly capable dancer, thank you very much. Her chin cocked in the air, miffed, as he escorted them towards the balcony. A tremble danced across her spine as a strong, sturdy arm pulled her close to him, barely has distance between their chests. Hermione's hand shook slightly when she placed it on his shoulder. Her tongue wet her bottom lip and Draco's eyes darkened as he tracked the movement, his hand tightened briefly on her hips. Feel free to make comparison notes, Granger, Draco murmured as he began expertly leading her through a slow waltz and perfect timing to the melody from the restaurant. At some point between the second and third song, Hermione's head found itself resting at the nook of Draco's shoulder, and as Draco's chin turned to rest against her head as they swayed, she couldn't help but think of how perfectly her body fit into his. Later that night, Draco brought her over the edge again and again, until she was a limp mess in his strong, secure embrace. His lips mapped across every inch of her skin, sweet, empty nothing spilling from his lips as he clamped her body over and over. Draco mouthed something inaudibly against her shoulder, pausing to kiss across her collarbone every so often, and Hermione gasped and backed with every precise shift of his hips. His mouth covered hers hotly as he followed her in a shared, soul-scorching release. Her name never sounded quite as beautiful as it did when falling from his gaping lips. Hermione found herself limply being pulled back into Draco's arms after he slipped out of her, with his hot, exhausted pants wet against her hair. She could feel his heartbeat race as she rested against her sweaty chest. Draco's fingertips painted invisible patterns against her back, and Hermione's eyes widened in surprise as a treacherous voice whispered from the back of her mind how badly she wanted to stay in that moment in his arms forever. There were three things Hermione was sure of. One, she would never let George Weasley babysit her children. Two, red wine definitely went best with tomato pasta. And three, and three, that she was definitely not dating Draco Malfoy. And yet, as she looked around the living room, at a green velvet ottoman she didn't remember purchasing, the 14th century wizarding text on her bookshelves, the hideous and obnoxiously ostentatious grandfather clock that could only belong to a Malfoy. She pictured the toothbrush next to hers on the bathroom counter, and it wasn't even the cheap emergency gas toothbrush she would purchase from her mother's supermarket, the old Slytherin Quidditch jersey she regularly tripped over in her bedroom, and the mint chocolate chip ice cream in her freezer, a flavor Hermione absolutely abhorred, but that a particular pale, pointy-faced aristocrat set across from her had a tragic fondness for her. And it's as if the floodgates opened up in her mind, dozens of memories lighting up like stray lumos charms. Parkinson's invitation with Hermione's name personally embroidered in navy blue silk and delivered to her personally because she was the quickest way of passing along the notice. Crookshank's wine as Draco refused to let him into their bed. Draco's name in jet black ink on her contract form as her emergency contact. Draco setting up the wards in a flat night after night. Narcissa taking Hermione's measurements in her office because Draco said he would have his mother sort it out for them, and it being a true shame that Hermione and Draco's colour palette didn't line up. Draco asking his mother how his father would cheer her up, his wife, because he didn't like seeing Hermione so upset over the Wizengamot's backstabbing. It's his arm around hers as they explored the beautiful side of Greece, the soft kiss at the back of her neck every morning at night, him rocking her gently back and forth in his arms after she'd contacted him, and it dawned on Hermione that she hadn't even thought twice about it when Crookshanks was ill and holding her as she cried all night long. It's his private smile whenever she finished the lunches he prepared for her, a smile that she saw almost every day for nearly a year. It was Harry's voice, genuine and open, surprised and confused as to why she hadn't brought Draco to a private, loved ones only event on bonfire night. It was Dorothy's wistful sigh as she lamented wanting her boyfriend to be as attentive as Draco. It was the shop assistant, an amused, knowing grin on his face as he bantered with Draco about his spitfire bird. It was Ginny, pleading, but firm as she insisted, her mind had to be blind not to see how he felt about her. And it's as if the veil of a notice me not charm had been lifted from her eyes. All of these moments that had been practically screaming in her face for a whole year, and Jenny was right, Hermione had been blind to it all. She hadn't known a damn thing, 
Hermione had been so focused on her work, angrily shoving away any distracting thoughts she had had over her growing feelings for her co-worker, the guilt that she had felt towards her cases. Whenever she found herself drifting off into fantasy, the jealousy, Hermione now acknowledged it to be, when Draco was cozying up to that inappropriate healer at St. Mungo's, the way she had to bite her lip to hold back her tears whenever sex with Draco got a little too intimate. She had spent months exhausting herself, denying her true feelings, and using that guilt to fuel her fight for her cases. And Draco had been there through it all. The annoying smirks, the private grins, the glint in his eyes whenever he cracked a joke about her not having time. Because it was a joke, wasn't it? But Hermione gave her blood, sweat and tears, quite literally in the medical case, into a job insistent on the fact that she couldn't afford to have any distractions, convincing herself that she didn't have the time to date anyone. Draco had slithered his way through the cracks, manipulating her life to ensure he got what he wanted anyway. A Malfoy is always prepared for anything, Miss Granger. Narcissa's silken tone echoed through her. Hermione exhaled shakily and barely registered her book slipping through her shaken fingers onto her lap as the overwhelming and consuming painful truth that Draco had indeed betrayed her trust and lied to her for over a year hit her. She felt like her heart was being trampled on by a herd of centaurs, and he was just sat there reading the Quidditch schools, oblivious to the anguish that was obliterating every cell in her body, her chest burning as if she had drank an entire barrel of Boober Tuba pus, Hermione turned to him with narrowed, accusing eyes. Malfoy, she said, her voice cried with barely concealed rage. Realizing that it had been almost a year since she had last called him that, after he looked up at her in confusion. Are we dating? Like pouring fire whiskey onto the raging flames of anger in her chest, Draco had the nerve to only look mildly sheepish. Chapter 7. Hermione leapt to her feet. I cannot believe you! Hermione, Draco started, a pacifying hand reached for her. His eyes were wide, the faintest glassy sheen of panic crept into them, and his face paled with worry. Good, you should be afraid, you bastard. Don't you, Hermione, me, you absolute prick! You lied to me! She spat as she smacked his hand away from her. Her heart hammered against her chest, a suffocating, searing pain that married perfectly with the acidic rage that was boiling in her stomach. How, how, how could you? I can't believe you. You complete ass, Draco Malfoy. The room seemed to close in on her, too small to hold all the rage she felt seeing through every fibre of her being. The last 14 months of her life, violated and manipulated by his interference. Merlin had even made her friends lie to her, hadn't he? She shook, her hands balled into fists and she swallowed hard to force down the nausea she felt as the last step of betrayal. Her own friends had let him do this to her. How could she have been so stupid? How long had he planning on dating her with Hermione in the dark? Despair clawed at her throat at the sudden thought that maybe he had never intended for her to find out. Maybe he had just wanted to trial a relationship without any of the strings that came attached with it, and then he would simply drop her like a hot potato when he grew bored. Or, perhaps even more painfully, or perhaps more painfully, he had used her as a practice run for when he was ready to marry a beautiful, tall, pure-blood witch, as he was no doubt expected to, as one of the heirs of the Sacred Twenty-Eight. A sob escaped her throat, her chest seizing in protest at the image in her mind. Draco and his elegant wife standing at the altar and Hermione drowning in paperwork at her desk, alone. Her hand grasped at the skin of her chest, trying to relieve the pressuring ache that was building, and Draco was up from the couch and in front of her in a blink of an eye. His hands cupped her cheeks gently, but firm in their comfort. Breathe, Hermione, just breathe, Draco murmured, and his forehead lowered towards hers. Hermione ripped away from him, and every betraying cell in her body screamed at her in protest. Don't touch me! She hissed and moved to stand across the room. I don't even want to look at you. You're just, just utterly loathsome. You complete foul. She shook her head. So for the couch and the table between them, Hermione crossed her arms as she looked at him with utter disbelief and scorn. Did you really think you could just date me without me knowing? 
that I wouldn't notice. Did, did you really think you'd get away with it? The pain expression that had been on his face quickly blinked into an empty smirk. Hermione recognized it as the one he would use whenever he was hurt inside. I have quite successfully, Draco said, for the last 14 months or so. Funny, Hermione sneered. Only I seem to remember rejecting you at three separate occasions, and last I checked, a relationship requires consent from both parties. She knew it was cruel throwing it in his face, her rejections, but in that moment she didn't care. She wanted him to hurt as much as she did. Draco just smirked again, his eyes dark and glinting, like he knew exactly what she was thinking. He probably does, a treacherous voice whispered in her mind. Technically, you said no to these three particular dates, not me. Her smug grin was insufferable. You are not getting out of this because of semantics, she said through clenched teeth. Her hair sparked and she had to dig her fingernails into her palms as her wrist twitched towards her wand that rested on the side table. She would not give him the satisfaction of her hexing him and him then gaining the upper ground on this. You knew damn well what I meant, Draco. Forgive me if I'm wrong, Granger, but you were the one jumping on me whenever you had the chance in the beginning, he shrugged. Awfully mixed signals for a bloke. For someone who said they didn't have the time, you certainly managed to squeeze me in. And the double entendre was not lost on her as he threw her a lascivious sneer. Some might say you even had all night long on some occasions. Hermione blushed, a betraying lick of arousal brushed at her navel as he stared at her heatedly. He lifted up a hand and started to count on his fingers. You had time for that runes exhibit, not to mention that cheeky romp in the cloakroom afterwards. You had time for the reading of that bloody book you always had your head stuck in at Hogwarts. And you had time to teach me to cook every Friday evening for a year. And you've had the time dining with both of your friends, not to mention when you're trying to not have a stroke whenever the Wonder Twins and I play a game of Quidditch. Quidditch is an insanely dangerous sport, Hermione glared at him. Draco grinned at her and tapped at his temple. Oh, I'm well aware. As a sealer, what's her face? He paused to throw a knowing look. Shelley, Hermione bristled and gritted her teeth as the healer's twinkling laugh danced through her mind. Whatever, Draco dismissed, as if the encounter had been irrelevant for him. As if Hermione hadn't almost reported to healer from her practice, her shorty stitching charms as a result of being too busy groping Draco's thighs. As if Hermione hadn't practically given herself a stomach ulcer in her seething jealousy. And Draco hadn't even remembered the healer's name. Draco huffed out a shaky laugh and looked at her imploringly. Relationships are like one of your bloody proposals, Granger. Not everything needs to be so backbreaking, exhaustingly planned out and analysed. I would like to have the option of figuring that out by my own choice, Draco. Hermione exclaimed and threw her hands in the air. Her frustration vibrated through every nerve in her body. You! She jabbed her finger towards him. You took that choice away from me. Don't you understand that? You've practically violated me by making that decision for me. How could you ever think for one minute that I'd be okay with that? She laughed scornfully before continuing. Hey, <laughs> this is just classic old school Malfoy, isn't it? taking whatever you want without giving a damn about someone else's feelings. I bet you probably had a right laugh about it last year when you managed to scratch no it all Granger's notch onto your bedpost. Don't assume you know how I feel, Granger, Draco snapped back, his expression suddenly cold and his eyes narrowed in warning. You can call me every name under the sun. Hex me if it'll bloody make you feel any better, but don't you dare undermine my feelings for you. Oh, I'm sorry, Hermione cooed. Her lips dropped into a pout as she battered her lashes. And did I cross some sort of boundary for you there? What a shame, I have no idea how that feels right about now. Draco threw his hands up in the air. If his eyes were the killing curse, she was sure the ceiling would have been six feet under by now. What is the difference? Please explain it to me, Granger. In going to all of these events, letting your swatchy little brain soak up all the knowledge it desires, before us coming home and you fucking me stupid on a concrete bed of ours. Hermione's heart stuttered at the notion that Draco considered her flat his, their home. She swallowed dryly as Draco continued on, his own frustrations flying out of him, and Hermione wondered just how long he had been waiting for them to have this conversation. Fourteen months, probably, she thought bitterly. 
and just looking back on it after the fact as a rather enjoyable date. Why is that such an unfeasible idea for you? Draco stared hard at her. His brows furrowed together, his eyes honed in on her like a viper. Tell me, Granger, because I'm curious. Is the concept of actually dating me that's pissed you off so royally, or that you think I lied to you? You lied to me, she spat. Draco carried on as if she hadn't spoken. You're all for jumping into my lap several days of the week. You were the one to invite me round here every bloody week for crying out loud. I held you in my arms all night whilst you cried over your cat. I watched you practically poison yourself to death with those revolting biscuits of yours because your wonderfully stubborn backside doesn't understand the concept of a decent break. I, Merlin Granger, you said that you needed me. Am I supposed to just, what? Not want something more meaningful? Fuck, for, for fuck's sake, it's just... His hands gripped at his hair for a moment. His knuckles white and shaky before he dragged them heavily across his cheek. Is the idea of being in a relationship with me really so disturbing to you? Relationships are about trust. Every syllable fell from her lip in derision, and she glared at him in utter contempt. What, like being your emergency contact? Drake a bit back without missing a beat. Or calling me when Crookshanks was ill? Letting me take care of you all week after that fucking manticore savaged you? She huffed, and he threw a glare, as if daring her to argue. How about letting me set your bloody wards every night? Does none of that equate to trust? Hermione fought her, and her shoulders curved in sheepishly. She had done all of those things, hadn't she? And not once had she thought twice about it, and it was like a fresh wave of anguish over her when she realized. To her, trusting Draco Malfoy was as easy and effortless as breathing. But at that moment, her lungs were full of sand dust. Draco's unwavering look smothered her, so she turned her head and watched as the pendulum rocked back and forth on the grandfather clock. She had never noticed just how grand and out of place the Malfoy antique looked next to all of her quaint, humble furniture, and she internally laughed miserably at the irony. The minute hand passed by, the ticking loud and heavy as it filled the distance between them. Hermione kept watching the clock. Draco kept watching her. Why didn't you ever say anything? Hermione whispered eventually when the clock signaled the new hour some ten minutes later. Her lashes fluttered in their desperation to hold back tears. Draco was quiet for a moment longer, evidently taking the time to choose his next words carefully. I told you, two years ago, Granger, I had all the time in the world to wait. She turned her head and looked at him. Despite her anger, Hermione couldn't help the way that her heart clenched at how his shoulders had drooped and a limp, self-deprecating smile that ghosted his lips. Since we're going down memory lane, I also remember you telling me so very aptly that my creatures were not as lucky. Draco's bark laugh was short, bitter. He looked down at his fist and scuffed his heel into the carpet. <laughs> if I'd have known how much those words were going to bite me in the arse, I would have never said them. Set tilt back up, great eyes piercing and unfaltering as they met hers. But that doesn't change the fact I'd wait forever for you, Hermione. Hermione gasped out a shaky breath, and she couldn't tell if she shook her head because of his declaration, or had a gnawing demon in her chest that urged her to throw herself in his arms. Her arms tightened against her stomach in an attempt to ground herself. That's not healthy. She couldn't help but whimper. Draco's eyes were warm with fondness, but his face was positively sacked with resignation as he shrugged at her. Not the first time I've been told that. He gave no further elaboration. Hermione didn't ask. It was Draco's turn to look away, his jaw clenched. The corners of his eyes were tight, pained, and his posture was rigid. Hermione wondered if he had interpreted her concern as another rejection. His hands trembled almost imperceptibly before it quickly tightened into a fist. She couldn't escape the cloud of sorrow and guilt as memories of the same expression reeled in her mind. Every time she had called him her colleague, her co-worker, her friend, that night after her cockatrice trial, when, in twisted irony, Hermione had thought that she'd almost crossed the boundaries of professionalism. She'd confessed with a slip of her tongue how relieved she was that he had returned, and had practically stumbled over herself to insist that she meant at work. How many times had Hermione unintentionally rejected him outside of his dinner invitations? How many times whilst she had punished herself for her feelings by throwing herself into her work, 
he had stood by and watched her turn her back on any sort of possibility that they could be so much more. When they would make love have sex, and Hermione felt as if his soul was intertwining with his, as her mind begged and pleaded with her to make him stay there forever. As she would tell herself, the tears burning up her eyes were simply from raw pleasure, and not the way she felt utterly consumed by him, with his head buried in her neck. Or when he begged her to look at him, his face open with sheer awe and unguarded pleasure. The way he had, only minutes earlier, practically spat at her when she insinuated that he didn't care for her, as if she'd greatly offended him by insulting her own naiveties. Had it all hurt him in the same way she felt in that moment? Like a part of her soul had been ripped from her. Another wave of despair washed over her, and her money couldn't tell if it was directed towards herself or the man standing across from her. Don't do that, he snapped, his head whipping back to hers. His expression was pinched, anguished, and he tried to glare at her, but it lacked any real venom. Don't look at me like I'm some, some ruddy piss poor pity case, like one of your oppressed creatures. I'm not. It's not. He shook his head, and his lips pursed in a strangled wince. He sighed, and his shoulders dropped again. I knew what I was getting myself into, Granger. Don't use that beautiful, bushy head of yours to try and twist this to fit your griff into a matrodom. You all seem to bloody hell. I knew damn well what I was doing. The room was silent as she absorbed his words for a few minutes. Why would he put so much effort into a relationship he knew couldn't be reciprocated fully? Why would he willingly give so much of himself to her when he knew her mind he wasn't available, wasn't aware that she needed to give something back? How could he lie next to her night after night, knowing that she considered him to be nothing more than a friend, at least in his mind? Her temper throbbed. Why me? Hermione couldn't hold back the question any longer. Why would he make himself suffer so much over her? Her hand cut the softness of her stomach. She had poor eating habits. She had quite a little spiteful streak. She was stubborn. She had horrendous posture. She straightened up and her spine groaned in response. She couldn't stand other people making decisions for her. Why not you? Draco asked back and looked at her with a frown like she had something absurd. Her heartbeat was an untamable, erratic thumping against her chest, and she exhaled slowly, a vain attempt to claw back her control against her betraying body. Hermione swallowed, her throat suddenly very dry, and quickly flicked her eyes to the out-of-place furniture, away from his eyes filled completely with an emotion Hermione didn't want to understand. The Ottoman? Crookshanks had scratched a naughty old one to death, rightfully so. It was hideous. Hermione shot him a look before pointing across the room. The Grandfather Club. You said you needed a new one. Right, so naturally I had to have one of your family's antiques? Well, they are the best. Hermione's tongue flicked against her moglas in irritation. And what about Greece? Draco snorted. <laughs> I'm honestly amazed you didn't cotton on at that point, Granger. I mean, come on now. He threw her a look, his eyebrows raised in mild disbelief. My family's private villa, really? Hermione glared at him. Were you ever planning on saying something, or what? Were you just going to wait for me to clue in whilst I was walking down the aisle in some, some Parkinson house elf wedding gown? A parkin what? Hermione waved her hand dismissively. Never mind, just... Were you really hoping I'd stay in the dark forever? Well, I was hoping when the third or fourth grandchild popped out, you might begin to have an inkling that something was up, Draco drawled. She had definitely sucked in oxygen way too fast, Hermione thought, when she bent over, knuckles white as they gripped at her shaking knees. She saw Draco's shoes appear in front of her, and his hands hovered barely an anxious kiss distance from her arms. Granger, fuck, that was a joke. His voice was strained. Hermione barked out a laugh of disbelief. <laughs> a joke? I've known we've apparently been in a year-long relationship for less than an hour, and you're settled down enough to think about our grandchildren. She spat the last word out as she straightened up, dodging his steadying hands as she moved backwards towards the couch. She spun on her heels and rolled her eyes in a snide mocking. Let me guess, you know our children's names too? No, Draco replied quickly, too quickly. His eyes darted to focus on the bookshelf behind her, his cheeks flushed pink, her jaw dropped. You, she began breathlessly, you know our children's names? Her head spun, and she looked him up and down with a hesitant disdain. 
Please don't say it, Severus. Jacob's nose crunched up in disgust. I know it's unseemly to speak ill of the dead, but who would willingly call their child dead? Point to Jenny Weasley, she thought, whilst a wave of relief sacked over her, and she dropped back down on the couch, her limbs heavy. She felt utterly drained. Hermione sunk into the bedrest of the couch and thumped at a freight thread in between the seat cushions. Crookshanks really did ravage a lot of the furniture as she tried to swim through the sluggish thoughts in her mind. How blind she had been! How far down in her own deep state of denial for her own feelings she must have been to be so stupidly ignorant to what had been a glaring neon light right in front of her. It had always been there, every kiss, every morning battle with her cat, every lunchbox, and she couldn't take her eyes off of work long enough to notice the oddities of it all. I'm so stupid, she whispered, broken. Her voice was thick and watery. Ginny, Harry, Ron, even bloody Dorothy knew you before I did. A shaky hand wiped away the furious tears that began to stream down her cheeks. You've humiliated me. Her voice cracked at the end, and a pain-strangled wee sounded out from across from her. How was Hermione supposed to show her face in work, all the while knowing half of her bloody department had clued in before she had? Any time she had been in a good mood, any time she had been stressed or upset, did they all think it was because of Draco? All of those hours he spent in her office bringing her lunch every day, she couldn't help but wonder what they must have all thought. Poor Hermione Granger, so incompetent at her own job she practically needed a babysitter. It was like her sense of self had been ripped from her skin, and she had never felt more vulnerable. Why didn't you just talk to me? Hermione pleaded with despair to the thick, heavy atmosphere of the room. She refused to look at him. Hermione wasn't sure that she could trust herself to look at him. Would you have listened to me? Draco sounded resigned, and Hermione cast her gaze to the floor. She envisioned modes of white paperwork around her desk her own voice echoing in her mind from all the times she had told him she was too busy. No, she probably wouldn't have listened to him, she swallowed bitterly. Draco kneeled before her, his eyes wild with pleading desperation. Hermione, he said quietly, as a placating thumb traced circles on her knee. And she didn't know if it was the way he said her name, or maybe if the thought had slowly slithered its way to the front of her mind. But her name in silken navy blue flashed in her memory. Theon Penzi, they know everything, don't they? Jacob didn't answer her, but Hermione hadn't needed him to, and she felt the acidic nausea of humiliation burn within her again. Her anger like a rejuvenation portion, Hermione leapt back to her feet and glared down at Draco, still on his knees, with as much venom as she could muster. I bet that must have been really entertaining for the three of you when we sat with them for those dinners, she said with a bitter drool. Poor stupid Swatty Granger, too busy blabbering away about protecting her beasts, and she can't even see what's right in front of her. Not much faith for the Visingamod, is it? Oh, no wonder she needs our precious pure blood money. Draco stood back up and stepped in close dangerously close to her. He inhaled and she quivered as his chest brushed against hers, the fury in her stomach smothered by that little demon that begged her to close the distance between them. Hermione had to stare at their feet as not to let her eyes flutter shut as the intoxicating scent of apples and cedar would seductively weaved through her senses. I told you before, Granger, it's not like that. He reached up to play with her hair. She didn't know why she let him. A hand glided through her curls, and he stared at his fingers, as if mesmerized. It's like you're in my skin, Granger, he confessed. You've got me wrapped around your little finger. He twisted a curl around his finger and watched and tranced as it sprung back into place when he let it go. Her face burned as she felt her searing grey eyes glide over her features. A gentle tuck of her hair, and then one of his hands cupped her cheek. His thumb brushed away a leftover tear. Say you'll be mine, Hermione. His voice was barely above a whisper, and his forehead leaned down to rest against hers. His nose nudged her softly, and her heart positively wept. We can be so good together, baby, please. You can be mad at me for as long as you want, as long as you need. Just please, just give us a chance. His other hand reached to tilt up her chin, 
The money's chest sinking into his. Every fragment of her muscles melted into his embrace when he leaned in. His lips brushed against hers. Stop! Nay, just, just stop! Hermione gasped as she ripped herself out of his arms again. Her nerves were raw and frayed as she stared at him with wide eyes. You can't just say those things and then kiss me and expect everything to be okay. Draco, I... You can't. Hermione shook her head. And then again, and now once more. You... You can't. Her throat closed over on a sob and she held out her hand in defense as Draco pleadingly reached for her. You've... What you've done... She shook her head at him again, and his paint agonized face was blurry through her tears. How could Draco think that she could stand to kiss him at that moment? Every nerve in her body felt exposed, stripped raw, and clawed at. Hermione felt like her chest was being crushed. Precious memories of their innocent outings tainted and violated by the fact that it had all been carefully and cunningly orchestrated by slippery fingers. And then it was like her anguished fury forcefully burst its way through the smog of betrayal and heartbreak, and words fell from her lips like she had no control. You've humiliated me. You've lied to me. You've made my friends lie to me. You've manipulated everything to fit into your plan. What about my plans, Draco? What about what I want with my life? Her voice was louder now, and she vibrated with rage. You took one look at me from the most superficial layer and decided you thought you knew what was best for me and what I would want. Well, guess what, Malfoy? You don't! Hermione. Draco's expression was shattered and his breath racked and thin. He looked like he'd just had his heart ripped out of his chest, his soul sucked out of him. And just for a moment, Hermione felt it. And her mind screamed at her to take everything she just said back to bury herself back into the comfort and safety of his embrace and just live there forever. The ugly, raging demon within her seemingly evaporated, and she gasped painfully at a sudden, stricken wave of regret that spiked every cell in her body. Her arms wrapped around and restricted themselves around her waist in an attempt to smother the conflicting emotions inside of her. She wanted him to stay. She wanted him to leave. She wanted to kiss away every inch of agony on his face. She wanted him to grovel on his knees. She wanted to wake up the next day to the sound of Draco fighting her cat for some toast. She never wanted to see his beautiful face again. She wanted him to stay. She wanted him complaining in their concrete bed with his arms around her waist as she snuggled into his warmth. She wanted him to stay. Her tongue wet her lips. I think you should go, she whispered. Hermione... Jacob's legs twitched as if he had to physically restrain himself. If you don't, I'm going to say something I'll regret, and I don't want to do that to you. She couldn't look at him and turned to look back at the grandfather clock again. She had Draco swallow dryly, and her eyes clenched shut as he slowly approached her. Her skin hummed as Draco's lips met her cheeks in a delicate kiss. I'm only of an hour away, he murmured next to her ear. With a final brush of his nose against the edge of her jaw, he stepped away, and Hermione could breathe again. Hermione stared into the fireplace long after the flames had died down, and a stench of burning ashes no longer clung to the air. The moon was high by the time Hermione had the energy to move again, and as she made her way to her bedroom, she had almost convinced herself that the tears that streamed down her face again was nothing more than irritation from the flue ash. And then he had the gall to actually try to kiss me. Can you believe that imprudent git? As if that was going to somehow take back everything that he's done. Ha! Hermione huffed and leaned back into a chair which creaked unnervingly. The ministry cafeteria really needed to upgrade their furniture. Her cheeks were hot and prickly and Hermione had to take several deep inhales. She hadn't realized how long she had been renting for and her vision had grown alarmingly spotty in the last few minutes of her recanting the previous night to her closest friends. Harry and Ron looked at her, waiting for her to continue. She flicked her brows and bit back an eye roll as she said, I'm finished. You also sat that 15 minutes ago, Ron said, his voice distorted and echoey as he broke off into a yawn. He straightened up, his face brightening as he turned to grin smugly at Harry. Pay up, Potter. Hermione frowned as she watched Ron's fingers clap against his open palm expectantly, and Harry reached into his pocket with a grumble. Her jaw dropped as Harry placed a couple of galleons into Ron's hand, the latter pocketing them with a gloating, Cheers.
did ye bet on me? Hermione spluttered and glared at the two of them accusingly. Harry at least had the decency to flush under her expression and took great interest in studying the leftover piece on his plate. Ron just shrugged at her. We had nothing else to do but wait for you to clock on. Might as well make some money out of it. Hermione bristled and static stung at the nape of her neck. Her eyes narrowed into slits. Is that so? We don't get mad at us, at least not just us. There's a whole pool going on with a few other employees. Ron gestured vaguely to the other tables before he turned and whispered to her conspiratorially. Can you pretend to be in the dark for one more month? Then give me a solid hundred gallons. Come on, I'll split my winnings with you, and you can go and see that, that blossom brune blokes you like. Blishin, Hermione corrected through gritted teeth. You made a bet? We did. Ron nudged Harry under the table, who looked very much like a man who would rather be faced with Voldemort again at that moment. About me, Ron Hunt, with our colleagues. You're making it sound like we got the whole bloody department involved, Ron rolled his eyes. I don't want to kick you whilst you're down on nothing, Miney, but you and Maffle weren't exactly subtle. You'd think for someone as bright as yourself, you'd remember the silencing charm every once in a while. All three of them looked uncomfortable at his implications. Hermione was positive her face had turned a violent foxier, and Harry coughed pointedly. Hermione, did you really never had any suspicions? He peered at her from beneath his glasses, with a small frown that married his eyebrows together. You mean, did I ever have any suspicions when a co-worker invited me to work-related events? Hermione rolled her eyes. Gee, let me think about that, Harry. He's at dinner at my house, Harry pointed out dryly and snorted. Imagine telling yourself that five years ago, Ron muttered, the pair of them ignoring him. Yes, to which we bring our case files over from work and finish them whilst you and Ginny try not to blow up your kitchen. You place Quidditch with us once a month, Ron added. I mean, really, that should have clued you in months ago. I don't care about Quidditch, Hermione snapped back. The stomach swooped in bitter anger at the realization that Ron had a point. Even if Draco and her childhood friends had grown to be cordial with one another, that certainly was enough of a reason for him to willingly spend time with them and engage in some light-hearted competition. Hermione remembered with a jolt that Draco and Ron had actually high-fived one another one time after they had won against Harry's tea. They had bantered with each other all afternoon like they had bonded, bonded over her. Merlin, she really had been blind to it all. You were Malfoy's jersey when you watched us play, Ron grimaced, likely at the thought of Hermione willingly wearing Slytherin colours. Well, it gets cold just standing there for hours. A warming charm not enough for you, Harry ducked to rub invisible dirt out of his glasses, his shoulders shaking with restrained laughter as Hermione threw him a dirty skull. Miney, you practically have a panic attack. Any time a bludger flies within five feet of him, Ron said as he reached for a plate and stole the last bite of a steak and kidney pie. They can cause severe concussions, Hermione scolded him hotly. Ron cocked a brow as he chewed. Yeah, I know. Happened to me last time. Took you an hour after the match to notice, by the way. I only have one pair of eyes, Ronnie. Yeah, they're always on Malfoy. Hermione's lip jutted out as she sobbed her arms crossed under her chest. Why are you two defending him? And don't think I've forgotten that you two hid this from me as well. But Draco, he took advantage of me. Harry's head snapped to hers and his eyes blazed furiously. You're saying now for we forced you? Hermione's hand darted out to grab his arms, Harry already halfway out of the seat. No doubt with every intention of storming into Draco's office and dragging him out by silky roots. She felt a rush of cold anxiety run through her as the implications of what she had said hit her. No, Merlin, no, not like that, Hermione gasped. She waited as Harry sagged with relief and slowly sunk back into his chair before she continued. I meant like tricking me into going on dates. Draco would never hurt me, Harry. At least no more than he already had. Hermione swallowed back the sob in her throat as her hand rubbed at the ache in her breastbone. My name. When you say he tricked you, Ron frowned at her. You mean you had some free time, Malfoy invited you to do something, and you agreed to it? 
He never told me it was for a date, the man hissed. I get that, but I mean, come on, Grease Hermione, really? Ron stared at her and mocked a guess. If you're comfortable enough to spend four days away in a private villa with one of your co-workers, then maybe I'm in the wrong department. I mean, really? He snorted and tittered at her. They're going to strip you of your brightest witch of her age title for that one. Harry shot him a warning look when Hermione sneered at him, his green eyes kind and open as he turned back to her. Believe me when I say I really don't want to ask this, Hermione. Harry did look a vile shade of peaky green and he grimaced. But these not dates, I mean after the date was over, did you too? How often did he end up spending the night? Oh bloody hell, Ron groaned and looked over her way to take a great interest in observing the food stains on the cafeteria floor. Seemingly hundreds of nights of hot gasps and slicked skin against her flitted across her eyes, and Harry held up both hands defensively. I'm not judging you or anything, Hermione, but, well, it's not like you exactly drove him away, did you? Sex does not mean I consented to dating, she barked back, a little too loudly, judging by the scandalized looks from a pair of senior witches sat at the table next to theirs. Hermione flushed. She was pretty sure she recognized one of them from the chambers. I'm not saying that it does, Harry said calmly. My point being, it seemed like you rather enjoyed hanging out with Malfoy. And yes, I know you thought it was for work, he added on quickly as Hermione opened her mouth in rebuttal. But you still enjoyed it enough to repeat it regularly as well as other activities. Harry coughed awkwardly, his ears blotch red. I know you think you don't have the time, and I'm not saying that it's not true. But you do have some spare time, and it seems to me that Murphy knew how to deal with that perfectly. I mean, it's taken you over a year to notice, so surely your date, um, work socializing get-togethers are kind of effortless? Not everything needs to be so backbreaking, exhaustingly planned out and analyzed. Hermione's eyes squeezed shut as Draco's strained, exhausted voice sounded in her mind. She felt another step of anger as she thought about Draco's hypocritical words. How dare he try to lecture her on relationships whilst he had spent over a year carefully and tactfully orchestrating their dates, just casual enough that Hermione wouldn't notice the veil of deceit behind his invitations, and just wonderful enough that Hermione would take him up on his offer time and time again. Hermione, you can't tell me that in all the time you've spent around Malfoy, you've never... Not even once thought about dating him, Harry asked, and she cursed him for knowing her so well. Every time he brought her lunch and she saw that beautiful private grin of his whenever she tucked into it greedily. Every night when he kissed her neck. Every time she would come back from a meeting and a stack of paperwork that she hadn't managed to look at had somehow mysteriously travelled to Draco's desk, which he would be going through ardently, and what had shocked her the first few times he had done it, he wouldn't even mention it. The first time they decided to be a little adventurous in a shower and Draco had accidentally gotten shampoo in her eyes. The way he had hovered over her all day afterwards, apologetic kisses pressed to any inch of the skin that he could see. How he would peacock whenever he won at their Quidditch matches and Hermione would congratulate him for not getting bludgeoned to death. She had let herself pretend just for a moment that they had been that little something more than co-workers and friends. And then she would remember the stack of cases, backlogged by at least two months, that Hermione wasn't even close to going through, and those thoughts would be dragged to the very depth of the back of her mind, snuffed out and locked up tight, until she would wake up the next day in his arms to a soft kiss at the back of her neck. Her nose tingled as she felt tears bloom in the corner of her eyes. Of course I have, she confessed quietly, unsure if the pair had even heard her over the bustling sound of their luncheoning colleagues. It's the fact that he lied to me, I trusted him, and he threw it back in my face. She wiped away at the tears that had treacherously begun to fall. Draco knew, you both knew, Jenny knew. Marlon, thanks to your bloody bed, it seems like half the ministry knew. I feel so humiliated. Her voice wobbled, and she buried her face in her hands as she sobbed. She felt each of their hands come up to rub at her shoulders soothingly, and she whimpered. How can I just forgive him? Hermione said thickly, 
and shook her head behind her hands. How can I just be expected to move on and forgive him when it feels, when it feels like I'm suffocating? The air at the table was thick and heavy with silence. My name, do you remember that boat trucker case a few years back? Ron asked eventually, when he had tried to stop that ministry excavation from being carried out. How it would have meant hundreds of thousands of boat truckers would have been wiped out. Hermione looked at him, her stomach tight with trepidation. Of course I do. It had been her first major bill to be presented to the Wizinger Mud, and she had lost. Ron nodded. Do you remember completely breaking down outside the chambers? How Harry and I had to be the ones to escort you to St. Mungo's? Hermione's eyes cast down on the table. The three of them had promised to never talk about that again. How she'd woken up confused and terrified to see healers and medi-witches in lime green robes. It had taken her three days to convince them she was of sound mind. She had refused to speak with Harry and Ron for two weeks afterwards until she'd realised how equally traumatic the ordeal had to have been for them to see her like that. And she'd stormed the aura department and terribly thrown herself into their alarmed but relieved embraces. Harry nodded in agreement with Ron. Hermione, you're brilliant and I would defend you on that down to my last knap. But let's be honest, it seemed like every few months I was being summoned to a department because it collapsed from exhaustion and needed an escort home. Face it, Miney, you don't exactly handle your stress well. Ron leaned against the backrest of his chair with his heavy exhale. As much as it pains me to say, and don't ever tell him I taught you this, but Malfoy, he's been good for you. It's like he knows when to pull you back, when you're on the brink of losing it again. I know you're swamped, and I know you think you don't have a second moment to spare. But have you even taken a moment to look at your pass rate this last year? I mean, sure, the Wizengum had buggered you royally with those manticores, but other than that, you've been on a winning streak. And I'm not saying that Malfoy is the reason for that. You winning those cases all comes down to your hard work and dedication to your job. But if Malfoy hadn't stepped in when he did, helping you with your cases, making sure you ate, just taking care of you, who's to say that your next case wouldn't have been your last? What help are you to the creatures you care so bloody deeply about if the next time you had an episode, what if you weren't as lucky? What if it meant you were forced to become a permanent resident at St. Mungo's? Harry and Ron's face twinned with pinched anguish, and Hermione's chest burned with guilt. It seemed like it wasn't just Draco who held back his feelings. It wasn't that bad, Hermione said weakly. Harry huffed out a weak laugh. Hermione, before Malfoy started joining your cases regularly, you were almost two stone underweight, and how many hours of sleep would you get on average? Three? Four on a good day? We all know you're meant to be Minister for Magic one day, Miney, Ron checked on and smiled when she flushed. Don't take yourself out of the running before you even had your shot, just because you don't know how to take care of yourself, even if that means having Martha be the one at your side to hold you steady. Hermione couldn't hold back her look of betrayal at her ex-boyfriend. I can't believe you, of all people, don't have a problem with that. Ron shrugged and took a moment to have a sip of his coffee. Judging by his faint winds of disgust, it had probably long gone cold. I'm 26 now, Miney. Figured I should at least have the emotional range of a soup spoon, you know. He winked at her, and Hermione snorted. The action quickly evolved into a full-blown laughter as Harry joined in. Look, Hermione, Harry said as their laughter trickled down, as your best friend. If we thought Malfoy was being malicious or could hurt you or had bad intentions in any way, don't you think we would have stepped in? Do you really believe we would have just stood by and let him do that to you? Harry's eyes were hurt and tight, and Hermione felt shame curl up in her stomach. She hadn't thought about it like that. As her best friends, of course they would have had their best interests in their hearts, and whilst they were cordial with Draco to an extent, did Hermione really believe deep down that they would have chosen his side over hers? Her shoulders curved in sheepishly. I meant what I sat on the bonfire night, Hermione, Harry interrupted her quite musing. I've never seen you so happy. Hermione curved a brow. I made our receptionist cry just a few weeks ago. Yes, but she's not going to spend her summer locked up in a jar. I'd call it progress, Harry grinned. The bustling around them dim, the lunch hour effectively drawing to a close as dozens of ministry employees left the cafeteria to rush back to their desks. As if on cue, Hermione's own one passed against the table. For what it's worth, Miney, Ron said as she slipped her wand back into her robes. 
What stopped me from ever saying anything wasn't because of Malfoy or the way he was with you. It was you. Hermione's brows furrowed as she tilted her head in confusion. Ron smiled at her, boyish, yet bittersweet, and her chest warmed with fondness. It looked so much like his teenage self when he smiled. It was the way you looked at Hermione. In the years you and I dated, you never once looked at me the way you look at Malfoy. The lift door shut it open with a groan as Hermione arrived back to her floor. She sluggishly stepped into the corridor, her soul weighed down on her heavily as she thought about what Ron had said right before she left, and every step felt like a marathon. Hermione needed to get back to her desk. She needed to stop thinking about this mess with Draco. She needed the stacks of white paperwork and her memos and her to-do list. Wait, no, Draco had made that for her. She wouldn't use it. She didn't want him thinking for one moment that she still needed him. The preposterous notion that, in any way, she couldn't do her job as a professional functioning witch without him. Her heart slammed to a halt against the ribcage when she spotted Draco stood by the reception desk, passing some folder to Matilda. He looked awful. Even from a short distance away, she could tell by the way his shoulders curved inwards, his slouch stance almost undetectable, the shocking mess of blonde hair that could give Harry a run for his money, and she could see the faintest bruising under his eyes and Hermione knew, like herself, that he hadn't slept. Hermione didn't feel as happy about that as she thought she would. As if sensing her presence, and maybe he did, Draco went rigid, and her palms were dumb with anticipation as his head slowly turned to hers. She couldn't help the shaky exhale as his eyes, closed off and empty, met hers. Ron's final word to her before she had left their lunch table echoed in her mind, and Hermione quickly looked away. She had no idea how she looked at Draco, as Ron had put it, but she knew that she didn't want him to see it anyway. Hermione breathed in deeply and pulled her shoulders back. Her eyes focused on her office door at the end of the corridor. Hermione moved quickly past the reception desk and she felt mildly guilty at the way she blanked the poor receptionist's greeting. Her steps aggressively thumped against the floor. She could have sworn she felt long, elegant fingers brush against her back when she passed them, and Hermione sucked in the air harshly. Laura, she said, when her office day was only yards away from her, and her money was very relieved when her voice didn't portray a single tremor. How many meetings do I have this afternoon? Two, Miss Granger, with a respective goblin and the banker from your March complaint file. Hermione waited until she had crossed over the safety threshold of her office before she turned around and looked back to where she still felt eyes on her from the reception desk. Draco's face was neutral, expressionless, and she felt a stab of bitter anger at how easy it was for him to appear so unaffected. A small, twisted, and vicious part of her wanted him to look as wrecked as she felt. Hermione pointedly held his gaze as she spoke, her voice loud and projected to the entire corridor, despite her system only being set two feet from him. Make sure it stays just those two meetings. There's nobody else worth my time today. As Hermione turned back into her office with the door slammed behind her, she thought about the way Draco winced minutely at her words, and how she didn't feel a single lick of satisfaction from it. She didn't feel good at all. Hermione led Crookshanks into her bedroom that night. She basked in the comfort of another being in her too empty bed for barely ten minutes before her familiar realized that Draco would not be joining them again. She gawped at the look of utter betrayal Crookshanks threw her way before it gingerly leaped from the bed and sulked back into the corridor. A few moments later, she heard his paw scratch at the gate of the fireplace, a distraught and confused whine as he called out for the wizard. She kicked off her sheets with a huff and stormed across her bedroom to slam her door shut, bitterly. Little backstabber, she grumbled and turned on her heel. Hermione cursed as she tripped, her foot caught in. She froze as she looked down at Draco's Quidditch jersey that had somehow wrapped itself around her foot without her noticing. Well, wasn't that poetic? She bent down and carefully freed her foot, before making her way to sit on the edge of her bed. Draco's jersey was still in her hands. She couldn't bring herself to let it go. She glanced mournfully behind her. Her sheets looked depressingly empty and cold. Hermione let out a shaky exhale as she laid back down and turned on her side with the jersey curled into her chest. She finally drifted off to sleep some hours later, breathing in apples and cedar wood. Tears dried against her cheeks as she had tried to imagine Draco's arm wrapped tightly around her waist. Chapter 8 Hermione didn't see Draco for the rest of the week, and she wasn't bothered one bit. After that lunch with Harry and Ron the other day, Hermione had decided Draco simply wasn't worth her stress and heartbreak. Anger. Her anger. 
What he had done was despicable, yes, but if she had learned anything from her mother, it was that she wasn't the first and certainly wouldn't be the last woman to have her personal life be temporarily screwed up by men. And it wasn't like Draco had made that much of an impact on her life anyway, despite what her friends thought. Merlin forbid she needed to rely on Draco to be functional at her job. Her great aunt Madeline would roll in her grave at the idea of Hermione being dependent on a man. The woman had protested in the suffragette movement for crying out loud. If a great aunt could survive chaining herself to a railing for four days, Hermione could definitely handle Draco's year-long deception. Harry and Ron aside, how much change could one wizard have made to her life? Besides, Draco had lied to her, he had manipulated her life, and he had taken advantage of her trust and promptly crushed it into a million pieces within her. So no, he was not worth Hermione being distracted from her work. Her time and attention needed to be focused on something much more important than him. Like the sneak edgecomb in fifth year, Hermione had no problem turning her back on someone who didn't value and respect trust. She was convinced that this occasion would be exactly the same. Yes, Hermione was confident. She wouldn't miss Draco worth a damn. She missed him like a limp. Hermione hadn't realized just how quiet her flat was when he wasn't around. The disturbing lack of frustrated yells as Draco argued with her cat whenever Crookshanks leapt up onto the kitchen counter when Draco was cooking. The soft whistle of his deep breaths when he was concentrating on his paperwork. When they'd both be set on her couch, Hermione's feet in his lap, and she'd look up from her book every so often when Draco huffed or chuckled at whatever stupid thing a character had done in his book. The thick silence of her flat now seemed to smother her. Her meals were all blend in her mouth. It didn't matter how many spices Hermione would add to her food. It all tasted like sludge. After the first evening in a row of her throwing her barely eaten dinner into the bin, she had stopped bothering with her efforts and took to just eating a couple of slices of toast. If she even had the energy to do that. Her stupid, hard, concrete bed was too empty. Night after night, she would coax Crookshanks into her room, and night after night, Crookshanks would stalk back out minutes later, and his glass seemingly got even more venomous as each night passed. I can't believe you're taking his side, Hermione grumbled, when she tried to stop him from escaping the clutches of her arms and he clawed at her with a hiss. Crookshanks had just cocked his chin at her, in what she could only assume was a sneer, before he sucked back into the corridor, and she didn't need to follow him to know he had returned to sleep on that blasted green ottoman she hadn't gotten around to throwing away or burning yet. On the night she managed to get some sleep, broken and restless, she would wake up the next morning to find her nose squashed into Draco's, the spare pillow, on the other side of her bed, her arms wrapped around it desperately. She had had a migraine for the rest of the day when she realized that the scent of his cologne had started to fade from the pillowcase. That evening, Hermione sat on the floor of her living room, poring over her notes and research that she hadn't managed to finish in her office. And no, it was not because she didn't have Draco's to-do list to follow. She had simply just taken on more cases, that was all her neck stiff, and her back hunched over horrendously. She found herself scowling at idiotic mistakes made by the archive department in their referencing, and let out a frustrated huff. Absolutely ridiculous! Draco, come look at this, she said, not looking up from her paperwork. After several seconds of odd silence, Hermione looked up. Her face blanched as she took in her empty living room, and her hand shot up to rub at the sudden, sharp ache in her chest as she remembered. Draco wasn't there. Her breath caught on an inhale as her eyes stung with salty tears. And it was like a tsunami of despair had collided into her when Hermione found herself realizing that she hadn't noticed just how used to and comfortable she had gotten to Draco being there until he wasn't. August 2004. There was a knock at her door, Hermione faintly registered through the fork in her mind. She looked up, her head sluggish and heavy with the effort and her shoulders drooped when she saw Malfoy lean rather dapperly against the doorframe. Please, not today. She was too tired to have to deal with his punciness. And just where were you yesterday, Granger? Malfoy tittered. If only old McGonagall could see her teacher's pat now. Skiving off work. However will you save your dearest werewolves with that attitude, Granger? His voice was light with mockery, but Hermione could detect the faintest hint of genuine curiosity. She looked back down at the file in her hands, and her vision blackened. A hand shakily reached for her drawer, and she pulled out one of the pepper-up potions her healer had given to her before he had reluctantly discharged her from the ward. 
St. Mango's, was all she replied, when she took a swig of the vial. Through a peripheral vision, she noticed Malfoy's ramrod shape. A small, weak flicker of amusement ran through her at the thought that she had caught Malfoy of God. What? Couldn't you tell that Hermione wasn't in the mood to talk? You asked where I was yesterday. I was at St. Mango's. Malfoy stalked over to her and she sighed. It looked like she was going to have to have a conversation anyway. Hermione glanced at her drawer and tried to remember the risks of taking too many pepper potions at once. Euphoria, hallucinations, rash decision-making, diarrhea. Probably not the best idea. Malfoy's eyes felt like razors across her skin as he scanned her body. You don't look injured, he said eventually, his posture going lax and Hermione could have sworn she saw relief flicker across his face. Hmm. Maybe hallucinations could occur with just a singular dose too. Hermione straightened the paperwork in the folder. Maybe if she looked busy, he would bugger off and then Hermione could rest her head against her desk for five minutes. Or perhaps two minutes. She still had to catch up to yesterday's reading. That's because I am not injured. It was just a mild case of exhaustion, she said blithely with a shrug. She looked up and was taken aback by the scrutinizing glare Malfoy gave her. She huffed and threw him a sneer. I'm a big girl, Malfoy. It's not the first time it happened. I can handle myself. Clearly, Malfoy scorned. He clicked his tongue, his eyes narrowed. Exactly how many times has this happened? Hermione had decided to stop keeping track after the fourth time Harry had to escort her home. She didn't quite think she was at double digits yet, but Malfoy didn't have to know that. What was it to him anyway? None. She was tired. Malfoy, can we please not do this now? She pleaded softly and delicately rubbed at her temples as she looked at the piles of sealed cases beside her that had appeared on her desk during her absence. Her chest ached. She had missed one day in her office and yet had somehow managed to be three days worth of work behind her schedule. And Jenny had wondered why Hermione broke things off with Oliver Wood when he had wanted their relationship to become more serious and for her to spend more time with him. She couldn't even afford one sick day. And Malfoy stared at her, his face unreadable as he seemingly deliberated something. Go home, Granger, he said eventually. Hermione frowned. You're clearly in no shape to be in work right now. You shouldn't be pushing yourself. One, because you're only going to do a shitty job of your cases and then you're going to have to start all over again. And two, you're just going to end up back at St. Mango's. And that means that I'll have to cover for you, and I really don't want to do that. Malfoy pretended to sigh heavily. Oh, so do me a favour and go home, Granger. She hated that she couldn't argue with his logic. She had already made several mistakes when taking notes on the Grindula report that morning, and she'd missed a very important meeting to discuss funding for a department that quarter. Hermione opened her mouth to agree when a whoosh sounded out across her office and a new stack of paperwork fluttered down onto her desk. Her heart positively sunk in her chest, and she looked up at Malfoy, whose jaws clenched tight at the new papers on her desk and smiled weakly. Another time, she said. Malfoy's eyes flickered to hers, and she barely registered the glint of irritation in his expression, before his face cooled and he stared at her blankly. All right, he said simply, and turned on his heel to stalk out of her office without another word. Hermione waited another fifteen minutes to be on the safe side before I had lulled and she whimpered as she sank weakly against the desk. Just five minutes, she told herself, before she promptly slept for the rest of the afternoon. The next day, Hermione startled as she walked into her office. A grand chestnut oak desk was sat next to hers, and a stack of cases that had been delivered to her office the previous day had been brought over, a third of them already opened and organized in front of a calm, indifferent Draco Malfoy. Hermione groaned and fought the urge to slam her head against the desk. She made another mistake in her transcripts and would have to rewrite the last two pages, again. Irritated fury bubbled in her chest, and her hand shot out in a violent jerk, promptly knocking the pile of cases next to her on the floor. A minor flash of guilt went through her when Hermione remembered that Madley had spent 45 minutes organizing those files for her. But she was still frustrated, so they would just have to stay there for the time being. Hermione glanced over at Draco's desk, his bouquet as fresh and bright as ever still sat on the edge. She stood and slowly made her way over, a hesitant hand reached out to stroke the delicate flowers. A crumbled-up note stuck to the bottom of the vase, with Hermione's name scrawled on it caught her eye. 
She reached for it curiously. Hull Muggle Central sighting. Update needed. Archives return one o'clock. Buy Granger's vile biscuits. Hermione shuddered on an exhale as her eyes fluttered in disbelief. But Draco really made a note to make sure she didn't run out of biscuits. Her eyes squeezed shut, her chest suddenly warm yet cold at the same time. How many times had he had done this? How many times had Draco gone out of his way to do something for her mind that she hadn't even needed? He hated her biscuit habit, yet he went out of his way to make sure she didn't go without them? Hermione thought of all the times her biscuit drawer had somehow been fully stocked overnight, despite her being positive she hadn't had the time to visit her supermarket. Only on some occasions had Hermione acknowledged that, logically, Draco must have refilled them for her. Merlin, had he gone into the muggle world for her? Hermione's eyes stung with bitter tears. Just one more thing she hadn't paid much attention to. She couldn't even remember if she'd ever thanked him. No, it was just one more thing she had adapted to. Like his desk, like his to-do list like his lunchboxes. It was one more thing that had just eased into her routine. Effortless. Harry's voice echoed in her mind. Hermione swallowed thickly, the knot crinkling, as she pressed it against her chest shakily. A knock on her door drew her out of her musings. She turned to acknowledge her assistant and tried to not flush when Madly paused with a curious look at the files that had been tossed to the floor. Madly couldn't quite hide her questioning glance, but wisely chose not to mention it. Medley couldn't quite hide her questioning glance, but wisely chose not to mention it as she handed Hermione a file. The little gossip would probably tell half of their floor by lunchtime, though. Thank you, Laura, she said, and walked back to her desk in a way that she hoped looked like indifference. To her surprise, Medley lingered, her teeth gnawing at a bit of dry skin on her lip as she glanced between Hermione's and Draco's desk. Hermione raised her brow at her. Yes? Medley paused for a moment, her eyes wide and cautious. May I speak candidly? Hermione blinked. Her eyes narrowed slightly, but she nodded. You may. Are you mad at Mr. Malfoy for something? It's, it's, it's just that he hasn't been here for over a week now. And he, well, both of you, I'm not being funny or anything, Miss Granger, but neither of you are looking too good. Hermione's pulse quickened. You've seen Dre uh, Mr. Malfoy? Madeline's eyes widened slightly. Oh, um, well, like, you know, just around. He's not really been in his office that much. She shuffled, and Hermione couldn't help but wonder if her assistant was regretting speaking up. But anyway, I just wanted to say, whatever it is, my gran always taught me that there's nothing that can be solved by just talking things out. Yes, well, Madeline's grandmother probably hadn't been deceived into a relationship for over a year. Hermione just smiled politely at her, and her assistant took that as a cue to leave. The sticky note in her peripheral vision had a question pop up in her mind, and Hermione called after her. Laura! Hermione bit the inside of her cheek. The other day, you, you said that Draco and I were good together. What, what did you mean by that? Medley smiled. Hermione would almost say she swooned as she shrugged. I don't know. I can't really explain it. You just, you just fit together, you know, like puzzle pieces or something. Like it's almost like you don't even need to try. It's just effortless. Hermione finished for her with a mad laugh of disbelief. Madeleine nodded and beamed at her. Yeah, exactly. Hermione glanced over her assistant's shoulder and peered into the corridor. The rest of the department, do they, do they know as well? Did they all laugh about it, about her during their lunch break? Did they also have a betting pool? Did they think Hermione was cheap for sleeping with a colleague? Did they all secretly think she was incapable of doing her job? Not everyone, Madeleine interrupted her misery. Like I said... I know we're trying to keep things quiet, and a couple of us knew, but it's like, it's like proper romantic, you know? We call you the dream team. Ever since we started working together, our turnover rates have skyrocketed. Do you know that we all got Christmas bonuses for the first time last year? That was because of you two. Medley smiled at her again, but her eyes were wide with pity. Again, I don't want to be overstepping boundaries or anything, miss, but for what it's worth, I mean... We all know your history with each other, so I don't think that there's anything the two of you couldn't overcome. Hermione didn't say another word as Medley left her office, her assistant's last words circling on repeat in her mind as she reached for Draco's note again. Her fingers traced over the elegant swoop of his handwriting. She had always admired his handwriting, and she couldn't ignore the small voice in her mind that questioned if she had been overreacting. 
Hermione wrote Draco a letter that evening, asking him to come over, her poor eagle feathered quill a half chewed in her anxiety. She stood at her kitchen window and stared at the letter in her hand as she tried to summon his strength to attach it to the waiting owl's leg. Had she been overreacting? Was Hermione blowing this whole thing out of proportion? Yes, he had lied to her, but he did have a point. She had enjoyed their outings together, and admittedly, yes, she had been the one to make the first physical move more often than not in the beginning. Had Draco somehow misinterpreted that as some kind of subtle signal that she wanted more? She had been the one to back him to stay when Crookshanks was ill. She did have him as emergency contact. Merlin, she'd even confessed that she needed him with her. Was that all just a big circus of miscommunication? But then again, a dark voice in her mind spoke up. He had to have known what he was doing was wrong on some level. Why else had he never made an attempt to talk to her? Why had he spent so much time and effort meticulously planning everything, artfully choosing his words so that she couldn't interpret his invitations as a date? Why would he go through all of that if he didn't acknowledge on some level that he knew what he was doing was morally incomprehensible? Hermione couldn't help but think about how ludicrous this all was. Would he have truly waited for her? Was Draco really content to just live off of the scraps of affection Hermione could afford to give until she'd retired? Or more likely, would he decide he was tired of waiting for her and go on to marry that beautiful, faceless, pure-blood heiress and live a happy life void of Hermione and her stubbornness? Her poor eating habits, her concrete mattress, her demonic cat, her dedication to her jaw that, sure, other people might have thought bordered on unhealthy, Medley's words echoed in her mind. They all thought that she and Draco made a good team. Was this really something that the pair of them could just talk out? Could Hermione forgive him that easily for his deception, for his humiliation of her? Okay, so Medley claimed that their department didn't judge Hermione. But was that really something they would all just say out loud? Hermione was a boss after all. Who is to say that Medley hadn't withheld some other truth? Hermione remembered how judgmental Medley was during the Daphne and William debacle. What if Hermione and Draco did go on to have a genuine relationship and they broke up? Could Hermione really spend every lunch break in the cafeteria, putting up with people's knowing and gossipy stares? The pitied looks from her department every time she and Draco walked past one another. And when they would need to work together on a case with Draco as a liaison? To have to stand so close to him, breathe in that wonderful, intoxicating cologne of his? To not even playfully tuck on her hair when her back rounded too far forward. Could Hermione even trust Draco anymore? Any future decision she would ever make, would she wonder if it was truly her own choice? Would she second-guess any career accomplishment? Wonder how much of it came from her own work or from Draco's interference? And yet, did a part of her want to find out? Some small, insatiable, curious side of her that wanted to forgive him that wanted to give into her desires and fantasies of being with him, to summon that griff into courage of hers and throw all caution to the wind. Did she owe to herself and to him to try? Eventually, the owl grew tired of waiting for her to make a decision and nipped at her fingers in spite before taking off into the night to fly back to the postal office aulery. It was probably for the best she thought, after she wordlessly cast an incendio on the envelope and watched as the shaky slope of his name melted into ash. He hadn't tried to contact her either. Hermione tried not to think about why that hurt so much. Her foot paused mid-step into her office, the heckles on the back of her neck tense with trepidation. Something was off, wrong. Had she left a window open overnight? A glance over to the glass told her that wasn't the case. Bugger. She had forgotten to send off the transcripts of her interview with the Gringotts banker, hadn't she? Hermione dashed to her desk before she stopped. The vividly distinct memory of her handing the envelope over to Medley flashed in her mind. She frowned, irritation licking at her spine as she slowly sunk into her desk chair. Hermione huffed after counting the cases on her desk. There was nothing new, there was nothing missing. Her mind screeched to a halt, and Hermione exhaled shakily. The painful, crushing realization that a certain desk next to her was void of any color. Draco's hydrangeas were gone, and it was as if the walls were closing in on her from within. A sharp, paint gasp slipped from her mouth, and her nails stuck into the armrest as her chest rattled and throbbed in anguish. She whimpered and her eyes stung. Her head was too heavy, her lungs were too tight. 
Her office was too small, and there wasn't enough air. She couldn't breathe. Draco's hydrangeas were gone. She couldn't breathe. She had to get out of here. She shakily rose from her chair, and barely remembered to pick up her back again as she headed for the doorway. Hermione had just enough wits about her to inform her assistant that she was feeling under the weather, and that she was taking a sick day. Had the corridor always been this long? Why hadn't the lift arrived yet? She practically gasped in relief when the lift was opened, and only when she was safe in its enclosure, and it catapulted backwards away from her office, away from his desk, did Hermione allow the cloud of sorrow to overtake her, collapsing against the wall of the lift as she let out a shuddered sob. What surely had to be one of the lowest moments in Hermione's life was when she found herself stood in the frozen food aisle of a muggle supermarket, and crying in front of the pins of mint chocolate chip ice cream. Hermione blubbered and quickly brought her hand up to cover her mouth to suppress the guttural whimper that burned at the back of her throat. There was a younger girl stood only a couple of feet away from her. Hermione could only guess she was around twenty or so, rather dreary dressed in grey jogging bottoms and a frayed oversized men's jersey, her hair a greasy, unkept bun at the top of her head. She looked as miserable as Hermione felt. Hermione watched as the girl reached for a pint of cookie dough ice cream and sent Hermione a pitied, limp smile like some silent form of camaraderie as she turned to walk to the checkout till. The small, silent act of kindness sent a fresh wave of tears down Hermione's cheek, and she stood there for another twenty minutes, snivelling and whimpering over gross mint chocolate ice cream. She would have to find a new supermarket to patron, she thought as she ignored the questioning glances that muggles would give her as they walked by the aisle. Hermione startled as a gravel yet jovial voice sounded out from behind her. I know these inflation rates are devastating, aren't they? An old man shook his head in dismay at the price stickers. Four pounds for some ice cream. Why, when I was your age, they were only a sixpence. It had been two weeks since Hermione last saw Draco, and she had been in a foul mood for the last three days. Of course, neither of those things were related. It just seemed as if her entire department had decided to be as incompetent as possible, and Hermione rarely managed to make it a couple of hours without snapping at another inept co-worker, who couldn't tell the difference between the inductive and deductive methods of organising presidential cases, or who stupidly couldn't name the leader of the 18th century Goblin Rebellion. Erk the Unclean was on a chocolate for a cart for Merlin's sake. Honestly... She thought the ministry had standards when it came to employment. She had even snapped at her department head when Hermione had been told that the spirit division was to take 4% of their budget that quarter. She had promptly set the memo informing her of a disciplinary meeting on fire when it arrived at her desk that morning. It wasn't just her department that was taking the force of her wrath. Harriet asked her rather innocuously if she wanted to come over Friday evening to help set up the nursery before Ginny's due date arrived. An acidic rage exploded from her as she sneered that, no, she did not want to help set up baby Albus Severus' room, and that, quite frankly, it was borderline child abuse for Harry to want to give his son that name. Hermione sat back in her chair and angrily stabbed at her overcooked carrots, whilst Harry just gawped at her. Her spine was tight with vexation, her mind stewed with her thoughts. Didn't Harry know by now that her Friday evening belonged to Drake? Hermione had burned a thought in her mind before it could finish. At least she had finally stopped crying. Her humiliating display at the supermarket had promptly drained her of any more anguish, and instead, her initial fury from that night had reclaimed her. She told herself that she must have just needed a few days to let it all out, some lingering repressed emotions from that night that she hadn't had time to process fully. Her and Draco had obviously just spent too much time together, and she had let herself grow too dependent on his presence. Hermione just needed time to reset her routine, to go back to the days before his stupid oak desk had stolen all that lovely space in her office. Now that he had put some distance between them, it was clear Hermione had just grown spoiled and sloppy with her work when he was around. She had gotten unnervingly used to him snatching cases from her hands, his stupid to-do list, his comforting hand massaging her neck when it was stiff and achy at the end of the day. The tuck on her plate had reminded her to straighten her back once in a while. It was obvious in hindsight that Draco had been far too distracting for her. Without him there to drag her to the flu once the sun had set, and he had decided that she had done enough work for the day, an absolute preposterous notion, Hermione was free to stay as late as she wanted in her office. 
It had taken Hermione pulling three all-nighters in a row, but she had finally caught up to her April files, and she felt the most wonderfully, exhaustingly productive she had in months. It wasn't like she could sleep anyway, thanks to her stupid, empty and uncomfortable bed. So yes, Hermione was doing much better. It turned out that a little bit of space was all that she had needed. She didn't even miss Draco that much anymore anyway. It wasn't even a sex that Hermione missed. As glorious, soul-scorching and wonderful as it was, she thought, as she lied in bed, curled up like a woodlouse. She tried voraciously to ignore the chill against her exposed back. It was the way she squeezed her arm tight against her stomach at night, trying in vain to imitate a strong and secure possessive grip. It was her imagining her soft, sleepy good mornings and good nights, the ghost of a kiss at the nape of her neck. It was the way she would stand up to walk out of her office to hand medley a file, and her vision would blacken, her legs shaken and weak, and Hermione would realise that it was almost four in the afternoon, and she hadn't eaten anything more than a couple of biscuits. And she realised, with a punch to the gut, it was because she had been waiting for Draco to walk in and hand her a lunchbox. Of a night, whilst Hermione desperately tried to ignore the emptiness of the other side of their bed, she could hear Crookshanks cry and whine as he scratched at the fireplace gate. Her poor familiar confused and hurt as to why his playmate had seemingly abandoned him. It was washing her face at night, noticing all of the ink stains on her face, and it just would burn. She imagined Draco's amused grin and his hearty laugh as she whacked a pillow against his face and complained that he had let her spend all evening with her face an inked mess. When Hermione would head to a flu in the morning, and her body seized with panic when she realised that she had forgotten to set the night wards, again, because she had gotten used to Draco being the one to do it every night. It was a determination and unhealthy grind of his teeth when Draco tried a more complex recipe of a Friday evening, and the way his chest would expand pridefully when it was cooked properly. Hermione's heart would flutter at the beautiful way his eyes lit up when she told him that the food was truly delicious. The way she looked forward to him bringing her lunches most days, not just because of how mouth-watering it could be, but because it meant that she got to see that soft, private grin of his. It was how Draco actually listened and actively engaged in discussions with her over whichever academic theory had sprouted in her mind of an evening. How he didn't back down if he disagreed with her, and on some occasions would even briefly pop to visit his family's library and come back with texts just to prove how wrong she was. How he would gently kiss her lips once, twice, and then a third time until her sulky pout melted away and she pulled his body on top of hers. He would smirk afterwards as she trembled and panted against his chest and ask her if that was her way of admitting she was wrong. When they would visit museums or exhibitions, and his eyes wouldn't glaze over in boredom, like her friends would. Instead, they would be sharp, focused, and inquisitive, as he hounded their poor tool guide with as many questions as Hermione would. The way that, despite all of his quips and jokes about the deadly beast, Draco put his soul into his work, because if there was anyone as stubborn as herself, it was him, and he refused to accept failure. It was the satisfied oozing of his eyes when he completed one of his brilliantly planned to-do lists and would promptly march over to her desk, planting devious kisses along her neck as he coaxed her into leaving the office for the day. The beautiful colouring of his cheeks as he shyly accepted the bouquet of flowers her money got for him, flowers that, despite his mocking tone, genuinely kept on his desk, reinforcing the stasis charm every couple of days. Heck, it was even the crude and nearly always uncalled-for comments about her wardrobe choices the way his nose would scrunch and light a stain whenever she mixed fabrics. Satin does not go with cordery, bloody hell, Granger. And he would glare in contemplation at her potato sack dress, like he was debating the consequences of setting the blasted thing on fire. It was as encouraging smiles with a warm hand rubbing at her back when Hermione was mentally roadblocked in a case. The sexy smirk when he caught her staring at him when she really should have been focusing on her work his hand rubbing circles on her ankles as they rested in his lap. How, despite his teasing of her own ink freckles, he had quite the hefty monthly bill from Twittle's dry cleaners, because he would come home after work with what looked like half of his ink put stained against the left sleeve of his shirt, too focused on completing his paperwork that he would often forget to wait to let the ink dry. Her mind was plagued with all of these moments, seemingly nondescript, yet precious in each of their own ways. Hermione sniffled on a watery sop and sank deeper into her cold sheets that had been freed of Draco's scent for several long, excruciating days now. A painful, hollow ache in her chest as her mind focused only on the fact that she just missed him. 
A week later, Hermione was in the middle of rereading the same paragraph about a goblin who had successfully sued his banker employees in New Zealand for the fourth time when Draco walked through her door. His gaze down and his feet seemed to drag against the floor. Her pen dropped to the floor, her chest tight with panic and trepidation, and the sound made his head snap up. His eyes widened briefly before his face went neutral, a cool emptiness to his expression that Hermione decided she hated. I, Draco paused to clear his throat. Hmm, <clears throat> I thought you had a meeting. He glanced over his shoulder, and Hermione watched as he squinted suspiciously toward her assistant's desk. He was holding a lunch bag, she realized belatedly, and a betraying shiver of happiness danced up her spine. Draco followed her gaze and quickly snapped his hand behind his back. It was unfair how charmingly endearing he looked with his ears flushed hotly. I cancelled it. I wasn't feeling well. Draco's jaw twitched. Have you been eating? You know I haven't. Hermione's eyes flickered to a biscuit drawer, and she felt a sick, twisted sense of rebellious satisfaction at the way his forehead vein pulsed angrily when he tracked the movement. He looked up at her ceiling in resignation and squeezed his eyes shut, a silent, for fuck's sake, mouth on his lips before he huffed, storming over to angrily slam the lunch bag on her desk. Parents are densets, revolting little thing. Oh, but I have too much sugar in my tea, Draco grumbled. Hermione was certain that if her heart wasn't currently being hammered against her ribcage, she'd have bitten back a fond smile at his fumbled phrasing of her parents' profession. Draco thumped into the seat opposite her desk, which, no, that was wrong, all wrong. He didn't belong there. He belonged at the grand desk by her side. Draco quirked a brow at her when she just stared at him. Eat. Hermione's stomach curled with sour irritation at his blunt order. Merlin, she forgot how insufferable he could be sometimes. What? Do I have to explain the process to you? He rolled his eyes. Eat. Oh, so they were back to him making decisions for her, were they? Hermione's face crunched up into a sneer. Her mouth positively sacred with venom. Telling you what to do now? What, do you think you're my boyfriend or something? The words fell out of her mouth before she could stop them, and she winced internally at the hot, defiant flash of regret that sneered in her chest. Draco also couldn't hold back his wince, his face briefly pinched with heart and the minute's flare of bitterness. Hermione looked down at her desk, ashamed. I'm sorry, she whispered. That was uncalled for. She thumped at her desk, not wanting to look up and let him see the way her cheeks burned in mortification at her spiteful retort. Drake was quiet for a few moments, the air between them thick and suffocating. You know, a sort of clever witch once told me I was no good to anyone dropping down dead. Hermione blinked. The hazy memory of a damned library corner and an exhausted boy drifted through her mind. I believe that was due to sleep deprivation. Humans can survive much longer without food. She couldn't help but bait him. It was easier trying to make him angry, easier to focus on her spiteful bitterness than the way her heart was rapid against her chest. That little devilish voice in the back of her mind that pleaded for her to slide herself in his lap, to pull herself across his delicious thighs, his thighs that resided in that too wrong chair. Draco's eyes twitched and his tongue flicked against the inside of his cheeks in annoyance, but he didn't respond, his challenging glare fixed on hers. A loud grumble from her stomach broke the tense silence between them, and Hermione's cheeks pricked hotly with embarrassment. She bit back a curse and shot him a filthy glare as he snickered at her. She petulantly reached for the back and slumped against the backrest of her chair as she pulled out the Tupperware box and slapped it against the desk. Hermione avoided eye contact as she dug in and fought her eyes from rolling back into her skull as the overwhelming, much-needed, savoury flavours danced across her taste buds. As delicious as the casserole was, beef so tender it all but melted in her mouth, the overachieving bastard. It paled in comparison to the small smile that ghosted his lips. It was brief, barely a blink, but it was there, and it was beautiful. And he was still sitting in a bloody chair. Hermione gripped the fork tighter in an attempt to suppress the way her hand trembled. The stale silence eventually began to gnaw at her, and the food began to taste like ash her senses unable to focus on anything other than him. You used too much salt. He hadn't. It was cooked to perfection. And Draco clearly knew it too, as he cocked his eyebrow and threw a mild glare, her expression softened by the faintest hint of fond exacerbation in his eyes. I've been distracted, he said, with a pointed look. Hermione flushed at the implication of his words. Her tongue wet her lips nervously, and she looked back down at her desk. 
The back of her fork had practically obliterated her last few potatoes by the time she thought of something else to say. Mr. Wilk, you know, the goblin who filed a claim for wrongful inheritance against Gringotts. He told me about a case in New Zealand, some sort of distant cousin of his, and there's some really fascinating legislation that I might be able to find similarities to in our archives. She forked out an extra long slice of onion and placed it aside on the top of a lid. Did you know that New Zealand Parliament gave permission for blood inheritance magic to be submitted during the trial? Draco picked at a piece of invisible dirt from his nails and flicked his brows in slight indifference. You thinking of comparing to the Centaur Belt Act, then? He drawled. Hermione nodded, a small bloom of relief in her chest at the normalcy of it all. Maybe Draco had decided things needed to go back to how they were before. Maybe Draco had realized how absurd it would be for them to be together. They had spent a lot of time together, after all. He must have just misunderstood his feelings to mean something more than they actually were, and he had just gotten caught up in the rushed thrill of sneaking behind her back. There was surely no way Draco actually wanted to date her. She felt like her soul had been poisoned at the thought. Yes, I, she cleared her throat, a little hoarse and scratchy. <clears throat> I, I was thinking if modern-day centaur packs could reclaim that sacred frowns their ancestors walked on, then surely goblins should be able to do the same for. Granger. I'm really not going to talk about this. Draco cut her off. His eyes flashed hot. Hermione's spine felt wet with cold sweat, and the temperature of the room seemed to have suddenly dropped. Her mouth parted as she faltered, only for a moment before her chest flared defensively and she narrowed her eyes. Talk about what? You sneaking behind my back and lying to me for a year. Back to that, are we? Draco huffed. Oh, you little... You denying it? You do know you would have actually had to have been willing to sit down and talk about us in our relationship. Hermione had skipped the beat at the term. Before you decided to stick your bushy, stubborn head in the ground, I'd hardly call it lying to you if you didn't even want to hear the truth to begin with. An omission of the truth is still a lie, Hermione gritted out. And don't think I've forgotten that you've made my friends and colleagues lie to me as well. So is that it, what it's about then? Draco raised a brow, his expression daring to look bored. You're being pissy because your old acquaintances knew something that you didn't. Is this all because your pride is a little wounded? No, I'm being pissy because you've been manipulating me in my choices, she spat. Draco rolled his eyes. Merlin, Granger, is it really so offensive to you that I want you to be my girlfriend? Hermione inhaled sharply, and a red shuddered to a screaming halt. Her heart thumped painfully against her chest as Draco met her widened eyes with his own piercing hungry gaze. Draco leaned in slowly, like a python about to strike its prey, and every cell in Hermione's body practically hummed in anticipation. Is it really so terrible that I want to call you mine? Draco's voice was like silk, and Hermione swallowed shakily to force down a whimper. Her eyes dropped to his lips. Merlin, she had forgotten how soft they looked, and her never quivered when he hummed. She looked back up at him. The heat in his eyes left her throat parched. Is it terrible that I want to treat you to dinner at nice restaurants and arrange private museum tours and exhibitions for you to soak up to your sweaty little heart's content? Draco, Hermione breathed. Do you know that you're the most beautiful when you're all geeked out in academia? The way your eyes go hazy when you're absorbing every word of a textbook? When that cute little lip of yours gets gnawed to death by your teeth? because you're trying to hold back from torturing that poor little tour guide with another question we both know that he doesn't know the answer to. Draco's eyes were drooped and heavy as he explored her face, his expression awed and open with wonder. Can you really blame me for wanting to be there to witness it? I was always raised to appreciate the finer things in life after all, he murmured. Smooth bastard. You really want to date me that badly? She could not back the disbelief in her voice as she stared at him in scrutiny. Draco huffed as he leaned back against the chair. He flicked the label of his tie disinterestedly, his casual, laid-back posture ruined by the pain tightness of his eyes. Well, given that I'm desperately in love with you, yes, it'd be nice to grab coffee sometimes, he drawled. Hermione's heart stopped beating. The tightness of his face seemingly melted away, and he gazed at her. Hermione had never seen him look so open and unguarded before. He loved her. Draco rose from his chair slowly his eyes never leaving hers as he inched his way around the desk. His fingers danced lightly across the edge, and Hermione shivered, like they were exploring her skin instead. He loved her. He was in front of her now, and he crouched to be level with her. 
A hand reached out, and his fingers glided through her curls. The nape of her neck tingled when his fingertips kissed the skin there. He loved her. Draco cupped her face gently with his thumbs, resting at the edge of her lips. She exhaled shakily, unable to tear her gaze away from the intensity of his eyes. He loved her. I love you, Hermione, Draco murmured. A thumb brushed against her lip, and his eyes darkened hotly when her tongue traced its path. He looked back up at her, his eyes fierce with determination, but light in their honesty. I love you, and all I want to do is make you happy. I know I can make you so fucking happy, Hermione. His forehead rested against hers, and one of her hands shot up and gripped at his hand on her cheek in a vain attempt to ground herself in a rapid heartbeat. Hermione couldn't hold back a whimper. Every fibre of her body was on fire. The very essence of her magic sang through her veins. I should have been honest with you from the start. I should have told you how I felt. I mean it, Granger. I'd wait forever for you. I should have told you I can wait, but fuck, I'm a selfish man, Granger. Once I'd had a taste of you in my arms, I knew I had to have you again. He swallowed and his eyes clenched shut. His hands trembled against her cheeks, and she couldn't stop herself from squeezing his hands in hers. I love you so fucking much, Hermione. Please, please, baby, let me prove how good we are together. We're so good together, Hermione. Draco's eyes shut open and he pulled away, and her body whined and ached in protest. He rested back on his heels, and Hermione had to look down. It was like his eyes had a hold on her. She felt as if she looked away, she would suffocate. Being held by Draco, it was like the first time she had been able to breathe easy in weeks. I'm going to ask you one more time, Hermione, Draco said slowly, and I promise I'll accept your answer, no matter what. He swallowed thickly, the hand on her knee squeezed painfully. Can you see yourself being with me? Will you give us a chance? Hermione stared at him with her mouth slightly agape, her thoughts whipping through her mind, too quickly for her to focus on clearly. The deafening pounding of her heartbeat made her ears hurt, and her skin practically vibrated under her steady and awaiting gaze. Her head throbbed, and her senses were overwhelmed with too many memories, his cologne, his slicked skin, his private smile, his possessive arm around her waist, the twinkling melody of the restaurant band in Greece, Ginny telling her how crazy he was for her, a promise to use magic the next time they decorated her flat at Christmas, his cheek nuzzling her hand under the gloomy lights of the hospital ward, her assistant believing they made a good team, the hole in her chest when she thought about him being with any other witch, how the only way she could fall asleep was if she was holding something that smelled like him now, how she had missed him, and her mind had just stared at him, her voice trapped in her throat like a cage. Draco blinked, a shaken, heavy exhale as his shoulders slumped, his face grey with resignation, and he cast his gaze towards the door. Finally got my answer then, he said with a bitter laugh, and when he looked up at her, his eyes were closed off, empty, soulless. She hated it. Understood, Granger. He stood up and left her office without a backwards glance. Hermione's eyes saw and dry as she stared at the empty doorway for minutes afterwards. He'd left. She hadn't found her words yet. He'd left. Her mouth hadn't worked. He'd left. She wanted to tell him. He'd left. Her chest trembled, and it was like sorrow and despair ripped through her muscles. Her lungs contracted tight, and her hands shook as she tried to press against her throat. Why couldn't she breathe? A ragged razor gasped tore from her throat, and her knees collided painfully with the floor when she slipped from her chair. One hand clawed at the floor desperately, her vision blurry and stinging with sultry tears, as her other hand scratched at her chest. Her insides were positively eviscerated, and a broken, blubbered sob finally freed itself from her mouth. Can you see yourself being with me? And it was minutes too late, but her mouth finally found the words that had been screaming at her from within her mind since the moment he'd asked her. No, from the moment he had sent her that first dinner invitation over a year ago. Yes, yes, I can't, she sobbed to her empty office. And in that moment, Hermione knew. She knew that all of her anguish and all of her heartache these last few weeks wasn't just because she missed him. She knew that her anger hadn't just been directed at him or her friends or her colleagues. She was angry at herself. Because with every denial, every frustration for even daring to daydream about them being something more than co-workers, every time she threw herself into another case, every time she hid behind the mountains of paperwork and legislation, she had been afraid. 
afraid of how he made her feel, afraid of how simple he made things for her, afraid of just how miserable she was without him around, afraid to admit that her excuses about being too busy were just that, excuses. It had been so much easier to say she was busy that she couldn't justify her own selfish desires against the dire life or death needs of her creatures. It had been so much easier for her to disregard Draco's invitations as just fleeting fancy, never once allowing herself even a second of her time to consider if his feeling for her were genuine. He was Draco Malfoy, and she was Hermione Granger. Of course he would have never actually wanted her, and she would have convinced herself of that. It had been so much easier for Hermione to be angry at her own feelings, convinced that he would never want her as much as she wanted him, to use that anger and redirect it to her cases, to stick her head in the sand, like he had said, so that she wouldn't have to face the fact that she needed him. So gut-wrenchingly stubborn in her own denial, she blinded herself from the truth that had screamed at her. Draco was good for her. And she hadn't been able to accept that. She hadn't been able to forgive herself for needing him. She hadn't been able to accept just how much she fell apart without him there to pull her back together. She hadn't wanted to need him. And so she'd smothered every morsel of affection, every flutter in her stomach, every daydream and fantasy she'd clawed into smithereens, convinced herself that those feelings would soon pass, that one day she would truly be able to look at him and feel nothing but professional respect for him, that one day she wouldn't want him anymore. Oh, but how she did. How she wanted him so much. It was like she couldn't breathe until he was near her. And that knowledge had always been there, lurking in the back of her mind. She knew with every to-do list she eagerly reached for. She knew with every lunchbox she gorged herself on. She knew with every sneaking glance she gave him, his wry, knowing grin fueling her to finish that particular section of her paperwork. She knew with every argument he had with her cat. She knew even before he'd given her all of that space to think for three weeks. Yes, she knew. She'd always known. And it was like a fresh wave of anguish drowned her, and she let out another wild sob. Miss Granger! Is everything... Miss Granger? Miss Granger! A lump footsteps rushed over to her, and a scent of fruity, summery perfume enveloped her, as Madley's arms cautiously wrapped around her shoulders. Miss Granger! What should I... Should I call Mr. Ra... Uh, our Potter? Hermione shook her head and turned to bury her head into her assistant's shoulder as she sobbed, the undeniable, all-consuming truth throbbing in her chest. Hermione hadn't needed these past three weeks to know that she loved him too. Chapter 9 Pansy Parkinson was in her office, and Hermione felt a terrible sense of déjà vu. Again, not just in her office, but once more, lounging in Hermione's desk chair with another pair of stilettos, that probably cost more than double of Hermione's monthly wage, rhythmically tapping against the side of her desk. And what irritated Hermione the most was that Pansy had apparently discovered her biscuit drawer. Her face screwed up into a grimace as she glared in disgust at the half-bitten biscuit delicately held between her forefingers. Remind me not to invite you along to the wedding menu tasting, Granger, Pansy drawled as she tossed the biscuit haphazardly onto Hermione's desk. Your taste in food is atrocious! Hermione bristled at the dozen of crumbs that scattered across her paperwork. Great. Great. Now she was going to have biscuit grease stains on official Wissingamot records. She strayed over to her desk and stared pointedly at her chair. Miss Parkinson, she grinded out. Pansy just raised a perfectly sculpted brow at her in return, and her eyes glittered with mirth as she refused to move. Stilted silence stretched between the pair, a non-verbal sparring for the upper hand, and her chair. Pansy's cool but amused expression morphed into a smirk, and she leaned back into the seat with a satisfied, content hum, her nails rhythmically tapping on the plush armrest. Hermione huffed and turned to sit, rather aggressively, in her guest chair, in her own office. Hermione wondered if the laws of self-defense magic applied to intrusive snakes that had accosted her seat. Her hand itched towards her wound holster as she took great pleasure in imagining a flock of canaries chasing Pansy out of her office. Her lips twitched in restrained laughter. What brings me the pleasure of your company, Parkinson? Hermione aimed for cordial. It sounded withering. Pansy looked at her, bored, as if Hermione had been the one to intrude on her. You know, contrary to what some people might think, Pansy threw Hermione a pointed look, an errand of the sacred twenty-eight has quite a lot to do. Oh, yes, 
Hermione Bat deciding which set of ostentatious wizarding robes to wear for afternoon tea was quite strenuous. A cold lick of panic stripped through her when Pansy's eyes narrowed into slits briefly, and she thought only for a moment that she had accidentally said it out loud. As far as Hermione could tell, Pansy must have just been able to read the sardonic look on her face instead, and Hermione let herself relax slightly into her chair. She sensed that this wasn't going to be a short visit. From liaising with the wedding planner? Hardly an important task, Hermione disparaged inwardly. To attending elocution lessons, mastering the varieties of ballroom dancing, maintaining and upkeeping the blood wards of the family home, learning the delicate art of networking. Again, I would highly consider you looking into that one, Granger. Hmm, maybe you should also look into doing ballet. What is with that posture? Are you trying to look like a hag? Hermione gritted her teeth and took to her old comfort of singing the Hogwarts school song in her head. That certainly worked the last time. Where was I? Hey, and of course, let's not forget learning how to manage the family finances. Whether we be old and bold. Wouldn't your father be in charge of your family's money? It wouldn't not. Hermione's brows knit together in a frown. Yes, they like to believe that they do. Pansy smirked before she tittered with a mock disproving shake of her head. Surely you, of all people, would understand the notice of not letting a man be in charge of your finances, Granger. Yes, my father arranged my diary, but I assure you it is the matriarch's duty to endeavour the longevity of our generational wealth. My mother has had me assist her in running the books since my monthlies began. Hermione gulped at Pansy's mention of a dowry. That was so archaic. Her eyes widened as a wicked voice inside her mind asked if the Malfoys would expect one from her. Our heads could do with filling with some interesting stuff. Hermione observed Pansy for a moment. He relaxed the inline positioning of her shoulders, the carefully crafted cool indifference to her face, her perfectly manicured nails. It all, indeed, radiated fine grooming. Her great-grandmother Ida would have loved Pansy, she grimed. With all of that being said, I'm sure it's clear to you now that I have very little spare time. You understand that feeling, Granger, right? Pansy said wryly, and her eyes glittered knowingly before they hardened into a short glare. So... The fact that I've spent the last three days babysitting a lovesick, depressed Draco Malfoy on my family room chaise has hardly been very beneficial for me. Hermione had known from the moment that she saw Pansy's sleek hair as she walked into her office that she was there about Draco. But the sound of his name made her jolt all the same. She hadn't seen a single strand of his hair since the day in her office, and there had been a dull, persistent ache in her heart at the idea that he was avoiding her. Avoiding her and licking his wounds at the Pansy Parkinson's family home, evidently. Hermione hoped that she didn't look as meek as she felt with her shoulders sunk inward and her heart shriveled and cold in her chest. Was he really that miserable? A small voice in her had wondered how quickly she could apparate to the Parkinson's estate and twitched towards her wound. Is he okay? She whispered instead, her eyes focused on a scuff mark on her desk. Sure, Pansy scoffed. He only went and had his heart stomped and pillaged by the love of his life, and now seems to be on some kind of shower strike, greatly appreciated, Granger. It's not like he's stinking up a family antique or anything. Not to mention, he's drowning a bottle of two-century-old fire whiskey like it's pepper-up potion. But yeah, he's okay, she sneered. Hermione stared at her, horrified. And you, you're just letting him. He could seriously hurt himself. I don't think you're in any position to be criticizing me about Draco's well-being right now, Granger, Pansy said icily. It was like ash in Hermione's mouth as the bitter truth of Pansy's words hit her. Is this the part where you curse me in retribution? Have you forgotten the part where I had no idea Draco and I were in a relationship? I'm sure you and Nod have laughed about it plenty of times over the past year, Hermione snapped back. Do you save the moral outrage for someone who actually cares, Granger? Pansy examined her nails, her face blank with boredom. I'm sure Porter's glasses steam up with excitement every time he gets the opportunity to do a big inspirational speech. So you should save your breath. Besides, Pansy looked at her, her eyes dark and fixed like a viper. Was it really so awful finding out that you were dating him? Hermione swallowed nervously as she struggled to avoid staring at the spot on the floor where she'd cried into her assistant's shoulder for nearly an hour. The spot where Draco had confessed his love for her. The spot where Hermione admitted to herself that she loved him back. 
her heart twisted in her chest. He li- He never told me how he really felt. Pansy cut her off with an impatient wave. Yes, truly really tragic. The emotionally repressed man couldn't just speak his emotionally stunted girlfriend. We've all spent many a night weeping into our pillows over it. She drawled before her eyes narrowed shrewdly. But from what I've gathered, it's not like you would have given him a chance anyways. Hermione flicked her tongue across her teeth in irritation. And what's that supposed to mean? She gritted out. Damn it, dumb Granger. We both know it's beneath you. Every time he invited you out for dinner, did you really think he just wanted to split some lobster with you? Pansy laughed scornfully. She sat upright in Hermione's chair and glared at Hermione with utter disdain. <laughs> he is trite. I swear to Sassy, he's trite, Granger. But you didn't want to hear it, did ye? You just stuffed that ugly, bushy hair of your into your ears, lamenting about your poor, defenseless house elves. And how could we forget about your psychotically deranged beast that needed your precious help? Oh, but of course, the savage manticore who have slayed Alcans for centuries is so much more important than Draco's feelings. Pansy rose from the chair and leaned her hands against the desk. Her eyes were lethal in their venom as she sneered down at Hermione. You were more than happy to use his body when you got all wound up, and I bet you just loved having your own personal chef to cook you your meals every week. You were awful getting a taste of what it meant to be Draco Malfoy's girlfriend, as long as it meant you didn't have to give him anything in return, right? Did you ever even once stop to consider his feeling in all of this? Pansy tilted her head to the side, a mockery of a pout on her lips as she pondered. Did you really not have any time, Granger? Or was that just an excuse, hmm? What? Big, brave Gryffindor princess couldn't handle the fact that this great death eater Malfoy fancied her? Or was that some kind of petty revenge for the war? Anger boiled in Hermione's stomach, her spine straightened in defense. Pansy's eyes narrowed farther, and she leaned in closely and practically hissed. You got tortured by a psychotic aunt, whilst he just stood by and watched, and you decided a little payback was needed? Proof that the good-for-nothing bully has a heart after all, and then crush it in your stubby, ungroomed fingers? Hermione snapped to her feet. Her bristled and sparked painfully against her neck. How dare you, Hermione seized. How dare you think even for one second that I would ever hold the action of his family against him? We were, for Merlin's sake, we were all just kids. I don't give a ruddy ass about his past, Parkinson. He has proved to me more than enough times that he is not that cruel, vindictive boy from our school years. He's, he's... Hermione's nose burned, and she stubbornly blinked back the salty tears that threatened to fall. She couldn't tell if they were from a heartache or rage. Draco Malfoy is one of the greatest wizards I've ever had the pleasure of knowing, she said vehemently. He's brilliant. He's intelligent. He's so bloody charming it'll make your teeth rot. He's probably going to run against me for Minister of Magic one day. And damn it, I'm not sure he'd lose. He, Hermione exhaled heavily, perhaps pressed tightly together to bite back a sob. He, he takes care of me in more ways than I can ever possibly count, and he's never once asked for anything in return. If it wasn't for him, I'd, I'd, I'd have, I'd have probably fainted my way into a permanent bed in some mangoes. And the acknowledgement of that hurt. If it wasn't for Draco intervening at the right time, what Ron and Harry said to her a few weeks ago was right. She was heading for a breakdown, whether she would have ever admitted that to herself or not. Her chest was hollow. Merlin, how could Hermione be so intelligent, yet so equally hopeless? Hermione shook her head, her eyes fixed on the floor as thick tears finally fell. I did make excuses, but not because of him. She spat and she looked up, mustering up as much anger as she could to glare at Pansy. It, it was because of me, she swallowed miserably. I'm not good enough for him. You're right. I didn't think about how he felt. I didn't let myself think about how he truly felt. I, I took all the attention I could get as long as it didn't interfere with my work and I couldn't, I couldn't give myself the opportunity to let my feelings by him grow. I was being selfish. I'm a selfish man, Granger. Hermione's chest lurched in a weak laugh. Oh, how wrong Draco was. She had been the one to push away her feeling, refused to let her thoughts get carried away about him. She had, as Draco said, stuck her head in the sand, too afraid to face the truth in her heart. And yet, she'd still eagerly tacked along on every adventure. She'd still lick up every crumb of the food he cooked for her. She'd basked under every touch, every kiss, 
every moment sweet nothings against her skin, and then she had proceeded to act as if they were nothing more than desk bodies the next day. Granted, Draco would then carefully plot another evening, minced over his words so that he gave nothing away, and he had had literally hundreds of opportunities to come clean with her. Another part of her argued. Maybe they were both as selfish as each other. Draco's mirthful words, when they'd been reunited after his Bollywood case, trickled into her mind, and just fluttered in bitter sweetness. What a pair they made, indeed. Hermione blinked out of her thoughts, and fixed her glare on Pansy. So don't you dare come in here and insinuate that I think I'm too good for Draco when that's when it's just the complete opposite. Time seemed to be endless, and Pansy stared at Hermione, and she had begun to wonder if Pansy had actually zoned out during Hermione's impassioned speech. When Pansy's face oozed into a knowing, triumphant smirk, and she stood up straight, her chin cocked towards the ceiling in sheer satisfaction. A pit fell from Hermione's stomach when she realized that she might have just fallen into Pansy's trap, that she had given Pansy exactly what she wanted. You love him, it wasn't a question. Hermione felt all of the blood drain from her face, her heart ferocious pounding against her ribcage as she stammered. You love him, Pansy interrupted her pathetic quivering, and for whatever reason, instead of pulling up your granny knickers and dealing with it like any normal witch, you hid behind your stacks of paperwork. A mannequin nail flicked at a mountain of files that were perched dangerously close to the edge of the desk, and her voice lowered, her earlier venom trickling back in. As long as you had your pathetic little creatures, you were safe, right? You could remain in blissful ignorance and have your little work husband without having to face any of the ugly consequences of your action. What are you? What consequences? You don't even realize just how far gone Draco is for you, do you? Pansy cut her off, and her pupils fled hotly. All you'd have to do is toss that hideous, uncanny plate of yours over your shoulder and bet your big muggle born doe eyes at him, and he'd come running to pant at your feet, ready to lick up any drop of measly attention you could be bothered to give. Pansy was positively bursting with rage, a usually poised demeanor all but forgotten. Yet Hermione could still detect the faintest layer of pain and distraught in her face, and it hit her that for as long as Draco had been withholding his feelings for her, Pansy must have been holding back a year's worth of anger and pain for her dear friend. Hermione couldn't help but picture every business dinner, every time she sat with Draco's arm on the back of her chair, every time he leaned in to murmur some sly quip about his friends in her ear, and Hermione would try in vain not to tremble in arousal as his hot breath licked down her neck. Every time she and Draco argued over whose turn it was to pay the bill, whilst the other couple sat there smirking at their antiques. Had Pansy really been filled with silent loathing towards her, biting her tongue every time? Manu already knew that Pansy didn't like her. That was obvious enough, a sentiment that was wholeheartedly returned. But the fact that Pansy had to sit back and watch as her friend and ex-boyfriend made himself suffer for over a year made her mind's stomach twist with acidic guilt and pity. Pansy was still raging. Every dinner rejection, every time you tossed him back through the flue, once we're done using him like one of your filthy little muggle toys, Draco still gave and gave with no regards to his own mental state. All of those precious little private museum tools. Do you even know how much those cost him? Playing healer for you, slaving away like a bloody house elf week after week so that you don't faint at your desk because apparently the only other food worthy of touching Granger's lips are some nasty little stale biscuits. Draco's beyond in love with you, Merlin knows why, and he's so stupidly in love that he won't stop to consider just how unhealthy this is for him. Do you even know how many times Theo and I have pleaded, have begged for him to just quit his job just to get away from you? Pansy rounded the desk, her expression so cold it made the hackers on the back of her minus neck rise. You, as poisonous as those rotten biscuits of yours, Granger. Her voice was deathly quiet. So, yes, you're quite right. You don't deserve him. In fact, it wouldn't be so much as a blimp in my day if you were to go full Janus Thickney from your job and spend the rest of your life drooling into your pumpkin juice. But Draco would be devastated. And frankly, like I said earlier, I don't have the time to be stitching him back together. Pansy leaned in, and coming up to tuck a stray curl behind Hermione's ear. A spiteful nail scratched rather painfully against the delicate skin, the nasty cow, as she murmured, So pull that broomstick out of your surprisingly pert ass. 
push that bushy hair out of your eye and try to see things from Draco's perspective. With a light, cordial smile that clashed terribly with the warning iciness of her eyes, Pansy flicked her brows up and wriggled her fingers in goodbye. Hermione wondered how much restraint it took for Pansy to not barge into her shoulders as she breezily headed towards the door. Oh, and Granger! And really, couldn't these Slytherins ever leave a room without a final dramatic word? Hermione bit back a huff and turned on her heel to toss her a glare. The faintest hint of amusement danced in Pansy's eyes before her expression cooled once more. I hear that Lady Malfoy has sought to deal with your party ropes personally. Make no mistake about it, Granger. Even if it means me imperioing you, I will be seeing that outfit at my engagement party. With a final smirk and wink, Pansy disappeared behind a doorframe and left Hermione to wonder what the odds were of her being able to install blood wards around her outfit. A Tupperware box appeared on her desk around lunchtime, whilst Hermione was sluggishly working her way through her documents. She stared at it. Her eyes burning as salty tears swarmed her vision. There was no note. You always left a note. Hermione's chest ruptured. He clearly didn't even want to speak to her anymore. Her quill and paperwork forgotten, Hermione's head sank into her hands and she sought. She cried until the steam had long faded and she could no longer feel the warmth from the container. Draco still hadn't returned to the department and her mind had poisoned her over and over again with the image of the tortured, heart-splitting pain of his eyes that day he walked out of her office, out of her life. Hermione had never felt more miserable in her entire existence. She had tried to find the courage to owl him, night after night, and yet, every time she was about to tie the letter to the postal old lab, Pansy's acidic words would screech in her mind. Hermione was poisonous for him. And the more she reflected on Pansy's words, the more she couldn't help but wonder if she was right. Hermione was stubborn. She had cowered away from her feelings. And she was so work-focused, she barely even managed more than half a night's sleep. How could she so selfishly expect Draco to put up with that for the rest of his life? No, she wouldn't let him. And so, she would let the owl angrily nip at her fingers from another wasted journey. And she would spend as much of the night as she could until her head was about to snap off from her neck in exhaustion. Buried neck deep, into her case first, as a small voice in the back of her mind pleaded with her to stop punishing herself. Hermione never listened, but her body quickly began to wear down. No longer fueled by her self-deprecating rage like a couple of weeks ago, it had been an exceedingly difficult couple of days for her as she worked through the endless ocean of paperwork, and her mind was just exhausted. And it was showing in her work. She'd made spelling errors, forgotten to send old cases back to the archives, had missed a follow-up meeting with Mr. Wilk, who, judging me by the foul hollow waiting for her on her desk the next morning, was none too happy about that. And I'd included the wrong hearing request with the appropriate case. So now two cases had to be backlogged while she started the finding motion all over again. And Hermione couldn't even bring herself to care. At that realization, her spine went tight, her blood cold. Her head slowly lifted from her hands, and she blinked. It was like her eyes were the clearest they had been in a long time, as she took in the hundreds of pieces of paper, the dozen or so unopened manila folders, and the sticky memo notes that bordered the edges of her desk. Her neck throbbed. There had been a sharp pinch under her left shoulder blade for days now. A glance to the mirror next to the desk showed her bloodshot, bruised eyes. Her skin was alarmingly sallow, and her right hand had a tremor from how tightly she had been clenching her quill. If Hermione couldn't feel the shuddering of her own pulsing heartbeat, she'd have assumed that she was close to death. Her eyes stung with tears again as she gasped at her appearance. What was she doing to herself? Had she let herself slip so far down that she didn't even care about her job anymore? Her chest clenched painfully when she realized how she had felt more irritated and concerned by these creatures the past couple of days. Her throat closed off, guilt and shame suffocating her. Harry and Ron were right. She was going to ruin herself. Merlin had really only taken just a few weeks without him being there for her to fall back into her old toxic habits. She needed to get out of there. She needed a break. She looked back at her desk, her stomach twisting with nausea as she took in all of the untouched paperwork again. Shaking her head in fear and disgust and denial, she couldn't quite tell. She pushed her chair back from her desk and her knees trembled as she stood and headed towards her door. Laura, I apologize for the sudden notice, but I'm taking some time off, Hermione announced to the apparent shock of her assistant. 
Madly blinked rapidly, and Hermione could practically see her brain whirring away as she tried to process what she had said. You, you, you as in, you aren't going to be here? Madly gawped at her. Hermione nodded and she was surprised at just how comforting and relieving it felt to say those words. Yes, I, um, I think I need a break. She smiled apologetically at her assistant. Can you rearrange my meetings? I, um, I don't think I'll be in for the rest of the week. She could have sworn Madly actually sagged in relief and her assistant nodded enthusiastically. Yes, I'll do that right away, Miss Granger. She reached for her quill and ink pad, already scrolling away. Before she looked back up, a genuine, happy smile on her face. Enjoy the rest of your week, Miss Granger. You've more than earned it. As it turned out, taking a few days off from work wasn't as daunting as Hermione had feared it would be. The bruising from underneath her eyes had faded, and she no longer looked a breast distance away from death. Of course, there was still that annoying entity in the back of her mind that cruelly whispered about the mounds of cases on her desk, the dozens of creatures that were waiting to her back from her, that she was being selfish and sloppy. But by the morning of the second day, the voice had already begun to quiet, and there was a relaxed ease to her shoulders that Hermione hadn't felt in some time. And if she kept herself busy with household chores that she had been putting off for weeks, it was easy to ignore the slight anxious clench of her chest that appeared whenever she found herself imagining being set at her desk in her empty, hydrangeal-less office. The moon was high in the sky by the time Hermione had all but completed her chores for the day and was sorting away her freshly washed clothes into her drawers. Hermione bent down and opened up the third drawer, her back stiff from standing up for so long and her bones groaned in protest. To put away her dark blouses, when she paused, her eyes going wide. One of Draco's cashmere jumpers lay folded up neatly to the side. Hermione exhaled heavily, a trembling hand reaching to stroke the buttery soft fabric. Apples and cedar would reach her nostrils, and her eyes widened. Her hand delicately pulled the jumper from its place and brought it to her face. She breathed in the scent of his cologne, and it was like Hermione was floating in a peaceful, still lake. Her hat grew hazy and full. Her limbs heavy as she clumsily pulled the fabric over her head. Every fibre of her body melted in comfort and she curled her arms tight across her waist. With her scent around her, she could almost pretend it was his arms she was wrapped up in. With her abandoned washing basket nudged to the side, Hermione headed for her bed. With her chin tucked into her chest and her hands curled into the sleeves of Draco's jumper, Hermione was out before her head met the pillow. It was the best night's sleep she had had in weeks. Do you think I overreacted with Draco? Hermione asked once Ginny had safely manoeuvred her pregnant belly into the dining room chair. Free from the taunting mountains of paperwork, Hermione had finally let herself sit down and reflect over the last couple of weeks. Her flat was too large and too empty of life for her now, and she couldn't help but wonder who she had been silently punishing more, Draco or herself. Eventually her thoughts had begun to overwhelm her, and she'd rather spontaneously invited herself to the Potter's house for an afternoon of some much-needed, furless and human company. Yes, Harry said, his lip passed over the rim of his teacup. Gee, think a little quicker, would you, Harry? Hermione said dryly. In a rather pantomime pause, Harry's eyes squinted in faint consideration. Hmm, yes. I like you better when you lived in a cupboard, Potter. Hermione grumbled and crossed her arms together, sulkily. Harry and Ginny both snorted. Hermione, just can you explain to me again exactly why you were so mad? Ginny frowned at her and raised her hand to count on her fingers. I mean, ye fancied him. Ye willingly spent time with him outside of work, and ye shacked him rotten every chance you got. Harry gagged, his ears flushing when the pair rolled their eyes at him, and turned to watch his son duel his teddy bears with a stick that James had found in their garden. He never told me that they were dates, Hermione sighed, feeling like a broken record. And yet, each time she had to explain herself, even she could tell that her excuses had grown weak and Hermione had grown irritated with her own stubborn self. Her explanations drained her, like it used up more energy to give an excuse than to just simply admit how she felt. Her heaving sobs on the floor of her office flashed in her mind, and Hermione paused to take a sip of a drink and was very grateful for the way that Harry and Ginny artfully ignored her hand that trembled against the handle. Why is it so hard for everyone to believe that I thought it was just a night out with a colleague? Is it really so absurd a thought? Yes, because I too regularly visit museums after hours in exclusive tours and then can noodle with my co-worker in a changing room, Harry quipped and bit back a snicker when Hermione flushed. 
Ginny turned to look at her husband with an impish grin. Which K worker? Is it Sergeant Morgan? He's rather dishy. She smirked at the way that Harry paled, his eyes narrowing in a light scowl behind the thick brims of his glasses. Remind me not to bring you to the Christmas office party this year, Harry said and returned Ginny's gesture when she playfully stuck out her tongue at him. Hermione smiled, observing the pair. They truly were good together, good for each other, like how Draco was for her. Pansy's venomous words from that fateful day in her office hissed in her ear, and her smile dropped away as quickly as it had appeared. Hermione thumped the rim of her cup, the pit in her stomach hollow and achy. Parkinson said I'm poisonous for him, she whispered, and her bottom lip trembled. Harry frowned and shook his head, a shocking mess of dark hair falling into his eyes. That's a bit harsh, not to mention untrue and unfair. Harry reached over to squeeze her hand in comfort. Malfoy told you he knew what he was doing. He's a grown man, Hermione. He could have called you in any time, but he didn't. Parkinson, that wasn't fair of her to put the blame on you. And since when do you give a crap about what Parkinson thinks about you? Harry stared at her, aghast. Parkinson doesn't know you like we do, Jenny chimed in. She only can see things from his side. She's probably just being overprotective. Besides, how many friends actually like their friends' partners? She probably just doesn't think anyone's good enough for him. Slytherins, you know, they have some intense, deep-seated sense of loyalty for their own. Ginny shrugged and looked at Hermione with a warm smile. Don't let her get to you. It's probably what she wants. Okay, but do you think I was stringing him along? I mean, did it seem like I was using him? Hermione looked at them both imploringly, her shoulders drooping when they both shifted uncomfortably in their seats. Be honest. Harry scratched behind his ear and smiled weakly at her. It's not that simple, Hermione. It's it's a weird situation you were in, you know. There was bound to be some imbalances between you two. I'm not saying that you did it on purpose, he added quickly when he saw how her face sunk, collapsing against the back of her seat defeatedly. No, no, we know you, Hermione. You care so deeply for people. How could we ever think that you would intentionally do something like that to him? He fiddled with his glasses, a hand brushing away his messy hair. I mean, do you want us to sit here and blame you for not pulling your weight in a relationship that you didn't even know you were in? Come on, Hermione, that's mental. Like I said, Hermione, Pansy doesn't know you like we do, Ginny began carefully. And I do agree with Harry, but Hermione, but Hermione, did you really not once think about how Malfoy felt about your situation? Hermione shook her head, ashamed. Gods, I, I could have been so selfish, she said, her voice thick with guilt, and she stared into her teacup. It felt like a pile of bricks was pressing down on her spine, suffocating her, and she inhaled a pained, sharp breath. Thick, salty tears burned her eyes as they cascaded down her cheeks. Denial is one hell of a weapon, Hermione. Don't be so harsh on yourself, Ginny said with a comforting pat to her shoulder. Hermione's eyes clenched tightly and her mind raced to change the topic. I've taken some time off work, she said, and straightened up and wiping away at her tears aggressively. Harry and Ginny both blinked at her in surprise, and her mind chuckled at a deep scrutinizing scanning of Harry's eye, like he had a sudden thought that she was someone else in a polyjuice disguise, ever the paranoid aura. Alistair Moody would have been so proud. Harry relaxed after a few moments and shrugged. That would explain why you're here, son's ministry files on a Thursday afternoon. He looked at her in concern. Hermione, it's not, you haven't, I mean, it's voluntary leave, right? Many witches in lime green robes flashed in her mind and her nails stuck into her palms to hold back a shudder. She nodded vigorously and sent him a reassuring smile. Yes, um, I kind of had this thought that I, um, I may not exactly manage my time well, she finished lamely. Harry blinked. And the bezoa is a universal poison antidote, he said dryly, after a beat and winked at her when she sent him a playful glare. She huffed out a laugh before swallowing bitterly. I don't even know how it happened. How did, how did, how did I even let it get so bad? She whispered, annoyance creeping through her when she felt her eyes burn with tears again. Hermione shook her head. I thought the more cases I took on, the more control I had. The more cases I could focus on, then I, I don't know what I thought. She had never felt more lost. 
Why do you find it so hard to take a break, Hermione? Ginny asked quietly. Hermione just shrugged. Her eyes burned into the lace pattern of the tablecloth. Silence fell over the trio for a few moments, broken only occasionally by James' gargled incantations and yells as he dueled his inanimate teddies. As always, Harry began and paused to clear his throat. <clears throat> it's mandatory for us to have a monthly counselling session with a mind healer. We are surrounded by dark magic and wizards every day, you know. And every six months we have to take enforced leave for two weeks. We're not even allowed to do desk work or we get sanctioned by robots. Well, Hermione would have bloody hoped so. She had witnessed firsthand just how draining some of those cases had been on Harry and Ron. Every six months was outrageous. If it were up to Hermione, they'd be placed on leave every 12 weeks. She frowned at him as she wondered why Harry had brought it up. I know you're not dealing with any dark wizards day in, day out, but Hermione, have you ever noticed? I mean, we were on the run for a year during the war, and then when it ended, you went straight back to Hogwarts. I know you wanted to do your notes. Harry held up his hand when Hermione opened her mouth to rebut. But you finished your exams, and then you flew straight to Australia and spent eight months with healers to fix your parents' memories. And then you came back home and immediately joined your department. I mean... Merlin, Hermione, when was the last time you actually willingly took a break that was longer than a weekend? Her cheeks prickled in shame when she realized that she couldn't name a single occasion. Harry smiled at her with pity. I think it might be worth you speaking with our department's mind healer. I think you need some help, Hermione. I think, I think you might have, well, I, actually, I don't know what, but you should really speak to someone. I'll send an owl if you'd like. He asked gently. Draco helps me, Hermione whispered meekly. And that's great, Hermione, Jenny nodded. Really it is, but you know deep down that you can't keep relying on someone else to step in at the right moment and force you to stop when you need to. You need to want to stop on your own. I think you owe it to yourself to at least try after all these years. Jenny was right, and it was like boulders of shame pushing down on her chest. Hermione had grown too dependent on him. He'd slithered into her whee, he'd slithered into her life effortlessly, and Hermione had let herself get comfortable in the routine of it all. She'd let herself become reliant on Draco, and now that she no longer had the external stability, she'd become lost. She'd lost herself. A small voice in the back of her mind reminded her that she'd been lost to her bad habits long before Draco came into her life, and her eyes pinched shut, scouring memories of lime green robes and her desperate pleading swarming around her mind. Maybe Harry was right. Maybe she didn't to speak to someone. How could she have lost so much control? Do you, do you think that's why you can't let yourself commit to a relationship? Ginny interrupted her miserable musings, chewing on her bottom lip. Her brows married in a frown as she looked at Hermione in contemplation. Do you believe it's somehow a waste of your time? Hermione thought back to her conversation with Pansy and shook her head. No, no, it's not like that. Draco, he's, he's just so wonderful, even before we, you know, for the first time. He was just brilliant. He's the best colleague I've ever had. He just made everything effortless. She passed a smile sadly at Harry, who frowned at her, his eyes dark with guilt. It's like you said, Harry. I'm a mess when I'm stressed. And I know my job is stressful, but I love it. I love my job. I love the red tape and a challenging precedent and the legislation. I love dealing with temperamental creatures because I know it's the first time that they're feeling like they're actually being hurt, and I want to do the best that I can for them. And if that means I can't go on romantic holidays or spontaneous visits to an exhibition, then there's a sacrifice I'm willing to make. Or at least she used to be, she tacked on internally. The scent of the again sea and Draco's cologne as she danced in his arms wafted through her mind. Her own voice pleading with her to stay in that moment forever. The memory of Draco armresting her cat for a meagre slice of toast. The softness of his lips against hers as she kissed away his sulky pout. Her breakfasts were so dull now. Draco deserves better than me, Hermione said, her head bowed in resignation. He seemed pretty happy to me, Hermione, Ginny rebutted with a quirk of her brow. The man said he loves you, for Merlin's sake. You must have done something right. Harry nodded. Hermione. Weren't you upset with him because you felt like he had taken your choices away from you? He pressed his lips together when Hermione shrugged half-heartedly. She didn't even know if she believed that anymore. 
by deciding that you're not enough for him, aren't you taking away the choice from him too? Harry continued. Shouldn't that be something that he decides for himself? Are you just not doing the exact same thing to him now? Shame clouded over her head. He had a point. She wondered if the universe was laughing at her over his twisted irony. Hermione, for bugger's sake, Ginny huffed as she tried to lean forward, her pregnant belly obstructing her path. She shot her husband a side glare. Good luck trying to do this to me a third time, Potter. A watery laugh left Hermione's chest as Harry coughed and pointedly looked away from the pair, his ears flushed as deep fuchsia as his cheeks. Ginny tossed her a quick wink before her face relaxed, her warm eyes compassionate yet firm. Hermione, do you admit, his reception aside, how happy you've been this past year? Ginny asked and nodded alongside Hermione. Then surely that's what you should be focusing on. Look, just forget about how hurt you were for a minute, as justifiable as you were in that regard. But how do you feel about him, truly? Her heart trembled in her chest and she looked down at the tablecloth again. But all she could see was Draco's private smile, just quivered on a shaky inhale. I love him, she confessed. Ginny let out an excited gasp from somewhere above her head, her hand shooting out to squeeze Hermione's. Hermione, look at me. Harry's voice was steady and soothing. She did so, and a wave of comfort washed over her at the knowing glint of his eyes, his lips lopsided in a fond, exacerbated smile. With all due respect, if you love him, why the hell are you set here at our kitchen table? Mare for Manor was as grandiose as it was imposing. The tall, ivy-wrapped gates stood before a long, graveled path. Lush, freshly groomed hatches mirrored each side, leading up to the marble steps of the entrance some hundred yards away from where Hermione stood. Hermione shifted on each foot, her bottom lip sore and swollen with the abuse from her teeth as she stewed over her thoughts. What was she doing here? Would he even want to see her? Hermione hadn't outright rejected him that day in her office, but who was to say that he hadn't interpreted her unwilling silence as a way of letting him down gently? How many rejections could one wizard take before he had enough? After all, he had spent the last couple of days at Pansy's place, and it was grimly clear to Hermione how they thought of her over there. What if Pansy had told him what she told Hermione? That Hermione, indeed, wasn't good enough for him. That she was selfish and often one-tracked minded when she got stuck into one of her case files. What if Pansy warmed down and Draco agreed that Hermione wasn't worth it? That she wasn't worthy of him? She loved Draco, truly. She loved him with every fibre of her being, and it was like every nerve was on fire from his touch, from just one look from him. And it apparently loved her, too. Through every little late night at her desk, every battle with her cat, every time she had pulled away from him, resetting the mockery of a boundary that she called a professional relationship. And yet, even though she loved him back, she had still broken his heart. She didn't deserve him. Pansy told her to look at the things from Draco's perspective, and she had. When he had asked her out on three separate occasions, she had rejected him. When she discovered the truth, she had kicked him out of her flat and ignored him for three weeks. When he told her he loved her, she hadn't been able to say that. Merlin, what was she doing here, she thought again. She cast Harry and Ginny for convincing her to go to him. Surely he wouldn't still want her after she'd all but thrown his feelings in his face. And it wasn't like he would never be able to move on from her, Pansy's dramatic claims aside. He'd marry his beautiful, pure-blood wife and live in their beautiful yet terrifying manner, and Hermione would spend the rest of her life exhausted and miserable in her stupid, lonely office. A pop from behind her jolted Hermione out of her thoughts. She spun around eagerly, all of her anxieties and self-deprecating musings from just a moment ago quickly forgotten. There were three important words ready to spill from her mouth, to apologize for her stubbornness, her denial, her fear, to them just how much she wanted to be with him, to... to... See a small female house elf stood curiously, yet proudly in front of her? She tried not to let the crushing disappointment show on her face as she smiled politely at the creature. Hello, my name is Hermione Granger, and you are? We is Twonka, Miss Granger. Twonka bowed deeply, her white bugged eyes shining with delight. It is an honor to finally meet you, Miss Granger. We is hearing so much about you from the young master, Miss Granger. The um, master Malfoy talks about me? Hermione asked with a thick swallow, her tongue suddenly too large for her mouth, as if she'd been spiked with a ton-tongue toffee. 
Trockel nodded enthusiastically, and her bat-winged ear slapped against her cheeks in a way that surely must have been bothersome, but her face betrayed no such emotion. Only sheer wonder and delight. Hermione would have even said that the elf looked awestruck, and she shifted on her feet in slight discomfort and embarrassment. Oh, yes, Master Malfoy is saying many wonderful things about Miss Granger. Trunkel frowned suddenly, and her fingers toyed nervously with the hem of her surprisingly tailored dress apron. Oh, he's terribly sorry, miss, but the young master is not at home at this moment. What? Hermione's spine was tight with disappointment. Surely he wasn't still at the Parkinson estate. Hermione could only imagine the variety of blood curses that would be cast upon her if she so much as dropped a hair onto Pansy's grounds. Well, he's most terribly sorry, Miss Granger. He's not knowing when he will be back. He's deeply wrong for Miss Granger's wasted journey. Trunkle's nurse practically touched the floor from her deep apologetic bow, and Hermione hurried to crouch in front of her. No, no, oh, please don't apologize. Hermione laid a gentle hand on the elf's bony shoulder. Really, I never notified the family of my visit. I am rather intruding, to be honest. Um, do you know where he is? Master Malfoy has been summoned to Cumbria for work is all we is knowing, miss. Hermione frowned. He didn't tell me. She got herself off with a blush at her foolishness. Tronco's eyes glazed over for a moment before they refocused and beamed blindingly at her. The lady of the manor is requesting your presence, Miss Granger. The little elf practically bounced in delight at that order, and Hermione blanched, panicked positively wet against her spine and awkwardly scrambled to her feet. Her knees pinched in sharp protest at the sudden movement, and Hermione groaned. No, really, it's okay, Hermione began before long, alarmingly thin fingers gripped around her wrist in shocking strength, and she felt a telltale pull of her navel as the ground vanished from beneath her feet as the elf apparated them through the walls. She was in a conservatory, was the first thing that Hermione noticed, and her muscles oozed in relief. She didn't think she was prepared enough to step foot back into that drawing room. It was rather grand. She reckoned every square foot of her family home could have fit into this one room alone, and seemed to resemble that of an arboretum more than a conservatory. The gentle trickling of a nearby indoor lily pond and the bright leaves of the spirea bushes added a soothing layer of comfort to the layout of the room. A peculiar-looking plant caught her eyes. The vertical stripes of its leaves seemingly dancing under her gaze. Hermione barely noticed her feet moving closer to the plant, her head growing fuzzy as her hand inched closer. I wouldn't get so close if I were you. Like being doused with cold water, Hermione leapt backwards and her head throbbed with a jarring sudden clarity at how close she had gotten to the plant, which now that she could think clearly had hundreds of sharp, slick teeth around its thin, pointed stalk. She looked around at the sound of the amused voice and paled at the sight of Mrs. Malfoy, sat only a couple of feet away at an antique white iron garden table. Narcissa's lips twitched and a perfectly poised brow rest at her questioner. Hermione realized with belated mortification that she had curtsied at the sight of the matriarch. Arisa mea consanguineum, also known as Himalayan cobra lily, Hermione finished, and made the wise decision to step out of the plant's enchantment range. A flick of surprise blinked across Narcissa's face, and Hermione's chest puffed out in slight pride at the thought that she might have just impressed her. Narcissa's lips pursed in contemplation as she looked up at her thoughtfully. You've studied the art of botany, Miss Granger. Hermione, please, and, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, yes. As a part of my notes, it, a type of apology and potions, I found. Helps indeed. Narcissa's voice twinkled, and she gestured for the seat opposite her. Please join me, Miss Granger. Hermione said and blushed when Henny knocked against the table. The delicate fine shiner rattled dangerously on the tabletop, and she looked at Narcissa sheepishly, the colour of her cheeks deepening at the startled yet amused glint in Narcissa's eyes. Once settled, and she had waited for the unnerving rattling of the teacups to stop, Hermione looked back over at the plant and frowned. Forgive me, Miss Malfoy, but I thought the plant's hypnotism charms were only effective if the plant had bloomed in the soil under the Himalayan mountains. I mean, that's why it's safe for them to be in the muggle laboratories. The soil is protected under both magical and muggle conservation laws, so they should be harmless. Correct again, Miss Granger. 
but the law only came into effect three decades ago, and the Malfoy family has been in possession of the plant long before then. Under the right care, the cobra lily can live for up to two centuries. I believe Madame Windsor over there is still a sprightly young seventy-five, as I said Riley, and I am told by the gardener that her venom doesn't feel a day over fifty. Great Cersei, a genuine, fully bloomed Himalayan cobra lily was plotted not ten feet away from her, and she'd already almost been poisoned by it. Her insides practically vibrated with giddiness, and Hermione could only hope that she wasn't drooling with the academic possibilities of it all. Her reason for being there struck Hermione like a brick, and she dipped her head timidly, abashed that she had let herself get distracted and forgotten her manners. Oh, how her great-grandmother would colour Hermione's buttocks at her cheek. I apologise for the sudden intrusion, Mrs Malfoy. I know I should have notified Draco earlier. Yes, well. Given the number of times that my son has snuck out of family dinners to spend the evening in more pleasurable company, it was only a matter of time before he tried to sneak you under my roof. Narcissa's lip curved into a smirk around the rim of her teacup. Hermione's stomach swooped in mortification and her ears burned hotly. I, no, that's not, I wasn't here to, we're not, she stammered, her head shaking furiously. I'm only teasing you, Miss Granger. I'm aware that you and my son are going through a rough patch, Narcissa said, and her brow slowly raised conspiratorially. All too convenient that Draco was called away to the opposite end of the country in a work emergency. Would you not agree? So Draco was avoiding her, she thought, and her shoulders bowed inwards, her heart seized and killed. Clearly sensing her mood shift, Narcissa tactfully asked about the goblin case that she was working on. Hermione blinked briefly whiplashed at the sudden topic change, but eagerly went on to inform Narcissa of her progress for the next several minutes. I'm, I'm actually taking some time off right now, Hermione confessed afterwards, tucking a wayward curl behind her ear. But when I go back, I'll be submitting the request for an official hearing date. I do believe a dear old friend of mine works in that New Zealand bank, Miss Granger. I can write to him to request a witness statement if you think that will help your case, Narcissa offered. Hermione God, before nodding enthusiastically. Oh, that would be wonderful. Thank you, Mrs. Malfoy. Uh, I mean, if it's not too much trouble. I don't want to impose, she said, backtracking quickly, and her neck prickled hotly. Narcissa waved airily. It would be my pleasure, Miss Granger. Comfortable silence fell between the pair. The gentle trickling of the lily pond danced around the walls of the conservatory. Hermione waited for Narcissa to finish her sip of a drink before she spoke again. Mrs. Malfoy, when you visited my office last month, she began and her tongue flicked out to lick her lip nervously. You told me how Draco once came to you to ask her to cheer me up. Hermione fiddled with her fingers in her lap. The calm indifference of Narcissa's face did not blink and she nodded once. I did. Hermione bit her lip and focused her eyes on a collection of oncidium orchids plotted just behind Narcissa. Why did, I mean, why would he... What would you really like to know, Miss Granger? Hermione's eyes shot back to Narcissa's, and she pulled back her shoulder determinedly. How long has Draco been in love with me? How long had he been suffering in silence, waiting for the day that Hermione could possibly return his feelings, waiting for Hermione to get over herself? Narcissa paused and observed her for a moment, with the faintest scrutinizing tightness to her eyes. Hermione thought back to the suspicion in her office about Narcissa being a legal demons, and she let the thought project clearly in her mind. I love him. Once more, Narcissa's expression did not change, but her shoulders relaxed almost imperceptibly, and the intensity of her gaze softened. Hermione could have sworn she saw another flicker of impressed surprise in her eyes for a brief moment. I do not wish to burden you with that knowledge, Miss Granger, Narcissa said carefully, before she glanced at her pointedly. And in any case, that is for my son to tell you, not to myself. Hermione felt rightfully chastised, her cheeks pinched warm with embarrassment. Goodness, how many more times would she put her foot in her mouth in front of Draco's mother? Right, I know, I'm sorry, I'm just... I don't know what I'm doing, Hermione confessed. I know I need to make things right with him, but I don't know how. I mean, I guess what I'm really asking is, well, how do you... I mean, what is it that you... Her blush deepened, 
and she fiddled with her napkin, her lingering mortification making it im oui. her lingering mortification making it impossible for her to ask. You are curious as how to we mareful woman cheer up our man. Narcissa's grin was positively shark like, and her miny skin tingled at Narcissa's inclusive use of the word our. Narcissa's eyes twinkled with a lecherous leer as she humped thoughtfully. Well, I'm sure that Draco would appreciate not knowing the methods in which I use on his father. Hermione fervently hoped that the thick vines on the wall behind her belonged to the Devil's Snare family. She had had a good life, all things considered. She supposed she could be very content to die from suffocation in that moment. Narcissa smiled at her, all amusement fading away whilst a delicate finger traced the rim of her china teacup. Relationships are as delicately unique as flowers, Miss Granger. No two bloom the same, nor hold the same level of beauty, but that beauty is subjective. Madame Windsor, for example, Narcissa gestured lightly. She is a personal favourite of mine, and Draco's too, but my husband much prefers the more obvious grace of the Dahlia. In fact, there are many a wizard or witch who would rather not have to deal with the stubbornness and temperamental attitude of the cobra lily. But that does not mean the flower isn't worthy of respect, nor should it be denied the opportunity to bloom into its true potential. Hermione swallowed under Narcissa's pointed gaze, her ears warm. Narcissa continued, The beauty of a relationship is that it is intrinsically ours. How it blooms is entirely unique to our own circumstances. And whilst others may have their opinions and criticisms of its journey, Pansy's scathing glare flicked through Hermione's mind, and she wondered if Narcissa had also been informed of his friend's concerns. It is still your journey to take. It is up to you to discover what makes your relationship different to that of the Dahlia, and therefore how it must bloom. Narcissa took a sip of her drink as Hermione pondered over what she said. You said Mr. Malfoy prefers Dahlias, Mrs. Malfoy? Hermione chewed on her lips, her stomach twisting with bitter nerves. Thus, does he not approve of Draco and I? Not that she gave a damn what Lucius Malfoy thought about her. But he was still Draco's father at the end of the day, and her mind did not wish to be the one to come between the family. Narcissa took a few moments to straighten her teacup on its saucer, before replying carefully, I would be lying to you, Miss Granger, if Lucius and I did not wish for you to come from a more finer breeding. Her mind swallowed bitterly, and she looked away, watching the miniature trickling waterfall of the lily pond. She had known, of course, but hearing it fall from Narcissa's mouth still made her chest pinch tightly, all the same. A soft, gentle hand rested on top of hers, and Hermione drew her attention back to Narcissa. However, my son has spent many an evening with the arm of a perfectly bred witch on his, and not one of them made my son as happy as you do. As his mother, that is what should be most important, is it not? Narcissa looked at her knowingly, and Hermione couldn't suppress a shiver of her spine. Besides, Narcissa continued that wry smirk returning to her lips. If Draco's father wishes to keep his monthly allowance as it is, he has very much a say on the matter. Hermione snorted. She couldn't wait to tell Harry and Ron that Lucius Malfoy had pocket money. Narcissa's words about Draco crept back to the forefront of her mind all amusement draining from her as quickly as it had risen. Had he really been that happy with her, even though their relationship was for the majority notoriously and painfully one-sided? Hermione frowned, dozens of memory whizzing through her mind as she tried to consider what moments of their relationship was unique to themselves. Evidently, Narcissus had no problem with having a one-sided conversation. Hermione's mind whirring away as she supplied Hermione with endless stories about how the Merfolk family had acquired each of the plants in the conservatory, and even offered Hermione a tour of the Manus Potion Laboratory the next time she visited their home, to which Hermione eagerly agreed, before blushing at her presumptuousness. She hadn't even spoken to Draco yet, and there she was, already making plans with his mother. Her great-grandmother Ida truly would be rolling in her grave. Hermione finished her tea, not even bothering to attempt to copy Narcissa's delicate grip of the china. Her knees still throbbed from being clipped against the table leg, and thanked Narcissa for the impromptu, graceful hosting some forty minutes later. 
The conservator glowed warmly under the light of the sunset. Narcissa nodded graciously. It was my pleasure, Miss Granger. Please do call me Hermione, she insisted again, as she carefully got up from her seat. Very well, Hermione. Is there anything else I can do for you? Hermione bit her lip, her mind having settled on what to do some minutes earlier, and the words that she never thought she would ever say fell from her lips. May I ask your house elf for a favour? Chapter 10 Can't Malfoy just make his own lunches? Ron grumbled after casting a quick healing charm on his finger that he had nicked with the potato peeler. Better yet, can't you just eat this for yourself? Hermione scowled at him, reaching over to check his finger, perfectly healed. He must have had plenty of practice in the field. She tried not to focus too much on the stress that that thought brought her. It's called a grand gesture, Ronald. She huffed and nudged him out of the way to take over peeling the potatoes. Ron mumbled something unintelligibly and leaned down to squint at the recipe. Marlin knows how our professors were able to mock your essays, Miney. I reckon your handwriting's worse than mine. Hermione sent him a warning glare. Don't forget to sort the water. You know, when you said you needed my help with something, this isn't what I had in mind. Ron mind, carelessly tossing the teaspoon of salt into the boiling pot. This is my two-week leave, Moiny. I'm supposed to be relaxing, not bloody cooking now for his lunches. Well, like you said, you're on leave, so it's not like you had anything better to do. Hermione said lightly, scooping the potato peels to the side of the chopping board. It was Ron's turn to scowl at her, and she snorted. Besides, you were raised by Molly Weasley. I'm sure you've managed to pick up something other than sausage links, she finished with a wry grin. Ronzi has flushed at her light jeeby. Doesn't mean I have to use that skillful Malfoy, he said as he reached over to check her spice rack. Of course, you have it organized alphabetically. It's the most efficient system. No, not that one. Use the open one. Hermione said and nodded when he picked up the mostly used paprika shaker. So explain to me how a few lunch boxes are supposed to win you Malfoy back, Ron asked once they had finished chopping up all of the vegetables a few minutes later. Hermione swallowed, her tongue wetting her lips before she replied, I want to show him that I, that I want to be there for him too, that I'm ready to be with him. She shrugged, her outwards blasé attitude, a stark difference to the storm of anxiety that was ravaging in her stomach. We've always cooked together, it's, it's our thing, but I've, um, I've never taken the step to cook just for him, like he has for me. Hermione looked down at her chopping board fidgeting with a couple of carrots as the now familiar stab of shame twisted in her spine. And you think this'll work? Ron asked. Her head snapped back up, her eyes wide as she vehemently insisted. It has to. Her chest clenched, her breathing suddenly heavy and shaken, and her money's nail dug into her palms painfully. It couldn't not work. She had already wasted so much time moaning over her wounded pride, trying to pretend like being with Draco wasn't one of the best things that had ever happened to her. At the very least, Hermione needed and wanted to prove to Draco just how much she truly cared about him. If, during their time apart, Draco had decided he wanted to move on from her, well, Hermione supposed she deserved it. But she still had to try. It has to, she repeated, her voice barely above a whisper, and her eyes squeezed shut. Visions upon visions swarmed her mind of Draco holding dozens of faceless witches in his arms, looking down at them with that private smile of his, and Hermione had to swallow back a distressed whimper. I can't lose him, Mon. Not after everything we've... I can't! A sharp panicked gasp cut her off, and she felt Ron's arm quickly wrap around her shoulders, and he squeezed her tightly, reassuringly. You're not going to lose him, Hermione. I reckon Malfoy would sooner chop off his arm than not to be with you. A secret arm, too. That's how much he wants you. Hermione's laugh was muffled against the crook of his shoulder, and she pulled away to smile at him. Thank you for being here, Ron, for doing this. I really am grateful. I know you and Draco aren't exactly best friends. Ron cocked his chin up, a full air of superiority and cockiness. Had he have been blonde, he would have been a dead ringer for Draco in their earlier years at Hogwarts. Hermione's lips pressed together fondly. Yeah, I know, I'm the best. The one who got away and all that, Ron said with a cheeky wink his hand casually running through his red locks, and he grunted when Hermione lightly slapped his chest. 
Hermione eyed the pot behind Ron's shoulder, the water dangerously close to boiling over the edge. She reached for a wand and tapped at a stove to bring the pot to a simmer. Time to add the potatoes, she said, and with Ron's help, carefully tipped the potatoes into the water. The pair chatted aimlessly over the next half hour, Hermione keeping a cautious eye on the stove. Apparently it was vital that Hermione knew all about the illegal Quidditch move that had been pulled by one of the seekers during the cup final, before she asked Ron about any case that he would have to jump back into when he returned from leave. Actually, I'm thinking of quitting, Ron said. Hermione whipped her head around and gaped at him. What? Ron shrugged, a deep frown, marrying his boyish feature. Yeah, I don't know. Don't get me wrong, it's great working with Harry and all that. He's my best mate and that, uh, one of our best mates, he added when Hermione coughed pointedly. They grinned at each other, only for a moment, before his expression faded back into resignation. Um, I'm just tired, I guess. Tired of the curses and the shield charms and the bloody paperwork. I was thinking of working with George at this joke job, maybe. I could do with some more laughter in my life. Hermione nodded. That'll be good for you. If that's what you really want, you know I'll support you in whatever decision you make. He sent her a half-smile and nudged her lightly. And what about you? Heard you've been ditching your office all week. What? Was there another Niffler infestation that forced you out? He teased and tittered at her. Aren't you afraid that the magical animal kingdom's falling apart without you there? Ha ha, she drawled with an eye roll. I'll be going back on Monday, but honestly, you've been hounding me to take a break, Ronald. Hermione crossed her arms against her waist and cocked her brow. What? Now I'm not working enough? The gnawing demon in her chest flared up again, the sea of paperwork that she had abandoned on her desk flooding her mind, and she bit down on her lip harshly in an attempt to distract herself from the that was blooming within her. Hermione knew she couldn't stay away for too much longer, but the fear that she would fall right back into her toxic habits had been lingering over her head for the past couple of days now. Ron's snort interrupted her panic musing. Please, you've not even been gone for a full week, Mine. He looked at her in concern. Why don't you give it another couple of days, hmm? Hermione looked down at her slippers with a shake of her head, her ankles shuffling together. This was a big step for me, Ron, she said quietly. And I genuinely love my job. I need to go back. She stepped towards the stove, spatula in hand, as she absentmindedly stirred the potatoes. Draco hated when they were overcooked and she gnawed on her bottom lip again. Harry thinks I should see your department's mind healer, she said after a few moments. She looked over her shoulder. Ron stepped back at her contemplatively. Do you, do you think that's a good idea? Ron scanned over her face for a moment in silence before he shrugged, his face blasé with a mild indifference. It's like I've always sat, Miney. You need to sort out your priorities. He grinned after a beat, and her mind's chest erupted with a surprised laugh. Check on the chicken, would you? She asked when their laughter died down, focusing on the recipe. Yes, I do. Hermione looked back up, frowning in confusion. What? Yes, I think you should see your mind healer, Ron said and bent down to open the oven. He cursed as hot steam wafted in his face, which flushed as deeply as his hair from the heat. Oh, she turned back to massage the oil into the chopped vegetable bowl. Uh, chicken is not supposed to still be pink, is it? He closed the oven tray when she stared at him blankly, and he stood back up. Look, I'm not saying you've got some unresolved war trauma or something. There's plenty of magic folk who speak with mind healers for much less than that. I know, she sighed. There's nothing wrong with speaking to a professional miney, and it's better to rule out anything than continue to suffer in silence. Besides, talking with a stranger might be good for you. Ron stepped in beside her and sprinkled more garlic over her fingers. You know, we're always here to listen if you need us, but there's value in an outsider's perspective too. Someone who doesn't know you like we do, and can just say how they see things, you know. I mean, what's the worst that can happen? At most, you miss an hour away from your desk, he shrugged again. At least you'll have tried it. Hermione frowned into the mixing bowl and chewed on her lip. I know it would help me, I mean, at least trying it, that's the thing. I don't... Why am I being so hesitant about this? I don't know if you've ever noticed, but you're a bit of a control freak, mine, eh? It makes sense that you'd have some reservations about talking about your problems with a complete stranger. Ron nudged her lightly. You want me or Harry to set the appointment up for you? She shook her head. No, no. If I'm going to go through with this, I need to do it myself. 
Otherwise, I'll just find an excuse not to go. Not if I stick Jenny on you, you won't. She puffed out a breathy laugh. <laughs> now there's a scary picture. She paused, looking up at him, and smiled softly. You really are a good friend, one. One flicked at the vegetable bowl. I'm helping my ex-girlfriend woo her boyfriend. Bloody right, I'm a good friend. Hermione snorted, which quickly melted into a full-blown belly laugh, joining Ron. She wiped a humid tear from her eye and grinned at him impishly. Guess which one of Draco's parents has pocket money? Ron's expression glazed over briefly, his brows furrowed before his eyes widened in shock and then in pure mirth. Who'd have thought your old Lucy needed his wife's permission to enter the Gringotts account? He shook his head and grinned deviously at her. You know I'm going to tell George about this, right? I would be disappointed if you didn't, she smirked. Ron shivered in fine disgust. Bloody hell, you look so much like Malfoy when you do that. I guess couples really do start resemble each other after a while. Well, then let us hope I never go blonde. According to Mrs. Malfoy, winter colors wash me out something awful, Hermione said dryly. Winter what? What a load of bullocks. He paused to look at her contemplatively. You reckon Malfoy's mum already has your wedding planned? Those lot usually go all out for the big day. Gordendorf, Strings Band, the Grand Marquet, the lot. Hermione blanched and her ears burned hotly. The memory of Narcissa telling her she would get their family seamstress to hold on to Hermione's measurements came to the forefront of her mind, and her mouth went dry. And Malfoy's always prepared indeed. Ron was silent laughing at her, her panic must have clearly showed on her face, and she quickly covered it up with a scowl. Please, like I'd ever have doves, she miffed, her stomach treacherously flipping at the image of her in Draco's arms, slow dancing to a string's melody like they had in Greece. Goodness, she hadn't even confessed to Draco yet, and there she was imagining their wedding. She blamed Pansy and her talks of her probably ugly elf-made wedding gown for these silly fantasies. Ron snorted. Yeah, yeah, just don't ask me to be a bridesmaid. Hermione tossed the potato peel at his head. Ron left a few hours later after bombarding Hermione with the news that he was running late for dinner with Luna Lovegood. From what she could gather from his rushed explanation, apparently they had bumped into each other during Beltane, and Ron had been rather taken with her and her conqueror's earrings. At first, Ron had assumed it was due to the crate of butterbeer he had gorged himself on throughout the day, but three days later, he was admittedly a little smitten. Hermione smiled, watching him vanish in the flue flames. After he'd shouted out, You're bloody better not tell me if I help you with this. Whilst a rather unorthodox pairing, Hermione couldn't help but think that Luna would be good for them. Healing, even. She walked back into her kitchen and set to work, filling up the Tupperware containers and then sealing them with several stasis charms. She then headed back into her living room, looking for her spare parchment and quilts. She paused, opening up one of the drawers of her coffee table. Her name stared up at her, sheets upon sheets of discharge papers and prescription notes from St. Mango's, dating as far back as four years ago. She breathed out heavily, her stomach churning. There had to be at least two dozen different records in a drawer. Merlin, she thought, as she thumped through them in disbelief. It seemed like it wasn't just her affections for Draco that Hermione had been in denial over. Had she really convinced herself that working past the point of exhaustion was normal? It was just a sign of her ambition, her dedication to her job, a small price to pay for the greater good? Brightest witch of her age, her ass, Hermione scolded herself, and made a mental note to write the mind healer when she returned to her desk on Monday. Draco had stepped in at the right time, and once again, Hermione was completely enveloped in her gratitude towards him. From him snatching a case from her fingers with a gentle but firm order to go join her friends for lunch, to him all but dragging her to the flue at the end of what he considered to be a reasonable successful workday, even as jeebies and taunts about her hag-leg posture because he knew she would only grumble and complain about her neck pain when settling down for bed. She really did need him. Even so, Hermione knew that she couldn't keep relying on him. Ginny was right. It wasn't healthy for either of them for her to keep placing that kind of burden on Draco. She remembered how exhausting and draining it had been during the war and their year on the run. Harry's mind slowly being poisoned by the Horcruxes and Voldemort's further descent into madness. How she would sneak from their tent in the middle of the night to sit and cry at the edge of their wards. How it was her only mental reprieve from being the put-together, focused Hermione that Harry had desperately needed. Yes, Hermione knew all too well how mentally exhausting that was. 
and shame and guilt churned in her stomach at the thought of placing Draco under a similar burden. She was going to give him the biggest fruit basket he had ever seen when she made things right with him. She did need Draco, and she wanted to need him, but his past few days away from her desk had given her mind soothing clarity that she hadn't felt in the longest time. She could take care of herself. She could take the initiative to step back from everything. And knowing that she did, indeed, still have the control she desperately craved was like a blanket of comfort around her soul. Hermione closed the drawer, a satisfied sigh leaving her, and continued to hunt for a spare parchment, eventually finding it, naturally, in the last drawer she opened. She stared down at the blank page, her bottom lip sore and swollen from the abuse of her teeth as she gnawed over it repeatedly. Hermione couldn't tell him in a letter. As easy as it would be to write down those three simple words, he deserved more than a cowardly confession. And yet, she knew she had to show something. Something that showed how much she cared for him. Something that showed how she was ready to try things properly. But what? Hermione's eyes stared lost. The empty parchment seemed to taunt her. She huffed in frustration and smacked down her quill onto the coffee table, looking around her living room, hoping that maybe the words she was trying to find would be written somewhere on her walls. The grandfather clock chimed, alerting Hermione that it was half past the hour, and she stared at the swing pendulum for a few moments before a shadow behind the antique caught her attention. She scowled. Great. The neighbors must have had another pipe leak. There was damp crowing. Her mind screeched to a halt. A damp, cold corner of the Hogwarts library, a hesitant hand creeping for the sleeve of a sleeping classmate, the first time her hand had touched his, a desperate but sincere pleading for him to start looking after himself, him accepting her biscuit token of compassion. Hermione smiled and looked back down at the parchment, reaching for a quill to quickly scroll her message. Hermione nudged at her once she finished, and Hermione blinked. Scurrying to her feet and grabbing her note, she rushed back into the kitchen and made for a biscuit tin. Placing another stasis jar on the biscuits, she wrapped them in tin foil and stuck them to the lid of one of the containers, her note carefully laid on top. With a satisfied exhale, Hermione called out for the Malfoy family house elf. Twinkle appeared with a pop, and Crookshanks, who had followed her into the kitchen with a curious and warning expression on his face, hissed, his paw reaching out to bat at the new intruder. Hermione scolded him lightly, carefully nudging him to the side with her foot, and turned to smile at her guest. Um, hello again, Twinkle. Twinkle stared up at her, her eyes wide and teary. Good evening, miss. We're so delighted to be in Miss Granger's presence again, miss. We're honoured that you's entrusting us with this task. Twinkle bowed, her nose touching a small stain on the kitchen floor where one had accidentally spilled some of the salt. Uh, yes, um, thank you, Twinkle, for agreeing to help me with this. You, you know you don't have to do this. Hermione reminded her kindly and bent down to lightly nudge the elf up from the floor. Twonka shook her head and gasped like Hermione had something positively heinous, which for a house elf maybe she had. <gasps> no, Miss Granger, we is honoured. We is very happy to be assisting Miss Granger. We will not let you down, Miss. Twonka bowed in her vow and Hermione sighed lightly. She wondered what the chances were of getting Twinkle to accept the patch of galleons on her side table. At a near desperate, delighted sob Twinkle let out, Hermione imagined it would probably greatly offend the little elf. Right, um, well, if you're sure, Hermione nodded when Twinkle practically choked on her agreement and turned to place the containers in a carrier bag, quickly casting a featherlight charm on it before handing the bag to the eager, grabby hands of the elf. Can you do me one more favor, Twinkle, and let me know when Draco, um, Master Malfoy, received these, please? Twinkle stood upright, her chest expanding in pride as she stared Hermione down determinedly. We will, miss. We will go to Master Malfoy right away, miss. We will not let you down, miss. Twinkle disappeared with another pop, and Hermione's stomach swooped with baited anticipation. Now all she had to do was wait, and clean and tidy her kitchen. The lift signalled her arrival to her office floor with a ding, and Hermione braced herself for the jarring stop. Evidently not well enough, as she stumbled, her shoulders clipping against the wall, and she choked on a groan. She certainly hadn't missed that in her short absence. The lift doors squeaked open, and Hermione's stomach flipped with giddiness as she stepped foot into the corridor. Giddy at the thought of sitting back at her desk, 
getting to dive back into her case files. The scent of fresh, untouched parchment, and she treated herself to a new ink pot. Peeling the lid off of a new one was always one of her mining simple pleasures. And having a mild allergic reaction to the dusty archived cases. Giddy because, well, because, oh boggering hell, she was just excited to see Draco again. More than once Hermione had to tell herself to slow down in her strife as she made her way towards her office, and she just managed to return Matilda's morning greetings as she passed the reception desk. Draco's office appeared in her peripheral vision, and Hermione's skin was electric with anticipation, goosebumps flaring up across her arms, and her navel twisted. She supposed there was no harm in making a quick pit stop. Good morning, Miss Granger, you're back. Maybe later then. Hermione smiled at her assistant and walked towards her office. Good morning, Laura. I hope things haven't been too crazy in my absence. Madly smiled, one shoulder shrugging dismissively. There was nothing we couldn't handle, but it's good to see you again, miss. Hermione nodded and stepped over her office threshold. Just give me an hour to get settled, and then, if you wouldn't mind bringing through my messages... Will do, Miss Granger. Hermione sent her another grateful nod and turned to cross her office. Her jaw dropped as she looked around the room. All giddiness and excitement about returning to work sucked out of her so quickly she felt winded. Her desk was barely visible, to be honest. Papers were stacked as tall as Hermione. They must have been charmed to not topple over, since they curved dangerously over the edge of her desk. And there was a crate of letters and memos nesting in the footwall. All of this was still after her colleagues had covered for her. The amount of fruit basket she was going to have to send was going to make quite the heavy dent in her bank account. Hermione groaned inwardly. Her eyes creased shut. Hermione took several deep inhales. With her shoulder blades pinned back determinedly, she approached her desk, careful not to knock over the tower of folders, and eased into her desk chair. Observing the ocean of paperwork in front of her, Hermione was lost as where to start. She decided to reach for the file closest to her, figuring that Madly had placed them there due to level of importance. Ah, excellent. It appeared Madly had taken the initiative to begin to process Mr. Wilkes' hearing application request. Her initial feelings of being overwhelmed quickly vanished as Hermione set to work. Like riding a bike, she thought. Her mass was oozing in satisfaction as she placed another completed form to decide for Madly to send off in the mid-morning post. Perhaps a few days off was all she needed. Now that Hermione knew she could always take a few days off from work with no major consequences, the daunting mountain of folders that threatened to bury her aside, maybe she didn't need to speak with a mind healer after all. Hermione had just gotten ahead of herself. She always had a tendency to overthink. It was clearly just a minor case of separation anxiety from her work that had her convincing herself otherwise for the past few days. She just had to remember to take a break once in a while. It was clearly nothing more than that. Hermione knew what she needed to do now to prevent another St. Mungo's fiasco. She didn't need a mind healer to tell her what to do. Hermione was confident that she knew how to control herself now. She would be fine. A brief tap at her door interrupted her thoughts, and her assistant peered through. A hesitant smile on her lips as she gently shook a wet of paper in her hand. Oh, perfect timing, Laura, thank you. Madeleine approached her desk and handed her a thick band of memos. These are the ones that I... And the others didn't have the authority or access to respond to. You don't have any meetings until Wednesday. I figured you would prefer to have a couple of days to, well... Madly glanced pointedly at the White House, practically enveloping Hermione. Ah, yes, good thinking, Laura. Is there anything else I can do for you, Miss Granger? She asked, and she reached for the pile of envelopes ready to be posted. She really was a decent assistant. Maybe Hermione should make a recommendation for Madly to get a raise. Hermione quickly rummaged through the memos, her heart sinking with each note that passed that didn't have Draco Signature's elegant scrawl. Um, I don't see a message from Drake, uh, Mr. Malfoy. Is he, is he back in his office yet? Hermione hoped that she sounded casual, almost indifferent. The pitied smile her assistant gave her told Hermione that she was entirely successful. I'm sorry, Miss Granger. Mr. Malfoy's still up in Cumbria, it seems. Oh, right, of course. He must just be out of postal owl range, then. Hermione couldn't suppress the despondent collapse of her shoulders, and her spine curved inwards, her visceral disappointment crushing her. I know, I don't think so, miss. Matilda has managed to be in contact with him since last week. She's been receiving updates to pass on to our head of department, so I think he's fine. It wasn't the comforting words Medley had evidently thought it would be, and Hermione's chest hollowed. Ah, 
she grunted out thickly. Oh, um, well, I mean, he's quite busy from what I've heard. You know how ferocious these vampire clans can be. Oh, and I'm not being funny or nothing by saying that, but, but, um, you know. Medley trailed off, her face flushed a deep red. Hermione cooked the brown, smiled thinly. I'm sure he is. She picked up a pile of papers, tapping them on her desk to straighten up the pages. Well, in any case, I'm sure I'll hear from him when he's got the time. The irony of her words was not lost on her. Medley left shortly after, and Hermione waited for the door to close behind her assistance before she exhaled shakily, her mind racing. Trunkle had informed Hermione that Draco had received his lunchboxes and her notes, so why hadn't he contacted her? Hermione's chest was tight with panic. Maybe she was too late. Maybe she had taken too long. Maybe he'd spent too many days poisoning himself into a drunk stupor on Parkinson's chaise, and let Pansy fill his head with all of her beliefs that Hermione was toxic, that they were toxic. She wondered how soon she might be able to arrange a port key to Cumbria. Hermione jumped as a rainfall of letters cascaded from thin air, lending in a messy pile over her hands. She blinked, once, twice, and then a third time, before she laughed, breathlessly. Of course! Did Hermione really expect for Draco to make a move on her through a letter that anyone in her department could easily get their hands on? Hermione all but scowled at her own ridiculousness. How silly of her to get so wound up in her own doubts. This was a personal, private matter between the two of them, after all. If he was going to contact her, of course he would deliver to the privacy of a flat. He knew that she appreciated her privacy. Yes, Hermione was certain that when she returned from work later that evening, there would be an owl waiting for her at her kitchen window. She just had to be patient. A glance at the clock on her wall made her huff out a heavy sigh. She supposed she could wait eight more hours if she absolutely must. Draco had certainly waited longer. There was no owl waiting for her when she got back to her flat that evening. Blue ash scattered across her living room rug as she sprung from her fireplace in eagerness. And there was still no owl when she finally dragged her feet to her bedroom several hours later, the grandfather clock chiming the arrival of the witching hour behind her. She didn't sleep that night. Her window still showed no post loud waiting for her when she entered the kitchen the following morning, nor was there a letter from him at her desk when she arrived at work an hour later. Hermione refused to let the wave of despair swallow her whole again. She couldn't just put her life and her job on hold for a man. And so she reached for a random folder and stuck her head in it. Hours went by, and her head lifted barely an inch from her paperwork. She told herself it was fine to miss lunch. It was fine to ignore Midlay's several offers to bring her a cup of tea. It was fine that her head throbbed with a migraine. It was fine that her vision blurred if her eyes scanned across the paperwork too quickly. She was just working hard. Hermione had taken a few days of leave. She had given herself time to rest. She could handle pulling an all-nighter just this one last time. Hermione paused, her quill dribbling a small pool of ink over her notes. But it wouldn't be the last time, would it? She looked up, a stifled groan lodged in her throat at the pulsing ache of her neck from being hunched over all day and startled at the moonlight streaming through her windows. She hadn't even noticed the sun setting. And as hard as she tried, Hermione couldn't hear so much as a pin drop from outside her office door. Everyone else had already left for the day. Hermione's chest heaved. She'd done it again, barely her second day back, and she'd already slipped up. Merlin, what was wrong with her? There is nothing wrong with speaking to a professional. What's the worst that can happen? Ron's words echoed in her mind, and she swallowed thickly. Ron was right. What was the worst that could happen? Anything had to be better than her working herself into early and forced retirement. Lime green robes flashed in her memory, and she breathed heavily. Reaching for a fresh piece of parchment, Hermione scribbled a request to arrange an appointment with the Ministry Mind Healer Department. Hermione barely waited around long enough for the letter to be sent off before she darted off to the lifts, vowing to herself that this was the last time that she would witness the moonlight from her office. Hermione had barely taken a couple of steps out of Gringotts. Mr. Wake's contingency for their new meeting was that Hermione had to go to him, of which she couldn't really argue against since it had been her fault that she missed the last one. When Theodore not literally bumped into her. Given her last interaction with Pansy, she couldn't help but wonder if his trusting was purposeful even as his hands reached out to steady her. His own gait, once again, barely even wavered an inch. The slight coldness of his eyes marrying his suave smirk certainly indicated to Hermione that he shared a similar viewpoint of her 
as his fiance. Great, round two. Hermione, his voice oozed with fine delight, and she stared at him, her brows furrowed in mild disbelief. They were hardly on well enough terms to be on first name basis, especially as of late. Not, she said pointedly. Theo grinned, her smile sharp and shark like, and made the hackers on Hermione's neck rise, and her spine was tight with vexation. Well, isn't this my lucky day? he said. And here I thought I would have to spend my lunch hour alone, with only the finest, honest words of the prophet for company. Hermione couldn't suppress her derisive snort. I'm sure that's just a regular occurrence for you, not? Theo's eyes flashed, the movement too quick for Hermione to pinpoint an exact emotion, and he tilted his head as he pondered at her for a moment. He tucked the newspaper into his side with glided ease and smiled at her charmingly. He looked like he was about to eat her. Might you join me for a spot of lunch? She would rather drink pubertuba pus. Hermione replied instead, Oh, uh, I actually need to be getting back to my desk. That wasn't a request. Hermione had a distressed understanding of how a lone gazelle must feel during an hyena attack. Like in the nature documentary she watched with her parents last Christmas, as she sat opposite Theo in the restaurant. It was solely clear to Hermione that this restaurant catered to a particular clientele. The menu had no visible prices next to their items, a glaring red flag that would have had Hermione quickly escaping to the exit had she come alone. Judging by the haughty look the metro gave Hermione's attire up on their entrance, there was clearly a dress code, one that Hermione would likely never successfully abide by, even with her best efforts, despite it being luncheon hours, and their napkins were actually embroidered with gold and silk. Hermione was genuinely concerned that if she touched the silver cutlery, it would repel away like one of those barbaric anti muggleborn repellent charms she had read about in her fourth year. I don't know what Drake has been fussing about. It took absolutely no effort at all getting you to come for lunch, Theo said as he boredly flipped through the menu. Hermione's tongue flicked against her teeth, the echoes on the back of her neck once again bristling with agitation. She should have just run away on the street earlier. Long limbs aside, no doubt the crushing weight of his ego would have slowed him down. He peered at her over the menu, his eyes glittering with mirth, and he hummed. Or perhaps you were just waiting for a different and much more handsome wizard to invite you out instead? What say you, Hermione? He leaned in with a lethal smirk and whispered conspiratorially. Shall I ditch my darling fiancé the same way you did Draco and you and I can fly off into the sunset together? I didn't ditch Draco, she snapped. Or contraire, my little lamb, he cooed. You were always the brains of your little menage a tried school, so I'm sure you're well aware of the social etiquette that dictates that when somebody tells you that they love you, it's only proper to say that. Theo gestured for the waitress to come over, and Hermione swallowed miserably, not even bothering to protest when he ordered on her behalf, without even asking what she wanted, as she picked at the silk thread of her napkin next to her cutlery. That day in the ministry, she said, deciding to cut straight to the chase after the waitress left, her eyes still boring holes into the table. You were hoping I'd cotton on, about Draco and I, about the truth. Her tone wasn't accusing, but whether by tact or self-preservation, Theo chose not to respond all the same. Only staring at her, his expression a cool, perfect mask as he waited for her to continue, but his eyes sparkled with the faintest hint of smug satisfaction. He and Pansy must have been scheming together since that day that she had received the invitation. Her name in royal navy blue silk flashed in her mind again. The couple that sticks their noses into other people's business together stays together, Hermione inwardly huffed. Her mind rushed to relay their meeting in the lift, an encounter that had seemingly been barely a blimp to Hermione at that time, but was now poignant in hindsight. She absentmindedly wondered how many more memories she would one day look back on and notice all of the little details that had passed her by. Hermione brought her focus back to Theo and looked at him cautiously. You said Draco is possessive over what is his, she began, watching his face carefully. He had an infuriatingly decent poker face. He didn't so much as blink. Does Draco want to possess me? You are aware of his Latin origins of his name, no? Theo drawled and cocked an eyebrow. It's in a dragon's nature to covet the things most precious to them. 
The miner's cheeks heated on her serpent-like pointed look, yet something pleasant warmed her chest at the idea of Draco finding her prescient. Besides, from what I've witnessed, you've more than enjoyed reaping the benefits of Draco's affection for the past year. The warm fuzziness in her chest quickly evaporated, replaced with something much more bitter and thick with guilt. She didn't even bother to defend herself. That unpleasant encounter with Pansy the other week still saw in her memory. I'm trying to make things right, she whispered into her lap. Do tell. I sent him food. There was a dry pause. Romantic? Thea panned eventually. Hermione's neck snapped up, her chest flaring defensively as she practically hissed. It is! A few alarmed patrons at a nearby table glanced over at her, and Hermione's ears flushed hotly at the disproving whispers the old witches murmured to each other as they got up, promptly moving to a table further across the restaurant. She leaned back into her seat and took a deep breath in an attempt to soothe the irritation curling in her stomach. It's our thing, she explained. When I met with Mrs. Malfoy, she taught me to think about something that was special for us. Cooking together. It's, it's our thing. You met no sister? Theo's poised in a different mask slipped, and Hermione took great satisfaction from his flabbergasted expression. His eyes narrowed suspiciously. When? The other day at his manor, when I went over there to tell Draco that I, uh, when I went to find Draco. Time seemed endless under Theo's scrutinizing gaze and Hermione had to sit on her hands to resist the urge to fidget with the napkin again. Pansy said that you love him. She scowled. This was why Hermione hated gossip. Honestly, it was nothing private anymore. As if sensing her thoughts, Theo smirked, his eyebrow cocked in amusement. Not only is Pansy my loving, adoring fiancé, but we are both his best friends. Of course she told me all about your little burly talk, and there's no privacy amongst couples anyway. Oh, thank you, my love. He nodded to the waitress, who had appeared with their order. Hermione blinked, surprised at how quickly the food arrived. But given how the prices had been hidden on the menu, she suspected quick and efficient service was part of the experience. And Bill. An admittedly divine-looking salmon fillet was placed in front of her, and she thanked the waitress quietly. Hermione rolled her eyes at the dashing wink Theo sent to the now-blushing waitress, and she waited until the girl was safely out of earshot before she responded. Everyone is entitled to their privacy, even married couples, she said, and petulantly shoved a forkful of salmon into her mouth. Thankfully, there hadn't been a repellent charm after all, and her eyes almost rolled into the back of her head. Great Cersei, it all but melted on her tongue. She wondered if she and Draco might try replicating it. Is that why you never told Draco that you love him? Theo interrupted her thoughts as he leisurely carved into his filet mignon. Hermione had not been surprised in the slightest that he ordered the most premium cut. Because of your adorable, naive little muggle belief that you shouldn't be honest with the person you love. Draco never told me either, she bit back. Maybe not in so many words, but certainly through other actions. His feelings for you have always been there. You've just not wanted to see it. You sound like Parkinson, she said. If this lunch is just an excuse for you to sit here and tell how poisonous I am for Draco, you can save your breath. Your adoring fiancé has already told me all about how much the two of you hate Draco and I being together. He even wanted him to quit his job to get him away from me. Theo had enough to smirk and his eyes glittered fondly, as if they were simply regaling their youthful adventures at school. As if they weren't currently talking about Draco's best friend hating the woman that he hopefully still loved. Oh... I wouldn't take any of that to heart, little lamb. Pansy does have quite the flair for the dramatics. He flicked his brows, the edge of his lips curved into a lascivious smirk, whilst his hand twirled the fork towards his mouth. His teeth slowly pulled on the fork, and the grating sound of the metal being scraped made Hermione's spine tense. She clenched around her own utensils tightly. She refused to give the smarmy sot the satisfaction of seeing her wince. Well... Thank Merlin, you're above all that, she quipped dryly. Theo's grin was sharkish and biting. Now, now, Hermione, let's play nicely. Despite your ruthless stabbing my best friend in the heart, I found myself growing rather fond of you recently. He tilted his head and pouted. It would be quite a shame to have to say goodbye to our monthly foursome dinners, he added belatedly, smirking when a passing waiter overhearing their conversation gawked at them. 
Hermione's cheeks coloured under the weight of scandalised stares, and she glared at Theo loathingly, who snickered at her. Such attitude, little lamb. Let's hope that you cook better than you socialise. Otherwise, you're never going to win Draco back, relying on that horrendous personality of yours. I thought you were growing fond of me. Her voice was thick with saccharine sweetness. Like drool of the living death, you're tolerable in small dosages. Hermione curled her lip, shoving a piece of asparagus into her mouth, bitterly. His words about Draco sat like iron in her stomach, and it took her several attempts to swallow, her throat full with anxiety. She still hadn't heard anything from Draco, and she couldn't ignore the suffocating, consuming fear that maybe she had been too late. I want him back, not. She whispered into her plate, squeezing her eyes shut to force back her tears. She would rather face off with Greyback than to cry in front of Theo. I do love him. I want, I want to spend the rest of my life with him. And as soon as she spoke those words out loud, the consuming and overwhelming sincerity of them struck her like a bludger. She already knew she wanted him, but she wanted so much more. She wanted to witness his every morning. She wanted to kiss his wrinkles as they aged. She wanted to find out their children's names. She wanted to argue with him about their children's names. She wanted to argue with him on her magical theories every day for the rest of her life. She just wanted to be with him. Hermione flushed, slightly mortified by her heavy honesty. It was only lunchtime after all. Perhaps she did need to take an etiquette class. Theo simply stared at her for several long moments, his eyes distant as he evidently became lost in his own thoughts. Eventually his expression cleared and he shrugged dismissively and turned back to his plate. Trust me on this, Granger. Draco has never been one for grand gestures. Theo looked up at her from carving her steak, his eyes dark and glittering with determination, and was that satisfaction? Whatever it was, Hermione had the distinct idea that she had just earned Theo's acceptance. She was surprised at the flicker of relief that passed through her chest. If you love him, just tell him, Theo said, effectively ending the discussion. As Hermione let his words sink in, and she finished her glory salmon fillet, Theo turned to conversation over to wedding plans, much to her chagrin, and spent the next 15 minutes dramatically retelling the story of how offended he had been when the wedding planner had the gall to suggest a violet colour theme for their after-party. How dare the wedding planner not know that neither Pansy nor Theo were light summers? As Hermione made the mental note to ensure that she sent them a congratulatory bouquet of violets on their wedding day, Theo pondered out loud over whether the wedding champagne should be Chardonnay or Pinot Grigio. Personally, I have quite a sweet tooth, so I would prefer that of a more citrus body. But Pansy is of the opinion that a winter wedding should be accompanied by dry wine. And since we're having a Pinot Grigio at the engagement party, oh, I do hope you make an appearance at the lamb. Mrs. Malfoy's dress robes never miss. Where was I? Oh, yes. Since we're having the Pinot Grigio then, it would apparently be in poor taste to have our guests drink it at the wedding as well. Theo continued on, and Hermione had to concentrate very intensely on the flavours dancing in her mouth to fight back her heavy, bored sigh. And yet, as bitingly annoying as the couple could be, whilst Theo then went on to offer up more appropriate hairstyles for Hermione for their special day, as adorable as your dog fur coat is, he mockingly assured her, she couldn't help but think that Pansy and Theo were made for each other. Crookshanks had been glaring at her all evening. Yes, I know, you're not the only one who misses him. I'm working on it, she eventually snapped at him, after his chest rumbled with a growl for the fourth time. Hermione had dared to sit in Draco's spot on the couch. It was one of the few spots in her flat that still had traces of his cologne lingering in the fabric, and this had evidently offended her cat greatly. Her calf still stung from his clawed protest. Crookshank's chin cocked towards the ceiling, and he haughtily prowled across the living room and leapt up onto the ottoman. He circled around on a plush cushion several times before plonking down flat, his sourly eyes barely visible as he continued to glare at her, unimpressed. Hermione huffed. Maybe Draco had been right. Perhaps her cat was an astral crux. Hermione turned her back on the furball demon and looked back at the letter set in her lap. Dear Miss Granger, we are pleased to confirm that your consultation with Mind Healer Reed has been arranged for you on the 7th of June 2006. Please report to the reception upon arrival. Our office is located on the 7th floor.
Hermione exhaled slowly, folding the letter back into its envelope once she had committed its contents to memory. She let her back sink into the cushions, surprised at how weightless she felt. Already there was a calmness to her. It ebbed like a gentle tide over her skin, and she basked in its soothing comfort. Hermione hadn't felt like this since she had last fallen asleep in Draco's arms. For the first time in a month, Hermione didn't find it difficult to breathe. Gelfling the Godling was an arrogant little sort. From the moment he had sauntered into her office and cocked his feet up onto the edge of her desk, granted he had to move the chair barely a hair's distance away to reach, he made it very clear to Hermione that he was doing her a favour by being here. Coming to her office to discuss his own complaint, Hermione definitely needed to recommend Madley for a race. Her assistant mercifully had had the foresight to only schedule a 30-minute slot for his meeting. She snuck a glance at her clock on the wall. Only 90 seconds to go. Mr. Gelfling had spent the last good 28, almost 29, minutes of their meeting disparaging the modest works of wizarding metalsmiths, how, even with their precious wizarding chance, their skill would never amount to that of the born-blessed goblin, and that only a goblin had the right to hold the prestigious title of a Gringotts banker. After all, no witch or wizard could ever have the intelligence or efficiency to handle the tasks needed of a banker. She had been sorely tempted to ask him if he had been employed at Gringotts during their break-in eight years ago. Fifty-five more seconds to go. Truth be told, Miss Granger, I do hold some concerns about your capabilities to handle my case. Hermione raised an eyebrow before she sent him a questioning, tight smile. I beg your pardon? Mr. Gelfling eyed the stacks of paperwork around her desk, disdain curling his lip. I do not believe that you have the efficiency in place to commit 100% of your time to me. 20 seconds to go. His beady black eyes pierced through hers. Perhaps I would be better off contacting the head of the department directly. He certainly knows how to focus his time towards his goals. His axe kicked off of the table and a small stack of papers toppled over onto the floor. He didn't even spare them a second glance. Eight seconds to go. And of course, I'm sure that in the future you will have other commitments as a woman of your age typically does. I'm sure you can understand why I would prefer to have my case handled by a more focused wizard. He smirked with a pointed look at her flat stomach. She couldn't hold back her glare of utter loathing. A quick flicker to her clock, and she turned back to him, a faint apologetic expression on her face. I'm afraid our time is up. You can speak with our receptionist on the way out to discuss rearranging the handle of your complaint, Mr. Gelfling. He straightened his waistcoat, a heavy sigh falling from his mouth, as a spiteful hand flicked at a spare quill that had been hovering over the edge of the desk, causing it to fall to the floor on top of a file. Mr. Gelfling smirked and wriggled his fingers and turned to waddle out of her office with nary goodbye. A small blessing, she guessed, and bent down to crouch in her footwell to collect her fallen paperwork. A light tap on her door, and she saw Medley's heels enter her office from underneath her desk. Miss Granger? Her assistant asked, no doubt perplexed at seeing a seemingly empty office. Under here, she called, and rubbed her knuckles on the wood. And there you are. Your next meeting is in ten minutes, with the lady who is refusing to close down her sphinx breeding farm. Oh yes, thank you, Laura. Is that all? She reached for a quill, her knees grinding somewhat painfully against her worn-in carpet. Yes, that's... Oh, wait, no. I thought you'd like to know Mr. Malfoy's in his office. He came in about twenty minutes ago. Hermione jumped and let out a string of curses as her head thwacked against the top of her desk harshly. A hand nursing the top of her head, she awkwardly scrambled out from under her desk and peered at Madley. She was very aware of how her eyes bulged out of her head. He's... he's what? she rasped out. Madley's lips twitched, and she had to turn and cough pointedly to hold back a visible laugh. Yes, he's returned not long ago, eh, uh, Miss Granger? Hermione leapt from behind her desk and strode towards the door of her office, her adrenaline and trepidation being the only thing that stopped her from toppling over. Her vision was dotting rather alarmingly. Eh, uh, Miss Granger, what about your meeting? Cancel it. Cancel? Um, but we've received word from the main desk your client is already on... I don't have time right now, she has over her shoulder and stalked her way down the corridor towards his office, towards him. His office door was open and Hermione's heart throbbed against her chest. A pit bloomed in her stomach. What if he had already left? 
if she hadn't missed him because she was in a stupid, worthless meeting with that hubristic goblin. Well, she supposed she could always accidentally set his case folder on fire. His doorway was barely a couple of feet away from her now, and her chest quivered, her nose burning as she fought back the suffocating fear that he had not left. Hermione exhaled silently, and she had to grasp onto the door frame so that her knees didn't buckle towards the floor. Her mind was positively dizzy from how her relief oozed through every muscle in her body. That, and she potentially given herself a concussion. Sweet Cersei. She had forgotten how broad his shoulders were. Her thighs squeezed together at the way that his white shirt stretched across his back, and her teeth gnawed on her bottom lip. It was almost indecent how sexy he looked in his office attire. He had his back to the door, seemingly organizing something into a manila folder. His briefcase had perched open and waiting on his desk, next to dozens of scattered folders, next to Hermione's brain short circuited, his hydrangeas still as freshly bloomed and blushed pink as the day she had given them to him. Her eyes stung with tears, and she swallowed thickly, forcing back down the relieved whimper in her throat. He had kept the flowers, and he still hadn't noticed her in the doorway. She licked her lips, butterflies fluttering up in a storm in her stomach, and called out softly. You're back. Draco's head snapped up, and he whipped around on his heel. Hermione couldn't stop her shoulders from melting when his eyes met hers, and her blood hummed in her ears. It was like her entire body rejuvenated under his attention. Her lungs no longer felt tight and compressed as she stood fixed under his gaze. It really was difficult to breathe without him. Draco's eyes flickered, only for a moment, before his expression shut at close, and he looked back down at the folder on his desk. His jaw clenched firmly. He looked like he was trying to pretend that she wasn't there. The butterflies fell into the reopened pit of her stomach. I'm just here to pick up some files. His voice was detached, empty like his expression. Manny wasn't sure which one she hated more. Oh, she swallowed thickly, forcing down the panicked nausea that had lodged in her throat. He was leaving again. If you love him, just tell him. Should she just blurt it out? Was that something a person just did? Just spit out their feelings for someone? Maybe she should storm over to his desk. Maybe grab him by the collar, tuck under a silken locks of his, and give him the snog of his life. How is Cumbria? she asked instead. Long, was all he replied, before he walked behind the desk. Like it was a shield. Like he needed some form of barrier between them, a barrier against her. And yet, he's kept his hydrangeas, she thought, with a hopeful twinge in her chest. Draco did not so much as glance in her direction as he read over the labels on his folders. She huffed, sour irritation furling in her stomach. She had almost forgotten how stubborn he could be. Merlin, could he not even look her in the eye any more? Hermione, uh, Hermione tore her eyes away from him. His refusal to peel his gaze away from these bloody folders was like knives piercing every nerve in her body. Her eyes landed on the calendar on the wall, and she breathed out a laugh. What a timing she had. Happy birthday, Draco. That got his attention. But the pain tightness of his face told her that maybe that had been the wrong thing to say. Just stared at her. She stared right back. Silence stretched between the pair. If you love him, just tell him. Hermione licked her lips nervously, the words bubbling in her chest. She could do this. She had been thinking it for days now. She had said it through her gifts, through her biscuit, through her words. She could tell him. You didn't reply to my note. Well, that was a start. A fleeting frown mirrored his brows. I didn't think you wanted me to. You made your point very clear, Granger. Draco looked back down at his desk. His laugh was bitter. Icy. Hermione didn't think her heart could hurt more. Wait, what point had she made? Hermione frowned back at him, his features going out of focus as she thought back to what she wrote. Take care of yourself. Her face went cold, the blood promptly draining away as she realized the connotations of her message. He hadn't thought of a mangy, damp corner of the Hogwarts library. He hadn't thought of a simple act of compassion during their darkest times. He had thought she was saying goodbye. No, 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 no. Panic weaved through her spine, and she opened her mouth. Her jaw practically vibrated with the words she was dying to tell him, that she needed to tell him. No, Draco, that's not... You did not have to do all of that with the food. Draco beat her to it, his fingers tracing elegant, nondescript patterns over his folder. Hermione never thought that she would be jealous of a piece of manila card, and yet it wasn't, it wasn't, it was never ploy or anything, he continued, a wistful, bitter smile etched at his lips. 
and he still wasn't looking at her. I liked cooking for you. It just gave me some peace of mind. I liked, I liked knowing that you needed me. I know that Pansy came to see you, and I know what she said, but it was never like that. He shrugged. I didn't care that our relay, that my affections were one-sided. Hermione's never twisted mournfully, but it wasn't one-sided. She needed to tell him. He looked up at her again, and her words died in her chest, smothered by the butterflies that bloomed under the faint, but still there, warmth in his eyes. Oh, how she missed that smile. Oh, how she missed him. How she loved him. Granger, I don't want you to feel like you have to pay that back somehow. I told you I'd accept your answer, no matter what. You don't... If you feel guilty, that's not what... He trailed off, and her heart clenched at the forlorn and lost expression on his face. The same expression he had when she had begged him to stay, when Crookshanks was ill. How he didn't want to take advantage of her. How she'd been afraid of taking advantage of him. She loved him so much. Draco's eyes stared determinedly, a jarring contrast to the open, raw honesty of his face. He had never looked so beautiful. I'm leaving you alone, Hermione. If I can't have you in this life, I can wait to try again in our next one. A pitiful whimper escaped her lips, and her knees sagged from his words. As romantic and all-consuming as his vow was, the idea of having to wait decades, maybe even centuries, to be in his arms again, of waiting until the next life, Hermione wasn't even sure if she believed in such a thing, to feel his morning kisses against her neck, to have to wait to see that beautiful private smile of his again, to have to spend the rest of her days in this life alone, in her concrete, empty bed, to not have him tease her about her inked freckles, to not have him tuck at her plate when her posture hunched a little too much. To not have him, right now, to have him thinking for the rest of his life that she didn't love him back. Hermione shook her head, her chest acidic and twisting in despair protest. Her eyes stung with salty tears and she choked on a sob. Maybe she was selfish, maybe she didn't deserve him, but she was damned if she lived one more day letting Draco believe that she didn't love him. I don't want that, she blurted out and rushed to continue after seeing his face drop in resignation. Merlin, would she ever not put her foot in her mouth? I don't want to wait. Draco's lips dropped open softly, and he looked at her hesitantly, his eyes rich with disbelief, yet a small flickering light of hope. And Hermione breathed in deeply, and this time her words didn't fail her. I want you, Draco, in this lifetime. I want to trip over your Quidditch jersey. I want to buy your nasty ice cream every week. I want to fill our flat with your family antiques, because it's your home too. It's always been your home too. I want to listen to you argue with our cat every morning. And I want you to make extra slices of toast. Because he's stolen yours from you. And well, you really need to improve your toast making skills. I want to go to Quidditch games with you. Not that I give a damn about your team. But you're just, you're so happy when they've won. And I'm selfish because I want to be there to see you so happy. I want you to prove to me how wrong my potion theories are even though you know I'm right, and I want to see a family library. I want to walk with you in your beautiful family conservatory and hear about your childhood adventures. I want our Friday dinners back. I want to buy you every type of flower there is, because, well, you're breathtaking when you blush. I want to know our children's names. Merlin, I want to know our grandchildren's names. I want Hermione paused, her chest trembling, her throat burning with acid as she forced down another song. I want you, Draco. I've always wanted you. I wanted to tell you that day in my office, and you didn't, and I know I couldn't. You know, for someone who sat yet all the time in the world to wait, you didn't give me very long to answer, you prick. She crossed her arms petulantly, her lips dropping into a pout. Draco stared at her. His face flittered between disbelief, wonder, delight, and then disbelief again, and he shook his head, his eyes wide and childlike in their vulnerability, like he didn't believe her. Like he didn't want to believe her. Hermione pulled herself toward and held his gaze determinedly. I want to do all of those things because, because I love you. It was Draco's turn to shadow on an exhale. He breathed like a man inhaling his first breath after being trapped underwater. His expression was pinched and his eyes clenched shut in a wince. He shook his head. Don't. He paused to clear his throat, his voice hoarse and strained. <clears throat> Don't say that just because I said it. And it was like her heart broke once more. But I do love you, she said softly, before the flames of determination fired up once more in her chest 
and she pulled her wand from her holster, gritting her teeth as she conjured up a red tulip to appear on his desk. A red tulip for perfect love, like what we have. Another wave of her wand. A peony. In some cultures, the name for most beautiful translates to peony. You're, you're my peony. A third wave of her wand. Sunflowers, for adoration and loyalty, I absolutely adore you, Draco. Draco's cheeks were positively flushed, his eyes lost in awe and disbelief as she waved her wand again and again and again. Gladiolus, white orchids, hyacinth, roses, dozens of flowers sprang onto his desk, her wand moving in a continuous blur until she could no longer see the folders, buried under a rainbow of petals. The folders had threatened to take him away from her. She paused, sweat wetting at her hairline, and she panted breathlessly. At some points, tears had streamed down her cheeks and she looked at him, a broken, pleading whimper at the edge of her lips. I love you, Draco. I'm sorry. I'm sorry it took me so long to say, but it's true. I love you. I'll say it every day for the rest of our life, if that is what it takes for you to believe me. I love you. She licked her lips, a tingle at the back of her neck, as his eyes, now hot and blown wide, traced the movement. You once told me that I was like in your skin. Well, you're my oxygen. She smiled weakly at him, her heart raging, twisting fiend against her ribcage. I can't breathe without you, Draco. Draco's chest heaved, and he swallowed thickly, his expression dazed and blown, like she'd clipped him over the head. I love you, she said. His eyes were now dark and fixed like a viper as he edged the corner of his desk. I love you, she repeated. He was in front of his desk now, his jaw tight with determination as he strode towards her. Every cell in her body hummed and throbbed in anticipation. I love you, I love you, I love you. She was like a broken record, repeating it with every step he took, repeating it for every denial, every rejection she'd ever made. Every time she had thought it, repeated it until he was a breast distance away from her and his hands cupped her cheeks fiercely. She thought she might collapse if he let go of her. I love you, Jacob's eyes glittered. A mix of awe, triumph and sheer happiness. She took back what she thought earlier. There, now, in this moment, he had never looked more beautiful. Once more, say it again, he said, and the gravelled vibrations of his voice made her knees quiver. His cologne was intoxicating, gliding and weaving through every pore of her skin. Every spare inch of her was encased with him. Hermione sighed happily, positively drunk from his touch. I love you, Draco Malfoy. A thumb gently swept away the lingering tears on her cheeks and his forehead pressed against hers, his whole body sagging in relief. Her heart sang in her chest, her trembling hands reaching up to stroke along the edge of his jaw. She needed to touch him. She needed to know that it was real. She needed him to know that this was real, that they were real. His nose nudged hers, and it never quivered and hummed in delight as his breath danced across her lips. Hermione... She hummed and her eyes fluttered close as she tilted her chin up slowly to his. There's nothing wrong with how I make toast. Her eyes flew open, meeting the teasing glint of his own gaze. She puffed out a laugh, a hand coming down to smack lightly on his chest. Git. Draco's lips curved into that beautiful private smile and Hermione's reached Nirvana. I love you too, Granger, he murmured and tilted his head down, Hermione's entire body an exposed laugh wire in anticipation, his lips swooping to meet hers. Master Malfoy, your port key is ready to... Ooh, Merlin's beard! They sprang apart. Hermione whipped around to see Thomas Diggle pointedly staring at the floor. His ears and neck flushed something horrendous, and his knuckles were wide as he gripped the doorknob fiercely. Uh, fuck, I mean, shit, uh, I mean... Thomas spluttered, his cheeks pale with mortification, and... Was that fear? Hermione looked back at Draco, and she had to bite down on her lip to suppress her chuckle. It looked murderous. What is it, Diggle? Draco spat his name like it was a cub. Your port, um, your port key is ready, Mr. S, sir. Your port key is ready, sir. Draco looked back down at Hermione, his eyes hot and steeled with intent. Give me ten minutes, he said, his eyes focused on her lips, and they flashed darkly when she shivered. Maybe they could make it twenty minutes. Ah, uh, um, well, yeah, I'm sorry, sir. But there was a delay in getting it sent to the department. It leaves in five minutes. I'm sorry, sir. Thomas apologized, and Hermione couldn't tell if he was apologizing for the department's error or interrupting. Probably the latter, judging by the utter venom in Draco's sneer, and Hermione snorted. 
She looked back at Thomas. The poor boy looked like he was seconds away from dropping to his knees and pleading for his life. It's all right, Thomas. He'll be right there. She appeased the tension in the air, and her lips twitched when Draco huffed indignantly behind her. Thomas nodded, clearly not waiting for Draco to protest otherwise as he darted from the office. Hermione turned and placed a placating hand on Draco's elbow, peering up at him from under her lashes and grinned wryly. Looks like you're the one who doesn't have any time, Mr. Malfoy, she teased, even as her chest curled in sour dissatisfaction at the thought of having to watch him leave. Draco blinked at her. He blinked again and then his chest shuddered on a breathless laugh of disbelief. Hermione let out a laugh of her own before her eyes dropped to his lips. Her lids felt heavy, her eyes hazy, and she lifted onto her tiptoes, tilted her chin to meet his lips, to meet the air as Draco choked out of reach. Hermione faltered, hurt and confusion marrying her brows into a frown. Draco smiled, equal parts amusement and want dancing in his eyes as he shook his head softly. If I try to kiss you goodbye, I'm not pulling away until you're screaming with your legs wrapped around my waist, Draco said huskily and wisely took a step away from her, yet his arms still twitched towards her in protest. I really do need to catch that portkey. Hermione bit down on her lip, peering over his shoulder to stare at his completely flower-covered, perhaps she went a tad overboard, desk contemplatively. Maybe if they were really quick. Don't even think about it, Granger. Draco groaned and turned to his desk to dig through the forest of petals, eventually pulling out those blasted folders. Hermione must have looked as sulky as she felt because he looked back at her and smirked. His eyes practically twinkled in delight. I've waited a very long time for you, Hermione, he purred, stepping in closely once more to tuck lightly on her plate. His lips twitched fondly. I can wait a couple more days. She huffed, just because they could didn't mean that they had to. Of course, she didn't say that out loud. She knew he was right. He did have to leave. As much as it pained her to agree with him, he had a job to do. No matter how much she wanted to leap into his arms and snuck the living daylight out of him. Instead, she stepped forward to close the distance between them and she reached up to fix the crisp collar of his shirt. She smiled when his arm snaked around her waist subconsciously. Hurry up and come back, Draco. She stared transfixed on his lips. She looked up and flicked her brow, her lips tugging it to another grin. I believe I owe you a coffee. He gazed down at her, and the smile was magnificent. Chapter 11 Dearest Granger, Is there any particular reason that my house elf woke me up at an ungodly hour this morning to deliver me a rather sizable fruit basket? Has my departure ticked you off that greatly that you decided to literally sweeten me up for this Cumbria clan? You will be disappointed to hear, my wonderfully spiteful witch, that I have been goring myself on Italian food the past few days. I'm pretty sure there is more garlic running through my veins than magic by this point, so I am well protected. Can't give much intel at the moment, but tensions aren't as high as my first visit. I'll keep you posted. DM. P.S. Stop slouching. Hermione hadn't spoken for ten minutes, and the incessant clicking of the Newton's cradle on Gila Reed's desk was beginning to give her a headache. The irritating desk accessory aside, it was a rather lovely, welcoming office. Lush green plants tucked away in each corner, the wall a soothingly plain cream, almost bland in the ordinary of it all. And the chair Hermione sat in still held its aromatic fresh leather scent. Yes, Hermione supposed she had no problem spending the remaining fifty minutes in silence in this artfully comforting office. What brings you here today, Miss Granger? Hila Reed had asked her, once Hermione had gotten comfortable in a plush armchair. Uh, I work a lot, I guess? I see. Now, is that of your opinion or from others? Hermione had snorted derisively. Does that matter? Shouldn't you just be asking me more about my being here? I mean, isn't that how this stuff works? Well... I'm here to talk with you, not with the concerns of others, Miss Granger. Gila Reed had replied back, calmly. Hermione had wondered how many times the healer had had to explain it to her other patient, her other visitors, and her stomach was leaded with embarrassment. Ye would not be the first ambitious witch to walk through my door, bearing the misguided concerns of her friends. 
This is your hour to speak, not a friend's, not a family member's, or a co-worker's. So tell me, Miss Granger, are you here for yourself or for others? Hermione hadn't known how to respond to that, looking down to twiddle her thumb anxiously, and so they sat in silence, the buggering Newton's cradle being the only sound to cut through the thick, stagnant silence. Miss Granger, I would just like to remind you again that this is your hour to speak. Hilary didn't smile, but her tone was soothing, and yet comfortably firm at the same time. Hermione smiled apologetically. I just... I don't know. I'm not sure I even need to be here, really. You wouldn't be the first person to sit in that chair and tell me that, but since you're already here, we might as well make the most of the rest of this hour. Hilary leaned back against her cushion and casually shrugged. We can talk about anything you like. It doesn't have to be about work or any one thing in particular. Now, of course, we can sit in silence for the rest of the session. That's also up to you. That's also up to you, if you would prefer. But this is your time to speak about whatever you like. Perhaps. Hmm. Did you catch the Quidditch final? Hermione barely managed to bite back her eye roll. I'm not a fan of Quidditch. Oh, thank heavens. Peter Reed let out a content sigh of relief and Hermione startled at a sharp break in her demeanour, as the therapist winked at her conspiratorially. Whilst I'm happy to talk about whatever my client wants, if I have to sit through another hour discussing the morally grey legalities of a wrinkly faint, I might have to arrange a counselling session of my own with one of my colleagues. Hermione snorted. All right, maybe she liked this humour. Try being in a friend group with three ex-players, Hermione said dryly. If I make it to a dinner with them, with it only being discussed for an hour, then that's a good day. Hila Reed grimaced for a moment before her expression flickered in wonderment. This friendship group includes Mr. Potter and Mr. Weasley? Hermione nodded. Yeah, yes, they're, um, they're actually the ones who told me to. They, uh, they suggested I should come here. A small pleased look flashed across Hila Reed's eyes quickly. But you were the one to arrange the session, yes? She clarified and returned Hermione's nod. Okay, was it something that they brought up with you often coming here? Hermione shrugged. Uh, no, it was quite a recent thing, but um, I guess you could say it was overdue. A curious head tilt. What do you mean by that, Miss Granger? Would you prefer Miss Granger, or can I call you Hermione? Oh, Hermione, please, I insist. Very well, Hermione. Why do you say that this was overdue? Hermione scratched at an itch on her neck. I, um, she puffed out a bitter laugh. <laughs> well, I've been hospitalized a few, well, more than a few times, because of work, or I guess how I handle my work would be fairer to say. Hila Reed's expression didn't shift. Hermione wondered if perhaps Harry and Ron had already talked about this during one of their sessions. When was the last time that this happened? Hermione's chest warmed, picturing the sudden arrival of an oak desk in her office a particularly stubborn wizard reading over her case files with an air of indifference. Two years ago this August, Hila Reed looked at her contemplatively. Two years is a long time, Hermione. Did something happen in that time? Um, yes, well, actually, I, I guess someone happened. Hermione's cheeks pinked shyly, and she looked back down at her own hands in her lap. She picked at a hangnail on her index finger absentmindedly. Hila Reed must have sensed her mild reluctance, as she didn't prompt her father. Okay, so, prior to two years ago, have you always had this tendency to work a lot, as you put it? Well, I mean, I started my job as soon as I left school and had um, taken care of some personal things. I don't really take holidays that much, I mean, besides the weekend off. Hermione shrugged again and reached for a glass of water that had been given to her at the start of the session. Her throat was very dry. Ah, yes. I've heard everything about your school escapades. Brightest witch of her age, I believe they called you in the prophet. Hila Reed wasn't mocking her. Her tone held a veil of genuine curiosity. Hermione's cheeks flushed deeper, and her hand slipped on the condensation of the glass slightly as she placed the drink back down on the table. Right. What were your studies like? Hila Reed prompted after a few moments of stilted silence. Hermione frowned. What do you mean? Well... I imagine you were quite the study as young witch. Would you say you put in the same amount of work in your studies as you do now at your job? Oh, I mean, well, I like learning, Hermione said dumbly, and her eyebrows knitted together in a frown. 
And do you like your job? Yes, yes, I love it. Okay, so would it be fair to assume that you put in generous efforts towards your studies then? Nina Reed crossed leg over the other and leaned against her armrest, her hand resting against her cheek as she looked at Hermione with polite but sincere interest. Well, I mean, I had to. Hermione's frown deepened. Nina Reed cocked her head again. Why do you say that? <laughs> well, I'm sure you're aware that I'm muggle-born. I didn't know anything about the magical world before I got my Hogwarts letter. So, I had a lot of catching up to do. I'm pretty sure I bought out half of flourishing blots before I went into my first year, just so I could study up on as much visiting culture as I could. Hermione chuckled at the memory. Her parents had almost keeled over upon seeing the total cost at a checkout till. That's a lot of pressure to put up on an 11-year-old, Hermione. Hilary pointed out, not unkindly, pulling Hermione away from her fond memories. Hermione paused, her mouth gaping for a few moments before she quickly recovered, her chest hot and flaring out defensively. How dare this woman try and twist Hermione's childhood? Yes, well, it's not like I had many people around me willing to help, she snapped back. Hilary frowned, and yet Hermione suspected it was more to do with her words than her sharp tone of voice. You were friends with Mr. Weasley during your school years, were you not? Hermione blinked and sheepishly curled in on herself. I mean, yes, we were, but not at first. I, um, she licked her lips nervously. I, I was never really good at making friends. She looked away, her eyes following the admittedly now little soothing clicking balls of the Newton's cradle as she thought back on her many lonely years of primary school. The lunch breaks in her classroom that she had begged her teachers to let her stay in drinking in the words of her textbook as she tried to drown out the delighted screams and laughter of her classmates on the playground outside. The whispers and taunts behind her back as she walked down the hallways of her being a freak and there being something dodgy about her. The day that Professor McGonagall had knocked on her door with her Hogwarts letter had been the best day of Hermione's entire life up to that point. Finally, Hermione had learned that she wasn't a freak, that she was normal but just in an entirely different world. That summer that she had spent scurrying every letter, memorizing every incantation, every footnote of her wizarding textbooks, and forcing her parents to quiz her, even on the car journey to King's Cross Station. She'd been fueled by the determination to prove that, for once, she actually belonged somewhere. That she would actually be able to make friends. Yet, the taunts and whispered had followed her. She was a know-it-all, a show-off. The sniggering jeebies about her not really belonging there from the Slytherins that had had Hermione desperately daydreaming about her old primary school classroom. At least at the end of the day, her parents would be waiting for her at the school gates to pick her up. But those first few months at Hogwarts, she was completely and suffocatingly alone, in a new world that she could only understand through the soothing words of her school books. And so, Hermione had fallen back in her old comfort, spending her lunches, evenings and weekends in the comfort of the school library absorbing as much knowledge as she could, so that she could prove one day, once and for all, that she did belong there, that she was just as much of a witch as, and in some cases better than, her classmates. And soon enough, even after befriending Harry and Ron, it had become part of her routine. A stability amongst the chaos of following Harry into a life of threatening encounters year after year, in between violent chess matches, giant snakes and werewolves, Hermione could find solace and comfort in the dusty tombs of her books. And of course, then, the more peril they found themselves in each year, well, the more Hermione needed to learn. More curses, more jinxes, more countercurses, more potions, more magical laws of principle. All of it lingering in some crevice of her mind, just waiting there for the inevitable danger to arise for Hermione to be able to step in and save her friends. She had never stopped. Even before she got her ministry job, Hermione had always never been able to take her foot off of the pedal. A voice in the back of her mind interrupted her musings and questioned if this wasn't something that Hermione should be speaking with Hila Reed about. She blinked, her head almost sluggish as she drew herself back into her surroundings and smiled sheepishly at Hila Reed, who was waiting for her patiently. Sorry, she said meekly. Hila Reed waved her off. Like I said, Hermione, this is your hour. Feel free to speak as much or as little as you want. Hermione nodded and spent the next fifteen minutes relaying her inner thoughts back to the therapist. So you felt, as a young girl, being thrown into a new environment like you had something to prove? Hila Reed summed up and looked at her, her lips pursing. Do you still feel like that now at your job? You were how old when you started working here at the ministry? Twenty... Twenty-one. 
Again, that's a lot of responsibility at a young age. I. Hermione stopped, blinking rapidly. She had been rather young when she started her position, hadn't she? Merlin, Harry was right. She did leap from one strenuous environment to another. Her chest twisted grievously as she pictured her bright-eyed, buck-toothed, eleven-year-old self camped under her blanket with Dad's torch in her hand as she ploughed through what was to become her favourite book, endlessly boring her future best friends with the facts about their school. Her innocent, naive eleven-year-old self had no idea of what was to come for the next fifteen years. Let's go back to your time at school, Hermione. Nina Reed calmly interrupted her building distress. You said that you spent a lot of time doing research to help Mr. Putter after you befriended both him and Mr. Weasley. And you also said that you felt like you didn't have anyone around you to help you, she emphasized at the end with a pointed look. Oh no, that's not what I meant. Harry and Ron, they've always been there for me. Hermione rushed to explain, her ears burning hotly. I meant before, before we were friends. I, well, I guess I only had myself. Ah, my mistake. My apologies, Hermione. She smiled lightly when Hermione shrugged dismissively, but her expression soon shifted back into a direct fixed stare. But would it be fair to say that Mr. Putter and Mr. Weasley relied on you a lot during their time at school? Hermione flushed. I wouldn't say a lot. Well, I'm not breaking patient confidentiality by saying this, Hermione. From what I've gathered from my time with all three of you, it's that it seems like your dedication and focus to your studies and research is what helped to save your life on several occasions. Research only gets you so far, Hermione retorted with a shake of her head. Harry was the one who saved the day, not me, and I, I wasn't always focused, especially, especially when we were on the run. What do you mean by that? Hilary asked gently. Hermione in her shakily, and her eyes squeezed shut tightly as she whispered out her most pained memory from that time. Her nurse anxiously picking at her hangnail again, until the skin was raw and sore to the touch. Frantic, rushed footsteps against the ministry floor, searing hot curses skimming past her ear. Desperately grabbing at Harry and Ron's hand, a clawed hand digging into her shoulder painfully that she couldn't shake off as they apparated away. Hermione desperately shouting out the password to their hideout. Her step of guilt of losing Harry's last comforting link to Sirius. Her attention distracted for barely a second. Ron's pain scream, his blood staining her hands and clothes after she'd splinched him. She had lost focus for just a brief moment, and she had almost gotten them killed. Hila Reed was silent for a few moments, the Newton's cradle melodically clicking away in the room. Is that what you believe is the cause of what happened? That you lost focus? That you had been distracted? And not because you were protecting your friends from a death eater who wouldn't have hesitated to kill you? Her nose burnt with a sniffle, and Hermione shook her head. Her chest felt empty, yet exposed, and raw at the same time. I should have cursed them away sooner. Before we left the ministry, I should have... Should have focused on saving yourself and your friends, which you did rather well given the circumstances. Hilary pushed firmly and cocked her brow. There's not many 18-year-olds who could pull off a three-person apparition, least of all with a dangerous dark wizard on their back. You did the right thing, Hermione. Hermione's eyes burned and she turned to look outside the window. A watery teary cough lodged in the back of her throat painfully. Not enough, she whispered. I disagree. You saved three people that night, Hermione. Mr. Putter, Mr. Weasley and yourself. And I'm so sorry that you were all forced into the horrific circumstances that you were. No teenager should ever be forced to make such choices in life. Hila Reed was tentative in her manner and in her tone and she leaned forward, her elbows resting on her thighs. Thank you for sharing your story with me. It was very brave of you to revisit it. And let me tell you, as someone who spends most of her working hours in the presence of vigilant auras, that's not always easy. I want to thank you for trusting me. Hermione's tongue wet her lips, nodding jerkily. Hermione, are you comfortable continuing? She waited for Hermione to nod again before she carried on. So you believe that you lost focus, that you let yourself get distracted, and so you made sure that it would never happen again, in any circumstance? Hermione blinked, trepidation hammering like a woodpecker against her ribcage as she waited for Hilary to continue. Hilary's eyes bored into hers, and in your mind from the tender young age of eleven, you have always felt the need to prove to others and to prove to yourself that you belong in the wizarding world. It's rather unfortunate that you were brought in during a time where others were not accepting of your birth status, 
and it was unfair to you that you had to fight in such a war. But other people's ignorance is not your burden to bear, Hermione. Hermione swallowed thickly. I don't care what people think of me anymore. Don't you? Near forgotten worries of her colleagues judging her over her relationship with Draco stormed into her mind. How she'd worried, agonized over the idea that they all believed her to be incompetent. That she should have been replaced. That she really was some sort of a scarlet woman. It's like I said, I don't care. Hermione let breezily. Hilary gave her a look like she could see right through her, and yet Hermione didn't feel judged or embarrassed. No, it was almost reminiscent of her old beloved head of hell, and a wistful clench of her chest had Hermione making a mental note to write to her favourite professor. And yet, you have still carried those burdens with you wherever you go, Hilary countered. And that's what I'm here for, Hermione, to see how I might help you to relieve the weight of these burdens, and maybe, one day, we might leave some of them behind you on your journey. Journey to where? Hermione whispered. To wherever you choose to go, that's the beauty of it. Hermione exhaled heavily and reached for her glass of water again. Water dripped down her blouse as her hand trembled. Can we talk about something else? She rasped out, the glass colliding with the side of the table harshly. Of course, Hila Reed replied, not missing a beat. I'd like to go back to what you said earlier, if you don't mind. About someone coming into your life two years ago? Warmth bloomed in Hermione's chest, and her navel fluttered with a kaleidoscope of butterflies as she thought about a certain blonde, pointy-faced wizard tugging playfully on her plate. A hand absentmindedly reached up to brush down the wayward curse escaping said plate as she nodded in agreement. Hilary nodded with her and tilted her head with a light-knowing smile. Would you like to talk with me about them? Hermione smiled down at her lap. He's, well, he's someone who helps me, um, actually, no. He's a bit more than that. Hilary listened silently. Hermione licked her lips, her chest overly stuffed as she tried to find words, any words to fit Draco in. He's like the scent of freshly cut grass, the feeling of fresh parchment, the warmth from a crackling lock on a cold winter's evening, like the comforting familiar taste of a ginger biscuit, she finished internally. Her biscuits was their memory and their memory alone. That sounds rather magical. If you'll pardon the expression, Hila Reed's lips pressed together into a quelled smile. May I ask, is it serious? Faceless children with unruly hair and pointed chins and allegedly pre-picked names giggling with innocent, youthful delight ran around in her mind. She nodded. Yes, it's serious. Does he know that you're here today? No, not yet. He's away for work. An understanding nod. And in what way does he help you? Her mind shifted uncomfortably. Her embarrassment and shame sat like a brick in her stomach. Uh, well, in every way, unfortunately. Hila Reed's eyes narrowed almost imperceptibly, a fleeting assessing glance of Hermione's face. Can you explain what you mean by that? Hermione swallowed thickly. She needed another drink. Her throat felt acidic. Um, well, he does, did, he did everything for me. He made sure I had lunch every day. I, um, I have a habit of working through my break most days. He made sure I wouldn't stay at the office too late, or he'd stay with me when I needed to pull an all-nighter at my desk. A decision he made that Hermione was always furiously against. He needed rest for Merlin's sake. He helps me on my cases, but even if he's doing his own work, he's still, he's still just kind of there, by my side. And how does it make you feel? A shame, Hermione whispered, her eyes clenching shut as tears burned her vision. Ashamed and, I guess, anxious that I'm that hopeless. Ashamed, afraid that I can't do my job without him. Ashamed of how much I liked it, his attention, his loyalty. But mostly, I'm ashamed that I've burdened him for so long. In more ways than once, she mentally tacked on. Her tempers throbbed. Click, 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 after Newton's cradle. It's interesting to me that you said that, Hermione. Hila Reed looked at her, pensive that you're focusing more so on the well-being of someone else, the choices that he has rather admirably but willingly made himself, as opposed to thinking about the fact that you're in such a position in the first place. Hermione blinked. I don't know what... She trailed off uselessly. Hermione, I'm not discrediting the efforts Mr. Ma this man has done for you. Hilary tactfully corrected herself. Hermione wondered bitterly if that buggering betting pool had reached that department too. And you're quite right. Almost two years of looking out for you. That would be quite the impact on one's emotional state. I'm not denying that it isn't. 
But with all due respect, like I said at the start of our session, I'm not here to talk about the mental well-being of someone else. I'm here for you. Peter Reed leaned forward, her elbows resting on her thighs. She looked at Hermione, not quite with pity nor disappointment, but with an insistency that made the breath catch in Hermione's throat. Hermione, you came to my office today because of your relationship with your work, not your colleague. Now, we can talk about whatever it is that you are comfortable talking about, your relationships included. But it is quite clear to me that the thread between education and addiction have become entangled with one another for you over these last 15 years. And I imagine your years that were unfairly sacrificed of you to fight in a war did not help. Hilary glanced over at the clock on her wall. Now, we don't have long left of the session, but I would at least like to discuss with you how we may to begin to unravel these threads. How I can help to provide you with the tools you need to take action into your own hands, to regain this control without feeling like you are taking advantage of your partner. Six salty tears dripped onto Hermione's clasped hands as she stared into her lap woefully. What if this is just who I am? Who I'm supposed to be? Hermione Granger, addicted to work. Hermione, your addiction is not who you're supposed to be. It's preventing you from who you're supposed to be. Her words were like a blow to the chest, and yet Hermione felt like a mountain had just lifted off of her shoulders. She nodded into her lap, her tears staining her trousers. Okay, she said thickly. Okay, Hila Reed parroted, leaning back into her chair. How about we start slowly, hmm? See if making small changes won't spike these feelings of anxiety and guilt that you may have, that has led you in the past towards these unhealthy habits. Hermione nodded again, Hila Reed copying the motion. Okay, Hila Reed said. Now, you said that you often have the habit of working through a lunch hour, yes? Unless your partner's there to intervene? Yes, but I don't I don't know that I I don't know if I can. I, I don't think. Hermione, breathe. Nice and easy, there you go. I'm not asking that you immediately take a full hour's break every day, at least not at first. Small changes, remember? Hilary tilted her head, looking at Hermione thoughtfully. How about we call it a homework? Consider this your daily homework. It'll be no more than ten minutes every day. That's all I want you to do, Hermione. Every day. It doesn't have to be at lunchtime specifically. It can be mid-morning. It can be late afternoon. But I would like for you to take ten minutes each day and go for a walk. It can still be within the ministry building. I would prefer it if you made it outside of the building, but that's your choice to make. But I would like for you to leave your department's level at the very least. Put some distance between you and your desk. And if there are days where you feel like you can do more than 10 minutes, please do. But don't push yourself too hard, Hermione. Small changes. Remember that. Small changes. Homework. Hermione liked homework. Besides, it was only 10 minutes. Cool relief washed down her back and she smiled. I think I can manage that. Hilary nodded in approval, casting another quick glance to her clock. Wonderful. Now we're coming up to the end of the hour, but I do have just a few more things I'd like to go over with you, if that's all right. As their hour came to a close, not long after, with Hermione agreeing to follow along with the mind healer's suggestion, and Hermione's soul felt both drained and invigorated at the same time. Perhaps she would take these first ten minutes to have a nap at her desk instead. Hermione pleasantly surprised Hila Reed by asking for another session in two weeks' time. Dearest Granger, thank you for the lunches. Not only are you keeping me alive and deliciously ripe for this clan, but your public claiming of me is effectively warding me away from Kinkleberry, what I can only assume he believes are his bedroom eyes. Things are wrapping up nicely. I'll see you when I return. The end. P.S. Stop trying to give my house half money, you heaven. Poor Twonkers is of the opinion that you hate her, and she's getting rather inconsolable. Hermione really needed to get madly to assist her in organizing her desk. She'd spent the last fifteen minutes rummaging through the papers on her desk, trying to find a particular court transcript she needed to double-check against a particular written argument from her hearing next Tuesday, and so far she had managed to find a broken hair tie, in all case she had forgotten to return to the archives, and she had groaned calculating the late fees that she would have to pay. A sad, half-bitten, stale biscuit. Parkinson, she scowled. Old, rather flirty memos from Draco. But no court transcript. Oh, where are you, you little bugger? Hermione huffed, scowling to herself. And you pry yourself on your organization, Hermione, honestly. She slammed her hat onto her crossed arms resting atop of her desk and heaved out a heavy sigh. 
Mani had no idea how she was supposed to keep a low-stress environment like she, in hindsight foolishly, promised she would try to heal a read. Losing an important case document was the exact opposite of low-stress. Might as well move into St. Mungo's this weekend, she grumbled into her arms. I thought I told you that talking to yourself is the first sign of madness. Hermione stiffened at a familiar drawl. Great. On top of missing Draco to the point of neediness, her brain had actually resorted to hallucinating. Perhaps her therapy session had been more mentally exhausting than she thought. A tsk sounded out from across her room. My, my, my. I thought the silent treatment was only for couples who had been married for several decades. She really did need to find out how long her hallucination lasted. Maybe she should ask Hila Reed during her next session. Nevertheless, Hermione lifted her head slightly to sneak a peek and her heart shuddered to a stop. Leaning against the doorframe, Draco's smirk was positively less chivious. And yet, even from her desk, Hermione could spot the hesitance and slight tightness to his eyes. He quirked a brow and wriggled his fingers in a wave. Don't I even get a hello? What, changed your mind already? His voice was light, teasing even, but she detected a faint hint of genuine worry in his tone. Hermione leaned back in her chair and grinned at him, cocking her brown return. Back again? Took you long enough? I thought I told you to come back quickly. Draco blinked and then all reservations melted from his expression as he smiled at her, softly, lovingly. She was pretty sure that her face mirrored his. He peeled himself off of the doorframe and stalked towards her desk slowly. Manny's heart was positively hammering in her throat, even as she rose up to meet him halfway. She was going to give him the snob of his life. Wait. Draco stopped in his tracks, his face pale with alarm. Hermione smiled at him reassuringly, shaking her head. I just... If we're going to do this, I need you to be honest with me, Hermione explained, looking at him imploringly. That means talking to me, even if you think I'm too busy or too stressed with my job to listen. This won't work if you keep things close to your chest. And the same goes for me too. You can't, you can't just give so much of yourself to me and not let me know if you feel like I might, like I'm not doing the same for you, Draco grimaced. Granger, please let me finish. She looked at him desperately, a year's worth of guilt crumbling down in her chest. You gave so much of yourself to me without ever expecting anything back for over a year. I know you said that you didn't care, but Draco, you have to. You have to care about yourself too. Hermione's eyes burned, her voice wobbling, and Draco's brows furrowed together in a pained wince. His hand reaching out for her. She let him hold her hand and she interlocked their fingers. A soothing anchor she could grasp to as she tried her best to claw out her thoughts. I mean it, Draco. If you feel like I'm slipping, or if I'm getting too sucked into my work, if, if you feel like I'm neglecting you in some way, Draco frowned and opened his mouth to argue. I know you believe that it didn't bother you, but Draco, I want you to care. I want you to expect me to put in the same effort because, well, relationships are a two-way street. We're a team, Draco, an equal team. And I want to know, I need to know that you'll call me out if I'm not pulling my own weight. It's not, it's, it's not like I won't try. I promise I will. I love you, Draco, but I also love my job. And look, Sometimes I will put my job first. I have to. That's just who I am. But there will also be times where I'm going to choose you, choose us first, and I need to know that you'll be there to kick me up the backside if I lose sight of that. I, I know it's another burden I'm placing on you, and I'm sorry, but I love you, Draco, and I'm going to spend the rest of my life making it up to you if, if you let me. Draco stared at her, seemingly lost in his own thoughts before he nodded slowly. All right, Granger. Hermione squeezed his hand, shaking her head insistently. You have to promise. Draco rolled his eyes and huffed, but put back a fun smile as he squeezed her hand in return. I promise. I promise I won't just spill all my woes into a dear diary moment and actually talk to my girlfriend. Hermione's neighbor fluttered at a turn, and it was Draco's turn to look at her firmly. In return, you have to promise to stop beating yourself up about this. I told you, Granger. I'm not holding it against you for not acting like you were in a relationship that you had no reason to believe that you were in. I, Hermione's cheeks colored and she looked down at their feet, bashfully shuffling her ankles together. Okay, she finished meekly. A hand gently tucked at her plate and she looked up, her breath catching in her throat. Draco looked mesmerized as he scanned over her face. I love you, Hermione, he murmured, his fingers tracing lightly over the ends of her hair. 
Hermione sighed happily and stepped forward to close the distance between them. His cologne made her head spin and her muscles melted from the warmth of his chest. I love you too, she replied and snaked her arms around his shoulders and pressing down on the back of his neck gently. Sips quirked into a wry smile as he bent down to close the final distance. Their lips met and her office faded out of existence. The only thing that mattered was their souls intertwining. The way Draco licked into her mouth gently, her nasal trembling and quivering at the soft, deep hum he gave when Hermione deepened the kiss, her fingers gliding through his silk-soft hair. His hands were possessive, anchoring grip around her waist as his tongue teased hers. Hermione hummed greedily and her hands thumped across his jaw. Her body became alive on this touch. If it was possible to suffocate and breathe the purest of air at the same time, Hermione was sure she was capable of doing so in Draco's embrace. The soul glittered and hummed. For the first time in over a month, Hermione was home. Eventually, when she could no longer ignore the way her head lolled alarmingly, she broke away with a desperate gasp for air, cut off quickly by a pleading whimper when Draco's lips sought to close the distance again. Wait a moment! She laughed breathlessly, and her eyes rolled to the back of her head when his lips simply claimed a new path of hot, wet, open kisses down her neck. Draco, she moaned softly. He groaned against her neck, and the vibration slit her nerves on fire. Hermione's face burned almost painfully when she looked over her shoulder. He hadn't closed the door behind him. It was a small mercy that just so happened to be the lunch hour. Draco, she gasped out again as he tongued over her paws, and her hands trembled as she reluctantly pulled his head away from her neck. Never lie to me again. Her warning was weakened by the way she almost moaned at the blown-out, hazy expression of his face. Draco truly was an unfairly sexy bastard. He blinked, small traces of cognitive thinking blooming in his eyes, and Hermione was cursing herself inwardly for ruining the moment when he nodded. Sincerity and honesty flickered across his face. Hermione bit her lip, witnessing Draco's eyes darken once more as she leaned in to kiss him softly. His hands had just begun to sneak under her shirt towards her bra when she pulled away from him with a sharp jerk, a small but alarming thought lightening up in her mind. He couldn't quite hold back his irritated tough, and Hermione had to scrunch her nose to hold back her amused snort. We're not married, are we? Hermione's tone was light, and she grinned at him teasingly, but she couldn't ignore the genuine flicker of fear in her stomach. She would seriously need to take a long, hard look at her observational skills. Draco's lips quirked, his eyes glinting. Not yet? Well then, Hermione's stomach flipped, her eyes wide as she looked up at him. Her entire body throbbed with pleased anticipation. Trust me, Granger, not even you could miss the avant-garde wedding extraordinaire that my mother is planning. Hermione scowled at the light GB, even as Ron's I told you so sang in her mind, and Draco's eyes twinkled as he leaned in and whispered, There's doves. Hermione blinked in dismay. I don't want doves, she huffed peculiarly. Oh, there'll be doves. Hermione really needed to sit down with the Malfoy family and have a serious discussion about their seemingly familiar trait of making life-altering decisions for her. But it's our wedding, she pointed out. Goodness, they had been dating for five minutes and they were already arguing about their wedding. And she felt that Lavender had a reputation for moving quickly. Draco snorted. That's what you think, Ranger. Pretty sure my mother has been playing my special day since the day I discovered how my cook worked. Hermione raised a disbelieving brow, even as she grimaced at his distasteful work. You're telling me you want dogs? I want you, smooth bastard. And yet Hermione's cheeks blushed, pleased, hands coming up to awkwardly play with the buttons on his shirt in a vain attempt of distraction, and Draco smirked knowingly before he continued. I want you, Granger, and if that means 300 wedding guests risk getting shat on by book, then that's a sacrifice I'm willing to make. She gawked at him. 300? I don't even know 300 people, Draco. She shook her head in adamant refusal. 50. 75. Hermione's eyes narrowed. 20. Draco tsked her. You'll have to be the one to inform my mother, Granger. Oh, she would. Hermione opened her mouth to continue, but Draco rolled his eyes, sense tugging firmly to pull her hips against his, and all arguments trickled out of her mind. Now, with all due respect, Granger, please do shut up and let me kiss my girlfriend. Well, she supposed she couldn't argue against that. With a pleased smile on his face and a hand softly cupping her cheek, he bent down and brought their lips together. It was lunch hour after all. It was highly unlikely one of their colleagues, mainly Diggle, he still couldn't look her in the eye, would interrupt them. 
she supposed that there was no harm in a little midday light petting but when draco's hand slipped under her blouse creeping up her back to fiddle with the clasp of her bra and she felt the front of his trousers being pulled a little too toward she pulled away quickly reaching up on her tiptoes to kiss away the frustrated frown between his brows her own navel throbbed mournfully if it's all the same to you i'd quite like to buy my boyfriend that coffee now she said reaching over to interlock their fingers together again draco sighed heavily but his neck and cheeks betrayed him by flushing wonderfully hermione's chest warmed with fondness have it your way then he drawled and his eyes glittered i told you it's my treat draco i literally have the money ready here in my hand good for you put it back in your pocket granger it's not even a galleon exactly you should have no problem letting me pay my sincerest apologies about this ma'am granger the vein in your head is about to burst would you just do you want me to call you a chauvinist again draco glared at her hermione glared back with the roll of his eyes breaking their silent standoff he shoved the coin back into his pocket he grumbled under his breath when hermione preened in smug satisfaction turning to give the awaiting bored barista her money go on ask me draco prompted after they had sat down tucked away at a relatively private table their drinks and food arriving not shortly after hermione frowned and looked at him quizzically whilst she reached for a plated scone and a mug naturally draco had decided last minute to switch to ordering tea with an alarmingly copious amount of sugar cubes on the side and her teeth ached as she watched him pour in full fat milk she would really need to tame that habit of his before he met her parents one day his lips curled in a knowing wry smirk around the rim of his teacup i know it's been eating away at your sweaty little mind granger just ask me hermione chewed on her lip how long have you been in love with me draco took a leisurely sip of his drink his eyes focused on the lace holes of the tablecloth hermione's heartbeat was a deafening pounding drum in her ears as she watched him ponder his answer carefully i guess my answer depends on to whom you're asking his thumb traced the rim of his cup delicately a small bittersweet smile bleeding onto his features who am i asking hermione cocked the brow draco's eyes flickered up to her briefly before returning to the tablecloth hermione laid her hand on his wrist her thumb gently rubbing at the smooth skin in comforting silent encouragement well if you were to ask my mother and hermione's cheeks blushed at the knowing look draco threw her she supposed it was a fool's hope to believe that a conversation about narcissa's son would have remained private draco cleared his throat lightly his own cheeks prickled a soft pink as he pointedly avoided eye contact <clears throat> my mother would answer somewhere around sixth year a shuddered exhale tore from her chest and she was very great Whee! a shuddered exhale tore from her chest and she was very grateful for the fact that they were set at a table as her knees buckled together the weight of anguish yet visceral affection for him bowing down on her shoulders had he really been carrying a torch for her for nine almost ten years she swallowed dryly and if i'm asking you Hermione gently prodded. Draco rolled his eyes with no real venom behind it, as he looked at her with a fond yet exacerbated smile. Give me a little credit, Granger. It takes more than a chance encounter with a little know-it-all and some disgusting biscuits. I mean it, Granger. You need to sort out that horrid little habit of yours. It takes more than that for me to become completely devoted to you. Oh, Hermione folded in on herself surprised at how she was torn somewhere between disappointment and relief draco raised a brow at her meek tone his eyes positively twinkling should i stick with my mother's answer granger don't tell me it's unrequited love that gets you off he teased his lips quirking into a smirk when she scowled at him other the effect of which was softened by the mortified flush of her ears and neck well you were the one to tell me you've been waiting for a long time and that you had no qualms about waiting even longer forgive me for believing your mother's point of view hermione all but stuck her tongue out as she circularly picked the raisins out of her scone draco snickered reaching over to tuck lightly at her plate even though she wasn't slouching she would really need to ask him why he did that at some point in the future but not right now she turned back at him and looked at him expectantly continue then um i mean if you want to she tacked on with a soft encouraging smile Draco leaned against the backrest of his chair, his brows furrowed thoughtfully. It would be a lie to say that that day didn't. 
alter my perspective of you. I mean, he asked bitterly. You were sat there with your beautiful big doe eyes all swift and pleading with me to look after myself. And all I could think about was how there was a very real possibility that one day I might watch you die. He shook his head, his face pinched with nausea and anger, of which Hermione greatly suspected was towards himself, and Hermione rubbed her thumb soothingly over the whiteness of his clenched knuckles, even as her own stomach churned at her thought. And that thought just, it just knocked me sick. There you were, talking about how I needed to keep myself alive, and fuck, you just seemed to genuinely care, even with our history, and I, I couldn't stop picturing it, a word without know it all Hermione Granger, a lesson without you jumping out of your seat to answer, to walk down the corridors and not spy a bushy mane a mile off. Draco cut himself off and swallowed thickly. I just felt so cold and angry at even the notion of it. To be honest, Granger, before that day, I hadn't even given it a second thought. I mean, why would I? We had never really interacted with one another. What did I care what happened to Potter Smuggleborn? But that night, after our conversation, when I was supposed to be fixing that fucking cabinet, I, all I could think about was why I was so scared and sick at the thought of being in a classroom without you being there to irritate the living shit out of everyone else in that room with your incessant need to prove how smart you were even though we had all long known and accepted it by then. Draco finally looked back up at her, and Hermione's heart ached at the shame and guilt in his eyes. She leaned in and cupped his cheek softly. He exhaled shakily, turning his cheek towards her touch. That was a long time ago, Draco. You don't have to explain your actions to me. You were different. We were both different people back then. She licked her lips, her mouth dry. I forgave you a long time ago, Draco. I don't love you any less for anything that you tell me. His eyes seared through hers fiercely, and he leaned in, slips claiming hers in a kiss, a touch too passionate for their public, family-friendly surroundings. I love you, he vowed huskily after he pulled away. His breath was hot against her lips, and she nudged her nose against her softly. I love you too. Draco grasped the hand that still cupped his cheek and turned his head to kiss her palm. A passing waitress sent them a warning, disapproving glance, her eyes pointedly flickering away to a young family only a few tables across from theirs, and Hermione flushed sheepishly. She cleared her throat, every pore of her body whining in disagreement as she pulled away from him and gestured for him to continue. So what? Did you, did you fancy me, or...? Hermione trailed off, and her navel throbbed at the still-heated blaze of his eyes. I had a fascination with you, Draco started carefully. At least I told myself it was just a fascination. But I'd be lying if I didn't fantasize once or twice about bending you over my quartering and seeing how lot you could be outside of academic participation. He looked playfully at her, which turned into a grin when she squirmed in her seat. The cafe had gotten rather warm. But then, after that night in the astronomy tower, Draco's voice quietened, and all arousal drained away from her as she leaned in, hanging on every careful word. When everything just went to complete fucking shit, and with the Dark Lord, with him living in my home, I didn't dare let myself think about you, at least not at first. I'm going to be honest, Granger, I actually managed to forget about you, my attraction to you, for a little bit. His smile was weak, dry, as he shrugged at her, until I realized why I was so nervous to read the newspaper each morning, why I practically memorized every letter of each article, why I would almost hold my breath until I finished reading the last page. I think my father grew suspicious too, the way I would insist on reading the paper first. I even snatched it out of his hands a few times, I think. Why, I couldn't bear to look whenever a new round of prisoners were brought in, or whenever the duck, whenever he announced that that evening's meeting had a special guest, and I would almost piss myself in fear. He puffed out a sharp, ragged laugh at the memory before he frowned. I hadn't realized until a particular group of snatchers dragged in a certain try-on to the floor of our drawing room one evening. Hermione's spine tensed, and a scar on her arm itched. As if sensing her discomfort, Draco ran his hand up her arm, seeing his tracing gentle patterns on the part of her sleeve that covered up her mark. I think I was looking for you, he said quietly, his eyes fixed on his hands. Not just you, but anything, any scraps of information about the three of you. I knew, I, I knew you'd be all together, as horrendously codependent as you three were at that time. I knew that the three of you, even Weaselby, 
where our best chance of ending that fucking war. I could never tell if I was relieved or terrified when I couldn't find anything in the papers. Or, as awful as it sounds, the guest of honor was just some random light witch or wizard that I didn't recognize. Just fucking typical. I had to clock on when the girl did I, and at that point I had to admit to myself, I fancied a little bit was being tortured by my psychotic aunt on the floor of my childhood home. He sent Hermione an apologetic look, her face cold as she tried to focus on the grounding grip of his hands on hers and not the memory of that fateful night. Her eyes squeezed shut and she inhaled slowly. I'm okay, she breathed out, when she felt his hand came up to cup her cheek. She opened her eyes and her heart shuddered at the tortured guilt in his eyes. She turned to kiss each one of his fingers individually, and, and then lastly his palm. I'm okay, go on. He paused, eyeing her carefully for a few scrutinizing moments before his shoulders relaxed and he continued. I threw up vows afterwards when you lot escaped, because of what she did to you. Aunt Bella always complained that I had a weak stomach for torture, so at least I had an excuse for her and my father, well, my mother. He shook his head, a ghost of a fond smile on his lip, and he cocked a knowing brow at Hermione. I'm sure you're aware by now, Granger, that my mother is a leg of lemons. Hermione couldn't help the satisfied, prideful expansion of her chest. Ha! I knew it. Draco rolled his eyes fondly at her slightly smug peacocking. My mother told me that night that she'd suspected something for years. Which, going to be honest, Granger, was not the case at all, as much as I'm sure you wish otherwise. He snickered when she sneered at his playful taunt. I mean, true. I complained about you a lot during the summer holidays, but fuck. You were just such a little swat. It did my head in. Add in your blood status as some sort of forbidden fruit, and my mother interpreted that as me holding a burning flame for you. But I let her into my mind that night, and she saw the memory of us together in the library, as well as some fantasies that were promptly ruined by her prying. And I guess she's just had her mind made up since then. I reckon she was rather relieved it was you, to be honest. The only other person I complained more about was Potter. I think my mother found it easier accepting me being in love with the Muggleborn than potentially being in a gay relationship with Scarhead. Hermione snorted, and Draco took that moment to sip some of his drink. He grimaced and wantlessly cast a heating charm on his cup, and then, after a thoughtful pause, Hermione's as well. She smiled gratefully at him. She had felt the warmth of her cup leave several minutes earlier. Hermione nudged at her, and she frowned. Okay, but at this point, you weren't in love with me, right? She paused and waited until Draco shrugged before continuing. Okay, but, I mean, aside from your trial, we didn't see each other for years afterwards. Draco hummed, and his eyes glittered with some fond private memory. Maybe not in person, Granger, but I definitely kept my eye on you. Hermione blinked in confusion. Not all the time. I do have my own life, Granger. Draco shrugged dismissively. But I'd look for your name in the newspaper every once in a while. Old habits die hard, and that, I swear, it was nothing more than mad curiosity for an old crush. But then I got the job offer through the post, and I was going to turn it down, until I remembered reading an article about a certain someone working in that very same department, and her valiant but failed attempts at saving the werewolves. Hermione's chest fluttered at the warm, bright grin he gave her. Believe what you want, but I actually had no intention of genuinely pursuing you at that time. I just thought it'd be fun to work there for a few months. Pulled a bushy pigtail of my old crush and then quit when I grew bored. It was hardly like I was strapped for cash. I didn't and still don't need this job. I never will. And panic must have flooded her face at the thought of him leaving. Leaving her. Because he smirked, shaking his head. You're not getting rid of me that easy, Granger. Hermione breathed out on a laugh. But that first day in your office, when we met again, I was genuine with my being there, Granger. I wanted to help you with that bloody bill of yours. I figured I owed you one after everything you did for me, but then... His lids grew hooded and heavy, and his gaze dropped to her lips. His eyes flashed heatedly when her tongue flicked out to wet her lips in anticipation. I noticed you had some biscuit crumbs on the corner of your mouth, and suddenly all I could see was six year. The library, your biscuits, and the many, many nights I laid awake fantasizing about you taking something other than those rotten biscuits into your mouth. He grinned wolfishly and flicked his brows. I almost bent you over your desk right then and there, Granger, he purred. He purred with a tilt of his hat, and Hermione had to remind herself that they were in a very public cafe, as warmth pooled in her navel. She squeezed her thighs together tightly. She couldn't get them arrested for public indecency. 
at least not until she had properly and thoroughly welcomed him home back in the comfort and privacy of their flat. But then we started working together, and I remembered how insufferable you were. Never mind, he could sleep on the couch. Draco snorted at her fronted glare and looked at her innocently. You said so yourself, Granger. You're a workaholic. I'd heard rumours, of course. Our co-workers all want me to steer clear of you as much as possible when you were on an active case. But then, you were always on an active case, if not several at a time. Ah, I mean, sure, I thought you could do with putting a bit more meat on your bones when I saw you again, but I didn't think much more of it. But then there was the day in your office, when you came back from St. Mungo's. Draco's brows knitted into another frown, and a vein on his temple throbbed. Again, there had been talks of you working yourself into the hospital previously, but I thought people were just exaggerating. I mean, you're Hermione Granger for crying out loud. You could handle anything. But that day, you just, you looked awful. He looked at her desperately. Even now, his face looked peaky at the memory. If it wasn't for the fact that you were just about able to hold a basic conversation with me, I thought you were some form of inferiority. Hermione winced, remembering that day in her office when she had decided to take a break, how she had looked inches away from death. I just remember feeling livid, and then being confused as to why I was so livid. I mean, yeah, sure, I knew I so fancied you a little bit, but that didn't explain why I was so angry. But most of all, I was confused about you. What on earth was going on inside that beautiful head of yours, and why couldn't you see what you were doing to yourself? Draco shrugged, but his jaw was tense and he paused to pick at his croissant. They'd added too much butter, it was far too greasy for his tastes, Hermione noticed. So you took it up on yourself to find out, Hermione guessed. Draco looked up at her, a half smile on his lips as he tilted his head and gazed up on her with wonderment. You're not the only one who enjoys a puzzle, Granger. And you were quite the intricate one. I was? Mm hmm. Took me a couple of weeks to understand how that brilliant mind of yours worked, and where your priorities laid for me to get into the rhythm of things, putting your cases and whatnot. But when I realized how well we worked together, well, I couldn't really find any excuses to stay away from you. Draco shrugged again. So I tore up my resignation letter. And, of course, it wasn't too long after that that I realized that I was in love with you. He said it so casually, like they were discussing the weather, and yet her mind had leapt to her throat all the same. What? Just like that? Just like that. And you just dealt with it? Pretty much. Oh? Draco pressed his lips together to bite back a laugh. Should I have said that I drank myself into a coma every night? Would that have you falling into my arms any quicker? She sucked her teeth peevishly, her arms crossing against her waist. This revelation of yours? Was it before or after the Wolfsbane bill passed? Before, he replied simply and quirked the brow dismissively. I told you, I was content to take my time and play it slow. But then you accosted me that day in your office, besmirching my precious honour. He smirked when she snorted indignantly. Well, I wasn't about to pass up what you were offering. I told you, I'm a selfish man, Granger. And if anything, you hopping into my lap was a good indicator for me to step things up a notch. Of course, Mother, ever the romantic, still believes it was between the stacks of some dusty old library tombs the day that you claimed my heart forever. A mother's intuition was some bollocks like that. And maybe she's wrong. Maybe she's right. Maybe I did fall for you back then. Maybe I've just spent years in denial. He passed to send her a knowing wink, and Hermione's cheeks pinked. But exactly how long is irrelevant to me? Once I knew that I loved you, Hermione, and wanted you in my arms, that was enough for me. It wasn't a full honest truth that Hermione was expecting from him. She could tell that he hadn't told her everything, that he had purposefully offered up Narcissa's point of view as a way to distract Hermione from his own preservations, maybe as one final shred of denial for both of their peace of minds that he hadn't been suffering, been waiting for almost a decade. Maybe Draco didn't truly know himself. Hermione couldn't help but notice that Draco had pointedly specified that he had realized his true feelings, as in he already was, and perhaps had been for some time, in love with her. Perhaps it was six year. Perhaps it was during one of the morning of his newspaper scorings of her. Perhaps it was the day when he accosted half of her office space. But Draco was right. Whenever it was, it was irrelevant. If just knowing that he loved Hermione was enough for him, it was enough for her. And yet Hermione couldn't help but wonder, why did you wait so long? Why didn't you just, why didn't you ever just move on? Don't tell me you're disappointed, Hermione huffed. You know what I mean. 
Fergusop's twitch in amusement. Granger, you are a lot of things. Brilliant, beautiful, arse-bitingly annoying, but subtlety is hardly your forte. As shockingly dense as you are to your own feelings, you wear your heart on your sleeve. I knew you fancied me back. She did, and she had. And maybe it was just a matter of still nursing and mildly bruised ego, but the fact that he had known whilst Hermione herself at the time was only vaguely aware of and heavily suppressing her attraction to him, she couldn't help but bait. You couldn't have known that for certain. Maybe I just like having you as a colleague. Suck many of your colleagues off in museum cloakrooms, do you? Drake would roll. Young mother sat at the table not far from them, gasped loudly, covering the ears of her child as she looked at the pair with a scandalized yet scolding glare. Her mind and stomach lurched in mortification. Her chest burned hot as she mumbled her fervent apologies, before quickly waving her wand to pass the Mifliato. She inwardly cursed herself for not having the foresight to do so as soon as they had sat down. Draco's smirk oozed smugness and self-satisfaction. He looked like Crookshanks when he had caught that mouse in her flat the other winter. Hermione took a sip of a drink to hide her snort at the thought. Perhaps she should tell Draco, and take in her own satisfaction at seeing his leer wipe off of his face. Even the notion that he could in some way resemble her pet that thrived on playfully torturing him. She turned back to him, a stubborn frown marrying her brows together. So, all it took was a few romps for you to know that I liked you? Like I said, you wear your heart on your sleeve. He paused to leer knowingly at her from under his lashes. And any lingering doubts I had were promptly cleared up after that darling healer Sally took such great care of me. His tone was teasing, baiting even, with the full intention of winding her up. And yet, even with this knowledge, Hermione couldn't help the bristling of her spine and the acidic curling of her stomach as she hissed through gritted teeth. Shelley, whatever. Draco's eyes were soft, loving in their warmth as he gazed at her. Even as Hermione's own heart was a kaleidoscope fluttering against her chest, she made a mental note that apparently Draco took Hermione's bitter jealousy to be some type of love language. She thought back to that blasted trip to the hospital, the glazed, almost fucked out expression on his face the entire time, when she thought he had been on some kind of delirious high from the Medi-Witch's attention. Perhaps that had been another thing that Hermione had misinterpreted. Hermione had been fretting over him and admittedly positively burning in her jealousy, barely giving the healer any room to do her job. Not that the floozy healer was doing that great of a job anyway. What? With one of her hands too busy filling up Draco's delicious thighs? Draco must have had euphoric watching Hermione practically burst a vein over him. The arrogant sword always loved being the centre of attention after all. She puffed bitterly. She guessed she really did wear her heart on her sleeves. A gentle tuck of her plate brought her attention back to him, his eyes still soft but tight with concern around the corners. Hermione smiled at him, her hand reaching to interlock their fingers again, and the way his eyes flickered when she did had another memory trickle to the front of her mind. Ron said that he never told me the truth about us because of the way I look at you. She cocked an eyebrow curiously. Did he ever talk to you about me? I seem to remember getting the token of, if you do anything to hurt her, I'll reunite you with your inbred ancestor's speech a few times. Yes, he said wryly. Hermione's lips twitched. He told me, rather reluctantly, may I add, after one of the matches, Draco continued, after a warning narrowing of his eyes as Hermione struggled to suppress her amusement, that he'd never seen you so happy. And since this was coming from a bloke who was not only your best friend, but had also dated you for several years, well... I figured only an imbecile would just stop. And by that point, Granger, I wasn't just in love with you, but I was also picturing every day of the rest of our lives together. And once I noticed that Weaselby was right, you didn't look at anyone else the way you looked at me. Well, then that was all I could see. Not to mention you get awfully cranky when I'm not around. Draco positively preened in his gloating, and he winked at her. Rather gets me going, knowing that I'm the only one who can tame your little lioness heart. Remind me to never get you dahlias, then, Hermione drooled with an exacerbated eye roll. Draco's smirking leer blinked into one of puzzlement. What? Never mind, dismissing him with a wave, Hermione's mind burned with the desire for more answers. All right, I can understand you asking me out the first time. I mean, well, logically, it only made sense, but why again? I mean, didn't you think it risky asking me out those other times, in case I figured out what you were doing? Well... By August, we'd checked in several public places, and you still thought that that was something normal co-workers did with one another, so... No, 
I can't say that there were many risks to be taken. Jacob penned, his lips twitched at her deathly glare. And then, of course, there was that encounter with the drunkard in Diagon Alley. Hermione's stomach churned sourly at the memory, her top lip curling into a sneer. I should have cursed him. He spat on you. Her voice was dark, low. Yes, and then you could have potentially gone to Azkaban, leaving me all on my lonesome. And to be honest, Granger, long-distance relationships don't do it for me, he said with a bored flick of his lapel, before locking her under his silly gaze. But that day, you were just so angry. Over me, what somebody else had done to me. I'd seen that look on your face hundreds of times before, when reading over your cases, listening to the woeful tales of your clients. Hell, I spent seven years on the receiving end of it back at Hogwarts whenever I insulted you or your friends. He shrugged, his fingers tracing around the rim of his cup. Not even in my deepest fantasies had I ever dared to picture you with that look on your face, imagining you giving it to someone over me. He smiled, his eyes losing focus as he became lost in some private memory. Hermione didn't pry. And you must have thought that I, that that meant that maybe I was ready to date you, at least properly. Draco nodded. But alas, it was not meant to be. He dramatically sighed, shaking his head in mocked mourning. Not that it mattered much, since I got to take you out on your birthday. The book reading, Hermione tacked on, warmth enveloping her chest at that memory. It really had been her best birthday in years. Yeah, didn't take me too long to realize you had absolutely no qualms about spending time with me in an environment where your brilliantly beautiful, swatty man could thrive. It was only when I'd asked you out for dinner that you seemed to get spooked. Shame, really. He paused to deliberately eye her up slowly, a heated, salacious smirk on his lips as he purred. I really do dream about ravishing you under the restaurant table, Hermione. Next to taking you up against the stacks of my family library, it's my greatest fantasy. It was all Hermione could see. Draco between her thighs, hidden by the white tablecloth in the privacy of their booth. Maybe Hermione could slide to her knees first, surprising him. Her strong fingers gripping at her thighs, keeping her legs pried open as she tried to shut him out of her way to pass her table. She'd maybe even have to stuff a napkin in her mouth. Draco, the egotistical bastard that he was, loved it when she was loud. Loved it when he made a scream. The spines of books, more valuable than the entirety of her bank account, digging into her back as he pressed her back into the shelf. They'd have to be quick. They couldn't risk alerting the house elves, alerting his parents about what they were doing. She wondered what the odds were of the Malfoy library having a table tucked away in a dark, slightly damp corner. Sweet Merlin, Hermione's knickers were getting damp. Perhaps there was some merit to Draco's fantasy. She was very aware that she had been lost to her thoughts for some time, and she blinked, focusing in on Draco, who looked very pleased indeed. He looked like he knew exactly what she was thinking about, and she flushed deeply. Her mind scrambled to pick at any topic, any unanswered question she might have had. Anything to climb out from underneath his gripping, aroused expression. Ginny, she said that Greece was an anniversary trip for us. Draco hummed thoughtfully. She and those twins were always the only ones with brains in her family. You, so she's right, Hermione gulped. It wasn't just, it wasn't just a holiday way. It, we have an anniversary. Her voice trailed off as she wondered if it was possible to celebrate and miss such an event at the same time. I was genuinely interested in the convention, Granger. You're not the only one to enjoy academic simulation every once in a while. It was just a nice coincidence that it fell around the same time as all. Besides, I wanted to treat you, he said with a dismissive shrug. What's the point of having private properties across the world if I can't share them with the woman I love? Hermione glanced down at her lap shyly. She wondered if she would ever get used to how breezily he proclaimed his affection for her. It was just so effortless for him. Her chest heaved with the guilt and compassion that had been steadily building up for over half an hour, and she sheepishly tucked her chin into her chest, her eyes burning with tears of shame. It took me so long, so long to get over myself. And all the while you were just patiently waiting, thinking of our children and our future, Hermione whispered. Draco let out a sound of mild distress, and his hand squeezed hers in a fierce grip. Granger? A ragged sob tore from her throat, and she shook her head, vicious anguish and acidic fiend in her chest. I'm sorry, Draco. I'm so sorry. I know you told me to not feel guilty, but Merlin, how can I not? You've, you're perfect. You've been so perfect. And I was such a coward, such a stupid, stubborn. Steady on, that's my girlfriend you're insulting, Granger. 
Jacob calmly interrupted and sighed with faint displeasure. <sighs> if you're going to continue punishing yourself, can you at least wait until we get back to the privacy of our office? Or did you forget that we are in public? Jacob pointedly glanced at their surrounding, of which several patrons were looking over at her teary, weeping form in concern. And in some cases, glaring scornfully at Draco, he looked back at her and flicked a bemused brow. They are probably reckoning I'm breaking up with you right now, and honestly, it's a matter of poor upbringing to do so in public. I'd at least have the decency to wait to do so in the privacy of our home. Draco sucked his teeth, a mocked air of haughtiness about him, and Hermione chuckled thickly. She sniffled once, smiling at him weakly, his own torn expression blurred behind her teary vision, and she leaned in to plant rather wet but firm deep kiss on his lips. Hermione leaned back with mild reluctance, Draco's breath an uneven hot exhale against her chin, and an ever throbbed with the urge to climb into his lap. She glared pointedly at their nosy onlookers before nudging her plate towards Draco. Would you like some of my scone? They had barely taken a couple of footsteps out of Hermione's fireplace when a flurry of bright orange flame furthest past Hermione's face and she yelped in momentary fright. Behind her, Draco let out a startled, deep-chested scream of his own, and then there was the alarming clanging of the fireplace grate crashing against her wall as he fell backwards. Fucking hell! Hermione whipped around, her instincts kicking in before she could process what was happening, her wand in hand with a stupefied ready on her lips. Oh! Now there was a sight. Draco sprawled in between the fireplace and the rug, with his cheeks prickled a deep rosy hue in agitation, as her cat fervently licked and pulled away at him in delight. Oh, would you just fuck off, you mangy? Stop licking me. Granger, would you please? Draco gargled, his head desperately tried to dodge away from Crookshank's incessant licking of his cheeks, his nose, his chin, anywhere that he could reach as Draco attempted to jerk away from him. Want me to leave the room and give you both some privacy? Hermione teased. Don't you fucking dare. I'll bugger off, you rodent. Draco growled, and his hand finally managed to jerk out and protect his face from Crookshank's loving attack. Can't believe you still haven't died yet. Crookshank just purred in response and nuzzled into the back of Draco's hand. Draco huffed defeatedly and craned his neck to peek over the endless fur of Crookshank's head and raised a pointed brow at Hermione. You're going to help me, or are you just going to stand there grinning all evening as I slowly suffocate to death on demonic cat fur? I think I'll just stand here, Hermione said wryly and scrunched her nose in amusement. Draco scowled at her and jerked his chin as Crookshanks tried to nuzzle into his mouth. Piss off, you little. You know, Granger, I'm starting to think perhaps I was better off camping out of at pansies. At least she... Ah, uh, stop it! At least she has a good fire whiskey there. Hermione hummed her focus on their conversation drifting away as she drank him in. That aching, pulling throb of her navel twisted and vibrated within her as she gazed down at his thighs. The inseam of his trousers dangerously pulled taut as he lay there with his legs sprawled wide open. In between her thighs passed with needy wand, and she bit her lip, memories of their unfinished reunion in her office oozed into her mind. The ghost sensation of his hot breath against the nape of her neck, his strong, firm hands travelling up towards her bra, Granger, please don't look at me like that whilst your fucking senai cat is choking me, Draco groaned. Thighs snapped up to his and, Merlin, she could have whimpered at the heated wound in his eyes. She sucked her bottom lip between her teeth and cocked her brow playfully as she looked at him contemplatively. She had promised to welcome him home thoroughly after all. With a sultry smirk, she could have only picked up from him. Her fingers teasingly crept towards the buttons of her blouse. You have two options, Draco. She was surprised at the huskiness in her own voice, as her hands toyed with the top button, as was Draco, from the way that his bottom lip dropped open softly. A muscle in his thighs twitched as she unfastened the first three buttons of her blouse, revealing her rather tame office-appropriate bra, and she had to squeeze her thighs together tightly. She remembered oh too vividly how it felt being pressed against those legs of his, Every nerve ending in her body practically vibrated and burned under the intensity of her stare. Another two buttons undone. You can go over to Parkinson's home and drink all the vintage, poisonous whiskey that you want. Her tongue clicked around the last syllable in perfect timing with the last button, her fingers unfastened. Goosebumps bloomed across her chest as she slowly, tauntingly, pulled the blouse off of her shoulders. 
Draco's eyes, a soft caress against her skin as he traced over her exposed body, and he slowly peeled his back off of the floor, dislodging Crookshanks from his newfound nest against Draco's neck. He jolted back onto the floor with a disgruntled hiss. They both ignored him. Draco's eyes were blackened, somehow hazy and razor sharp at the same time. Like prey trapped under a viper's targeted gaze, Hermione shivered, her tongue wetting her lips as she slipped her arms out of the sleeves. Her blouse fell into a forgotten pool around her ankles. Every cell in her body lit on fire with baited anticipation for him. Or, Hermione murmured and slowly took a step backwards towards her corridor. Never throbbed as Draco rose up from the floor in one graceful, fluid movement, his searing eyes never leaving hers. Hermione pulled at the hair tie, holding her plate in place, and her curls shook free from their restrained imprisonment. Her tummy clenched and trembled at Draco's choked of groan. Had she left the heating on? Her neck felt slick. His hands twitched towards her as he stalked over slowly. She took another step backwards. Her surprisingly steady hand traced delicately along her collarbones, and she looked up at him through heavy, hooded lids. He was barely an angel's kiss distance from her now. Her mouth dry and her head fuzzy, Hermione exhaled breathlessly. Or you can come with me and make love to your girlfriend. He blinked slowly, drunkenly, and then all Hermione knew was apples and cedar wood, as Jacob pulled her into his embrace, claiming her in a fierce kiss. There was a very good chance that if Hermione attempted to haul herself up from her damp, soaked sheets, her knees would cave under. As it were, she was still trying to catch her breath, her throat raw and parched, protesting against every wrecked pant Hermione just about managed to squeeze out. Her damp, sweat-slicked skin glittered under the moonlight streaming through her window. Sweet, Cersei. That was good. Good? Phenomenal. Mind-blowing. Soul-consuming. She could still feel the stretch of him inside her, and her muscles were melting from her sheer, blissful satisfaction. Her thighs still trembled, sticky with their combined releases, and her fingers ached from how hard she'd clung to his wonderfully, deliciously broad shoulders during her last scorching orgasm. She felt like a useless, fucked-out puddle of bones, and she loved it. That had to have beaten their weekend in Greece. Merlin, she reckoned, it even topped off their all-nighter from Halloween. And Halloween had been magnificent. A dumb happy smile stretched onto her face and her heart sang in her chest as she heard Draco close the fireplace gate setting the night walls. She wanted to hear that every night. A shock of white blonde hair rounded the doorway and Draco paused, taking in her limp, sprawled, limped position. His lips twitched before his expression cooled into one of casual indifference, his mask betrayed by the way he strutted over, naked as the day was born, to place a glass of water on her bedside table. He perched on the edge of the bed, brushing away some hair that was matted against her sweaty forehead. His eyes practically twinkled. Hermione's head limped to the side, a weak, lazy smile on her lips as she met Draco's knowing, amused gaze. I think you broke me. I can't feel my legs. A pleased hum rumbled in his chest, a Cheshire cat grin creeping across his features. Are you sure it's not just because you're lying on a bed made of rocks? I must admit I haven't missed that, he drawled with a quirk of his brow. You love me, my mattress, Hermione grumbled into her shoulder. Only half of that statement is correct. Ah, so you do love my mattress, she teased and jerked when his fingers poked the sensitive, ticklish skin of her ribs. Her arms might as well have been noodles when she weakly battered his fingers, Draco catching her hands with ease, and Hermione's heart fluttered when he brought her hand up to softly kiss each individual finger. Pure golden affection bloomed in her chest as she greedily drank in the tenderness of his expression. She felt full, completely enveloped and encased with her love for him, seeping out of every inch, every pore in her body. And yet, somehow, it still wasn't enough. A regretful, aching pang in the pit of her stomach that she still wasn't enough. I love you, Draco, she whispered and blinked rapidly to push back the burning tears that threatened to mar her vision. I'm sorry it took me so long to admit it. I'm sorry that I pushed you away. I'm sorry that I chose my pride over you. I'm sorry. Hermione? Draco's voice was rough and his brows pinched together, a pained tightness to his face as if her words were like knives to the skin. I thought you promised not to blame yourself. Her nose crunched with a sniffle and she swallowed thickly. I know, I know, I did, and I swear I won't mention it again, but I just need to. Are you still mad at me for lying to you? Draco cut her off, his eyes sharp. She faltered, 
Before summoning up every last morsel of strength, she had to pull herself up. Taking his hand in hers, she frowned and fervently shook her head. No, of course not. I, I forgave you ages ago, Draco. He cocked his head to the side. So, then why can't you forgive yourself? Hermione blinked. He puffed out a laugh, his free hand reaching up to tuck at her damp, sexed-out calves. Like I said, Granger, you're brilliant but dense. His voice was warm, and he leaned in to kiss at a frown between her brows. Besides, I always knew you'd come around eventually. He pulled away and smoldered, his chin cocked towards the ceiling, in probably complete sincere arrogance. I am, after all, irresistible. Hermione scoffed, all anger and guilt quickly vanishing, and she reached behind her to grab a pillow, whacking it in his face, and snickered when Draco spluttered on an oof. His eyes narrowed challengingly, and her neighbor paused at the heat in his gaze. Hmm, she supposed she was ready for another round. The air left his lungs in a startled gasp as he lunged at her, pinning her arms back against the mattress. His thighs on either side of hers, he pushed his hips into her, smirking when she keened softly, her chest arching up into his. He patted innocently, his expression a disturbed contrast to the way his hips slowly dug firm, devilish circles into her. It's a matter, Granger, he crooned, his eyes flashing hotly when she could only choke on a throaty groan. Cat got your tongue. He leaned down and he dragged his tongue across a throbbing vein in her neck and her money trembled, stubbornly biting back a whimper as he sucked on her paws. His hands went effortless, vice-like grip on her wrists as she tried to jerk her arms up. He wasn't close enough. There was too much space between them. She needed his body to consume hers completely. Draco hummed against her skin, and her nerves went fire. Please, just a little closer. Please, she gasped out, her eyes rolling to the back of her head when she felt him smirk against the damp nape of her neck. She jerked her arms again and huffed. Want to touch you? The insufferable bastard that he was, Draco was quick to pull her wrists together, easily covering them both with one hand, and his other one danced and teased down her arm past her shoulder to toy around the sensitive, goosebumped skin of her breasts. And if I want you like this, Draco countered, a right grin on his lips. Her man's tongue flicked at her teeth, and she stared him down. Well, if you're content to do all the work, then don't let me stop you, she penned. She pushed her hips up pointedly, highlighting where she wanted, needed his hands to be. Draco grinned, his teeth biting and sharper, before pursing his lips contemplatively. I might just do that, Granger, he said, and returned to map her neck with soft, feather-like kisses, as his fingers continued to tease around her nipple. Hermione ground low in her throat, her head snapping back against her pillow defeatedly. She wasn't quite ready to beg just yet. It didn't take Draco too long to grow impatient with his own workings, his head travelling down to kiss around her other breast. His hand slid down her navel, thumbing over her hip before his touch disappeared from her. She felt him frown and he lifted his head slightly. Granger, he murmured, his breath hot against her breast. She shivered, her neck digging further into her pillow, her eyes still squeezed shut. Mm? I was rather lost in a moment earlier, so forgive me for not noticing sooner, but, and not that there's anything wrong with it, but when did you last cast a hellish charm? Hermione's eyes snapped open, eyes caught mortification wrapping down her spine and had jerked upwards, meeting his inquisitive, confused eyes. She cast a self-conscious look down towards her thighs, Draco following her, and he yelped, ripping away from Hermione, his face washed pale in aghast and disgust. Hermione's own chest was white with hot embarrassment. With a positively shit-eating grin on his face, Crookshanks sat near millimetres away from Hermione's leg, his chest puffed out in a glow to find his head in disarray from where Draco's hand must have been not moments earlier. Hermione had to bite down on her knuckles to hold back the bubble of laughter in her chest as she took in Draco's expression. He looked like he was going to be sick. Get out, he roared at her cat. Crookshanks just meowed, his tail gliding happily in the air. Draco sneered at him before turning to glare at Hermione. She must not have been able to hide that mirth from her face and she sniggered. You better have enjoyed that last check, Ranger, because I'm never getting hard again. Her amusement broke through, and she let out a hearty laugh. Her spine bowed inwards as she laughed until tears streamed down her cheek, and a stitch burned under her ribs. Crookshanks purred and hopped onto her thighs. She leaned in to stroke down his back and cooed at her old familiar. 
Did you miss Draco, Croak? She cooed, spying at Draco from under her lashes. She passed her lips together fondly. He was positively petulant. Hm? Shall we let you stay tonight? I know you missed him dreadfully, didn't you, Crooks? She straked under his chin, and Crookshank's chest rumbled with pleased purr. Hermione parted innocently at Draco, who looked like he was seconds away from disapparating back to the shells in Parkinson Manor. Well, Draco, should we let him sleep in here tonight? I know you missed him too. She grinned when he bristled, sneering at her with no real venom. Like a splinter under the nail, he spat. Hermione tittered, gently lifting Crooks to the side of her, and then crawled a short distance to kneel between Draco's thighs. She smiled when his arms automatically wrapped around her waist, even as his gaze dropped away from hers, stubbornly, pointedly, staring at the floor as he sobbed. Just one night, she murmured and leaned in to give him a short, sweet kiss. You really did miss you, Draco. Another kiss. I miss you. She kissed him again, smiling against his lips when his nails stuck at the base of his spine. Missed having you in our bed. Hans stroked along his jaw. She kissed him once, twice, a third time more. Just one night, she repeated and exhaled breathlessly when his steely, sharp eyes met hers. She smiled at him and leaned in to give him a final deep kiss. She kissed him for all of those long, lonely nights that she couldn't. She kissed him for every time that she wished he was there, next to her in their bed, where he belonged. She kissed him for all of the nights she wanted to have with him. Draco's hand cupped the back of her head as he deepened the kiss, only for a moment, maybe a few seconds longer, before he pulled away, just far enough that they could breathe and looked at her, deliberating silently. Fine, one night only, Granger, he said eventually with a firm pointed look at her and then her cat. You try to sleep on my hat and I'm going to gift my mother with a nice new knees of fur scarf, he pointed a warning finger at Crookshanks. Her familiar just blinked lazily, easing up onto his paws as he traced around in a circle, plodding back down with a content sigh into the exact same position he had been in moments before. Hermione leaned over to stroke over her old cat's spine, smiling softly when he purred happily. She looked back over her shoulder and gave Draco an impish grin. So, I'm guessing you don't want to sleep on either side of him? Draco looked at her exasperatedly. Don't push it, Granger. She snorted, and Draco's lips quirked briefly, his hand reaching up to lightly tuck at the ends of her hair. Come on, then. He murmured softly and shifted up the mattress, tucking on her arm for her to follow into his embrace, of which she gladly did and breathed out a full, content sigh of relief as his arms wrapped around her waist. A small, soft kiss to the back of her neck, and Hermione's heart soared. Good night, Hermione. Her fingers interlocked with his, and Hermione knew only bliss as she murmured back a soft, sleepy, Good night, Draco. She was oddly cold, was the first thought that Hermione had when she woke up the next morning. Her eyes opened blarely, before quickly clamping shut again in protest. In their passionate, needy desperation of each other last night, they'd forgotten to close the curtain, and the early glow of the summer sunrise acted like a blinding Lumos charm for Hermione's sleep-addled gaze. A shiver running up her exposed back brought her back to her first thought, and she realized that her waist was suspiciously free of a strong, possessive arm. Her eyes flew open, her chest a wayward shudder of panic, and her head shut up from her pillow. Her heart trembling against her ribcage, Hermione slowly turned to peek over her shoulder at her side of the bed, hoping, praying to all deities above that, oh, how precious. Hermione's cheek pinched with a fond beam, utter affection soaking her warm, giddy chest. She couldn't help but wish that she had taken that photography course with Ginny last summer. Oh, how she wanted to capture this moment for eternity. And not just because it would piss Draco off to no end, having physical evidence of it. Draco flat on his back, with one arm resting above his head on the pillow. His other arm, a protective hold on Crookshanks, was curled up on his torso. Their sleeping breaths, a matching, slow and steady tempo. She bit down a smile when Crookshanks twitched and Draco's arm tightened almost imperceptibly around him. She glanced over at the clock on the bedside table, grimacing in mild disgust. She had risen over an hour before her alarm clock was due to go off. A thought tickled her mind, and she looked back over at Draco, chewing her lip in contemplation. She supposed she did have some time before she had to get ready for work. With a smile, she stretched out a cautious hand to lightly stroke across Crookshank's spine, careful not to wake the two of them, before she quietly slipped out of the bed, throwing on a random shirt from her bedroom floor and tiptoed out into the corridor, heading for her kitchen. 
Thank Merlin she had stopped by the supermarket the day before last, she thought, as she rummaged through the contents of her freshly soaked fridge. After a year on the run, Hermione had zero reservations about eating slightly gone of vegetables, but he could not back a quiet snort at the idea of her wonderful but prissy boyfriend. Goodness, even just the thought of calling Draco her boyfriend made her stomach swoop happily. Trying to force down some wilted spinach and a can of beans from three years ago. Hmm. Perhaps she could make shakshuka. She spied all of the ingredients needed in her fridge, and Hermione couldn't remember Draco ever trying it. Nodding to herself, she pulled what she needed from the shelves and set to work. With the boiled peppers and onions sorting away in the pan, Hermione turned her attention to mashing up the tinned tomatoes. After a rather draining battle in opening a stubborn cap of the can, she had eventually resorted to using her wand, and she had just added the herbs into the sauce when she heard the sleepy, shuffling footsteps from her corridor. Strong arms wrapped around her waist, and she smiled as Draco eased her hair over one shoulder and softly kissed at the newly exposed skin of her neck. Her muscles went lax as she leaned back into his embrace, and his chest vibrated against her shoulder blades as he hummed, please. Good morning. His voice was almost tantalizingly gravel, thick and chesty due to the almost disgustingly early morning hour, and Hermione had to remind herself that she was surrounded by sharp knives and scaldingly hot oil after her navel clenched with wound. Nothing would ruin a morning glow quite like a trip to St. Mungo's A&E ward. Good morning, she greeted back, picking up her wooden spoon to mix the herbs in the sauce again. Draco's arms tightened around her waist slightly, his hips pushing against the bottom of her spine. She could feel him smiling wryly against her neck. Is all of this for me? Oh, look, and you made breakfast too. Hermione laughed, caught off guard, and turned to peek at him over her shoulder. His eyes glittered as he grinned back at her, before cocking his head towards the pen. What's all this, then? She poured the saucer to the pan, making sure that the vegetables were equally covered before tapping her wand to reduce the heat to a simmer. Shakshuka! Goes on tight? She snorted and lightly jerked her elbow into her side. It's a traditional breakfast meal from Tunisia. It's quite delicious, actually. You hate my toast that bad? Draco, I can only explain to you so many times that condiments are not optional when it comes to toast. She turned to look back at him and cocked a brow. Or do you actually plan on having me choke to death? Draco shrugged. Well, you seemed content to let me choke to death all of those times that your blasted cat used my face as a pillow. So, I'd call it a simple retribution. He trailed off, eyeing the pen behind her. The sauce is sticking. Hermione whipped around and cursed as she rushed to save the integrity of her pen. She frowned, eyeing the too thick, gloopy consistency of the tomatoes. Hmm, maybe she should add some. Some water will save that, Draco finished her thought. An exacerbated roll of her eyes. I know that. I'm just saying, it's a common trick. You're forgetting who was the one who taught you how to cook. Hermione quipped and looked at him incredulously. Draco didn't miss a beat as he tsked. And what a miracle that turned out to be. Do me a favor, Granger, if you ever decide to leave the ministry. Please don't become a professor. She scowled and cocked her chin upwards, slightly miffed. Well, if you don't want to try some, I guess I can always go over and have breakfast at Harry's instead. Draco's arms peeled away from her, her mighty stomach swooping mournfully at the loss of his warmth, and he came up beside her, nudging her hip with his, and snatched a spoon from her fingers. So... What else goes into this sha shushka sh what was it? Shakshuka, Hermione's lips pressed together fondly. I just need to add the eggs. With Hermione's careful instructions and a few jerky interventions, her face grey as Draco could try to deviate from the recipe. What's wrong with adding sausage? You said it was a breakfast food. They eventually sat down at the dining table, Hermione quickly darting back to the fridge to grab some fresh orange juice. Her fingers tightly gripped her fork as she waited with bated breath as Draco took a mouthful of his food. His cautious, contemplative expression barely lasted a second before surprised delight lit up his eyes. His lips downturned in appreciation and he tilted his head. Not bad, he said casually, his perfected aura of calm indifference thwarted by the way he eagerly scooped up another forkful. Smug satisfaction oozed across her back. Her shoulders pulled back as Hermione sat up straight and happily tucked into her own dish. Maybe she should become a professor. A patient professor too, just to spite him. Lovingly spite him, of course. His foot brushed against hers, by accident, Hermione believed at first, until it happened a third time, and his foot looped around her ankle. Hermione spied a glance at him from under her lashes. 
His face was carefully blank, bar the miniature ghost of a smirk at the edge of his mouth, her cheeks warm and her stomach fluttering happily. Hermione pressed her ankle against his touch, her own smile broadening when that all-too-familiar, beautiful, private smile of his bloomed across his face. They enjoyed their breakfast in comfortable silence, Draco biting back a snigger whenever his feet would creep up her calf every few minutes, and Hermione's food would fall back onto her plate as she startled in pleasant surprise. How was your week? Busy. So, just the usual, then? Draco bit on his cheek, his lips twitching as Hermione shot him a look. Actually, she said slowly and shifted in her seat, her stomach cold with trepidation, and she licked her lips nervously. I went to see a mind healer the other day. She winced as Draco's fork scraped against the plate. He gawped at her, his eyes furiously scanning over her. Did something happen? Drake asked, after a few moments, his voice tight. His face peaky and his knuckles white as he gripped his cutlery. Hermione could practically see all of the panicked scenarios running through his mind, and her chest warmed with affection. She reached out to place a placating hand on his. No, 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 I'm fine, I promise. She smiled at him. Drake observed her, his eyes tight, before he blinked. His shoulders relaxed, and he turned his hand to properly intertwine their fingers. He nodded silently, gesturing for her to continue. His thumb traced comforting, soothing circles over hers. Whether the action was for her or for himself, she appreciated it all the same. She smiled down at their joined hands before looking up at him from under her lashes, her cheeks flushing bashfully. As it turns out, I might not manage my time well. A stagnant pause, and Draco's thump halted in its motion. Well, no shit, Granger, he drawled and puffed out a relieved laugh, shaking his head into his plate. He looked back up at her, all amusement fading away as his brows pinched together in concern. Do you want to talk about it? Hermione put down on her lip. One day, soon, but but not yet. Draco nodded and she continued. I booked another session in two weeks and I, um, I think I'm going to go back. Do you want me to come with you, wait outside? He asked, eyeing her carefully. Hermione shook her head. No, this is something I need to do by myself. He nodded understandingly, not pressing her further on the subject, and he felt a wave of tenderness wash over her, noticing the faintest glimmer of self-doubt in his face as he pointedly stared into his plate. Draco, look at me, she said softly and leaned forward, inwardly cursing as her hair fell into her plate, washing her hair was such a strenuous task, and squeezed his hands. Please look at me, she repeated. He did, and her heart wept at the hesitancy in his eyes. Just because this is something that I have to do for myself, it doesn't mean that I don't still need you, she said. I do need you, Draco. I'll always need you. But I need you here with me, not for me. His jaw clenched, and for a moment Hermione wondered if he was going to try and argue with her. His eyes dark and unreadable until his hand clasped around her wrist and he tucked lightly at her arm, shifting to angle himself sideways in his seat. Come here, he murmured. She smiled, easing up from her chair, and rounded the table. His hands pulled at her hips, gently guiding her to sit across his thighs. Her arms looked around his shoulders as his came around her waist, and he huffed playfully. You can't just let a bloke spoil his girlfriend, can you? Sips curved into a smirk, and Hermione cocked her head to the side, amusement pinching at her cheeks as she looked at him knowingly. Well, I'd hate to steal away the attention from someone else. Drake's brows furrowed in confusion and Hermione had to bite down on her cheeks to hide her smirk, and said pouting innocently, You and Crookshanks looked awfully cosy when I woke up this morning. Are you sure you didn't miss him? Draco scowled, Sears flushed an adorable fuchsia pink, as his eyes shifted to stare at the wall behind her. Haven't the foggiest idea what you're on about, he said lightly. Hmm. He accosted me. Sure. I was sleeping, defenseless. Of course you were. I hate your cat. I'm sure the feeling's mutual, Hermione drawled, and her shoulders shook in restrained laughter. Draco laughed again and turned to glance across the room, attempting in vain to disguise the blush that had crept from his ears towards his cheek. His eyes flickered, and then he turned back at her, a smug, sly smirk on his face. His eyes glinted with some private, amusing thought, and Hermione should have really suspected that something was up by the suspiciously innocent look he threw her. Granger? He cooed, a hand snaking up her back to brush through her hair. Hermione humped distractedly, her eyes focusing on a small patch of tomato sauce on the corner of his mouth. 
She very much so wanted to lean in and lick it off. Shouldn't we be getting ready for work? Her spine cracked as she jolted off his lap, whipping on her heel to stare in horror at the time on the grandfather clock. Bugger, bugger, bugger. She darted from the table, rushing towards a corridor, cursing the entire way. She wouldn't have time to wash her hair, and Hermione grimaced at the thought of spending an entire day at her desk with her hair reeking of tomato juice. Draco's hearty laugh followed her, and as she rounded the entrance to their bedroom, she could hear the sound of plates clicking together as Draco evidently began to clear up their mess. You can be real good, you know, she shouted. I love you too, Granger, he sang back. Flustered by his words, she didn't pay any attention to where she was stepping, and she groaned in a strangled curse as her hip clipped the dresser. Draco's Quidditch jersey nestled around her ankles. She limped into her bathroom, a huge, happy, dumb smile on her face. Vivaldi's truly was a magnificent restaurant. With early 20th century scones and lamps casting a warm sunset glow across the room, the walls a cosy, enveloping walnut shade, the rouge wall drapes that shielded their booth away from the open floor plan, the intoxicating scent of the musky leather cushion, and the soft, subtle heat from the tea lights on their table. Vivaldi's was, indeed, completely deserving of Hermione's appreciation and full, undivided attention. At least it would be if it wasn't for the wicked tongue lapping away achingly, teasingly, slowly, between her thighs. Her calf trembled and Hermione bit down on her tongue. She was going to have bruises on her palm from how tightly she gripped her fork in a vain, foolish attempt of keeping her mind grounded. Her eyes lolled to the back of her head. One large, firm hand stroked soothingly up her dancing calf, as the other hand joined her tongue, equally teasing in its ministrations, never quite giving Hermione the friction or fullness that she craved. Hermione was achingly empty. She gasped out, plump, wet lips, a tight suction right where she needed his touch the most. Her thighs quivered, and Hermione buried her mule into her napkin. Her hips a mind of their own as she bucked and grinded into the sensations. Oh, God, she whispered, and her eyelids fluttered in perfect unison with the tongue flicking over her. Her rather divine veal sat poorly forgotten in front of her. The randy bastard couldn't have just let her enjoy her osobuku in peace, could he? More, faster, please. He chuckled against her, and his hot breath sent a tantalizing shiver up her spine. Her back arched slightly, her hips a constant soft bucking, and her hand shot down to grip through his silken curls as he granted her wish. His wonderfully long fingers slipped inside her, pressing up to meet his tongue through her walls. Yes, 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 she panted, and smacked her hat back against the plush backrest. Her nails ranked across her scalp, the tight muscles of her thighs jolting together when he moaned against her. Hermione would really need to leave the life band a tip before they left. No doubt their pleasant melodies were the only thing keeping the pair from being discovered. They really did have a tendency to forget the silence and charm. A third finger joined the others, and Hermione's mouth dropped open in a silent scream. Her cheeks were heated, and she couldn't tell if it was from arousal or from embarrassment at the illicit slick 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 of his fingers. Her navel twisted and pulsed in greedy, insatiable want, and the beginnings of white-hot heat flared at the nape of her spine. She was so close. The sound of the drapes being pulled open sent icy reality crashing over her shoulders, and she sat up, ramrod straight. Her thighs squeezed against the sides of his head painfully in a silent warning, and Hermione quickly gulped down a too big sip of her wine. His tongue and fingers stilled. She coughed smiling apologetically at the waiter behind her closed fist. Is everything all right, madam? The waiter asked, his eyes flickering between her flushed cheeks and the barely touched plate of veal shank. Oh, yes, I'm, I'm fine. Everything's fine. Her eyes widened as the finger began to glide in and out of her again, in devilishly slow movements. Stop it. She silently chastised with another vice-like squeeze of her thighs. His tongue circled around her in retaliation. Where is Signor Malfoy? Is the food not to his liking? Shall I ask the chef for another dish? The waiter, Adrian, his name tag said, cast a concerned look to the other barely touched plate. Oh no, trust me, he's very satisfied, she said sourly, and Hermione gripped at the silky locks under the table when he quietly snickered against her. She nodded in polite pointed dismissal. 
I promise everything is wonderful, Adrian. We'll let you know if there, if there's a problem. She coughed again, hiding the breathless hitch of her voice as a thumb wrapped tight, firm circles around her. Her navel lurched, her thighs a constant trembling as she felt the crescendo build rapidly. She practically screamed the Hogwarts song in her head. There was no way she was having an orgasm in front of this poor young waiter. Go away, she begged silently. The waiter eyed her suspiciously, and Hermione could have sworn she saw his eyes flick towards the tablecloth. His cheeks pricked a bashful red, and he bowed, his eyes carefully avoiding hers as he wished her a pleasant meal. The drapes had barely fallen closed when his fingers picked up rapid speed, and Hermione barely managed to hold back her ragged gasp as the coil snapped. Hopes bucking and convulsing against his touch. Her nerves alert with raw, unbinding pleasure, his tongue continued in its ministrations as she rode out her orgasm. Hermione collapsed against the backrest and weakly pushed his head away from hers. It's enough, she slurred, her navel twitching at the overstimulation. She was utterly boneless. There was a shift of the tablecloth, and his face, looking equally flushed, equally fucked out, appeared as Draco gracefully limbered his way back into his seat. Feet cold, she muttered, and had to close her eyes, her cheeks heated in mortification and idle arousal, when Draco sucked his fingers into his mouth, and utterly satisfied, Cheshire cat grin on his face. Merlin, they could never come back to this restaurant, and Hermione had had such wonderful things about their tiramisu as well. He released his fingers with a pop and flicked about her. Don't remember hearing any protests, Granger. You know, when I said we should go out as a belated celebration of your birthday, this isn't what I had in mind, Hermione said, and after bracing herself for a moment, pulled herself back into an upright sitting position. Draco hummed, taking a lengthy, generous swig of his wine glass. Really? Because this is exactly what I had in mind, he replied with a wink and pouted thoughtfully. I believe I informed you on two separate occasions that I fully intended on having my way with you under the dinner table. You also said you would wait until after the third course, Hermione said dryly, and poked at her cold polenta. I've never had this dish before, Draco. She didn't sulk. After all, she had just had a rather bone-meltingly wonderful orgasm, and she wasn't a child, but Draco still tittered at her, his eyes twinkling fondly. Granger? If you want to eat some veal that bloody badly, I'll port Gios to Italy tomorrow and you can have it properly. Hermione puffed out a laugh. Is this before or after you spent the afternoon hand-fitting me olives from Zabini's vineyard? Oh, it's hardly the right season for olives, Granger. I will guess we have to make a return trip in September, he grinned. Hermione raised a brow challengingly. I guess so. Draco's eyes flashed, the moment too quick for her to decipher with what before he leaned in, positively bewitching Hermione into a slow, sensual, yet meaningful kiss. His palms cupped the nape of her neck, and he groaned low in his throat when Hermione glided her fingers through his hair. He pulled away, bending his head to kiss along her jawline softly, before leaning back into his seat, a smirk tying at his lips from the soft, protesting whimper in her throat. All set for the preliminary hearing against the Sphinx breed on Monday, he artfully shifted the conversation away, and Hermione had to blink several times to clear away the woolly fog of arousal in her mind. What? Oh, she scowled. Yes, that wretched woman returned both of my summons notice, so Ron and a few other auras are going round to the farm on Sunday evening to bring her in, to make sure that she doesn't try to flee. I thought you said Weaselby was quitting. Draco tilted his head curiously. Ronald, Hermione corrected with a pointed glare, is quitting, yes. But he's going to wait until after the baby is born and when Harry returns from paternity leave. She Weasel still hasn't popped, he huffed out in amusement. Never know who has a worse temper between her and Potter. I bet she's just absolute heaven for Potter right now. Harry complaining to her when he had bumped into her on her walk break the other day about how he had spent the last two weeks dodging bad booby hexes and making sure he didn't breathe too loud. Of all things to be self-conscious about, Hermione, it's the decibel of my breathing. When Ginny was in the room, popped into her mind, and Hermione smiled wryly down at her plate. Her best friend earned his living facing off with dark wizards every day, but couldn't handle the mood swings of his pregnant wife. What about you? I heard the billywick smuggler is appealing against the sentence, Hermione said, taking a forkful of the cold meat on her plate. She fought the urge to roll her eyes to the back of her head, 
even cold, the flavors danced along her taste buds. Fergus' chest rumbled with a displeased hum, his lips thinning as he reached for his wine glass. Bastard's actions had us obliviating half of the bloody town, and there are still some tensions between us and the Muggle government for those Russian terrorism rumors. Trust me, he is not getting off lately. They're giving him a retrial now, a bored half. As is his right, apparently, he drawled with an eye roll. Doesn't matter, though. I'm still the lead witness, and regardless of if it was an accident or not, a week straight of casting memory charms on the muggles was a right pain in my ass. So I'll be damned if he doesn't spend at least a week of his own life in Azkaban. The mighty bit back a laugh, the pinching of his eyebrows, the slight curling of his lips, and the way that his chin haughtily cropped towards the ceiling. He looked very much like the sorely boy from their school days. Remind me to never piss you off, she teased. Draco's eyes leered at her. I'm sure I'd think of some other ways for you to make it up to me. She shivered, squeezing her still sensitive thighs together under the heat of his look. Perhaps it was her turn to sneak under the table. The drape slowly pulled open, halting her naughty thoughts, and Adrian cautiously, almost hesitantly, peeked through the gap. Relief visibly washed over his face when he saw both of them set at the table, and he coughed politely, pulling himself to attention as he greeted the pair of them. Every inch of his body oozed professionalism, and a minute's tint of a disproving side eye as he bowed. May I take your plates? You may. Draco nodded and moved to place his arm around Hermione, his fingers tracing nondescript patterns around her shoulders. Hermione hummed sleepily, the muscles of her back going lax as she sank gently into his embrace. Pleasant butterflies fluttered in her chest as his head turned, placing a quick peck against her temples. A wonderful, near hypnotizing concoction of apples, leather, and cedar would dance around her senses, and Hermione felt herself being pulled back into arousal as she stared down at her hand resting comfortably, possessively, on Draco's thigh. Black really was an excellent colour on him, she thought absent mindedly as she lightly squeezed his thigh. She bit back a pleased hum, feeling his muscles twitch underneath her fingers. Shall I bring over the dessert menus? She vaguely registered Adrian's offer. No, thank you. And Hermione should have really seen it coming by the way that Draco's voice practically glittered with mirth. Hot mortification seared up her spine, and Hermione fervently wished for the ground to swallow her whole as Draco drawled. I've already had this old. Daffodils, Granger, Draco panned, looking at her in disbelief. Doesn't this florist of yours sell more masculine flowers? It appears the nocturne hags have run him dry of all his belladonna nightshades. Hermione crept back with an eye wall, placing the bouquet on his desk. She looked over at him, fluttering her lashes like she had witnessed Lavender do many times during their years at school, as she mockingly cooed. Can't I buy my pretty boyfriend some pretty flowers? Draco scowled at her, his cheeks prickling a delightful rose hue, and Hermione had to bite on her lip to suppress her knowing smile as a hesitant hand reached for the bouquet his other hand wordlessly summoning a glass vase to home the flowers. Not pretty, like I'm so delicate, like I didn't check her right here not an hour, Draco grumbled, Hermione only catching a few words as she walked back to her desk. Her stomach fluttered when she heard Draco cast a stasis charm and her lips pressed down on a satisfied grin. She let out a pleased sigh, sitting down in her chair and pulled herself into her desk. How was your walk? Hermione smiled over at him. Good. I made it to seventeen minutes this time. Draco looked over at the clock, thoughtfully. So you did. He didn't sound surprised, nor were his words patronizing, but rather Hermione felt a wave of sincere, gentle pride from him. He never joined her on her walks. After their conversation at breakfast the other week, and some very thorough convincing on how Hermione needed him in other ways, her hips were still bruised from his grip. Draco had been content to carry on with his own work whilst Hermione took a break. As short as the break was, it felt good to step away from her desk, even if the thought of extending it to a full hour still made her stomach twist in knots. Hermione couldn't help but wonder sometimes during her walks just how attached she was to her work that she felt like, even in the days when she knew she could stay out for longer, she didn't hesitate to spin on her heel and head back to her desk once her wand bust in a reminder. But as equally attached to her job as she was, Hermione was also spitefully stubborn and loved a new challenge. Her mind thrived on it. And so, as each day passed, she ignored the buzzing of her wand just that little bit longer. She discovered that listening to the rushing streams of the fountain in the ministry lobby helped to drown out those vicious whispers in the back of her mind. And so, she would loop around the lobby for several minutes until she was near dizzy, her mind matching buzzing to her wand, 
and she would head back towards the lifts. Of course she knew that her alone time also gave her and Draco some much needed distance, even as short as it was. She couldn't help but suspect that Hila Reed had planned it so that would be the case. Small changes, like the woman had said, and by going on her walks alone, Hermione could already feel the grips of control at the edges of her fingertips, and the guilt from burdening Draco for all that time wasn't as acidic in her stomach anymore. Ten minutes out of the near 24 hours that they spent together, on the days that Draco didn't have to be in his own office, wasn't much, but Hermione knew that it was the new beginning towards a healthier balance between the two of them. He still had to remind her occasionally to go for a break, much to her frustration, not towards him, but that she still hadn't adapted to this new habit. That it wasn't as effortless as all of those times that Draco had helped her, and she had made the mental note to bring it up with Hila Reed during their next session. The pair of them worked in relative silence for the next couple of hours, Medley coming in to drop off the filing motion paperwork being the only distraction to their peace. Granger, I'm hungry. Draco piped up some time later, making Hermione jolt. Her quill scratched through her last paragraph of the notes, and she turned to scowl at him slightly. The corner of his lips twitched, but his face otherwise expressed nothing other than calm indifference. He cocked his head towards the door. Come on, let's get food. She blinked. I've already had my break, Hermione said. Did you eat during your break? He asked lightly, as he reached for his suit jacket on the back of his chair. Her stomach gurgled loudly before Hermione had a chance to lie, and she scowled again as she gripped her belly tightly, Draco snickering at her. I've already had my break, she repeated, sulkily. He walked behind her, leaning down, a hand lightly tucked at her plate, and he placed slow, cajoling kisses around her neck. Let's go for lunch, Granger, he murmured, his hot breath sending shivers down her spine. There was not enough oxygen in the office. She inhaled raggedly when his lips suckled underneath her ear. I have deadlines, she said weakly, arguing against his ministration, even with her hand pushing down encouragingly against his neck. Deadlines are not due for another three days. I checked earlier, Granger. Come on, what do you say? He hummed, pulling away to spin her chair from where it was tucked in the football. Hermione huffed half-heartedly. Her concentration had already broke, and even if she didn't join him, the smirking git's action would just be playing on loop in her mind until he returned to the office anyway. Fine, she bit out as she got up from the chair, reaching for her bag. She looked back up at him, a brow raised challengingly. But I'm paying. He rolled his eyes, stepping out of the way for her to head towards the door first. Stop treating me like I'm a bloody witch, Granger. I'm buying. She nodded at her assistant as they exited the office, even as she bristled at his words. What is it with you and your utterly incapable demeanour of letting a woman pay for you? What's with you and not letting a bloke pay for you? He argued back smoothly. The pair of them continued their growingly heated discussion as they walked towards the lift, and Hermione found herself surprised at how little she cared about the knowing grins and whispers from their colleagues as they made their way through the department. Oh, don't even try and use your family name as an excuse, Draco. Hermione's voice dripped with exacerbation as they stepped into the lift. Your mother has already told me all about your father's monthly allowance. Draco's brow flicked upwards in surprise, before a cloud of suspicion grew over his features. She told you about that, did she? Hermione picked at some invisible dirt under her nail as she hummed dismissively. She did. Draco clicked his tongue. I see. I'm still paying. No, you're not. Try and stop me, Granger. Ebimu snored. <laughs> Draco, you can't even handle my cat. Draco cut her off pressing her into the wall, effectively shutting off her teasing comments as he drew her into a knee-trembling kiss. Hermione's chest murmured in a pleased sound, and she reached up to wrap her arms around his neck as she deepened their kiss. She felt his lips curve into a smirk against hers before he licked at the entrance of her mouth. Hermione would let him think he won the argument, she thought, as one of his hands palmed at her bum in a matching rhythm to his tongue. She already had another rebuttal in mind for when they reached the ground floor. Ginny gave birth during the early hours of Thursday morning, and Hermione all but tore the letter off of the poor, awaiting owl's leg after she eagerly ran to her kitchen window when she and Draco returned from work later that evening. A happy, watery sob broke from her chest as she read through the contents of the letter, and she giddily reached for the photo in the envelope. Hermione cooed, counting the small, curled-up toes and fingers in the photo Harry had attached. Draco couldn't suppress his bored look when she gushed at him, shoving the photo under his nose. At least it's not Ginger, he called. Hermione scowled at him, clinging the photo to her chest protectively. He's not an it, 
she hissed at him and cocked her brow. I thought you wanted children. I do. I want our children, Granger. I have absolutely zero interest in anyone else's ankle biters. He shrugged dismissively, but sighed and gestured for her to continue. So, what unfortunate name that the little tyke gets saddled with? Hermione peered down at the photo, her fingers tracing around the beginning mouth twitch of a yawn the newborn gave the camera, and she smiled softly. Not even twelve hours old, and this baby's hairs were already as unruly as his father's and older brother's. Albus Frederick Potter. Hermione had almost forgotten how grand the manor conservatory was. A constant look of awe on her face as Draco guided her around the different plants, her hand clasped in his. She'd initially been rather hesitant when, as they approached the flue after leaving their office, Draco had spontaneously suggested that they spend the night at his home for once. Hermione had already once before burdened his mother with a surprise visit to their manor, and she was not keen on starting another toxic habit. But when Draco assured her that his mother had, with a shocking lack of tact, told him that she was going round to the Parkinson Manor that evening to help with the final preparations for the quickly approaching party, so the manor would be free of any unwanted disturbances, Hermione had supposed there was no harm in dropping by. She had, after all, once told him that she wanted to hear all about his childhood stories, and Draco had been more than happy to indulge her as he escorted her around the grounds of his family home. Apparently, toddler Draco was quite the little terror, little to Hermione's surprise, and took great joy in trying to climb the vines in the conservatory, of which Hermione learned actually was a close relative to the devil's snare. And here we have my personal favourite, Draco paused, as they nearly completed a full circle around the room, ensuring that he kept a cautious, considerable distance between them and the plant. Madame Windsor. Oh, we're well acquainted. Hermione's lips twitched amusedly as the enticing stripes of the plant quivered in their attempt to lull them in closer. Draco's brows furrowed, his eyes scrutinising her briefly before his expression cleared. Ah, yes, when you came around to pry my deepest, darkest secrets from my own mother, he teased, shooting her a wry smirk. Hermione huffed with irritation, the effect softened by the mortified blush that bloomed across her cheeks and neck. I came here for you, she reminded him with a suck of her tea. Draco made a pleased sound in the back of his throat, tugging on her hand to pull her in for a quick kiss. He pulled away too quickly and flicked his brow suggestively. Want to see the library? he asked, a gnawing smirk blooming on his lips when her eyes widened eagerly, and her neck cracked with the ferocious knot of her head. Draco wrapped his arms around her waist tightly, murmuring a wry, Hold on, and Hermione's stomach lurched at the familiar swoop of sidelong apparition. The overwhelming flowery concoctions drifting from her senses as the warm, sunset-lit glow of the conservatory vanished around them. Wow. That was all that she could think, just wow. There had to be at least three dozen rows surrounding them both, and evidently the Malfoy family took great advantage of their high ceiling. At least fifteen feet high, stacked completely to the brim of a beautiful array of colourful binding, leathers, browns, greens, golds, royal blues, a pico collection of beautiful books that were no doubt more valuable than some of the richest vaults in Gringotts. The one from the sunset glimmered through the stained glass window ahead of them, casting dancing light fragments across the shelf, where the antique brass picture lights couldn't extend to. A display case stood in the centre of the room, and Hermione squinted, recognising the names written on the open pages of the large silverback book. Of course the Malfoys would have a record of their family ancestry on display in their own library. She wondered if her face was a stark resemblance to that of when she had first stepped into the Hogwarts library. She wonderment and utter bliss. Hermione turned on her heel and cocked a brow as she grinned at him. You know, if you brought me here a year ago, I would have agreed to being your girlfriend on the spot, she teased. Draco blanched, his eyes widened almost imperceptibly, his head whipping around the room in near pained contemplation. Hermione snorted when he sculled seemingly towards the nearby stacks. He looked like he was mentally kicking himself. Hermione moved closer to him, a hand reaching up to cup his cheek, bringing his focus back to her. She smiled softly, tilting her chin to give him a quick, gentle kiss. She had barely pulled away when his hand cupped the back of her neck, bringing them back together. He kissed her fiercely, and every cell in her body burned in white-hot delight as she returned the kiss with equal vigour. Eventually, as her mind grew fuzzy like cotton wool, Hermione pulled back with a desperate, ragged gasp for air, and Draco groaned softly, leaning down to press their foreheads together. His eyes, hot and hazy, stared down at her lips, and his lips fluttered lazily when her tongue flicked out to wet her lips. His fingers glided through her loose curls. 
a pleased rumble in his chest, before lightly gripping at a section at the nape of her neck desperately. Please tell me my little bookworm has a naughty little library fantasy stored away in that brilliant mind somewhere, he said against her lips, his voice hot and graveled. Money moaned softly when his teeth nipped at her bottom lip. Her devilish thoughts from the cafe the other week sprang in her mind, and her thighs squeezed together tightly. Priceless book spine sticking into her back as Draco desperately ground her into the stacks. The cocktail aroma of old books and his cologne practically suffocating her as she buried her head into his neck to muffle her wanton moans. A temporary charm in the corner of the library to make it appear damp and cold. Her money exited shakily, nodding her head. She supposed he had all the time in the world to explore the library later. She practically pawed at his neck to bring their lips together again. Draco's muffled, delighted groan like a caress across a sensitive, pulsing navel, his tongue wickedly licking into her mouth as he blindly began to walk them backwards towards a nearby bookshelf. Do avoid the first editions, won't you? The pair sprang apart, Hermione letting out a startled squeak as she whipped around to the source of the interruption. Her heart fell to a positively icy stomach. Lucius Malfoy rounded the corner of a nearby section, every step slow and seemingly calculating. His sharp eyes scanned over the pair of them, viperous in every sense of the word, and the hackles on the back of Hermione's neck rose defensively. Lucius had been well known to come into every room in which he was in, and it appeared his stint in Azkaban hadn't doused the ability in the slightest. Hermione's hand twitched towards her holstered wand subconsciously, and Lucius paused, spotting the movement. A slick, oozing smirk spread across his features. I do say, Miss Granger, I would hope that you would not be so common as to curse the lord of his manor in the comfort of his own home, hmm? Both of his hands clasped his cane as he rested in front of him. There was the quick rustling of their clothes brushing together as Draco artfully placed himself between Hermione and his father. Lucius smirk grew positively sanctimonious. Father, I wasn't aware that you had returned. Draco bowed his head in greeting, his voice a steady tenor, but Hermione spotted the familiar pinching of his shoulder blades through his shirt and a slight pulsing of his temple. Clearly, Lucius drawled, with a pointed glance to the nearby bookcase. In a peripheral vision, Hermione noticed Draco's hand twitch behind him and reached forward to interlock their fingers together. The subtle tension of his shoulders eased slightly, and Draco rubbed his thumb over hers in comforting circles. Lucius blinked lazily back towards the pair of them, his lips pursing in faint contemplation. Shall I inform Twinkles to prepare breakfast for four hats tomorrow? Father, Draco spluttered, his ears looking painfully pink, and Hermione turned her equally flushed head to focus her attention on a shelf of thick olive green tombs. They looked expensive, original texts maybe, hmm. Perhaps if Hermione was lucky enough, if she touched them, they would curse her, send her off to some alternate spiritual plane for all eternity, anything to escape her current surroundings and unwanted company. Surely I don't need to remind you that there are family heirlooms dating back six centuries in this very room, Draco. She spied, Lucia's lip curling in Marta's taste from her peripheral vision. I am aware of how possessive you are when it comes to playing with your toys, but at least allow Miss Granger to join us for a proper family dinner before you decide to conceive my grandchild in our family library, Draco. Father, I, I beg you pardon? Hermione scorned simultaneously, even as her cheeks ached from heated embarrassment. Ah, so she speaks, Lucius crooned. I see that you have managed to retain that shrill tone of yours, Miss Granger. And here I was, worried that it had been lost after one of your delightful little visits to St. Mungo's. Hermione's blood ran cold. How do you know about that? She asked, her voice quiet and dark. Lucius cocked his head and tittered with a slight shake of his head. You don't believe that I would allow my unwedded heir to dally about with just any plain witch without keeping a cautious eye on her, do you? you you've been keeping tabs on me, she said incredulously. He hummed thoughtful. Hmm. 
how does the charming little muggle expression go? Like father, like son? Lucia smirked, his eyes bone chilling in their awareness as he stared Draco down. Draco audibly swallowed, and Hermione squeezed his hands with reassurance. So, you did know? Of course I knew! Lucius picked an invisible piece of lint off of his robe, his expression bored. Do you think that your mother is the only parent who knows her son? After all, after all, I was also there at the many, many, near endless breakfast you went on your harmonious little tirades about our dear guest here. There are only so many times that you can bring up a young lady's hair, as horrendous as it is. No offence, Miss Granger. Offence taken, she inwardly snarled, glaring at him. Lucia's eyes flashed with mirth as he continued. Before one grows suspicious. Draco briefly glanced at her over his shoulder, before looking away, his cheeks bruised in their ignominy. Hermione felt her own lips being tucked in fond amusement. As blind as she might have been to the true nature of their relationship, she had always noticed that Draco had a thing for her hair. Lucia's fingers rhythmically tapped across the head of his cane as he subtly scanned Hermione head to toe. Her teeth ached in their grinding as she fought the urge to shudder under his scrutiny. I would wish you a pleasant evening, Miss Granger, but I'm sure that my son already has plans to make sure that that happens. Lucia smirked at the twinning uncomfortable blushes on their faces and bowed his head at her. I shall see you both in the dining room tomorrow, at the usual hour, Draco. I do not care at what time the pair of you will retire with your little sleepover. You will still join your family for the breakfast hour. With a final pointed and sufferable look, Lucia sauntered towards the door, disappearing into the looming corridors. They both waited with bated breath before Draco spun on his heel, his hands clasping the top of her arms as he scanned her head to toe. Are oh, you all right? Draco's face was peaky, his brows and lips pinched together, and he couldn't quite meet her in the eye. I swear I had no idea he was back. He was supposed to be with my grandmother and friends for another week. Hermione's chest was warm and giddy under his fluttered attention, his hands a constant soothing stroking of her arm. But she still scoffed indignantly. Her initial panic from being sprung with the surprise meeting aside, the notion that Hermione would be afraid of a middle-aged wizard with pocket money and a flair for the dramatics. Draco, I have literally ridden a dragon. Your father might as well be a pygmy puff, Hermione panned. Draco stared blankly at her for a beat or so, and then his face crept, a blinding, heart soaring grin on his face. Now there's an image, he said wryly, and his hands grasped her tightly, pulling her towards him with the clear intention to kiss her again. She jerked away with a cautious glance to the probably purposefully left open library doors. Just because I'm not afraid of your father doesn't mean I'm impervious to his effects. She jutted her chin to a nearby bookshelf, reaching out to tuck his hand as she stroked the aisle. Draco's throat cut off somewhere between a whine and a grunt as she dragged him across the floor. There were books already levitating off of the shelves as she cast her wand about aimlessly. Pick up as many books as you can, Draco, and help me bring them back to my flat. I'm never coming back here again. So, how did you find your homework, Hermione? Hilary asked finally some twenty minutes into their session. Difficult, Hermione admitted, and puffed out a bitter laugh, which is ridiculous, because it's not even ten minutes of my day. Hermione, remember what I said at the end of our last session, about trying to avoid using these negative words? Hilary looked at her pointedly. When it comes to establishing a routine, every person is individual. No two people have the exact same lives, nor do their minds process the same action identically. And for you, Hermione, your mind has conditioned itself to a routine with little to no breaks at all. Even small changes take time. Right, Hermione conceded, her chest hot from the gentle chastising. May I ask how many times you managed to go for your walk? Hilary prompted after the click-click-click of the Newton's cradle was the only noise in the office for some considerably long moments. Oh, I went every day. My record is seventeen minutes. She couldn't help but puff her chest out in pride. Hina Reed's brow flicked in mild, genuine surprise, and Hermione's stomach practically somersaulted with glee at the appraising look in her eyes. That's excellent, Hermione, truly, Hina Reed said. Now, I'd like to explore why this was so difficult for you if you're comfortable with doing so. 
Was it a doing so every day or the duration, do you believe? Hermione paused thoughtfully. I guess it was just doing it. As in, taking those first few steps away from my death. Once I was away from my department, I had no problem carrying on, at, um, at least until my alarm set off and I could go back. Could go back? Hilary looked at her curiously. Hermione, if you did not enjoy this, then perhaps we should look into other options. Oh, no, 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 I, did, I didn't mean that. That wasn't... Hermione trailed off and huffed mildly irritated. Must these people read into every little word someone said? And she thought that she had a problem with over-analyzing things. I, I did, I mean, yes, it was difficult. And there were days where it was more so than others. But I did, I do like going for walks. It's just, um, I already told you, I love my job. And well, I, I had some deadlines and the Wisingham not hearing. And I couldn't exactly just chart my responsibilities. I'm not asking you to, Hermione. Hila Reed replied patiently. And the purpose of these exercises isn't to distract you from your duty, but rather it's to give you that time to clear your mind, to reflect on those feelings of anxiety that you have, and to see if you can gain some clarity over these feelings without the physical interruptions and presence of your paperwork. Hilary leaned forward, her elbows resting on her thighs, a firm but not unkind expression on her face. Hermione, with all due respect, you are always going to have deadlines. You're always going to have meetings and hearings with the council. If you don't learn to recognize these excuses that your mind tells you, then you are going to remain entangled in these harmful threats. Excuses. The word felt like a dirty curse on her tongue, and she grimaced. And yet, somewhere lodged deep inside the pit in her stomach, her mind knew that he was right. Like trapped in the vines of the devil's snare, the more justifications her mind tried to make, the more control she had lost over the years. And short of quitting her job, she knew the only way to break free was to talk with Hila Reed and follow her firm but patient guidance. I'm sorry, she said meekly. Never apologize, Hermione. The mind is a tricky fiend to all of us. And I would like to point out that you made the brave decision in coming here today. So, already on some level, your mind has begun to recognize these harmful habits. Hermione licked her lips, her mouth like sandpaper. Draco's had to remind me a few times to take a break, she confessed into her lap. I still keep burdening him. Hermione, I would have been mightily surprised if you had managed to kick a 15-year pattern in just two weeks, with no hurdles in the way, Hilary really appeased her. As impressively bright as you are, this is not something you can learn from the pages of a textbook. Hilary really paused, her lips pursed slightly as she looked at her in contemplation. You mentioned earlier, when we were going over your history with Mr. Malfoy, that you taught him how to cook. A valiant effort, I'm sure. Her mouth twitched in amazement. Hermione nodded. Was he a good cook in the beginning? How on earth did you manage to set a stove ablaze? You were boiling potatoes. You're the professor, Granger. Honestly, it's uncouth to settle all the blame on your pupil. Hermione bit back a smile and picked at her nail bed absentmindedly. Hardly. Did you feel like he was burdening you when he made mistakes or couldn't follow the recipe, even though you knew he was willing to try? When he tactfully decided not to mention the week of howlers she had cursed his way when he had given her food poisoning, she understood Hila Reed's point. They're not exactly the same thing, Hermione couldn't help but argue. Cooking is something you can learn from a textbook, regardless of if it's learning to cook or learning how to set time aside for yourself. It is a skill that takes time to develop and perfect. If it wasn't, everyone would be a professional chef. How does that muggle expression go? Rome wasn't built in a day? Gila Reed peered at her. Hermione, I would like for you to think of a walk on the beach. Hermione blinked in dismayed belief. What? Surely they were not about to do something as woolly as hypnotherapy, she scorned inwardly. Please, just trust me. She waited for Hermione to nod, returning the gesture. Okay, good. Now, picture yourself going for a walk on the beach. You can close your eyes if you think it'll help. Good. Steady breaths, too. Yes. Perfect, Hermione. Picture yourself on an empty beach. Your shoes are off. It's a nice early morning sunrise. Not too hot to cause discomfort, and not too cold to make you want to leave. Feel the grains of sand between your toes. Feel a gentle morning tide lap against the shoreline. Can you picture it? She didn't want to. 
Yes, she said quietly. Now, on this beach, look down at your feet. Look behind you. Are there footsteps? Well, if she had been walking, then obviously. Yes, is what she replied instead. Good. Think of those footsteps as your past decisions, your past choices. Now, you can go back and retrace those steps again. But all you are doing is stepping into a hole in the sand. You are not going to make any significant changes to the marks that are already there. Sure, you might make them bigger, but that's not what we want. Now, look ahead of you. Look at the untouched sand, fresh, free of any previous actions. Each step you choose to make is a new one. However many more footprints you choose to leave in that sand is up to you. Now, open your eyes for me, Hermione. She did and blinked blarely. Hila reads patient expression waiting for her. Hermione. Like the grains of sand on a beach, your future will always be there to wait for you to take the next step. And it's okay if right now, there are still some steps that you can only take if Mr. Malfoy is there behind you to give you the push. Just like how you were there for him, to guide him through one of your recipes. He got there, eventually, and so will you. Maniac said slowly and shakily reached for the glass of water on the table beside her. So, on your walks, if you don't mind me asking. Were you able to reflect some more as to how these unhealthy patterns of yours took root? I know we discussed during your last session about your younger self feeling the need to prove your worth to your peer. Hila Reed leaned into the resting hand on her cheek, a patient, encouraging smile on her face. Hermione swallowed a too big a sip, her chest burning with the effort, and shrugged limply. Kind of, she rasped out, and massaging soothing circle against the fires in her chest. Ah, uh, you are right, Hermione. Hila Reed reached cautiously towards her. I'm fine. It just went down the wrong way. She waved her off. She waved her off and took a couple of deep inhales until the acidic clenching of her chest faded away. If you're sure, Hila Reed said slowly, her eyes showing the faintest tightness of concern. Hermione nodded. Yes, I am. <clears throat> she cleared her throat and pinned her shoulders back in determination. And, um, yes, I did. Uh, think about it, I mean, she clarified. Are you comfortable sharing these thoughts with me? Another nod, and a cautious glance through the closed door. Our sessions remain confidential, yes? Hila Reed's eyes scanned over her in brief scrutiny before she nodded slowly. Unless I have reason to believe that you are at risk of great harm to yourself or to others, yes. Our conversation will remain within these four walls. Okay, well, um, I guess I, I didn't quite think so much about how they, my habits started. But there was a period of my life where I knew I went too far. And I even stopped because I knew it was too much for me. She rubbed her anxious, damp palms against her trousers. Hila Reed looked at her silently. Her tongue flicked out to wet her dry lips. I guess you, you could say in my third year, time um, was on my side. She drew out each word slowly, finishing with a pointed look to the healer. Hila Reed's eyes blinked in understanding, her bottom lip dropping slightly in genuine surprise before she remembered herself her expression quickly cooling back into that neutral state of blank calmness. I see. And this was just your third year. Uh, yes, um, I had quite the ambitious timetable that year. Too ambitious, she added with slight bitterness. Even with knowing it was too much pressure and responsibility on the younger adolescent self, Hermione had to admit it was still a slightly sore subject that she couldn't keep up with her wonderfully busy schedule. Hila read hummed. But time was not on your side in the end, right? You said that you were able to pull yourself back? Yes. That's good. That's very encouraging, Hermione. Hila Reed leaned back into her chair with a pleased exhale. The fact that you had the initiative to take control of the reins before shows me that you are indeed capable of doing it again, and you will. She tacked on the end after a momentary thoughtful pause. Hermione's lips pressed together in a small smile before she looked at her expectantly. So what do I do next? Do I just keep going for what? Small changes, Hermione, she reminded her again, and cocked her head to the side, seemingly deliberating something for a moment before she spoke again. If it's taking the initiative once again that causes you trouble, perhaps you can start doing so in other environments to begin with. See if you can build the habit elsewhere before we transfer it to your work. Hermione's head tilted in confusion. Like how? You said that Fridays are when you and Mr. Nafa cook together, yes? Well then, and only if you're comfortable with changing this routine, perhaps you might like to do another activity. Invite him out for dinner at a restaurant. Hermione's cheeks colored, remembering how their last restaurant outing went. She really did want to try the tiramisu, that randy bastard. 
or perhaps brew a potion together, visit an art gallery, just a new setting. Of course, if these Friday dinners are very meaningful for the both of you, I do not wish to take that away. It can be any day of the week. All I ask is that you are the one to make the initiative. And from what I've gathered from our conversations is that Mr. Malfoy would have very little protest about anything that you would like to do. Her blush deepened and her heart glittered in her chest, cosy warmth blooming in her stomach as she pictured the surprised but happy way his eyes flickered whenever she surprised him. The hydrangeas, the quidditch tickets, the news that she had reserved a booth at Vivaldi's. So you're asking me to go on dates? Hermione chuckled, slightly perplexed. Hmm, I suppose I am. Initiative, Hermione. The more you practice, the easier it will be when it comes to bringing yourself out of that work mindset you say you have difficulty leaving. And of course, I would still like for you to keep to your daily walks. For now, let's keep it under twenty minutes. Is that all right with you? Hermione smiled. Yes, that's all right. Good. A quick glance to the clock on her wall. Now, I'd like us to talk some more about your habit of using negative vocabulary. Is that all right? Hermione exhaled deeply and reached for a glass of water, taking a long, steady sip. She made sure that she was set comfortably in the plush armchair before she nodded at the healer. She had the feeling that the rest of her session was not going to be another walk on the beach. Only through the coercion of Verita Serum would Hermione admit it, but Pansy knew how to plan a celebration. The chateau had to have been surrounded by at least 300 acres of lush summer green land and blush pink dogwood trees. No doubt Hermione bet that it must have cost the Parkinson's a pretty sicker to have them imported from Japan lined the perimeter of the grounds. Hermione was pretty sure that the orchestra, whom had been playing a wonderful waltzing symphony from the moment that they had arrived, were actually the official orchestra from the Wizarding Theatre in London. A passing waiter offered Hermione another flute of Pinot Grigio, of which she took with eager gratitude. Draco had left her side some minutes earlier to catch up with Blaze, and Pansy had taken the opportunity to cost her lovely alone time. Well, I'm glad you remembered the memo about it being a formal occasion. Once again, Hermione was convinced that Pansy was speaking directly to her hair. She ran a self-conscious hand against the slick back braids and smiled tightly at her. It's a lovely party, Parkinson, Hermione said gracefully. Pansy hummed, her shoulders pinning back as she preened slightly, satisfaction oozing in her eyes as she glanced around. Of course it is. At the very least, it serves as an appetizer for the wedding in four months. Hermione blinked, taking a bath. She had mentioned a winter wedding, but she had assumed that he had meant the following year. Pansy eyed her jarred expression and smirked. Only commoners prolong their engagement, Granger, Pansy said with a tone of slight condescension, as if explaining the concept to a five-year-old. It's unseemly to hold the bride in limbo for too long. Well, we wouldn't want that. Pansy's eyes flashed. Manny could have sworn with amusement before her expression cooled again and glanced over to where Draco stood. Her lips licked into another smirk, and she cooed an interested brow at Hermione. So, when can I expect a thank you? Pansy blinked and feigned innocence. A thank you? A perfectly manicured claw gestured absentmindedly in Draco's direction. Let's not pretend that your darling little reunion had nothing to do with me. A scorned half. <laughs> you said I was poisonous, Hermione reminded her bitterly. Pansy waved her words off dismissively. I was on my monthly stranger. You can't hold me accountable for anything I said that day. Besides, she gave an impish smirk. You're here, aren't you? So clearly my words hold very little value to you. Hermione cleared her throat, biting back a scoff at Pansy's watery excuse and looked at her pointedly. You gave me that invitation on purpose, didn't you? Finally caught on, have you? Pansy replied dryly, her eyes flicking over Hermione's shoulder briefly before turning her and knowing Leah spreading across her face. You best start thinking more like a Slytherin Granger. I'm sure you'll be one of us soon enough. She cocked a brow, her lips passing into a smirk over the rim of her flute. Hermione bristled, this time not holding back her scuff quite in time. <clears throat> I really don't see that happening. Oh, I don't know about that, Hermione. A voice cooed from behind her. See his Cheshire grin appearing not long after as he walked past her to stand next to his fiancée, a long arm wrapping around the small of her waist. Theo cocked his head, his lips pursed contemplatively. I'm sure Edgecombe Bird would vouch for the fact that you have quite a little devious side to you. In fact, you're already quite a little Slytherin from where I'm standing. Theo and Pansy's matching smirks unsettled her. The hackles on the back of her neck cold and tight with irritation. 
A crane of her neck showed her that Draco was still deep in conversation with Blaise Sabini, and with a resigned droop of her shoulders, she turned back to the scheming couple. I assumed I'm supposed to take that as a compliment, she drawled. The highest of honours. Theo quipped back, amusement dancing across his eyes. Do you spare us the teethful in conversation of pretending that you and Draco aren't going to be married one day, Granger? Pansy rolled her eyes. Like Theo and I aren't already aware that we're going to be your little offspring's godparents one day. Yeah, right. There was a greater chance of Draco dying his head ginger than that happening. Hermione's lips curled, even as her cheeks flushed hotly. Draco told you that, did he? She said, with what she hoped was a tone of casual indifference. As if her heart wasn't a raging, giddy hippogriff against her ribcage at the idea of Draco discussing their non-existent children so candidly. Believe it or not, but we don't just sit around plotting nefarious schemes all day, my little lamp. Theo sked at her, with a mocking, disproving shake of his head. Honestly. I thought you, of all people, would know better than to treat someone based off of their stereotypes. We do have normal conversations with our friends, just like the common wizarding folk do. Hermione looked at them both, exacerbatedly. Forgive me for thinking otherwise. Given that our last couple of interactions involved you both having ulterior motives. And look how well that turned out for you, Pansy said with a bored sip of her drink as she eyed up Hermione's rose. Not many people who get the honour of wearing robes selected by Lady Mare for herself, especially not ones that coordinate with her only sons. Hermione brushed at her robe subconsciously, but she wasn't particularly fussed about fine threads. Even she had to admit that her outfit was beautiful. When it had arrived at a flat the other day, the designer's name printed in actual velvet on the box, she had almost been too afraid to touch it, worried that the sudden sweat blooming in her palms would ruin the delicate silk until Draco had come up behind her, snorting as he informed her that the ropes had had protective charms woven into each individual thread. They were practically indestructible. Hermione had initially been a bit put out. She should have expected that Narcissa would dress her up in green. But on close inspection, it was more of a juniper green than a Slytherin green. And when she squinted, the fabric seemed to have traces of golden flecks woven in thin spirals. Flecks that twinkled wonderfully in the warm late-June sunlight. The silk was like cool water to touch and flowed against her body just as well. From the front it was a rather conservative necklace, and the hem farming her collarbones wonderfully and comfortably. But from behind it had a slightly daring Carl swoop back, of which Draco greatly appreciated given the soft kisses he couldn't stop placing up the nape of her spine before they had left her flat. Draco's tan waistcoat matched her dress, and Hermione had nearly leapt on him. Expensive dress be damned when she had noticed how wonderfully and deliciously the waistcoat had showed off his trim waist, highlighting his broad shoulders even further. Even now, as she peeked a glance over at him, the devilish urge to grab him by his tie and ravage him behind one of the dogwood trees lingered deep within her navel. Hermione had a prick her cheeks behind a flute as she drained her glass and artfully changed the subject. So, four months to the wedding, um, what? How's the wedding planning going? she asked lamely. Pansy's lips twitched before her expression cooled. Going well, of course. If you're truly interested, I'm in need of a second opinion when I meet with the wedding coordinator next Friday. Shall I change the lunch reservation for three people? Pansy looked at her innocently, but a ghost of a smirk lingered at the edge of her lips. Hermione swallowed back a grimace, but her sour disdain must have been clear on her face as Theo grinned bitingly. I do believe the little lamb may suddenly find herself holed up in a meeting on Friday, my darling, Theo hummed. Hermione bristled. She really hated that nickname. Pansy looked at her in contemplation before she'd to her fiancé. And after everything we've done for her poor little monsters. The pair sent her matching faint, disappointing shakes of their head, and a disturbed shiver ran up her spine. Merlin forbid she and Draco began to copy each other's ticks one day. So it's now to marry quickly. Hermione's voice was unnaturally high in her discomfort as she pushed to change her subject once more. Pansy's grin was viperous as she looked at her knowingly. Curious about our pure blood traditions, Granger. A surprisingly graceful snort sounded behind her. I'd hardly label it a tradition. Our dear Pansy is just excited to gain the access to the Not Family Woods. Draco gracefully joined the conversation, his hand a much needed, comforting press against the bottom of her spine. Hermione resisted the urge to sack with relief against his touch, instead pressing back against his hand in a silent thank you. Draco had over briefly before turning back to the couple. Shouldn't the pair of you be making your gracious rounds to the other seventy three guests? He cocked a lazy brow. After all, we are all here to celebrate your union. You never did like me playing with your toys when we were growing up, Draco, Theo pouted. 
Still haven't learned to share after all of those years? I guess not, Draco replied, his voice tired and his arm wrapped around Hermione's waist, pulling her into him. He looked at a pair of them expectantly. Of course, feel free to stand here and disappoint your parents with your less than graceful hosting, but Granger and I are going to go for a spin. Hermione barely had a chance to register his words before the hand on her waist tucked at her, the knowing massful smirks of the engaged couple disappearing behind her as Draco led her to the dance floor. He spun her with practiced ease, and Hermione let out a surprised laugh. The edges of his eye pinched in front delight as Hermione grinned up at him wryly, as he began to lead her in an expert waltz. Is this another early birthday present? she asked teasingly, the salty air of the Aegean Sea floating in her memories as she pictured the last time that she had danced in his embrace. He hummed, his eyes scanning across her face appreciatively, before they glinted with a salacious smirk. I can think of another way we can celebrate my birthday, with you in my arms, he murmured, cautious of the nearby couples dancing around them. Hermione snorted, a hand lightly slapping his shoulder. You're incorrigible. You love it, he tsked, abandoning all formal etiquette as he pulled her hips against his, and their chests brushed together deliciously. He led her effortlessly. Like gliding on ice, they moved around the dance floor. Hermione's blood hummed and sang in her ears and her skin tingled as Draco's eyes never left hers. The hum of chatter and the melodies of the orchestra soon faded from her senses. In his embrace, in his arms, the world only belonged to the pair of them. Her heart was a kaleidoscope in her chest, filled only with her love and affection for him. Sheer happiness coursed through her veins. Hila Reed had been right. Hermione couldn't change the past. Her months of denial, her weeks of bitter anger, and then fear. She had to let it go. Hermione knew better than anyone how fickle time was. And though it had not been ideal, her choices had still led her to this moment, to being with Draco, to be able to spend her remaining days loving him as deeply and as fervently as he loved her, to take the next step in the sand. Her surroundings hazily bloomed back into view, and her mind looked over his shoulder at a chateau a couple of hundred feet away, anticipated butterflies twirled about her stomach as she looked back up at him, giving him a nervous smile. Draco's brows furrowed in slight concern, but he gave her a patient smile. Something wrong. She shook her head, unable to hold back her happy grin. No, the complete opposite. His smile widened into a matching grin, and he bent down to give her a brief soft kiss on the forehead. What's going on in that big brain of yours, then? He asked when he pulled away. She bit her lip, only remembering belatedly that she probably now had lipstick on her teeth, and quickly wiped her tongue across her teeth before she hesitantly replied. You can rent individual suites at the chateau, and... If you're already coming as a guest, they offer you a discount. Draco just looked at her, waiting for her to continue as he spun them both around. Hermione broke her eyes away from his hypnotizing gaze and focused on the gold swirls of his tie. I checked earlier. They have a sweet free. She inhaled deeply and looked back up at him determinedly. What do you say you and I take a long weekend and... And we stay here for a few more days? Draco stood and another couple grumbled as they almost barged into them. Hermione didn't pay their disgruntled glares any attention as she waited for him to respond. You want a little getaway together? he asked, his voice a cocktail of disbelief and hope. Hermione shrugged casually, a stuck difference to the shuddering, twisting nerves of her stomach. Yeah, I, I thought it'd be nice. A few days to ourselves before I have to start on my next court hearing prep. She peered up at him. So, do you want to? Draco looked at her. His eyes hazy as he seemingly became lost in thought for a few moments before his expression cleared up and he cocked a knowing brow at her. What about work on Monday? he murmured with a teasing smile as he pulled her back closer to him. This time Hermione allowed herself to melt into his embrace and she reached up to lock her fingers behind his neck. His arms tightened around her waist in response. Hermione hummed a pleased, thoughtful sound, her thumb tracing light circles at the nape of his neck. Her lips twitched in a teasing smile of her own and she leaned up with the intention of giving him a kiss a touch too inappropriate for their former surroundings, she responded back. I think I can find the time. December 2006. The large imposing doors of the Wizengamot chambers loomed behind her, and Hermione relished an anticipated thrumming of her bones whilst Draco threw some last-minute practice rebuttals at her. Following the wizarding riots in Portugal four years ago, Hermione finished looking at Draco exacerbatedly. That was a cheap shot, Draco. I was still sulking about last week. You could have died. He didn't get anywhere near close to me, Hermione said dryly. I'm too young to be a widower. Draco, we're not even married. 
You best hope this bill of yours gets passed, Ranger, because that's the only thing stopping me from porking to Scotland and fetching myself a wonderful new manticore headman for the fireplace. Hermione snorted. Draco, how do you expect to slay a 200-year-old fully grown manticore when you can't even handle one tiny old cat? I told you he's not a cat. He's a lost horcrux. Draco scowled, crossing his arms petulantly. Her lips twitched and she looked up at him fondly. She stepped in closer to him, a pleased sigh escaping her as he pulled her into his embrace. She breathed in the intoxicating scent of his cologne, nuzzling her head into the nook of his shoulder. Draco's hand had a comforting constant stroke up the length of her spine. I'm going to win, Hermione vowed, her words muffled against his thick black cable jumper. Draco hummed in agreement, and she felt his lips kiss at her temple as he bent down. Yes, you are. His voice dropped to a murmur, evidently mindful of the chamber guard behind them. And when you win, and you storm up to my office to write me silly in my chair in celebration. Hermione's never quivered, his breath hot and tantalizing against the sensitive skin below her ear. Her fingers gripped at his jumper when her earlobe was enveloped by his lips for a painfully short moment, and her entire body throbbed in urgent, needy want. There was an abandoned old chamber's room somewhere down the corridor, Hermione registered vaguely through the quickly building fog in her mind. The Wizengamot were notorious for never being on time for hearings, maybe if the pair of them were really quick. Please do not stop by the florist outside on your way up, honestly, Granger. I could open up my own bloody flower shop with the number of bouquets in my office. Hermione huffed, all budding arousal draining away as quickly as it built, and she pulled away, an eyebrow cocked incredulously. You know, you could just let the flowers live their natural lifespan. Nobody is forcing you to keep all of them forever under a dozen stasis charms. Except a hydrangea, she mentally tacked on. If he ever got rid of his hydrangea, she would make it her life's mission to sprinkle in her ginger biscuits into every one of his future meals, for as long as they both would live. Draco's lips stint in displeasure. That's an appalling idea, Granger. She bit back a snort. She supposed she did have a tendency to go overboard with the flowers. She'd have to ask Wheeler Reed during their next sessions if habitual tendencies could transfer over to others. She would also need to buy the healer a Christmas card, Hermione remembered belatedly. Oh, don't forget, Theo and Pether returned from their honeymoon yesterday, so we are meeting them for dinner tonight. Her shoulders sagged, and she frowned at him. Why are you telling me this now? She paused, peering up at him from underneath her lashes imploringly. Can't we reschedule it for another night? Draco smirked and tapped on her plate lightly as he tittered. Now, now, Granger, if I was forced to suffer through three dinners in a row with Weaselby and the loony girl, then you can suffer through one evening with my friends. After all, he winked conspiratorially, it's like you always say, we're an equal team. Hermione huffed, breaking eye contact to glare at the words behind his shoulders. She knew that her words would come back to bite her in the ass one day. Draco snickered, leaning in to kiss at her frown until it melted away. Think of it as a pepper-up potion, he said against her forehead. Just a little something extra to fool that ang um, that passion of yours to get you through this hearing. His nose skimmed hers, pausing to nudge her in a soft nose kiss, and a burning embers of arousal flared up within her navel again as a scent cupped her chin, kissing her firmly, his tongue a teasing lick against the entrance of her mouth. Now go in there and save those bloody manticores of yours, so that when we get home tonight we can christen our lovely new mattress thoroughly before dinner, he whispered hotly, teasingly against her mouth. With a sly grin she knew mirrored his own, Hermione leaned in to kiss him once more, only pulling away when a chamber guard coughed pointedly. I love you, she said, thumbing along his cheek softly. Draco's eyes twinkled. I know, he replied with a smug grin. With a cut of snort and a final eye roll, she turned on her heel and nodded at the guard to release the protective, salient wards on the Wizengamot entrance. There were three things that Hermione was certain of as the doors groaned open, revealing the grand courtroom ahead of her. One, she was going to win this manticore appeal. Two, Pansy Parkinson's wedding dress truly was stunning. And three, despite his sulky insistence that the previous fifteen months had counted, Hermione Granger had been dating Draco Malfoy for the last six months. And it was going pretty well. Thank you for listening to today's chapter of Once More with Feeling by Wet Pretzel, read by Alamex Mabella. If you would like to stay up to date on upcoming chapters and stories, you can follow me on AO3, YouTube or Tumblr. Thank you to Web Pretzel for letting me read their story and thank you to all of you for listening.